Ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor to present to you for the first time the Honorable Sarah Huckabee Sanders, Governor of the great state of Arkansas. <laughs> Wow. Speaker Shepard, President Hester, members of the Supreme Court, distinguished members of the General Assembly, and my fellow Arkansans, it is an absolute honor to stand before you as the 47th governor and the first woman governor of the great state of Arkansas. I was 13 years old when I attended my first joint address back in 1996. Some of you may actually recall it was a pretty chaotic day. After getting lost in the surging crowd of the hall, I actually missed part of my dad's first big speech in this very chamber. Today, I made sure to get here bright and early, and much to the surprise of pretty much anyone who knows me, I'm actually on time. I'm grateful to be joined by my family, my wonderful husband, Brian, our three kids, Scarlett, Huck, and George, and members of our extended family. Thank you all for being here. We are also honored to be joined by former Governor Asa Hutchinson and the First Lady Susan Hutchinson. Thank you so much for your service to our state and the example that you have led with over the last eight years. I hope I can meet the bar that you have set. I also want to recognize former Senator and Governor David Pryor and his wife Barbara, who set an incredible example of service and love for our state. I know how much you loved Arkansas and what a great job you did as parents because I had the opportunity as the Attorney General of Girls State to spend an entire day with your son where he treated me better than anybody should have. And I'm very grateful for your leadership and your service. Thank you for being here today. As we gather in these storied chambers at the dawn of a new day, a turning point in the history of Arkansas will usher in a new era of good jobs, great schools, safer streets, and stronger families. The people of Arkansas, in their vast wisdom, have entrusted a new generation to lead. This is our moment. This is our opportunity. And you and I are the leaders who our people have chosen to get the job done. Our reasons for such high confidence and boundless optimism are many. History teaches us that to every generation comes not only great challenges, but great opportunities, and often in quick succession. After the upheaval of World War II, there were decades of unparalleled economic growth. And after the turmoil of Vietnam, stagflation, and the gas lines of the 1970s, there was peace and prosperity of the Reagan era. 
after the financial crisis of 2008 and years of lingering stagnation, there was an unprecedented economic boom. Like the rest of our country, Arkansas has weathered its fair share of storms. A worldwide pandemic, shuttered schools, crippling inflation, and rising crime. But here in Arkansas, that long night of hardship and heartache is breaking into a brighter tomorrow. If we seize this moment together, if we act on the principles that each of us hold dear, we can make Arkansas stronger than it ever has been before. I couldn't ask for better partners in this endeavor. President Hester, Speaker Shepard, your partnership is the reason that I know we will deliver for the people of Arkansas. I want this legislature to know that as governor, I will always have an open door and an open mind. And like most of you, take note I did say most, I don't care about getting the credit. I only care about getting results. So this session, let us think bigger. Let us think bolder and do better than we ever have before. With, I'll pause. Be careful, in my last job, they never clapped for me at the podium, so when it starts now, I'm gonna give you a minute. <laughs> With family budgets still battered by inflation, let's deliver another historic tax cut and give the people of Arkansas the pay raise that they deserve. Let's not surrender the competition for jobs to other states. Let's cut taxes and bring jobs right here to Arkansas. And let's also cut wasteful spending so we can continue to phase out the state income tax altogether. The challenges that we face in education did not appear yesterday, and they certainly will not be solved tomorrow, but we will get started fixing it today. I ask you to send me legislation that expands pre-K, improves literacy, and gives students real-world skills they need to succeed in the workplace. Parents cannot be an afterthought in education. Parents are the foundation of a child's success. So let's give parents a greater role in education, including, <laughs> including the right to choose the school that's best for their child, whether it is public, <laughs> private, or parochial. When we give parents a choice, we give children a chance. In these endeavors, I will be guided by clear principles, principles that I know each of you share. Among these principles is the belief that the first responsibility of government is to secure the lives, the liberty, and property of its citizens.
any government that tolerates rampant crime has failed in its most important duty. As of today, Arkansas will tolerate crime no longer. Together, we will build the prison space we need to keep our citizens safe, and we will put more of our courageous cops on the street. We will shut down the crime wave that has plagued our cities. And let me be clear, we will teach our children that the badge is a symbol of justice. The police are a force for good, and our officers are heroes who are worthy of our highest respect. There is so much more we can achieve as partners working together. If you send me legislating, legislation promoting adoption or improving foster care, I will sign it. And if you send me a bill defending the right to free speech or the right to keep and bear arms, I will sign it. And if you send me a bill that rewards our teachers with higher pay, I will sign it. Make no mistake, if you send me legislation that grows our government at the expense of freedom, I will veto it without hesitation or remorse. As a mom of three kids, I have no problem saying no. Today, let us reaffirm our commitment to a timeless American idea that government exists not to rule the people, but to serve the people. The special interest will speak loudly, but it is the voice of the people that we must hear and follow. They are the men and women who till the soil, drive the long halls, and run the restaurants. The people who work hard, give back to their communities, and help their neighbors in times of need. The people who teach their children to love God and to be proud of their country. They take responsibility for their actions, and they deserve a government that does the same. A government that does a few things and does them exceptionally well. That is the government that they voted for, and that is what we will deliver. Today, let us each pledge that we will not rest until we have a government that is as good and decent and hardworking as the people of Arkansas.
I ask you to stand with me as we work for the state we love and for the people that we serve. Thank you so much for the honor of being your governor. God bless you, and God bless the great state of Arkansas. Thank you so much. Somebody lean on the wall. You on the wall? Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> As we all understand, uh, here in the city of Little Rock in central Arkansas, and of course uh, the state of Arkansas, we've all experienced a devastating uh, tornado, uh, which has created a state of emergency uh, for the city of Little Rock, central Arkansas, and the entire state. It graves the heart uh, to see uh, many of our residents who are now uh, been displaced uh, across the city as a result of these tornadoes. Uh, we want to assure uh, the public uh, that your first responders are going above and beyond to ensure public safety, health, and welfare. I couldn't be more proud of the work that they're doing and will continue to do throughout the night, the weekend, and the coming days. Uh, what we want to share with you today is that I've been in constant contact with Governor Huckabee Sanders. We've requested uh, the state of emergency. She has uh, dutifully accepted that and is already under coordination with all of the state parties as well as federal partners to ensure that we have what we need when we need it, to ensure that we are responding to our residents as quickly as possible. Uh, today, uh, you'll hear from a number of different individuals, particularly from uh, the response mission from our chief of Little Rock Fire Department, Delphon Hubbard, as well as the Little Rock Police Department acting chief of police uh, during this period of time, Andre Dyer. Uh, we have uh, Major Casey from the Arkansas State uh, Police, and we'll continue to share more information uh, throughout this time. Uh, but again, we want to send the message to the residents uh, that we are here for you. We understand what's going on. Uh, we're rapidly working towards uh, all health and safety efforts at this very moment. Uh, so please know uh, that we got your back, uh, that we're here for you. We also, uh, most importantly, are praying for all those that have been impacted by this tornado. Uh, we know uh, that God will prevail as always. Uh, Governor Sanders. Thank you so much, Mayor. Uh, we are so grateful for your partnership in, in this very difficult time for our city. Uh, as each of you know, um, Today has been a very hard day for the state of Arkansas. Uh, but the goodness of this is that Arkansas and Arkansans are tough and we are resilient. Uh, and no matter what comes our way, 
uh, we will get back up the next day and keep moving. Uh, we will help our neighbors. We will ensure that every Arkansan uh, who needs assistance has it. Uh, our message and our mission is really simple. The people come first and the paperwork will come second. Uh, we have been working closely with Mayor Scott as well as state and local officials around the state of Arkansas who have been impacted. Uh, everyone from our sheriffs to our state police, National Guard. As most of you know, we activated Arkansas's National Guard and we have approximately 100 guardsmen that are on the ground uh, offering assistance, not just here in central Arkansas, uh, but other areas of the state that have also been impacted, like Wynn, Arkansas, uh, where we are pulling all of our resources together. Arkansas State Police, uh, as well as law enforcement here in Little Rock, our fire department have done a heroic effort uh, and have been working diligently from the moment that we knew that storms were headed our way to assist the people of our state. Uh, I can't thank you enough for um, just the enormous amount of time and effort that each of you have put into and will be working on over the course of the next several days. Uh, we are very thankful, not just for your work today, uh, in this moment, but frankly, the service that you bring to our state every single day. And uh, we are never more grateful for our law enforcement and for our National Guard uh, than we are in moments like this. And so we thank you on behalf of the entire state for the work that you're doing. We stand ready to help. If people need assistance, we ask if it's an emergency that you call 911. Uh, if it is not an emergency situation but you need assistance, we encourage you to reach out uh, to your local county emergency management officials. You can find those resources online. Uh, Arkansas and the state government stand ready to offer whatever assistance is needed. Uh, we've offered that to the mayor here as well as other cities across the state. I also spoke with the FEMA director, uh, Chris Well, uh, earlier this evening and have already requested federal assistance and they are working quickly to make sure that any resources that we need on the ground here will be provided as well as Arkansas already declaring a state of emergency, providing resources for those towns that have been impacted. Uh, thank you again, Mayor Scott, for uh, your partnership in this process and your leadership, as well as all of those in our law enforcement community that are stepping up today and helping our citizens get through this. With that, I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Lieutenant Colonel Aaron from State Police to give a few updates and comments. Uh, currently, we have troopers deployed in the Little Rock, North Little Rock metro area, uh, assisting Little Rock, North Little Rock Police Department, Jacksonville Police Department, Cabot Police Department. Uh, and also, we've got our emergency response troopers responding across county, concentrated in the area of wind that right now appears to be the hardest hit. Uh, and this is going to be a continued operation. Uh, we're assisting other agencies as these requests come in. Uh, right now, our efforts are focused in this Little Rock, North Little Rock metro area and across county. Thank you. We'll now have the response um, mission from Chief Delphon Hubbard, and then following him, uh, Chief Andre Dyer. Good evening. Uh, Little Rock Fire Department, upon this initial uh, impact of this storm, this tornado, uh, we've responded to overturned vehicles, heavy damage to residential and businesses in that community, uh, along with downed trees, downed power lines, uh, ruptured gas lines, uh, they faced a lot of uh, various uh, mitigating emergencies there. Uh, one of our fire stations is in that area on North Shackleford, uh, fire station number nine was heavily damaged. Uh, so that limited their ability to respond to those uh, calls for emergency. However, they did serve as a shelter in place for many members of the community who came to their fire station seeking uh, shelter from the storm. Uh, we have been in great partnership with uh, MIMS as we uh, triage treated and transported several of the individuals that was in that area that needed medical attention. Uh, we also assisted Public Works in their means of uh, clearing the trees from the uh, streetways, the down power lines, uh, I mean the down power poles in those particular areas to assist with our emergency vehicles being able to get in and out of those areas. And even with uh, uh, our fire station being down that's in that particular area, we had several of our other neighboring communities such as Conway, Maumel, Bryant, they came in to assist us. They're still here in the city, uh, lending a helping hand wherever we may need uh, that particular assistance. And uh, also we partnered with our police department going door to door. 
uh, ensuring we have accountability of all those residents that lived in that community so that there would be a means of either rescuing those individuals or uh, just getting them out of that particular hazardous environment. And so we were pretty successful at that. That particular number is not available at this time as to how many people uh, we were able to move from that area, but that's a continuous ongoing assessment of the fire department. Chief Dyer. Yes, sir, thank you. Good evening. I'm Assistant Chief Andre Dyer. This is a very horrific event that occurred here in our city today, but you can be rest assured that the members of this city's government, the fire department, mayor's office, uh, the police department is doing all that we can to make sure that uh, you do not become victimized twice by the actions of anyone that wants to come into the area, the affected areas, and, and try to commit any type of crime. We are here in full force, along with state police, uh, a few other entities. I want to I want to say thank you to all of the surrounding departments that wanted to come in and help us and offer their assistance. Uh, we could not have done what we've done thus far without you. Um, but we need for everyone to understand uh, there were a lot of areas hit today in this city. There's going to be a, some displaced individuals. Um, we will do all that we can to secure those areas to make sure that there's no looting that takes place. We will enforce the law to the highest extent for those that believe they can come into the area and take advantage of this horrific event. We will not allow it to happen. We will be very strict on who we're allowing to those areas. We understand that you're anxious and you want to get back to your homes, but you have to allow the process to take place. There is nothing that anyone can do in the evening hours without all the power lines that are down and the electricity being out. So do us a favor and stay out of the area unless it is absolutely necessary. Be patient with us because we will do our jobs to the fullest effect of the law and we will not allow anyone into those areas until we deem it safe for you to be able to go into those areas. So with that said, we wanna, we wanna thank everyone who came in to assist. Uh, we needed each and every hand that uh, came in to help us out uh, and we will always be here for you just as you were here for us. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Dyer. Again, we are here for the public. Uh, we're responding uh, as quickly as possible to each and every area as we've already shared today. And we are in deep prayer for all those that have been impacted. As you know by now, uh, we're asking for individuals who have been displaced to go to Hall High, High School. Uh, we're working with you there once you get there. Uh, we'll give more updates as we continue to reassess the situation. Uh, we'll have another update sometime mid-morning tomorrow. Uh, we'll let you know the time and the location. Uh, that will, at that point in time, we'll start beginning assessing even more damage uh, that we may not be aware of tonight. Uh, so I want to make certain that you have all of that information available. Again, I ask the residents of Little Rock not only to be in prayer for Little Rock, but to be in prayer for this entire state. We'll now take questions. If you all have, a, a Governor, for you and also for the city, do you have a breakdown of how many fatalities there are, injuries, people displaced? So uh, right now, I, I can um, confirm that we have two fatalities uh, in Wynn, Arkansas. Uh, but as you know, this is an ongoing situation, still a lot of search and rescue efforts going on across the state. But right now, we can confirm, uh, based off of information from local law enforcement on the ground, that we have two fatalities in Wynn, Arkansas. Do you, do you expect that number to go up? Uh, certainly possible. Um, we're, we're hopeful that it doesn't, but I think given the nature and the volatility of the situation, we're certainly preparing that it could. In terms of hospitalizations, do you have you an idea for a time? Yeah, I've spoken to uh, the leadership of hospitals, both here in Central Arkansas and around the state. Uh, right now we have a number of injuries, but no individual hospital has been overwhelmed or is at a capacity uh, that they are unable to, to manage. Like I said, this is an ongoing situation. Uh, we expect those numbers to increase as search and rescue continues. Uh, but right now, uh, we feel like our healthcare uh, professionals and teams on the ground, both here in central Arkansas and around the state, uh, are capable of managing what is coming in. Uh, we've also deployed resources for mobile health units, particularly in the Wynn area and working closely with a number of partners to make sure that any health care needs that they have are being addressed. Can you all feel as well and prepare for this level of severe weather? Yes, uh, I can uh, rest assured that the city of Little Rock and we know for certain that the state of Arkansas 
has been very prepared for this event, well trained on special issues like this, and so couldn't be more proud than the first responders at this time. Yeah, I, I echo the, the mayor's praise for our first responders. They have done an absolutely amazing job as, as other people are sheltering in place. They're running into the danger, and we could not be more grateful for their willingness to step up. Uh, but any time that you have uh, a tragedy like this, I don't think you can emotionally be prepared, but certainly in terms of coordination with our state and local officials, partners across the state, uh, that has been a seamless process, and we expect that to continue over the course of the coming days. Can you speak about the response of school districts, you know, making the decision to let students out early, you know, in preparation for this? I uh, cannot speak in totality on the response of school district, but we know uh, Superintendent Wright uh, is fully prepared in situations like this, and so we have been in constant communication. Clearly, as you know, uh, that we have all of our displaced individuals and residents being located at Hall High. Uh, we're also utilizing another location uh, for our LRPD and other first responders. I uh, can't share at that point in time because we want to keep that uh, to ensure that we maintain the continuity of the operations, but it is a Little Rock School District facility. Do you have an idea of what were some of the hardest areas in Little Rock? I'll have to uh, ask Chief Dyer kind of talk us through that. Some of the areas that was most <laughs> Some of the areas that were most affected uh, were mainly in, in West Little Rock. Um, it covered about 2,100 uh, citizens that could have been affected. So it was a pretty large stretch of, of uh, area that uh, that the tornado actually hit. Um, right now we're still assessing that damage and we can't just give you a pinpointed area that was hit the hardest, but we do know that there were several areas that were affected pretty, pretty badly. Next question. Uh, Mayor, so they're just to confirm with you, so there, there are no, no fatalities in Little Rock that you're aware of, and I guess is that surprising given how big of an area, how busy an area? There it is was. truly a, a, by the grace of God that we have not experienced any fatalities to, to date. We still are assessing the damage uh, and talking with Greg Thompson, who is over MIMS. We know it's somewhere close to 30 individuals have been transported to our local hospitals. Uh, but still, uh, as we're sharing, we're still assessing damage and want to make certain before we give any. Uh, definitive numbers uh, on, re regarding that, but at this point in time, again, by the grace of God, there's no fatalities. Do we know if any first responders have been injured, particularly that fire station that was hit by the storm? Chief Lester. That's true. Uh, we were very fortunate. None of our personnel, none of our fire personnel were injured during that particular time. And even in the midst of uh, once the storm passed, they were part of the uh, group that rendered aid to those members of that community. Thank you. A couple more questions. Governor, how long do you think until the state receives federal assistance, and what will that, uh, what resources will that open up to our community? Uh, the FEMA director expressly committed that they're moving as quickly as they can. They expect those resources to be available immediately, uh, but we've already opened up a number of significant resources from a state level, and feel confident that we can address whatever needs that the people of Arkansas have with the resources we have available at this moment. Uh, we've allocated two hundred and fifty thousand dollars currently. Uh, with significant room to grow, and we'll address whatever needs people have. One last question. Have there been any provisions made to get people who don't have transportation after the storm to the shelter location? Uh, yes. Uh, we've, up until this point, I believe, and may have uh, still working on a timeline, but we do know that Rock Region Metro has been going to different staging areas between the Little Rock Police Department and Fire Department and are being transported to Hall High. Uh, and so that's what we know at this time. From a statewide perspective, uh, we're working closely with local law enforcement as well as National Guard uh, and um, the Sheriff's Office and County Judges to make sure that individuals that need uh, temporary housing and transportation are having those needs addressed as well. And finally, thank you everyone. And again, uh, please remain in prayer for Little Rock and the entire state of Arkansas. Thank you. Thank you guys. We'll let you guys know when the next update is. It'll be tomorrow morning. We'll probably have a different venue than this. I know it's tight. Thanks for accommodating us tonight. Another continual update about the status of things. Uh, as you all know, Arkansas suffered 
pretty devastating destruction over the course of uh, Friday afternoon and evening due to tornadoes coming through the state in both central Arkansas and in Wynn, Arkansas. Uh, certainly a long road ahead, but we're making significant progress in cleaning up those communities um, and primarily taking care of people that need assistance right now. Uh, as we've said from day one, our focus is going to be on the people first and the paperwork second. Uh, as much as we can, we are trying to alleviate some of the pressure points that individuals have. A couple of things that we're going to do this afternoon, we're going to sign two executive orders. One that will allow for uh, paid leave for state employees who have been impacted directly by the storm as well as uh, a second executive order that will extend the tax deadline uh, for those who have been directly impacted by the storm. As many places as we can find to relieve those pressure points, that's what we're gonna do over the course of the next several days. Also, uh, wanna announce that uh, FEMA has opened up their location here in Little Rock. It's at 315 Shackleford Road where people can go for assistance. Our goal is to make sure that they have a one-stop shop so that they can come in and uh, process things from both the federal, state, and city level. Any documentation that they need or specific assistance requests that they have, they can do that all in one place. Uh, and that is the first of that location so that we can start addressing those problems. North Little Rock and Wynn operations by FEMA, we expect to open within the next 24 to 36 hours. And we will keep you guys updated on that. Lastly, uh, we launched a website this morning, helparkansas.com, that people can go to uh, both who need assistance, a list of options available, whether it's shelter, food, clothing, or other assistance requests that they have. Uh, all of that is in that one central location, as well as those who wanna volunteer. They either wanna donate uh, time, money, or supplies. They can go there and find a number of options available. So that's helparkansas.com. All of those things are gonna be in that one place to make it as simple as possible for those who need assistance, as well as those who wanna help out uh, fellow Arkansans. I can't tell you how thankful we are for the absolute outpouring of support that we have seen as we've traveled across the state over the last couple days from Arkansans stepping up and helping their neighbor. Uh, I wanna remind people that we have a long way to go. Uh, let's not lose that enthusiasm and continue to help our fellow Arkansans over the course of the next several weeks as we see these needs and demands come up. Last thing, uh, I wanna be sure that we remind people that Arkansas is expected to uh, have additional severe weather that comes through tomorrow. We wanna make sure people are paying attention to their local officials and weather alerts that are coming in around the state. There is a large area of Arkansas that we expect that could be impacted. So please pay attention to any weather alerts that you see over the course of the next 48 hours uh, that could impact the state and make sure that we are paying attention to those alerts and taking them seriously. Thank you so much for your help. And uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Senator Cotton and then we'll take a couple questions. Senator. Thank you, Governor, for hosting me this afternoon. And thanks to AJ Gary from the Department of Emergency Management uh, for an informative briefing. And thanks to all the hard workers in the department uh, who are not just helping Arkansans recover from these ter terrible storms, but helped avoid the worst possible outcome in many cases, the loss of human life. Um, we can rebuild your homes, we can rebuild your schools, we can rebuild businesses, but we can't um, bring you back to life. So they've done great work. And, and as the governor said, uh, unfortunately, we're in to the spring storm season. There could be heavier storms coming ahead to include storms for tomorrow and into the evening. You should always listen to your local officials, to your weather forecasters. I, may, I know it may seem sometimes like you can ride out a storm, but the risk is simply not worth it. Please heed their warnings and follow their directions uh, to make sure that you protect yourself and your loved ones. Um, one thing I've seen across the state is that while you can destroy a building, a storm can do a terrible amount of damage, it can't destroy the human spirit. And the spirit of Arkansas has been shining strong for these last three or four days. Uh, you go around central Arkansas and you see pop-up tents on corners where people are offering food and beverages uh, in some of these distribution centers for food and clothing and other items. You have almost as many people dropping items off as you have them picking it up. Um, as I travel around Wynn this morning, I saw the Methodist church that had been destroyed there and someone said there's the Methodist church. It was destroyed, but you had the pastor out front. You had a lot of uh, his congregation working to repair it and pitching in with others who have lost their homes. And I, I thought to myself, that building may have been destroyed, but that church is stronger than ever. And I'm sure that pastor and all of his congregation are gonna be gathering somewhere 
this Sunday to celebrate Easter together because what really defines us as a state is our people and our common spirit. And again, we can uh, rebuild buildings, um, but nothing can ever, ever take away our spirit. And I'm just so proud to be serving the great people of Arkansas. Uh, we've had a great response around the state uh, and our, our governor, our Department of Emergency Management uh, has worked around the clock these last three days to help people with their immediate needs. We're pleased to have FEMA on the ground coordinating federal response as well. There'll be a lot more than immediate needs and we're not going to go anywhere for weeks, for months, for years, for as long as it takes to help you put back everything, to build your home back, to get your school back, to put your business, your, uh, your church uh, back in good 100% working order. We'll be here for you. That's what your elected officials are supposed to do. I can tell you that's what Governor Sanders, that's what I, and that's what, what the rest of your elected officials will do. Thank you all. Thanks. Any questions? What is the state doing to prepare for the state of Arkansas? Lots of debris still on the ground, which could be could be even worse, really, for those storms that we're expecting. Are, are you guys doing anything to prepare for it? Absolutely. I mean, not just because the storm is coming, but because that's the nature of the responsibility in front of us is to clean up that debris. We're trying to make that happen as quickly as possible. The other thing is letting people know that this is potentially uh, a severe weather alert on the way and that people are paying attention to those alerts, that they're taking shelter and that they have a plan in place for themselves and for their family. Uh, those are the most important things that we can do right now. Um, and AJ, I don't know if you want to speak to anything specific. AJ Gary, the director of uh, Adam here in Arkansas. AJ, if you want to talk about any of the other specific actions ahead of tomorrow. Sure. So what we also do is uh, when we have severe weather coming in, we'll do coordination calls with all of our counties, uh, local officials that can dial in. We have the National Weather Service. They are a great partner of ours that can give those updates and let everybody kind of know what's expected. Um, of course, we've been activated for the Friday storm since Friday, the State Emergency Operations Center. We will continue to run that activation through Wednesday. So we will have our personnel here at the EOC that we can respond to any needs at the local level um, if there are any. Um, again, you know, the best thing people can do is really pay attention to the weather uh, advice that's coming in from whether it's the Weather Channel, it's their local news or local weathermen uh, to, uh, to really heed those warnings and to take uh, precautions when they need to. Sure, we had a very positive conversation, as you can tell uh, by the folks behind us with uh, FEMA, as well as the administrator that was on the ground yesterday. We've had a great and consistent partnership back and forth. Uh, going to continue to work together. It's going to take everybody engaging and investing. Uh, I'm incredibly thankful that we have amazing partners in our federal delegation, both through Senator Cotton, Senator Bozeman, and all four of our uh, congressional delegation are helping make sure that the federal response is everything that we need and that they're acting quickly. So far, we have not asked for anything that they haven't delivered, and we're incredibly grateful for that uh, back and forth and the cooperation we've received from the federal side. Senator, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that. But. I, I would just stress one more time what uh, AJ said. Um, please heed the warnings of your local elected officials, emergency managers, uh, and the weather forecasters. Um, if they encourage you to take shelter, we can reschedule a baseball game. You can run an errand another time. You can finish that last task at, at work uh, some other time. But if the storm hits you the way it hit central Arkansas or the way it hit wind, um, and, and you haven't taken proper preparations, we can't bring you back to life. So please, wherever you are in the state, if you hear those warnings, whether they're from weather forecasters on television, the radio, from your local emergency manager, your local officials, please heed them and take them seriously. Uh, I think we saved a lot of lives uh, in Wynn and central Arkansas because our citizens in those communities did act and their leaders took steps like sending kids home from school, uh, making sure that everyone who wasn't an essential emergency response job was home as well so they could take shelter. So please heed those warnings. Um, question, sure. Governor Sanders, I know you toured Jacksonville. That city is working really hard to clean up uh, all the debris and damage. They told me yesterday National Guard is there, Red Cross. Is FEMA going to be setting up there, especially with the threat of more severe weather tonight? 
Right now, uh, the plan is that FEMA would have locations in Little Rock, North Little Rock, and Wynn, and that North Little Rock location could help serve the residents of Jacksonville. Working very closely with the mayor, Mayor Elmore, there on the ground, and if they have specific requests, uh, additional guard and things like that, we're happy to, to meet those. Uh, but right now, we feel comfortable with those three centers. If we need to add a fourth, we would certainly work with FEMA to make that request. Thanks so much, guys. We appreciate it. And I want to say a special thank you to Speaker Shepard, President Hester, Senator Dismang, Representative Eves, and all of the legislators who made today possible. It's been an incredibly busy few weeks here in Arkansas. I've spent a lot of time traveling around the state, helping people recover from the storms and tornadoes that came through just less than a couple weeks ago. And our legislators have been working around the clock to wrap up this legislative session. But even before the events of the past couple of days, our Kansans have been struggling. Single mom in Russellville has had to pick up extra shifts at work because of prices at the grocery store are too high. Working parents in Smackover can't afford a summer road trip anymore because gas has gotten too expensive. And the small business owner we spoke to in Bentonville just filed his taxes and realized he can't afford to hire new staff next year. Because of DC Democrats out of control, reckless spending, our Kansans are caught in the middle between sky high inflation and sky high taxes. Our state desperately needs relief. And our administration and the legislators that have been in session are delivering on exactly that. In a moment, I'll sign a tax cut that this year alone will cut $150 million off the personal income tax and $36 million off the corporate income tax. This covers 1.1 million Arkansans, the majority of taxpayers in our state. We're also phasing out a state a tax on Arkansas manufacturers called the throwback tax. Currently, manufacturers based here have to pay a tax when selling things outside of Arkansas, hurting their ability to compete in the free market. We'll get rid of this tax and boost businesses, jobs, and investment in our state. And I wanna say a special thank you to Senator Gilmore and Representative Beatty for their leadership on making sure that that happened during this session. These changes won't just help the hardworking Ar Arkansas families struggling with inflation. It will also level the playing field with our neighbors. We have zero income tax states like Tennessee and Texas on either side of us. In Mississippi and Missouri, have just passed historic tax cuts. We want Arkansas to be competitive in retraining, retaining and, mess that up a little bit, attracting and retaining talent. Today, we're taking another step to regain our competitive edge. That's the number one priority of our administration. Better schools, safer streets, and lower taxes. All to make Arkansas the most attractive state in the country to live, to work, and to raise a family. This is the first major tax cut of my administration, but it certainly won't be the last. We're gonna to continue to find ways to cut government waste and government spending. We will continue to cut taxes until we can responsibly phase out our state income tax. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues in the legislature to make a few remarks. Thank you, Governor. I just want to say I'm very proud to be a part of this. This is a continuation of uh, tax reductions we've made since 2015 in this General Assembly. And thank you to my uh, good friend, Senator Dismang, and all my House and Senate colleagues for doing this. It keeps Arkansas on the right path, in my opinion, gets people back home more money, and creates a, an environment in Arkansas that I think businesses will find friendly. So uh, with that, thank you very much. Just to echo what he said, I think that we've been very diligent over the last several sessions in, in keeping and dropping that rate, that individual income tax rate down. But in addition to that, we've also done everything that we can to simplify the process and simplify how individuals are required to file their tax returns here in the state. We've consolidated tables. This gets us one step closer uh, to be able to get us back to one table. In addition, uh, you know, there's lots of questions about who this impacts. Well, it impacts every taxpayer that makes above $23,400 in the state. They will receive immediate impact because we were able to make it retroactive to the first of this year. Uh, lastly, I, I do want to talk about the path that we've gone down and, and the fact that we did focus on low and income middle family and income families here in the state first and that you can see inside our tax code. In fact, 
those making below 23,000 are set at 3.4%. Again, we, we've got a commitment. I'm proud of what we're doing and we're headed in the right direction. And I think we'll, we'll make it a little farther down the road sooner than we think. Thank you. Take a couple questions if there are any. I'm really confident in our path forward. We've made sure uh, that we can fully fund both Arkansas Learns as well as the criminal justice reform package at the same time delivering on the promise to continue chipping away at our state's income tax. We have already made significant changes. The budget that was proposed by the previous administration, we made cuts to that in our proposal. Uh, we're gonna continue looking for things like that and when we find those savings, we'll pass it on to the taxpayer. But we feel very confident about the path forward um, and are leaning very heavily on our colleagues and our partners in the legislature to work with us as we continue to deliver for the people of the state. From inflation, I mean, I, again, I would just like to say that there was a commitment to make sure that we focused on low and middle income taxpayers first. Again, this, this is a reflection of the fact, I think, that all families are hurting from inflation here in this day. Uh, but again, we, we did our work. We made our, you know, we made our decision to focus there first. And again, you're just seeing a chipping away at the top rate. Um, and, and that's what you're, that's the, the result of the bill. Yeah, I do think they do. When we consolidated the tables, we cut taxes for individuals that had never received a tax cut here in the state. Uh, the folks that were kind of in between the tables and, and that impacted more our Kansas to a greater degree than even what we're talking about here today. Uh, but again, that was what we decided to do first. Um, and this is just a reflection of the continued path to drive that top rate down. Because at the end of the day, that what will hurt families in Arkansas is if we're not competitive, that we're losing our population to out of states, that we're losing entrepreneurs to other states. Um, and so I think this is reflective of the fact that we want to be progressive. This is a progressive task, ta uh, tax uh, structure that we have here in the state. It will help draw people in cont and continue the progress that we're having. aware of any specific project that would be dependent. I think that the uh, reference was made that there may be contractors that have facilities in multiple states, some of those states which have already eliminated the throwback rule, but I would, I would imagine it's not just the defense contracting industry, but probably a number of industries. And so I think that was given as just kind of a, uh, an anecdotal reference, but as far as a specific project, there's, that was not, uh, at least from my standpoint, that was, there was no specific project in mind. Anybody else? Google wouldn't be classified as a social media company, and so there's a, a clear distinction there. Uh, our goal is protecting kids, empowering parents to make the best decision possible, and we know how harmful social media can be to kids. And by putting this piece of legislation in effect, uh, we do not impact any current users only new users and only residents here in the state, so not out-of-state people that come here to visit would not be impacted. Um, but anyone under the age of 18 with a new social media account would be verified by a parent. Doesn't mean they can't have it, just means they have to have verification in order to do so. We think that this helps us do a better job of protecting kids in the state of Arkansas, and that's a good thing, so absolutely a plan to sign. Uh, 
look, we're going to continue looking at every way that we can engage in this process and hold big tech companies accountable, something that has never been done. And as much as we can continue down that process, we're going to. We think this is a great first step uh, of holding these social media companies accountable and protecting kids for the long haul. Thanks so much, guys. Appreciate it. Twenty-four hours. One of the big things was watching uh, current weather coming into the state. Uh, we've been in touch with local officials in all of the counties uh, that have been impacted over the last 24 hours and uh, thankful that we have minimal damage in those areas. So far, no injuries reported. Uh, we continue to monitor the weather, certainly the flooding and issues that they may bring both in areas that were impacted by storms on Friday as well as those impacted by today's weather uh, continue to be just absolutely overwhelmed and grateful for the number of Arkansans that are stepping up and helping their neighbors. Uh, the place that we are in today, City Center, uh, here at Emanuel, has been just a tremendous leader and partner in the efforts that they're making to take care of all of Central Arkansas, doing a phenomenal job. So thankful for the work that they are doing, as well as so many of our local churches and partners that are really just saying, uh, whatever the need is, we can meet it. And so far, we have seen our Kansans just uh, really take care of one another. It makes us, uh, I think, proud to represent our state even more than we already were. Uh, I've got Senator Bozeman, Mayor Scott, Judge Hyde, uh, Pastor Smith, and several others here on uh, Tony Robinson from FEMA. We'll give a quick update, and then we'll be happy to take a couple questions. Again, want to reiterate. Um, we are hopeful that people are getting all the assistance that they need. One of the best places that you can go is helparkansas.com. It has an extensive list of all of the places if you need assistance or if you want to offer to give assistance and help. Uh, there are a number of ways to do that, and we encourage you to get on that website or go to one of the FEMA recovery centers. We have three of those located around the state, one here in Little Rock, uh, one in North Little Rock and one in Wynn, and all of those are listed on the website, helparkansas.com. You can go there to get specific information for your area about how to get or give assistance. And again, just want to say thank you to the people of Arkansas who have really stepped up and addressed the needs of our community. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to the pastor and let him say a few words. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Governor. Um, so the city senior is here just to do that, to serve the city. Uh, every week we're providing emergency dental care, food and clothing, also an adult education center here where you can get your GED because we exist to serve the city. That's why we're here. Those that are affected are our neighbors. They're our, our friends. We're not going anywhere. They're not going anywhere. So these are our people and that's why we exist to, to serve them. So because we have about 100 volunteers working every week, it stays just well for the mayor to come in and allow this to be first for the first responders on Friday afternoon about 5.30 and then starting Monday to be the Family Assistance Center. So we're so grateful for the state and the city partnership uh, to serve the people that we're trying to serve, obviously, every day uh, of the week. But probably most gratitude goes to church members and also over 100 people who don't have any affiliation with the city center or Emanuel, just walked up to serve. And so it's been a sweet time to see our Kansans come together and do what they do, which is to serve each other. Uh, first and foremost, just want to share uh, the appreciation to Governor Sanders, uh, as well as uh, Tony Robbins, who was part of the FEMA 
uh, Region 6 Administrator County Judge Barry Hyde and Pastor Smith. What you see today uh, is the, the great communication, collaboration, cooperation between state, federal, local, and nonprofit, all working together to ensure that the residents of Little Rock are the first priority. Uh, we do want to make one, up, one announcement. If you do have debris removal, we have allowed Reservoir Park to be that debris removal location, drop-off location. Please go there. Uh, please do not go to our landfill in southwest Little Rock. We want to make certain that everything from West Little Rock stays in West Little Rock uh, from a reservoir uh, standpoint. That being said, I uh, just want to continue to reiterate that this city center has a great partnership with Emmanuel Baptist Church. Uh, they truly had the great vision in 2017 uh, to locate this location here uh, to be the hands and the feet uh, of the city of Little Rock. And what you see today is just a great partnership between the city and this church. But again, it's countless and nameless individuals who are here working together. And we say thank you. We appreciate you. We see you. We feel you. And we know this is demonstrating the unity of our city during this time. And we continue to show God's hand at work. Uh, that being said, said, Administrator Tony. Thank you, Mayor. Just want to reiterate, uh, certainly want to thank the pastor for this great center we've got set up to provide a one-stop shop for people to come and get assistance. And, and, and as we were out this weekend, I want to thank all the volunteers that were out. What a great effort of community coming together to help community. FEMA is here to work alongside of our state partners. Uh, we're working very closely with the Arkansas Division of Emergency Management. We have the president declared a major disaster declaration, uh, turning on the program of individual assistance, which helps individuals in Pulaski, Lone Oak, and Cross Counties. Uh, they can call 1-800-621-3362 or apply at disasterassistance.gov to receive assistance for uninsured losses to help them with uh, rental assistance, temporary housing, some lost contents. And so we encourage you to apply for that assistance. First, call your insurance if you're covered by insurance so that we can look at those uninsured lost and get you assistance. Thanks. Well, just to that, I'll, I'll add all the folks you see standing behind me, this is our job. We get paid to do this. So the unsung heroes and sometimes the sung heroes, like a pastor with Emmanuel Baptist leading uh, in the community, the uh, uh, folks who are really boots on the ground and affecting people's lives right now are the many, many churches in Cross County, in Lone Oak, and in Pulaski County, in each of the cities, and, and, and those who are even outside the area. Um, uh, the, the amount of help in cleanup, uh, packing up, uh, in getting food, of, of making sure that the uh, pantries in the area are, are well stocked with foods that don't require refrigeration or cooking because they don't have electricity is just overwhelming and, and I'm so thankful uh, for all these folks in our community. Thanks. We're in a situation where we can't prevent a tragedy like this from happening, but we can determine the response. And so that's why we're here today. I'm representing the congressional delegation, really to pat people on the back, thank them for the great work that they're doing in making sure that we're doing all that we can to support the effort. I see a lot of news people here today. Be sure to thank your weathermen. Thank you all for the great job that you did in uh, getting the word out, you know, making it such that people were aware that this was happening. I'm sure many lives were saved as a result of that, so give yourselves a pat on the back. Our first responders have done a tremendous job. All that are involved in that, the uh, nonprofits have come together doing a tremendous job. And then also uh, our mayors, the governor has done a tremendous job. The list goes on and on. So like I say, we want to make sure that the federal response is as it should be. And uh, Tony is doing a tremendous job with FEMA. And so it's going to take a while, but it's just going to take all of us continuing to work together. But I do appreciate the efforts of everybody so far. We'll take out a couple questions if there are any. I'm going to take the easy one. Sarah's going to tackle the hard one. <laughs> I don't think that was the agreed upon deal on the front. We'll give them to the mayor. So. <laughs> I wonder, Tony, um, yeah. a lot of people out there, a lot of people out there don't really know where to begin when it comes to asking for assistance from FEMA. Step by step, run down and what they need to be doing. 
So thank, thanks for the question. First, once again, if you have insurance, the first step is to call your insurance provider to start that process. They are going to help you on that recovery much better. If not, then the next step is to apply for assistance at 1-800-621-3362 or www.disasterassistance.gov. And what we'll do is register you through that process. So you should have with you uh, a driver's license. You should have uh, your insurance policy, uh, who your carrier is, uh, the the policy number and uh, other documents it's really important for us to know uh, where your damaged dwelling address is and where you're currently staying and then a current phone number and so what I'd really ask people is is if uh, you move or go somewhere differently keep that information updated once you've registered because it's really important for us if we have to contact you or send you something through the mail that we have good contact information for you as well but once you start that registration process then an inspector I may come out and visit your dwelling and, and we'll work you through that process and the things that we need to be able to provide you the assistance. The other thing is we will have a close partnership with the Small Business Administration. So you may receive something that says we need you to apply for the Small Business Administration. Please do that. They offer some great programs through low interest loans. We would help you with your home contents and that's a form of assistance that goes hand in hand with what we deliver as well. So ask people to make sure when you get that, fill it out. They'll coordinate with you as well. They'll be working with us when we set up our disaster recovery centers and be there with us as well. And so we'll have uh, next week some disaster recovery centers where once you apply, if you want to go check on your assistance, you can do that at those centers. If I could just echo, one of the things that Tony mentioned were some of those documents that you may need, driver's license and things like that. At each of the FEMA uh, disaster recovery centers, and I'll walk through the three different locations that we currently have, we have representatives from the state agencies that can help provide those documents for individuals who lost those uh, due to the storm. We have representatives from each of the key DFNA, DHS, to help make sure we can quickly get those documents to individuals so they can process their request with FEMA as quickly as possible. We have uh, three centers currently set up here in Little Rock. It's at 315 North Shackleford. Uh, encourage people that need assistance to go there where it can be a one-stop shop to get everything that they need. In North Little Rock, it's at 1300 Pike Avenue. And we also have a center in Wynn, Arkansas, uh, and that's located in the old Sears building. So any one of those three locations, individuals who need assistance can go there to make those requests and hopefully get everything that they need processed and processed pretty quickly. Uh, and a, a, a huge uh, pat on the back and kudos to FEMA for turning those requests very quickly. They've already started processing checks uh, and funding for individuals. We've had reports uh, from people here in central Arkansas that have already received uh, funding from FEMA. So they're, they're moving quickly and we're really grateful for the work that they're doing. What's the latest on the federal uh, cost share request? Uh, we have put in a request for 100% cost share through the federal government. Uh, we're waiting a response and hope to have that back quickly uh, with a good answer. We'll put a little pressure on Tony, but we feel pretty good about it so far. Anybody else? Easy crowd. They must be scared of you, Senator Bozeman. They're hard on me. Sure. Um, do you all feel like we dodged a bullet uh, given the storms last night? And is that impacting any of the recovery systems? I, I don't think you could say that given the amount of devastation that's widespread, not just across central Arkansas, but around the state. We have a lot of people hurting, uh, but I'm thankful for, uh, like I think each one of us has talked about, seen and noticed firsthand, just the outpouring of support uh, from local churches, nonprofits, but also the tremendous cooperation between city, state, and federal uh, government officials making sure that we get the job done and take care of people as quickly as possible. Uh, when you have this kind of devastation, I don't, I don't think you can use uh, certainly that term, but we're going to try to make sure we minimize the impact as best as possible. Just to clarify that question, um, in terms of uh, yesterday when you were speaking in Jacksonville, you had expressed some concern about uh, damage from the overnight storm maybe hindering efforts today. Um, what has that been like? Have you seen any impact? Certainly the rain doesn't help. The high winds that we've seen in different parts of the state are not ideal, uh, but the crews that have been working since Friday are continuing to work despite the fact that they're working under tough weather conditions. Another reason we're so grateful for the many uh, people who have stepped up. Mayor, I don't know if you want to comment specifically about Little Rock uh, and the efforts that have been ongoing here despite the fact that we've had weather challenges. Uh, we have not seen the energy or the effort from people that are uh, out there removing debris and offering assistance slow down in any way. 
Sure. Uh, again, as the governor stated, uh, there are just so many uh, organizations that are being very helpful during this time. Uh, we clearly know that the weather has impacted some um, of these opportunities. However, uh, we just want to give a shout out to everyone, whether it's uh, Goodwill Arkansas, the American Red Cross, Cross uh, Engage Arkansas, clearly Emmanuel, what's going on here, but we know uh, Amazon brought in close to two or 3,000 tarps, and we know how important tarps are uh, during this period of time. And so uh, I definitely don't want to go down a whole list because I'll forget someone. If you've done something, we say thank you. All right. Thank you guys so much. We appreciate it. Anybody else? Google wouldn't be classified as a social media company, and so there's a, a clear distinction there. Uh, our goal is protecting kids, empowering parents to make the best decision possible, and we know how harmful social media can be to kids. And by putting this piece of legislation in effect, uh, we do not impact any current users only new users and only residents here in the state, so not out-of-state people that come here to visit would not be impacted. Um, but anyone under the age of 18 with a new social media account would be verified by a parent. Doesn't mean they can't have it, just means they have to have verification in order to do so. We think that this helps us do a better job of protecting kids in the state of Arkansas, and that's a good thing, so absolutely a plan to sign. Look, we're going to continue looking at every way that we can engage in this process and hold big tech companies accountable, something that has never been done. And as much as we can continue down that process, we're going to. We think this is a great first step uh, of holding these social media companies accountable and protecting kids for the long haul. Thanks so much, guys. Appreciate it. Before I start, I want to give a couple of updates uh, on some of the recent storm recovery and mentioned that FEMA has now opened a fixed facility in Wynn that will serve as a hub for all disaster relief. That location is Ridgeview Baptist Church. Anyone that needs assistance, uh, we encourage you to go to that fixed facility that FEMA has now opened in Wynn at the Ridgeview Baptist Church. You can find uh, a full list of all services provided as well as if you are looking to uh, help others in need, we encourage you to go to helparkansas.com to either seek assistance or to help provide uh, other Arkansans in need. I also want to draw attention to the executive order that I signed late in the day yesterday, which reduces government red tape and frees up an additional $3 million to help with tornado victims' immediate housing needs. Our administration is going to stand with our neighbors until they are back on their feet and make sure that any Arkansan in in need receives the assistance that they are looking for. I want to say a huge thank you to Attorney General Tim Griffin, who is here with us today, Senator Gilmore and Representative Gasway, and all of the legislators and members of law enforcement who made today possible. I also want to say a huge thank you to the Arkansas State Police for hosting us at their headquarters and to all of the members of my administration, uh, but most importantly to our law enforcement community who has worked so tirelessly um, not just on this effort, but that puts their, themselves on the line every single day, serving and sacrificing for the safety of our state. Since the introduction of the Safer, Stronger Arkansas Legislative Package, I've heard from police and prison personnel from across our state. These are the people on the ground every day trying to keep our streets safe from violent criminals. And frankly, they've been struggling. They see the problems that riddle our prisons, our criminal justice system, and our law enforcement programs. Almost uniformly, they are ecstatic to see the Safer, Stronger Arkansas le Legislative Package signed into law. I heard particularly strong testimony from Saline County Sheriff Rodney Wright, who's president of the Arkansas Sheriff Association. He described how this legislation affects every single county in our state and has the support of every single sheriff. Sheriff Wright in particular has more than 40 state inmates sitting in his county jail. He can't move them to the state prison because of the bed shortage. 
And while he's holding these felony offenders, he's unable to lock up other criminals in our state. When we let misdemeanors go unchecked, those minor offenses will often transform into major ones. It's no mistake that Arkansas has one of the highest violent crime rates in America. In a moment, the legislation I sign will put an end to that failed status quo. No more revolving door in our prisons and no more weak sentencing and no more unsafe streets. Under the Protect Arkansas Act, if you commit an egregious offense like murder, rape, or child sex abuse, you will serve 100% of the jail time that you are sentenced to. Violent offenders will have to serve at least 85% of their sentence before they're eligible for release with supervision. No more letting violent criminals back on the street without serious prison time. I'll also sign the death by delivery bill today. That legislation is focused on the killer drug dealers that are fueling our ongoing fentanyl epidemic. The Biden administration has left our southern border wide open, allowing a flood of fentanyl to pour into our country through Mexico. To protect our citizens, Arkansas will step up where the federal government has failed. Arkansas will now charge drug dealers with murder if they deliver certain drugs that cause an overdose. For the most heinous drug dealers, those who traffic fentanyl to children, we will charge them with life in prison. In addition to these two bills, my administration is funding a new prison with 3,000 beds to address the crisis level prison bed shortage in our state. Talk to any law enforcement officer and they'll tell you that this is one of their number one legislative priorities. We're also investing in the practices that are proven to reduce recidivism. And we will offer millions more dollars in incentives to bring additional corrections officers into the field and enhance pay and training for our police. Some have criticized Safer, Stronger Arkansas. They say that a new prison and stronger sentencing are too tough on Arkansas's criminals. But we will not let violent criminals continue to go unchecked in our state. We will not allow them to continue to terrorize our citizens. And we will certainly not accept the failed status quo. We will not rest until we hold criminal, criminals in Arkansas accountable and enforce the law on the books. We can and we must do everything that is within our power to protect the people of our state. That's a big part of what we're doing today. And with this group behind me and those other members in our legislature, we will not rest until we see that come to completion. Thank you for being here today. And now I'll turn it over to our Attorney General who has worked tirelessly on this effort, not just in this process, but for years. Tim, we want to come up and say a few words. If you ask any Arkansan, pretty much any Arkansan on the street, they will tell you how much they respect law enforcement. And if you go to a public event with politicians, you can bet on 100% saying great things about law enforcement, telling how much they love law enforcement, how much they support law enforcement. But there is nothing more disrespectful and dishonorable toward law enforcement than asking them to catch our most dangerous criminals and then shortly thereafter systematically releasing violent felons back out on the street and saying can you please catch them again and again and again I, you know that I may be from a different background but that's not how I say thanks to law enforcement, and it's not how we stay safe. This act changes that, and I want to thank the governor. I want to thank, obviously, the legislators that worked so tirelessly on this, particularly Senator Gil, excuse me, Senator Gilmore, Representative Gasway, and also want to thank Tawny Raul, Tawny over here, who has worked so hard, and Ryan Cooper from my office. You know, the governor painted a picture of a lot of interlocking parts. You can't just talk about prison capacity in isolation. 
you can't just talk about misdemeanor justice and what the sheriff is dealing with in his county in isolation. And you can't just say, well, now I want to talk about violent felons. They are all interrelated. If you don't fix one of those parts, you don't fix anything. And that is exactly what we've seen over so many years. And now, thanks to the governor and the other folks I've mentioned, and all the law enforcement that backed this way early, this is going to be addressed comprehensively, all together, not piecemeal, not in a way. And so a year later, we're going, well, we got to go back and fix it again. We got to go back and do this. So if you fix prison capacity, you then alleviate the unnatural pressure in the county jails where they're holding people that don't belong there. So once you alleviate that and move those people into prisons, you restore misdemeanor justice, which we've talked about, which is drag racing and drunk driving and shoplifting and petty theft and all these different things. And so you're not, it's not just about feeling safer, that's critical, that's at the center of this, but it's also about improving quality of life in our communities. No one wants to live in a community where one sort of criminals are in jail and everybody else is running free. Yes, we need to be safe, but if you make us safe from violent criminals, but you have graffiti on every street, drag racing on every street, all of this sort of thing going on, nobody wants to live there either. You've got to deal with it comprehensively to create a place where people want to raise families and live in peace. And that's what this does. And this has never been hard intellectually. This has been hard politically for some, hard for me to understand. This is an 80-20 issue, 80%, 20% with the public, 80% for. Oh, and by the way, 83% in the state Senate voted for it and 82% in the state House. So this is not hard, but it took a while to get a leader to do it. And that's why we're here. So thank you, Governor, for doing this, for making this a state where we can feel safer and know that it's going to take some time, but that the path we're on is one where the people who would do us harm are separated from those who want to live in peace. Thank you all. Thank you, Governor, for your leadership. Thank you, Attorney General, for your leadership on this issue and, and helping champion this issue. You guys have done tremendous work in pushing this, and thank you. And Arkansans, thank you for your leadership on this. To all the stakeholders in the room, to the prosecutors, to the business and industry leaders who are here today with the chamber, to our law enforcement, to everyone who had input in this bill, thank you. We listened to you. I hope diligently listened to get a good policy that you see in this bill. So I say thank you to Ms. Tawny Ryle and, and Ryan Cooper, who worked so diligently in helping draft this legislation, thank you guys for your efforts. I'll say this, if you are a citizen of Arkansas who wants safety in your communities, this bill is for you. If you're a victim who suffered much and is still dealing with what you've gone through as a result of criminals in the state wreaking havoc, this bill is for you. And if you're in law enforcement, and you put that uniform every day, put that uniform on every day and go out into our streets and defend us from violent criminals. This bill is for you. And with that, this bill will give us the safety that we need. It will stop the repeat violent criminals that are wreaking havoc on our streets. And with that, I'm saying thank you to my colleague in the House for his efforts on this bill with me, the partnership that we had. He brought a ton of experience that was needed into this issue, and I appreciate that because this was a team effort. 
So again, I say thank you to our leadership for pushing this issue. I look out in the room and I see so many faces who had input and helped push this issue, and I say thank you. This bill is a game changer for this state. I'm going to repeat much of what you've heard because there are so many thank yous that are in order uh, for passing such a monumental piece of legislation like this that's truly going to enhance the safety of all our Kansans. First, let me begin with the governor. It took courage to step out there and take the lead on this issue when many others in the past have failed to step up when they had the opportunity to. This governor had the courage to step up and take this issue head on and it's going to make a difference for our Kansans for decades to come. And so we, I can't thank her enough. Our Attorney General, who drove the conversation on this issue, uh, really got out in front and was talking about this when no one else was. Uh, he deserves a ton of credit for his leadership on this issue. My Senate co-sponsor, Senator Gilmore, who uh, spent hours and hours researching and working on this issue. He and I sat in a conference room for hours, late at night until midnight, many nights working on this bill. And he also deserves a ton of credit. And then uh, Ms. Tawny Rao with the Sentencing Commission and Ryan Cooper, who uh, is staff attorney at the Attorney General's Office, both of those guys did excellent work and are responsible for a lot of the language in this bill. I guess, you know, what I would leave you with is that our Kansans deserve safe communities. And during the debate, we heard it brought up that there are issues that we need to address and long term. And I completely agree with that. Poverty lack of opportunity, education, these are all issues that highly correlate with crime. But our Kansans deserve protections now, and this bill will give our Kansans the protections that they need now from the violent criminals who would do us harm. Thank you. Don't run off. If they give us anything hard, Mike, we're going to look at you. <laughs> yeah, I'm talking to you. Yeah. Anybody? Questions? Sure. The first part of the funding, that $330 million, is year one. The additional funding comes in year two, obviously. Uh, while I wish that we could build a prison in a year, uh, certainly not possible. And so part of that funding is broken up between year one and year two. And can you repeat the second question? Uh, under the leadership of uh, Secretary Perfiri, who I'd like to come up to go into a little bit more detail, uh, he's been working diligently to see what additional space we can create within the facilities that we already have. Uh, we have a rough estimate that close to 500 additional beds can be opened up uh, through this process. Secretary Prefere, I don't know if you want to add additional, but that'll help alleviate some of the impact in the immediate while we're building the new prison to get to those new 3,000 beds. Thank you, Governor. And to the Governor's point, we will continue to evaluate our infrastructure and add temporary beds in any capacity that we can. Obviously, we are uh, very in tune to staffing levels, inmate safety, public safety, as we add capacity to existing locations. So all of that comes into the algebra when we're talking about adding additional beds to prisons. To the Governor's point, we've identified approximately 500 beds that we can add to current infrastructure. Now I'm also reviewing um, the Tucker facility, which we have shut down some barracks there recently um, as a result of staffing levels. As staffing levels come up, I will be activating additional beds at that facility. Um, and I think between those processes, we will be able to bridge the time frame associated with new construction 
um, and any increasing capacity. We will use existing staff. We can absorb those existing beds with our current staff. Absolutely. We're evaluating all of our programs currently within the Department of Corrections. We're identifying those that are value added with respect to reentry and what that means to community with these individuals that are consuming those programs during their term of incarceration. What we believe in is time well spent. We want those programs to be meaningful and translate into cognitive restructuring and cognitive behavior change as well as potential opportunities for career paths for these individuals that were formerly on a criminal career path and turning them into productive citizens within our community, tax-paying citizens with our community. And so the programs that are value-added, we will maintain. Those that aren't value-added, we will jettison, and we will be adding additional programs to the Department of Corrections that are meaningful to that population and ultimately to safer communities. We're currently evaluating with the $20 million that's being added with this particular uh, fiscal uh, budget um, in increasing pay. Um, and we also may look at some geographic stipends associated with our hard to fill locations. Um, the anticipation is, is that with increased pay and increase in geographic stipends that we will be able to attract and retain staff. Anybody else? Great, thank you so much, appreciate it. I'm going to give a quick update uh, on the storm recovery process that's going on across the state, but specifically in Wynn, where I was this morning, had the chance to be there as students were starting back for their first day of school. Pretty amazing to see that community come together so quickly uh, after the devastating storms that hit Wynn, Arkansas on Friday of last week. We are unbelievably thankful. Uh, and proud of the fact that those students have only missed five days of classroom instruction and are already back in the classroom. There was certainly uh, an immense sense of hope, excitement, and enthusiasm from the parents, the teachers, the students themselves. I had the chance to, to stand with the volleyball team, the soccer team, and some of the baseball team as they cheered the elementary students coming in. And I can tell you, while the buildings may be broken and crumbled, the spirit in when could not be stronger uh, and more enthusiastic. And so very happy with the progress that they've made. We still have a long road to go that is not lost on anyone here or in that community. And we're gonna continue to be with them every step of the way, but really proud of the progress and excited for those students to return back to the classroom today. Uh, while we're on the topic of kids and the reason that we're here this afternoon um, is because of the legislation that I will sign here in a few minutes, I want to give a huge thank you to Senator Dees and Representative Eubanks for their leadership on ushering through another piece of legislation that I think makes Arkansas a national leader in protecting our kids. As a parent, this is a very personal thing. I have a 10-year-old, a 9-year-old, and a 7-year-old, and seeing the increase that we have, not just here in Arkansas, but across the country, when it comes to things like depression, anxiety, loneliness, suicide rates, particularly among teenage girls, you start to pay attention to what are things that are contributing to that. While social media can be a great tool and a wonderful resource, it can have a massive negative impact on our, on our kids. And that's why I'm proud of the legislation that these two have helped ushered through our legislature this session, and I'm proud to sign that will, I think, take great steps in protecting the young people of the state of Arkansas. We will now require parental consent for anyone under the age of 18 in the state of Arkansas starting a new social media account uh, to have that parental permission in order to get a new account. This does not apply to someone when an existing social media account, someone from out of state, but specifically for new accounts to those under the age of 18 that are starting those accounts here in the state of Arkansas. This is, again, another step in protecting our kids. I think anybody that looks around what is happening and is satisfied with the status quo, 
frankly, you aren't paying attention to what is happening here in our state and across the country. So I'm proud to sign this legislation. I'm proud to have worked with these two individuals and the rest of our partners within the legislature to get it done. And with that, I will turn it over to Senator Dees and Representative Eubanks. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Governor, and, and, and thank you for the opportunity to, to come celebrate this day. You know, today it's a joy that we get sent here by the people from our district to find solutions. And today, I'm proud of the solution that we, we get to sign into law today. We've got a, a governor and Governor Sanders and her team and colleagues with Representative Eubanks in the House and the Senate that have heard you. We've heard from parents. Parents are asking for solutions. Today the problem is one third of all sexual crimes from an online situation are stemming from a social media interaction. This can't continue to happen. We can't continue to turn a blind eye and protect the profits of large social media companies over the protection of our children. And that's what this does today. It sends a clear message that we want to partner with parents, empower them to protect our children. We're so excited about that. It's the same logic that we have had and that we create across society. We create the same logic of reasonable age verification uh, when it comes to buying cigarettes or purchasing alcohol or rated R movies or even to go vote. We have, we have the same logic, but for some reason we have, we have not applied that to an online setting. And that ends today. The state of Arkansas and our kids will be more protected today because of this legislation. I'm so thankful for the hardworking team that's been able to work overtime to find this, this solution. And so today, we hear you. We are going to find solutions for our kids. As a, as a father with three young kids, I'm excited about this. I'm excited about, about protecting the culture. Today, I've often said that our culture is being eroded and it's happening online. And so I want my kids to be protected and I want them to want to raise their family here as well. And making sure that we have a stronger and a safer community is at the core of that. You'll see a stem of a large amount of the legislation that we've been able to pass has the same theme of protection of children, whether it's education, prison reform, or things like this. We're going to protect our kids and our future. Thank you. Again, I want to thank uh, Governor Sanders and Senator Dees for allowing me to be included in this legislation. Uh, whereas uh, the senator has three young children, I have 10 grandchildren, and I'm concerned about their safety as well. The, uh, this morning, I heard a radio spot that reinforced uh, the feelings that I have about how important this legislation is. And it was a radio spot from the Arkansas Internet Crimes Against Children task force and it basically said two things when was the last time that you checked your children's device to see where they have been going and the reason for that was they said it only takes a few seconds and a few clicks and those children can be at risk and Senator Dees and, and Governor Sanders has addressed some of those issues with regard to sexual exploitation human trafficking uh, cyber bullying, bullying and and the such but after hearing that radio ad this morning, I'm more convinced than ever that this is the a correct first step to go towards protecting our children. I know the internet or the tech industry is concerned about this legislation and I'm more than willing to meet with them to discuss future legislation. But again, I, I am uh, confident that we have made a, a good first step and once again, I'm thankful for being involved in it. Thank you. I'll sign and then we'll come back. Anybody have any questions?
this is one of the reasons that the third party verification was so important is so that that information was not going directly to social media companies. There's also uh, prohibitions on them using that data for anything other than verification. Uh, and that's the reason that it's set up in the format that it was. Senator Deese, I don't know if you have anything to add, but that is for the protection of that data and to make sure that it doesn't go into the wrong hands. Absolutely, again, there's a penalty uh, should they uh, do something with that data other than the purpose of verification. I could not be more proud of the fact that Arkansas has passed the most comprehensive historic piece of education legislation. One of the things that uh, I think our entire state can be proud of is that we went from the very bottom in teacher pay to the top five overnight. That we are empowering parents to make the best decisions about how and where their kids are educated. That we are putting the resources and the training into the hands of our teachers so that they can do their job more effectively and more efficiently. I'm extremely excited about what LEARNS means for the long-term impact for our state. I think it's going to bring about transformational change, and I don't think it's going anywhere. Those are ongoing um, and no updates at this time. Certainly don't want to comment on ongoing litigation, but we continue uh, to push on that. And I think the Attorney General's office would be a great place to continue to follow for updates, but uh, they're not letting their foot off the gas anytime soon and expect that to continue and, and ultimately end in our favor. Synergies, feel free to jump in, but that's part of what that third party vendor will do is set up a, an online process for the parent to verify. Uh, Synergies, I don't know if you want to comment on the details of it. Absolutely. Great question. Great news is a lot of these social media sites already have parental filters, parental work sites, and tools that will be implemented into this process. We are asking for a reasonable age verification process. Today, we've met with a lot of these third party vendors. And it's actually a very easy process to streamline in to vet, validate um, they're an adult and, and then they can have access to the content. And again, one more reminder is it is only for new, newly created accounts, not for any current accounts today. September, is it September 1st of this year? Yeah, would be when that goes into effect. Giving time for companies and partnership to work together. Absolutely. The, the focus of this legislation is on the largest social media sites um, out there. It, today in the, in the legislation, in the bill, it talks about uh, companies with $100 million in revenue or, or more. Uh, companies like Facebook, uh, Meta's uh, parent company, uh, Instagram, TikTok, um, uh, uh, things of that nature. And so that's the focus. That's, and I'll tell you, that's where we've seen a lot of the, the largest statistics of, of issues where kids have been damaged. I, I've met with personally with uh, law enforcement across the state and have seen examples where kids have been harmed through these sites. Today, we know that having a conversation with a parent and engaging that process should mitigate a large percentage of the damage we're seeing for kids. There's lots of tech companies that, that you might think fall in this, but under traditional social media uh, aspects and the definitions of what we're seeing, uh, only certain companies apply. Today, we're seeing where the largest percentage of issues uh, come in the traditional social media setting, not in a one-way communication factor, but more in the traditional definition of social media. To be clear, it's not targeting all online operators, all big tech. It's specific to social media, which organizations, Google, companies like that, Amazon would not fall under a traditional social media. Take one last question. Make it a good one, you're the end. There's a lot of concern, I think, perhaps that you may have shown uh, from you know, some of the talk about the city about uh, the consequences of the legislation and should it or not um, continue up to some sort of enhancement to the same way that we're going to operate in Arkansas. Um,
I think there's a willingness to work with them to meet the requirements within the law. Uh, but I, um, and, and certainly I think you'll hear a commitment both from the senator and the representative in doing so and making sure that they have the ability to meet those requirements. Uh, as Senator Dees indicated, this is not a complicated process and we're willing to work with them and have given them ample time in order to meet those requirements. So we feel confident that they can get the job done. They figured out much harder things on the daily basis when it comes to big tech. I don't think this should be too heavy of a lift. Thanks so much, guys. We appreciate it. I want to say a huge thank you to Attorney General Tim Griffin, who is here with us today, Senator Gilmore and Representative Gasway, and all of the legislators and members of law enforcement who made today possible. I also want to say a huge thank you to the Arkansas State Police for hosting us at their headquarters and to all of the members of my administration, uh, but most importantly to our law enforcement community who has worked so tirelessly, um, not just on this effort, but that puts their, themselves on the line every single day serving and sacrificing for the safety of our state. Since the introduction of the Safer, Stronger Arkansas Legislative Package, I've heard from police and prison personnel from across our state. These are the people on the ground every day trying to keep our streets safe from violent criminals. And frankly, they've been struggling. They see the problems that riddle our prisons, our criminal justice system, and our law enforcement programs. Almost uniformly, they are ecstatic to see the Safer, Stronger Arkansas le Legislative Package signed into law. I heard particularly strong testimony from Saline County Sheriff Rodney Wright who's president of the Arkansas Sheriff Association. He described how this legislation affects every single county in our state and has the support of every single sheriff. Sheriff Wright in particular has more than 40 state inmates sitting in his county jail. He can't move them to the state prison because of the bed shortage. And while he's holding these felony offenders, he's unable to lock up other criminals in our state. When we let misdemeanors go unchecked, those minor offenses will often transform into major ones. It's no mistake that Arkansas has one of the highest violent crime rates in America. In a moment, the legislation I sign will put an end to that failed status quo. No more revolving door in our prisons and no more weak sentencing and no more unsafe streets. Under the Protect Arkansas Act, if you commit an egregious offense like murder, rape, or child sex abuse, you will serve 100% of the jail time that you were sentenced to. Violent offenders will have to serve at least 85% of their sentence before they're eligible for release with supervision. No more letting violent criminals back on the street without serious prison time. I'll also sign the death by delivery bill today. That legislation is focused on the killer drug dealers that are fueling our ongoing fentanyl epidemic. The Biden administration has left our southern border wide open allowing a flood of fentanyl to pour into our country through Mexico. To protect our citizens, Arkansas will step up where the federal government has failed. Arkansas will now charge drug dealers with murder if they deliver certain drugs that cause an overdose. For the most heinous drug dealers, those who traffic fentanyl to children, we will charge them with life in prison. In addition to these two bills, my administration is funding a new prison with 3,000 beds to address the crisis level prison bed shortage in our state. Talk to any law enforcement officer and they'll tell you that this is one of their number one legislative priorities. We're also investing in the practices that are proven to reduce recidivism. And we will offer millions more dollars in incentives to bring additional corrections officers into the field and enhance pay and training for our police. Some have criticized Safer, Stronger Arkansas. They say that a new prison and stronger sentencing are too tough on Arkansas's criminals. But we will not let violent criminals continue to go unchecked in our state. We will not allow them to continue to terrorize our citizens. And we will certainly not accept the failed status quo. We will not rest until we hold criminal, criminals in Arkansas accountable and enforce the law on the books. We can and we must do everything that is within our power to protect the people of our state. That's a big part of what we're doing today. And with this group behind me and those other members in our legislature, we will not rest until we see that come to completion. 
Thank you for being here today. And now I'll turn it over to our Attorney General who has worked tirelessly on this effort, not just in this process, but for years. Tim, we want to come up and say a few words. See if, see if you, I don't know if it's on. Teacher voice, get, get ready, it's coming. I go with my mom voice. Yeah. Right. I'll just use my teacher voice. So, uh, for those that don't know who I am, my name is Jacob Oliva, Secretary of Education for the state of Arkansas, and I'm excited to be here today to meet so many wonderful people interested in going to what I consider to be the greatest profession of all professions. So thank you all for joining us today. We are so excited to be here and meet uh, some of our colleges of education that are in teacher preparation. I got to meet some students that are currently in high school that are making a commitment to wanting to become a teacher. And I even met some seniors that are currently doing their internships and practicums in classrooms right now in the state that are getting ready to go to work. And what I can tell you which is exciting is I always say that being a teacher is the best profession of all professions that anybody can go in. And we're excited to be here on Educator Commitment Day to uh, memorialize this event. I, I'm relatively new to the state. I've been here for about four months, but I'm not new to education. I've, I've done almost 25 years as a classroom teacher. I've been a school principal, a superintendent, and now a secretary of education. So I've, I've got to see the teaching and learning experience from all levels. And if I was to say anything to anybody uh, that's going new into this profession or becoming a teacher, the first thing that I would always say is, just because you're an educator and you're a teacher, doesn't mean you stop becoming a student and that you've always got to be committed to learning. And that's what makes this profession great, is that we can always get better at what we do. And a lot of times new teachers feel like they're supposed to know everything. So I want to tell you from, from very first day, it's okay to ask your principal questions. They want you to ask questions. We don't expect you to know everything. And most of you are going to get assigned a mentor teacher. It's okay to ask them questions too. It's okay to ask them to say, hey, I have a student in my class. I'm really struggling to help them stay attention or on task. That's what the mentor teachers do. And each one of you, when you go into a classroom, you're gonna get assigned a mentor. And I can tell you, my very first year as a teacher, I was assigned Miss Babcock. I taught third grade, and I would not have had a wonderful year if it wasn't for her helping and guiding me. So I used to see all the time these bumper stickers that uh, would ride around town that says, if you can read this, thank a teacher. I always wanted to add to that bumper sticker that says, if you can read this, thank a teacher. If you're successful in life, thank your mentor. So make sure you embrace that mentor and embrace uh, the guidance and experience they give to you. And we know that the high quality preparation you receive is gonna set you up to be successful. But I'm here to introduce somebody that I think is a very, very special person. And when I uh, first met this person, she told me she was gonna be known as the educational governor and improving education and investing in teachers and in our classrooms was gonna be her number one priority. And I am so excited to be able to work with a governor that is committed to following through on those promises. And we are seeing each and every single day policies that invest in education, invest in salaries, invest in loan forgiveness, invest in even waiving teacher licensing fees for some of our uh, new folks that are going into the classroom because we want to recruit, retain, and recognize the best. Didn't even recognize that some of our state board members are here joining us to open up their sleeves to make sure you have what you need because they're committed to making sure that we're creating conditions to set you all up for success. And when we do that, we know our students will thrive and prosper. So without further ado, I'd like to recognize the great governor of Arkansas. Please help me in joining welcoming Governor Sanders. I don't have quite a teacher voice, but I do have a mom voice, so I'm going to try to uh, speak as loud as I can so that you guys can hear me. Uh, so thankful for Secretary Oliva and the unbelievable job that he is doing. Uh, his depth and experience is really helping 
shape education here in the state. Having somebody in his role who's been in the classroom, who's been a principal, who knows exactly what each of you are going through uh, and will go through, as well as being a parent. Um, he has such a unique perspective and is uniquely qualified to tackle some of the challenges that we have in front of us. And I could not be more thankful or more excited that we have him leading the Department of Education here in Arkansas. He has done just an absolutely phenomenal job. I have to say all those really nice things because I've given him one of the hardest tasks in all of state government. So if I build him up, I feel like it gives him a bit more confidence to tackle some of those big challenges. I'm so excited to be here among some of Arkansas's uh, soon to be newest teachers in the state. Um, as Jacob said, it's one of the most important professions that anyone can enter into. You have no idea the lives that you will shape and that you will touch and that you will impact in your classroom. I know that I wouldn't be standing here today if I had not had teachers who gave me confidence, teachers who believed in me, and occasionally a teacher or two who put me in my place and let me know that I had a lot more to learn, uh, including one particular professor when I was in college. I showed up as a freshman, thought I was the smartest person there, and uh, took a more senior level communications class. And I was given an assignment, I spent a little bit of time on it, turned it in, and was waiting for this professor to come back and tell me how smart I was, how impressed he was with my work. And he asked me to stay after class. I said, wow, he must have really been like wowed by the spectacular work that I've turned in. He actually asked me to stay after class because he said he was so disappointed in the work that I had done that he was gonna give me a chance to redo it. It was that bad. And it had red ink all over it. And he gave that back to me, gave me a second chance. He said, Sarah, I know you're capable of doing better. And so I went and this time I worked really hard. I came back and he gave me a B plus. <laughs> But he ultimately became my favorite professor. I took every single class that he offered and he helped me develop and really hone my skills. But more importantly, he gave me confidence and he gave me a pathway forward. If he had not taken the time and attention that he had, I might still be uh, trying to figure out how to get that first assignment done. But teachers have a real world impact on their students and the the role that you're taking on, the profession that you're entering is an incredibly uh, respected profession. And as a parent, I get to see the impact that the teachers in my kids' lives have on every single day. And it's amazing. I think over the last couple of years, a lot of parents were reminded just how hard teaching really is when we had to do it ourselves during the COVID pandemic. And uh, I found out very quickly that I was probably not cut out for the classroom. Uh, after we had a couple of revolts from the student body at my house, I decided that I would stick with this profession and leave the uh, teaching up to the professionals. But I can't tell you how proud we are that people like you are gonna represent our state and that you're gonna be shaping the next generation of leaders. I'm also very proud of the fact that Arkansas went from the very bottom in teacher pay to the very top overnight. As you enter into this profession, you get to start at the peak for anywhere in the country for teacher pay. And that's because of the hard work of the people in this room, the hard work of our state legislature coming together and making education a priority, making our teachers a priority. I'm really proud of the fact that we are rewarding the best and the brightest here in the state of Arkansas. We're gonna focus on retaining our great teachers, but also recruiting amazing teachers like yourselves. So thank you so much for your willingness to take on this task, to step into the classroom. And those of you who are going into the middle schools, uh, best of luck and may God help you from here. So thank y'all so much for being here today. We appreciate it. Good morning. Uh, I wanna add two things to what they said. One, the teacher mentor piece. My teacher mentor my senior year of college was Sherry Smith and she is still in the district that I am now proud to teach in and she still mentors me to this day 13 years later. Every first day of school I get a letter, I get mail encouraging me as an educator and that mentor relationship cannot be overstated. So that is so powerful and I'm gonna try to use the teacher and mom voice combo today. Uh, but 
you know, I'm a proud graduate of A-State and nothing really prepared me in those courses to speak after the Secretary or the Governor, but I'm going to do my best. Uh, you have likely all heard it said that everyone's teacher, everyone's story includes a teacher, and that is absolutely true. Our stories do include a teacher, or a few teachers, who shaped our experiences, who encourage us, inspire us, and challenge us to become who we are today. There is no doubt that an educator played a role in your decision to be here today and your decision to commit to a career in education. What I have found, though, is sometimes we do not talk enough about the students who have inspired us to greatness. While you're just beginning this journey in education, you have probably met these students, children, friends, classmates, who are a part of your why. These exceptional individuals have influenced you to pursue a career and changing lives. Sooner than you can even imagine, you are going to have students of your own. Students who will make you laugh, cry, humble you, and force you to grow to be the best version of yourself. These students will encourage you and inspire you. You will partner with their families and their caregivers to work to ensure that they are safe, loved, and learning. In doing this, you will learn from the very students you committed to teach. You will learn that sometimes they are the ones teaching you. You will learn to be innovative and in meeting the needs of, needs of all learners, even those with the most exceptional learning needs. You will learn to ask for help because this job cannot and should not be done alone. And you will learn to give grace more than you knew you had to yourself, the students you serve, and the families who are trusting you with their most prized possessions. Your heart may hurt for the students you felt like you could not reach and then swell with pride when you see sometimes maybe years later that that seed you planted has bloomed into something incredible. I had a text message just yesterday from a student through the teacher's phone telling me about a success they had just had. I have not taught him in two years and he was so excited to share with me his success. You are going to open up not only the classroom doors you teach in, but your heart to these students every year and a new group of smiling faces. Now there will be hard days and there may be hard years, but there will be immeasurable moments of joy when you see that student's success and achievement. While there is no greater responsibility than teaching, there's also no greater privilege and gift than being a teacher. Thank you for committing to be a teacher and for being here today. Okay. We are now going to do our countdown to Teacher Commitment Signing Day. Five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> State Park. It's a great morning to be here, uh, especially with the announcements that will be taking place today and the signing of these bills uh, into law. So it's a perfect setting uh, to talk about all of the announcements today. This location means a lot to our state park system, the visitation that we have here, its connection to central Arkansas, the recreational opportunities and the resources that this park provide are an important part of the Arkansas State Park System. These bills and laws that will be signed uh, today will improve our park operations, our ability to conduct business within an Arkansas State Park. They will also allow us to improve 
and our abilities to meet guest expectations. Part of our goals of entering the session was to find opportunities for us to improve our ability to operate as a state agency within the hospitality industry, uh, but also to meet the cha ever-changing guest expectations that we have. It's unprecedented and amazing to have the support that we have had this year from the governor's office, from our first gentleman, as well as the Arkansas legislature, and we appreciate their support this year. I would be remiss if I didn't also mention that uh, we have the support of our state park recreation travel commissioners, uh, many of which are here today. Uh, if you'll just raise your hand and I'll uh, introduce each other. We have Jim Schamberger from Hot Springs, Eric Jackson from Hot Springs, Ron Gossage from Alma, <clears throat> Rebecca Baker from Moralton, Mike Wilson from Little Rock, and Austin Albers from Ponca. So thank you for being here with us today and joining us. It is my pleasure to introduce Secretary of the Department of Arkansas Parks, Heritage and Tourism, Secretary Mike Mills. Good morning, and what a great morning it is. Uh, the weather's cooperated and uh, I got here about seven o'clock, walked three miles on these trails dressed like this. Um, and so it really truly is a, a wonderful day to be here. Um, I just want to say uh, to the legislatures and to the governor, thank you for making a, a, such a great session that has involved my de uh, department and the, all the divisions within it. Uh, and, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Representative Maddox, who will explain to you a little bit more. Thank you so much. First of all, I just want to say what a beautiful day and what a great day to be here. I do want to start out by saying thank you to Governor Sanders and thank you to the first gentleman for seeing tourism and outdoor recreation as an important piece of economic development and allowing me to play a very small role in that. Working together, we will continue to push the natural state onto the world stage. I was honored to sponsor the Natural State Initiative legislation. This will take Arkansas state parks, tourism, and outdoor recreation to the next level. I also want to say thank you to Senator Hester and Senator Irvin for working with me to pass this legislation. Senate Bill 464 creates a natural state initiative pilot program that will establish up to four opportunity zones. With this bill, Arkansas can seize the momentum and further establish the natural state as a leader in the outdoor economy and make Arkansas the destination for outdoor enthusiasts around the world. Outdoor recreation generates $862 billion annual in economic output nationwide. Signing this bill into law can help Arkansas bring more of those dollars to our great state. I was also proud to sponsor SB 497. It allows Arkansas State Parks to provide hospitality experience that matches the outdoor recreation and restaurant offerings that we have. With the signing of SB 497, state parks can now exceed guest expectations at the state park lodges and offer the very best in service. These bills are necessary to grow Arkansas tourism, grow our outdoor economy, and to ensure Arkansas is a repeat vacation destination. Thank you so much. Good morning, I'm Senator Missy Irvin, and so glad to be able to be here. I'm excited to have Senator Matt Stone with me, one of my colleagues, I appreciate you being here. Um, you know, it's so exciting for me to stand here at Pinnacle Mountain State Park. I grew up actually just down the road and had the opportunity to, to see Pinnacle Mountain from my house when I grew up. And so I'm just, it's really wonderful to be able to be here today. I'm so grateful to our governor and our first gentleman, Sarah and Brian Sanders. They, they really have such an incredible passion for the state of Arkansas, but it's not just them. It's not just the governor, and it's not just the first gentleman. It's the first family. They are an inspiration, and they are ideal families that are exactly who come to these parks. 
I grew up having birthday parties at Pinnacle Mountain State Park. And this family, the first family, really epitomizes what Arkansas is and what it can be to so many people across the entire country to bring your children and hike these mountains and to fish in these streams and in these creeks and to paddle your canoe down the Buffalo River or down the Sillamore Creek or the White River in the lakes that we have in Lake DeGray State Park. We, Arkansas is truly a hidden gem. When I raised my four kids, the best thing in the world was to go dig for diamonds. You got four kids, man, you just put them to work digging all day in the dirt, searching for diamonds. I think we're the only state that you can become a treasure hunter when you're 10 years old. It's pretty exciting. And so for me to be a part of this natural state initiative and to pass these great bills really exemplifies what Governor Sanders said from day one. She was going to be competing against every state to make Arkansas the best, the top of its game. And that includes tourism. Tourism is an incredible economic driving force for the state of Arkansas. Why? Because God has given us this. God has given us the natural resources that we so treasure and we hold dearly. And that is exemplified through these bills, through Senate Bill 472, Senate Bill 498. These bills will reduce our, our administrative burden. They will streamline, create, um, cut out unnecessary red tape and bureaucracy so that we are able to compete and really attract all those tourism into our state and through our state parks. These, these state parks are economic drivers for 49 out of our 75 counties. Over 9 million people visited our state parks last year. That's an incredible amount of people, but I know with these bills and what we're going to be able to maintain uh, through our trail system, our monument trail system, which is going to be world-class destination, next month at Mount Nebo State Park, we will be hosting the Mountain Bike Enduro Series, which will host the Rocky Mountain Series and Tour Resorts. We will be able to to attract more of those types of events to our state. The Silamo Bike Trail in Mountain View, where I live, is one of five epic mountain bike trails in the state of Arkansas. Only Colorado has as many mountain bike, Silamore bike trails like ours that are epic bike trails. The Monument Trail, being able to maintain that, is going to make this a world-class destination in the state of Arkansas. So I'm so excited. I love the example that they have set with their children and the first family. We've got to get out there and enjoy our state parks. These bills will help us really compete, but we will not be the diamond in the rough anymore. People will know us, and Arkansas will shine like the diamond that it is. Thank you so much. And it's my pleasure and my honor to, to introduce our first gentleman, Brian Sanders, and who's done a fabulous job with the Natural State Initiative. Thank you. Appreciate everybody coming today. And uh, I'm not sure how many of you know this, but uh, Pinnacle actually used to be the local dump about 50 years ago. Uh, it's where you could see for miles trash just piled up. And it's now, of course, one of our most beautiful state parks. Um, not only in the state, but in the country. And that's thanks to a lot of the people that are here today. Uh, you know, I've had the chance to go around to state parks now all over Arkansas, and some of the best people that you're gonna find in our state are the people that work in our state parks. We have the best state park system, and we're gonna make it even better. Uh, Arkansas, as everyone here does know, is the natural state, and we wanna keep it that way. Uh, when we launched the Natural State Initiative earlier this year, we set out to establish Arkansas as the destination for year-round outdoor adventure. And the reforms Sarah will sign into law today are going to provide a strong foundation for us to advance our mission to elevate the best outdoor experiences in Arkansas, that we have a right to win, get more kids off screens and outdoors to improve health and quality of life, and double the number of entrepreneurs, workers, and the overall size of our outdoor economy. I'd like to hit on a few of these reforms, um, starting with the Natural State Opportunity Zones, uh, which uh, Representative Maddox um, covered a little bit, but I want to get a little bit more into that. So under this uh, reform uh, that Sarah will sign here shortly, we are going to establish four Natural State Initiative Opportunity Zones 
in or near Arkansas state parks. And uh, with development infrastructure at Arkansas state parks, this additional incentive will lower the tax burden for payroll and sales taxes on new investment and is the perfect canvas for entrepreneurs to test a new concept within an existing recreational area. Investors can repurpose or build facilities for food, beverage, and lodging, or repurpose or expand recreational facilities or infrastructure for guiding services. We're in the process of now identifying four state parks to do this pilot program, and once we establish success, uh, we plan to expand that to additional state parks. Uh, another reform Sarah will sign today, we will now allow state parks, including those in dry counties, to more conveniently access alcohol permits. Alcohol can now be served at large festivals and events in state parks and be acquired and utilized by third-party vendors. Permits will be accessible to both private and state-owned restaurants, bars, and concession areas, modernizing our operations to remain in step with visitor expectations, particularly with out-of-town guests, which account for 50% of our 9 million uh, state park visitors each year. Additionally, uh, we will provide an exemption for, from the procurement process for Arkansas State Parks hospitality-related purchases used for overnight guests. This will help Arkansas State Parks to significantly improve amenities and the state park brand so we can provide the best state park experiences anywhere in the country. Uh, further reform that Sarah will sign, we will now allow for the creation of trails and trail maintenance in Arkansas State Parks to be handled by the department without review and approval by the Division of Building Authority. Our monument trail systems, including the one here at Pinnacle, as well as at Devil's Den, Mount Nebo, and Hobbs State Parks, need regular and continued maintenance. This re reduced the unnecessary and costly administrative processes and delays required for trail maintenance, hiring contractors and subcontractors, and accomplishing the needed maintenance projects so we can continue to elevate Arkansas as a world-class mountain biking destination. We will reform our outdoor recreation grant process to do more high-impact projects. Fun Park grants awarded $3.25 million this year. We have raised the population limit from $2,500 to $7,500 and removed the $10,000 cap for these grants. Along with the outdoor grant program, a 50-50 matching grant up to $250,000, the Arkansas Department of Parks, Heritage, and Tourism awarded $6.5 million this year. And we are now, thanks to this reform, positioned to spend more of those dollars on high-priority, high-impact outdoor recreation projects going forward. We will increase historic tax credits for historic districts and qualifying properties in Arkansas across the board with higher credits for small towns. This will encourage investment and improved quality of life with a focus on preservation and revitalization of main streets and downtowns across our state. And finally, in partnership uh, with Arkansas Game and Fish, we will discount by 50% the cost of a lifetime hunting and fishing license for kids under the age of 10, incentivizing parents and grandparents to buy their kids and grandkids a lifetime license encouraging more kids to get off screens and outdoors and guaranteeing additional federal funding and revenue for Arkansas Game and Fish. Uh, there has never been a better time to get outdoors in Arkansas. Uh, I know many of you, uh, like me, love our state uh, and love what we have here. It really is our unique selling proposition, particularly in this region of the country. Tourism is our number two industry after agriculture, and we're going to continue to do everything we can, not only to conserve our beautiful outdoor spaces, but to elevate outdoor recreation and make Arkansas a leading destination for adventure. So thank you for your time. Appreciate all of your support. And with that, I'll introduce my wife. <laughs> Love you. I get the easy part today. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, normally, I have the hard part of walking through each piece of the legislation, but I got off the hook today and let Brian take the lead on that since this has been uh, the heart and soul of the Natural State Initiative that we launched earlier this year, and he has done a phenomenal job leading that. Before I get a little bit more into uh, the legislation we're going to sign today, I want to give a quick update. Uh, as all of you know, we have spent uh, the last week and a half traveling around the state working on rebuilding and recovery from hard-hit areas that were devastated by tornadoes that came through the state of Arkansas. Uh, one major update in that space, one of the biggest challenges that individuals have after a storm like this is lodging and housing. Uh, I'm excited to announce that the state is partnering with the American Red Cross, who will be offering temporary housing, and people can access that by calling 1-800-RED-CROSS. This is a great 
additional step in our recovery process. They do a phenomenal job uh, and are experts at helping provide temporary lodging. We encourage anyone who needs assistance in that area to reach out. You can also always go to helparkansas.com to get information about any type of assistance that you're looking for. It's also a great place if you have the ability and the willingness to volunteer or donate uh, to help those who need assistance, go to helparkansas.com. Thank you so much for all that you have done. We have seen Arkansas step up in an amazing way and help our neighbors uh, through each piece of this process. And I could not be more proud of the way that our state is serving one another. One of the best parts about Arkansas, aside from our people, is our natural beauty. And that's why I'm so excited to be part of this initiative and to get to sign into law 11 pieces of legislation that will continue to elevate Arkansas's outdoor economy. As Brian mentioned, it is our number two industry, but it is one of our best selling points. I tell people all the time I want to be the chief salesperson for the state of Arkansas. Along with Brian and our three kids, we are going to make sure that no one misses out on the excitement and the adventure that Arkansas has to offer. Now, some of that adventure, Brian would like to go us a little bit further than I would. I'm perfectly fine walking on the trails, not flying down them on two wheels like he normally wants us to do. Uh, I wore heels purposefully so he couldn't drag me up the mountain after this event was over. But in all seriousness, we have an absolutely amazing state park system. And this gives us the opportunity to take it to the next level. It gets rid of some of the unnecessary government burdens and red tape, allowing our state parks to do what they do best, serve the people that visit them, and help in add to the excitement and the amenities and the adventure that each of our state parks can offer. It also helps us elevate and grow our outdoor economy by bringing new entrepreneurs into the process and letting us elevate each of the different experiences around the state of Arkansas. I could not be more excited about working in partnership with my husband on this project. As you can see, he brings uh, a lot of depth uh, and excitement and adventure into every aspect of our life, and particularly in this area and into the administration. Our legislative partners, Senator Irvin and Representative Maddox, have done a phenomenal job shepherding each piece of this uh, package through and making sure that uh, we are really elevating and taking Arkansas to the top. And Mike and Shay, thank you so much for your leadership and all that you are doing to help Arkansas State Parks be the very best in the country. Thank you guys so much for being here today and for all you all do uh, to help elevate our state. I want to end with encouraging every Arkansan to go out and visit a state park this year. If you wanna visit 10 or 15, we're happy with that too. But I think if every Arkansan will at least explore a little bit of our own backyard, they will be shocked to find out the amazing beauty that they can find right here in the natural state. Thank you so much for being here and thank you to our amazing team for helping get this done. Thank you.
graduate of Little Rock Central High School. It's a very exciting day, not just for Central High, but for the entire state of Arkansas. We created the specialty license plate program, I don't know how many years ago, and there are now hundreds of specialty license plates in Arkansas. You would think one of the very first ones we would do would be for Little Rock Central High, but for whatever reason, it hasn't happened until now. Uh, we all know the story of Central High, uh, what was originally Little Rock High School. Even before 1957, it was a school that was renowned for its academics and athletics, not only in Arkansas, but across the country. It voted in 1927 by the National Association of Architects as the most beautiful high school in America. Uh, but then, of course, we know the story of 1957, which changed not only our city and our state and our country, but the entire world. When nine black children who were uh, memorialized in statues behind us today uh, changed the world. The NAACP said that what happened at Little Rock Central High is one of the ten most significant events for African American people in the entire world. What stands out to me about what the Little Rock Nine did, uh, which separates them in my view, is number one, eight of the nine members of the Little Rock Nine are still alive today because what they did, they did when they were teenagers. They were 15 and 16 years old. And they, the second thing is they didn't just do it for one day or even a week or a month. They did it every single day for nine months while they were ridiculed in public and in many cases by their peers. And their heroism changed the world not only for young black kids to be able to go to school, but, but it also transformed the educational experience in the lives of people like myself uh, because my experience at Central was so much richer because of their heroism. Um, and so that's why it's such a no-brainer uh, for us not only to have a memorial on the state capitol grounds, but also a, spe a specialty license plate for Little Rock Central High. This would not be possible, of course, without our Central High community, uh, the Tiger Foundation, which I've been proud to serve on the board of since the beginning about 10 years ago, and we have several members of the Tiger Foundation board here with us today. We also have the mayor, I'm, of course, not talking about Mayor Scott, who's a proud Parkview graduate, but the mayor of Central, Nancy Russo. Uh, she claims me as a bonus son, which means I'm lucky enough to claim her as a bonus mom. She is a force to be reckoned with, a legend in her, her own time, who's not only preserving the legacy of Central and keeping it alive, uh, but it's absolutely flourishing. Uh, of course, we also would not be here today uh, without the leadership on this issue of my former Central High debate team member, uh, the person who will make this bill law by signing it, Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders. We stalled out in the Senate on this bill, surprisingly. The, 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 bill, the bill failed on its first vote, and we, we put it off for a day, and we were going to vote on it the next afternoon, and that morning I had a number of my colleagues in the Senate come up to me and say, Clark, you need to know I have not personally been lobbied by the governor once this entire legislative session until this morning. Uh, and it's on this bill, the specialty license plate for Little Rock Central High. So I, I really want to extend my gratitude to Governor Sanders for her help and leadership on this issue. But then, of course, uh, the legislation would, have, would not have happened without our legislative partners. We have a number in both the House and the Senate. Senator Ch Chesterfield did her student teaching at Central High. Uh, Representative McCull is a former teacher at Central, and then Representative Allen and Ennett, uh, like myself, are both graduates of Little Rock Central High. But of course, Representative Ennett was the one to file this legislation, and she was the House sponsor. We're so grateful to her for her help and leadership. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Representative Ennett. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my greatest honor to be here in front of you, surrounded by the Little Rock Nine statues. House Bill 1485 is more than, than, more than just issuing another license plate here in Arkansas. It's about commemorating the work of the Little Rock Nine. And without their bold and brave actions, I would not be here in front of you today. And because of their bold and brave actions, they help make the world a more tolerant and accepting place. I want to say, I'm not going to be here long, but I do want to say um, thank you to um, Senator Clark Tucker. I don't think you realized a year ago, when we were two years ago, we were talking about this and we were at a Tiger Foundation meeting. And I said, why don't Central High have a license plate? 
And um, Senator Clark Tucker said, well, let's work on it. So we're here today, and I'm with much gratitude. Thank you for being a Senate sponsor. Also, I want to mention, too, with each sale of this license plate, money will go to the Tiger Foundation to help cultivate and help create new I mean, talent of present Central High students and future Central High students. And I also want to thank our governor, Governor Sanders, for her bold leadership, for getting it across the finish line. Because like Senator Tucker said, it died over in the Senate. She whipped everybody up. So this is, she resurrected it. So this is purely a bipartisan effort. And I want to thank you for your leadership. And I want to thank everybody here. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Nancy Rousseau, the very, very proud principal of Little Rock Central High School. In 1998, Central High School became the nat a National Historic Site. It was a very, very special time. None of us ever realized we would ever get to that point. And that was in, in 1998, and then in 2002, when I became principal of Central High School, I created a bucket list. And one of the things on my bucket list was to get, you know, I'd drive around town and see all these neat license plates, and I thought, if anybody needs a special license, it's Central High School. So this is so exciting. I, pre I really appreciate um, Denise Ennett, uh, my former student, Clark Tucker, and of course our governor for supporting this bill. Uh, she was, I was assistant principal when you were at Central. Um, Miss De she was definitely a great debater, and I think that still stands. Um, just so everyone knows, uh, Central High School is not only a National Historic Site, but we are in the process of a recommendation, a nomination, and we're hoping within the next year or so that we will be a World Heritage Site. That's pretty unbelievable, and uh, we're very excited about the continued the legacy of excellence at Central High School uh, will continue, we hope, forever. Thank you again for all of you for getting my bucket list almost completed. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rousseau. I, I'd like to just clarify one thing. The reason that Dr. Rousseau knows me so well was not because I spent time in her office while she was the assistant principal uh, for disciplinary action, but because I was a model student. I'm pretty sure that was the only reason I ever <laughs> ended up there. Uh, but a, a huge thank you to you, not just for being here, but more importantly for the leadership that you bring to our state. Uh, the role that you play at Central is much bigger than just that single high school. You have made such a huge mark on education in the state of Arkansas. Uh, and if you'll remember, you actually also had me as a student at Pulaski Heights Junior High. So uh, we've, we've known each other for a long time and very proud of the friendship, but more importantly of the leadership and the work that you have done to pave the way and how many students that you have impacted over the course of your career. So thank you for the work that you have done and how you have served so tirelessly uh, for a long time. And Clark and I, as he mentioned, we were debate partners. I have to say I'm extremely happy that we were on the same team and uh, not on opposing teams. And I could not be more excited or proud to get to work with you on this as well. Um, Clark was a year older. I just wanted to point that out too, that he's actually <laughs> much older than I am, but um, was a phenomenal debater as well. And we had a lot of fun at Central. One of the things that I absolutely love about Central High is that every student that you meet that attended Central has a deep sense of pride. And that is a remarkable thing. No matter where you are, Central High students find each other. And there is a connection that goes above all of the politics and every other thing that would normally divide a community that sense of connection from Central High graduates is something that is really special. And that's why I was so excited to get to be part of the group that helped carry this over the finish line. Not just because it's a license plate that I know will go to benefit the Tiger Foundation, which is an incredibly important and worthy cause, but it's so much bigger than that. 
it symbolizes and it marks the culmination of seven decades of progress that we have made here in the state of Arkansas. And I think it is such an incredible reminder that a building that once stood in 1957 as frankly a building that was not a place of honor or respect or a symbol that people looked at for good from 1957. They see a very different place today. Central High is the most racially diverse student bodies in almost the entire state of Arkansas. That tells you a lot about who we are and how far we have come since that horrible time in our state's history. I'm unbelievably proud that I get to be here today and as a proud Central High graduate get to sign into law something that marks the progress of our state. I can't thank Representative Ennett enough for her leadership on this. This would not have happened without her and without Senator Tucker. I'm just glad that we have so many Central graduates that are in the legislature that uh, could make this possible. And to uh, all of those who have helped, thank you for making this uh, possible and a reality. And with that, I will sign what I think uh, many people may see as a trivial piece of legislation, but I think it's really a remarkable sense of history and a great day for our state to think about the difference that has happened over the last seven decades. Thank you for being here and thank you to each of my colleagues for your leadership on making this happen. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. This is uh, an amazing moment for the state of Arkansas, and I could not be more grateful for the partnership with President Hester. Um, you know, when you're coming into your first legislative session, there are a lot of unknowns, but one of the things that I knew would be one of the most important things that would carry us through and deliver real success for the people of our state was the partnership with members of our legislature. And we could not have asked for a better, more dedicated group of people uh, and unbelievable leadership under President Hester and Speaker Shepard, who could not be here with us today. So thank you. We only had a couple moments where we disagreed, but we ultimately, I think, all ended on the same page on every big issue. And the big winners out of that entire process were the citizens of our state. And I'm very thankful for all of the members of our legislature that are here because without each of you and your dedication and your willingness uh, to stand up to the critics and to push back when it was really important, we would not be here and we certainly would not have the level of success that we have had in this first 100 days without each one of you. So thank you for your leadership. I'm also really proud of the unbelievable team that I get to work with every single day. The members of our staff are some of the most dedicated public servants I have ever encountered. And I've had the chance to work with a lot of people and there are no greater individuals than those that have poured themselves into these first 100 days. Every challenge that I have issued, every request that I have made, every uh, moment they have stepped up and delivered time and time again uh, and I like to keep my foot on the gas pretty much 
all the time, all the way to the floor. And this team has been right there every single step of the way. I'm very thankful for each one of you and your dedication to our state, uh, the staff in the governor's office, as well as our amazing cabinet and total administration have been absolutely unbelievable and incredible partners from day one. So thank you for your willingness to stand with me, even on the days where it wasn't so easy. So thank you. It is very special and pretty fitting that we get to celebrate this moment here today while we're at the governor's mansion. We are literally making Arkansas history as we are surrounded by Arkansas history. I don't mean this to sound like a joke about his age, but I get to sit in front of uh, some Arkansas history today. <laughs> Arkansas's best governor, one of our country's best governors, and one of the most remarkable leaders anywhere that I've ever seen. My dad is here as well as my mom, and I'm so thankful that you are here and on the front row uh, to be part of the new history that we are getting to make here. This is still the place that my family has lived longer than any other, is this one behind us. And I hope that the memories that my kids get to make are as great as the ones that my brothers and I did under two amazing parents who loved this state and served with everything that they had. So thank right. you. You know, the first day that I walked into this house, I'll never forget the feeling, kind of the overwhelming power of stepping into this uh, amazing, incredible spot. Everything seemed so big and frankly pretty intimidating for a 13-year-old girl from Texarkana, Arkansas. Still, kids have a way of making things their own and rising up to the challenge and the intimidation. And on more than one occasion, I found myself downstairs in my pajamas welcoming a tour group that was uh, here. I have no doubt that my kids will be carrying on not only that tradition, but making plenty more of their own special moments in history. Uh, and I, I have warned the state troopers in the detail, they may want to get their handcuffs ready because uh, we've got a couple wild ones in our group. But my husband Brian and I could not be more excited about taking on the next 100 days. None of what I have been able to do, not just in these 100 days, uh, but in the last decade plus would have been possible without him. And I'm so thankful that we get to do this together and that we get to raise our kids in this unbelievable place. One of the most special parts of this house is the Janet Huckabee Grand Hall. My mom worked tirelessly to build that and I'm, amazed at the work that she was able to accomplish and the way that she was able to get that done despite all of the craziness that went on around it. One of my favorite parts about that building and that place is that it lists the names of all of the governors who have lived here, who have come before me. And each name on that staircase tells a story of the public servants who came before me and lived in this house and served in this office. And each is a reminder of what this new generation and this new administration means. I love the Arkansas that I grew up in. The Arkansas that many of those earlier governors helped to build. But I ran to be a change maker, not a caretaker of the status quo. And despite some of the great things that were done by those people that came before me, we came here to shake things up. And I think that's exactly what we have done over these first 100 days. On the campaign trail, I said time and time again that change had to start in the classroom. Underperforming schools don't just fail our students. They condemn a generation to a lifetime of government dependency. In my first 100 days, we passed Arkansas Learns in record time because we came here to break the status quo. We're giving teachers the historic pay raise that they deserve. And we're giving Arkansans the right to choose whatever school works best for their family. And we're making historic investments in early literacy, in pre-K, and career and technical education. The change that we are bringing 
to the education system in Arkansas is transformational. And it is going to have an impact for generations to come long after all of us here are finished. And I am so unbelievably proud of the work that each of the individuals here put in to make that possible. These changes are already paying off. Just this past week, because of Arkansas Learns, the state is keeping Marvel Elaine School District in Phillips County. That district is staying open. That would never have been possible before Arkansas Learns. It's not enough just to educate our kids though. We also have to make sure they're safe, whether they're online or on the streets in our communities. As the first mom to ever hold this office, one of my top priorities is protecting our children from predatory social media companies and making sure that they're safe wherever they are. We all know that big tech is abusing our kids' privacy and wrecking their mental health. That's why we passed a law that finally gives parents more control over their kids online. And soon, all Arkansans under 18 will need parental permission to get on social media. But online threats aren't the only thing endangering our kids. In these first 100 days, we've made landmark changes to Arkansas's justice system, cracking down on the criminals terrorizing our city. We raised the minimum amount of time felons spend behind bars before they're let out on supervision. And we will build a new 3,000 bed prison to stem the prison shortage in our state. We will not allow inmates to walk free anymore simply because we are out of space. These changes will be tough on criminals. And I've been very clear, Arkansas justice will be tough, but it will be fair. As we improve education and public safety and more homegrown talent and businesses will decide to stay here in the natural state. As long as we have some of the highest taxes in the region, we know people will leave for greener pastures which is why I'm so proud that we were able to continue working on phasing out our state's income tax by passing a $150 million tax cut. Any individual making over $24,000 in the state of Arkansas will now have more money back in our pockets because of the hard work of our legislature and our executive branch to deliver. We will... One of the last key priorities that we had in this session was making sure that everybody outside of Arkansas understands the amazing story that we have to tell. I consider myself the chief salesperson of the state of Arkansas. I love the fact that we're called the natural state and I want everybody else to know why. We have some of the most beautiful natural resources of any state in the country and people need to know it. Arkansans should be proud of the investment and the resources that we have right here in our own backyard. Tourism is our number two industry, and we have now cut some of the red tape and the government regulation so that it can continue to improve growing our state's outdoor economy. I'm so proud of the work that my husband has done leading the Natural State Initiative and helping to grow outdoor recreation and that outdoor economy right here in our backyard. Despite the fact that we were working hard and spending the bulk of our time on this legislative session over the last 100 days, our state was faced with other challenges. We had absolute and total destruction across central Arkansas, hitting some of our biggest population centers, Little Rock, North Little Rock, Sherwood, Jacksonville, Cabot, and win over in East Arkansas. This was a devastating storm that hit our state just three weeks ago. And when a natural disaster this big happens, you put all the politics that we've been focused on, you put those things on the back burner. And you step up and you focus on the people of our state. You push the paperwork, you push the partisanship to the side, and you focus on making sure that the basic needs of every Arkansan are met. 
I was on the ground from the offset to meet with survivors, direct relief, and coordinate with officials, both Democrat and Republicans alike. The road to recovery is going to be a long one. But even as I surveyed damage in the hours and days after the storm, I saw something so incredible, something that gave me hope, something that reminded me why Arkansas is such an incredible and special place. I watched our Kansans step up and put their arms around each other, offer the jackets right off of their own backs, open their homes, open their doors, and take care of people in need. It's the proudest that I have ever been to be the governor of the state of Arkansas. Seeing that, I know that whatever changes that we have made in the last 100 days, that Arkansas will be successful. We will continue to be the greatest state in this country, not because of anything any of us do, not because of any of the change that we bring about, but because of the people that we have the honor of getting to serve. There is nothing that I could be more grateful for and have the opportunity to do than to be the governor of this unbelievable place. Thank you so much for working with me, helping us to implement this change, but more importantly, taking care of the people of our state when they needed it the very most. Thank you for your dedication to the people of Arkansas. I can't wait to see what we get done over the next eight years. Thank you guys so much and God bless you. Thank you so much. This is uh, an amazing moment for the state of Arkansas, and I could not be more grateful for the partnership with President Hester. Um, you know, when you're coming into your first legislative session, there are a lot of unknowns, but one of the things that I knew would be one of the most important things that would carry us through and deliver real success for the people of our state was the partnership with members of our legislature. And we could not have asked for a better, more dedicated group of people uh, and unbelievable leadership under President Hester and Speaker Shepard who could not be here with us today. So thank you. We only had a couple moments where we disagreed, but we ultimately, I think, all ended on the same page on every big issue. And the big winners out of that entire process were the citizens of our state. And I'm very thankful for all of the members of our legislature that are here because without each of you and your dedication and your willingness uh, to stand up to the critics and to push back when it was really important, we would not be here and we certainly would not have the level of success that we have had in this first 100 days without each one of you. So thank you for your leadership. I'm also really proud of the unbelievable team that I get to work with every single day. The members of our staff are some of the most dedicated public servants I have ever encountered. And I've had the chance to work with a lot of people and there are no greater individuals than those that have poured themselves into these first 100 days. Every challenge that I have issued, every request that I have made, every uh, moment they have stepped up and delivered time and time again uh, and I like to keep my foot on the gas pretty much all the time all the way to the floor and this team has been right there every single step of the way I'm very thankful for each one of you and your dedication to our state uh, the staff in the governor's office as well as our amazing cabinet and total administration have been absolutely unbelievable and incredible partners from day one. So thank you for your willingness to stand with me, even on the days where it wasn't so easy. So thank you. It is very special and pretty fitting that we get to celebrate this moment here today while we're at the governor's mansion. We are literally making Arkansas history as we are surrounded by Arkansas history. 
I don't mean this to sound like a joke about his age, but I get to sit in front of uh, some Arkansas history today. <laughs> Arkansas's best governor, one of our country's best governors, and one of the most remarkable leaders anywhere that I've ever seen. My dad is here as well as my mom, and I'm so thankful that you are here and on the front row uh, to be part of the new history that we are getting to make here. This is still the place that my family has lived longer than any other, is this one behind us. And I hope that the memories that my kids get to make are as great as the ones that my brothers and I did under two amazing parents who loved this state and served with everything that they had. So thank you. You know, the first day that I walked into this house, I'll never forget the feeling, kind of the overwhelming power of stepping into this uh, amazing, incredible spot. Everything seemed so big and frankly pretty intimidating for a 13-year-old girl from Texarkana, Arkansas. Still, kids have a way of making things their own and rising up to the challenge and the intimidation. And on more than one occasion, I found myself downstairs in my pajamas welcoming a tour group that was uh, here. I have no doubt that my kids will be carrying on not only that tradition, but making plenty more of their own special moments in history. Uh, and I, I have warned the state troopers in the detail, they may want to get their handcuffs ready because uh, we've got a couple wild ones in our group. But my husband Brian and I could not be more excited about taking on the next 100 days. None of what I have been able to do, not just in these 100 days, uh, but in the last decade plus would have been possible without him. And I'm so thankful that we get to do this together and that we get to raise our kids in this unbelievable place. One of the most special parts of this house is the Janet Huckabee Grand Hall. My mom worked tirelessly to build that and I'm amazed at the work that she was able to accomplish and the way that she was able to get that done despite all of the craziness that went on around it. One of my favorite parts about that building and that place is that it lists the names of all of the governors who have lived here, who have come before me. And each name on that staircase tells a story of the public servants who came before me and lived in this house and served in this office. And each is a reminder of what this new generation and this new administration means. I love the Arkansas that I grew up in the Arkansas that many of those earlier governors helped to build. But I ran to be a change maker, not a caretaker of the status quo. And despite some of the great things that were done by those people that came before me, we came here to shake things up. And I think that's exactly what we have done over these first 100 days. On the campaign trail, I said time and time again that change had to start in the classroom underperforming schools don't just fail our students they condemn a generation to a lifetime of government dependency in my first 100 days we passed arkansas learns in record time because we came here to break the status quo we're giving teachers the historic pay raise that they deserve and we're giving Arkansans the right to choose whatever school works best for their family. And we're making historic investments in early literacy, in pre-K, and career and technical education. The change that we are bringing to the education system in Arkansas is transformational. And it is going to have an impact for generations to come long after all of us here are finished. And I am so unbelievably proud of the work that each of the individuals here put in to make that possible. These changes are already paying off. Just this past week, because of Arkansas Learns, the state is keeping Marvel Elaine School District in Phillips County. That district is staying open. That would never have been possible before Arkansas Learns. It's not enough just to educate our kids, though. We also have to make sure they're safe. 
whether they're online or on the streets in our communities, as the first mom to ever hold this office, one of my top priorities is protecting our children from predatory social media companies and making sure that they're safe wherever they are. We all know that big tech is abusing our kids' privacy and wrecking their mental health. That's why we passed a law that finally gives parents more control over their kids online. And soon, all Arkansans under 18 will need parental permission to get on social media. But online threats aren't the only thing endangering our kids. In these first 100 days, we've made landmark changes to Arkansas's justice system cracking down on the criminals terrorizing our city. We raise the minimum amount of time felons spend behind bars before they're let out on supervision. And we will build a new 3,000 bed prison to stem the prison shortage in our state. We will not allow inmates to walk free anymore simply because we are out of space. These changes will be tough on criminals. And I've been very clear Arkansas justice will be tough, but it will be fair. As we improve education and public safety, and more homegrown talent and businesses will decide to stay here in the natural state. As long as we have some of the highest taxes in the region, we know people will leave for greener pastures, which is why I'm so proud that we were able to continue working on phasing out our state's income tax by passing a $150 million tax cut. Any individual making over $24,000 in the state of Arkansas will now have more money back in our pockets because of the hard work of our legislature and our executive branch to deliver. We will. <laughs> One of the last key priorities that we had in this session was making sure that everybody outside of Arkansas understands the amazing story that we have to tell. I consider myself the chief salesperson of the state of Arkansas. I love the fact that we're called the natural state and I want everybody else to know why. We have some of the most beautiful natural resources of any state in the country and people need to know it. Arkansans should be proud of the investment and the resources that we have right here in our own backyard. Tourism is our number two industry, and we have now cut some of the red tape and the government regulations so that it can continue to improve growing our state's outdoor economy. I'm so proud of the work that my husband has done leading the Natural State Initiative and helping to grow outdoor recreation and that outdoor economy right here in our backyard. Despite the fact that we were working hard and spending the bulk of our time on this legislative session over the last 100 days, our state was faced with other challenges. We had absolute and total destruction across central Arkansas, hitting some of our biggest population centers, Little Rock, North Little Rock, Sherwood, Jacksonville, Cabot, and win over in East Arkansas. This was a devastating storm that hit our state just three weeks ago. And when a natural disaster this big happens, you put all the politics that we've been focused on, you put those things on the back burner. And you step up and you focus on the people of our state. You push the paperwork, you push the partisanship to the side, and you focus on making sure that the basic needs of every Arkansan are met. I was on the ground from the offset to meet with survivors, direct relief, and coordinate with officials, both Democrat and Republicans alike. The road to recovery is going to be a long one. But even as I surveyed damage in the hours and days after the storm, I saw something so incredible, something that gave me hope, something that reminded me why Arkansas is such an incredible and special place. I watched our Kansans step up and put their arms around each other, offer the jackets right off of their own backs, open their homes, open their doors, and take care of people in need. 
It's the proudest that I have ever been to be the governor of the state of Arkansas. Seeing that, I know that whatever changes that we have made in the last 100 days, that Arkansas will be successful. We will continue to be the greatest state in this country, not because of anything any of us do, not because of any of the change that we bring about, but because of the people that we have the honor of getting to serve. There is nothing that I could be more grateful for and have the opportunity to do than to be the governor of this unbelievable place. Thank you so much for working with me, helping us to implement this change, but more importantly, taking care of the people of our state when they need it at the very most. Thank you for your dedication to the people of Arkansas. I can't wait to see what we get done over the next eight years. Thank you guys so much and God bless you. We are excited to be here this morning and talk about a uh, new piece of legislation and new program that we will have here at the state level. Uh, all of us moms certainly I think can appreciate this new change for state government employees and as a mom of three kids I know the difficulties that so many parents have juggling uh, that work-life balance and so we're hopeful that this will not only help all the new moms that work for state government, but also help give the state a competitive advantage when we're hiring uh, people into state government. So with this piece of legislation, all new mothers will receive 12 weeks of paid leave, uh, which is pretty substantial and something very exciting for any new mom working in state government and matches kind of the industry standard. Also, one of the other things we really want to encourage uh, individuals to participate in is being foster parents. And so we would provide 40 hours each year for foster parents so that they can help with the process of taking in kids when they have uh, doctor's appointments and things like that as that come up as new foster parents. We want to make sure they have the ability to do that. We know how important it is for parents to have time to bond with their kids and spend those initial first few weeks at home uh, while still being able to maintain their employment. And so we're really excited about this legislation. Could not and would not be possible without our incredible sponsors, Representative Fott and Senator Urban, uh, who have carried this legislation. And it is a, a personal issue for them and something that we're really excited that we got to partner with them. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Senator Urban to make a few comments and then Representative Vaught. Then we'll sign and come back up for questions. So thanks. Thank you so much, Governor. It was so exciting to be able to work with you as our first female governor, who obviously is a mom of three amazing kids and uh, who can be so related to this piece of legislation. You know, five years ago, we passed the first bill to extend maternity leave for four weeks to our state employees. And at the time when we did it, it was so encouraging to see male state employees donate their time to their female colleagues so that they could take advantage of that four-week maternity leave. And because we did it that way, it cost taxpayers zero money. Uh, we were able to tap into the catastrophic fund, leave fund, and pay for it, uh, and so it's already been paid for. And as we monitored that four-week progress with maternity leave, paid maternity leave, we were able to see that we could extend that to meet an industry standard of 12 weeks of paid maternity leave and create a policy to encourage more people to become foster parents and foster families with this policy. Um, I wanted to tell you I had this amazing state employee named Brooke Holloway who testified on behalf of this bill in the state agencies committee. She was planned to be here today for the bill signing. However, she went into labor Saturday and texted me this morning a picture of a beautiful baby boy. He is the first baby to be able to take advantage of this policy that starts today. Uh, um, actually, it started uh, when, when we enacted the emergency clause, which was specific for her because she, at the time, was 34 weeks pregnant. 
So sometimes emergency calls have meaning and sometimes uh, for this case, it was very, very important that these young moms uh, which we are so appreciative of that work in our state government can take advantage of the full 12 weeks of, of paid maternity leave and, and be where, there with that baby. So I'm proud of the state of Arkansas for stepping up. I'm proud of the state of Arkansas for being a leader in this category of maternal leave. And I'm just proud of, of our governor for signing it. I'm proud of Representative Vaught for being my companion in this process for the past five years. And it's been so great to do this on behalf of women uh, in the state of Arkansas to be able to have that time to be with their babies and for them themselves to recover from that process. So thank you again, Governor, for signing the bill and for being a champion and a supporter. And, um, and just this is a great day for women uh, in our state and, and to celebrate and acknowledge uh, the very important role that they have in, in really humankind. So thank you all. Thank you, Governor, uh, for acknowledging what I consider to be some of the best legislation that come out of the session, um, because it does help so many women in our state. As Senator Irvin said, when we first started this uh, five years ago, um, we had a lot of young women leaving state government because they didn't want to leave their child or didn't have somebody who could take care of their child. So that's why the legislation even began to begin with. So. And this time we got to add foster care. I don't think it was something that we meant to leave out the first time whenever we ran the first bill. It just wasn't put in. And so I was glad when someone approached and said, hey, would you consider doing something for foster moms? You know, we need help too with our children. And, and I was glad that we sat down and we worked through some legislation with DHS that worked great with them and what their policy would be. And again, I'd say it is a great day for women in the state of Arkansas. And thank you again, Governor and Senator Irvin. A great day for Arkansas uh, such a special thing not just for the city of Little Rock but for the entire state dr. Patterson thank you so much for your leadership not just today but across the UAMS system and all that you do to help support our great state it's uh, good to be back with Mayor Scott we've been together a lot over the last uh, month or so uh, but very exciting to be here and get to be part of something uh, positive in the rebuild of our city so very excited to be here this is the second time in just two weeks that we've had the chance to celebrate something happening here in Little Rock after our city was recently devastated by tornadoes that came through at the end of March we still have a long road to go as we recover and rebuild but things like today I think are one of those reminders of the hope and the goodness that we have right here in our city and things like this that give us the confidence that we need to move forward together. This facility's area of focus, spine and bone health, has a very special place in my heart and certainly for our family. When my mom was only 20 years old here in Arkansas, she was diagnosed with spine cancer. She had just married my dad and entered into what they thought was gonna be the beginning of an amazing life. It worked out okay, but she was told that she might not live if she did she was told she would probably never walk again and she most certainly would never have children. Well, clearly my mom loves to defy the odds. By the grace of God, not only did she live and walk again, but she ran marathons and of course had children. My brothers and I are very thankful for the care that my mom received. She had amazing doctors and specialists that supported her throughout her entire treatment process the kind of doctors and specialists that we know that this new facility will help recruit to Little Rock and to our state, helping thousands of Arkansans to live their very best lives. It's only two years ago that you broke ground on this hospital. 
and where most other projects would get caught up in the bureaucracy and the red tape, we're going to be seeing the very first patients here in a month. That's an amazing testament to the skill, to the vision, and the drive of everyone here today and probably the persistence of Lowry Barnes, who is an absolute legend, not just in Arkansas, but across the country. And my guess is that Jake and his team got tired of getting emails from you, Lowry, and they said, we'll, we'll get it done faster. Our state cannot thank you enough for the dedication and the vision that you have brought here today. Tosh puts Little Rock right at the helm of spine care research and will perform an outstanding 6,000 surgeries in the very first year alone. Think how many Arkansans will be helped by this project. And think about how many new doctors and support staff it will attract to our incredible city. When I had my own cancer diagnosis last year, one of the things that helped me recover and become cancer free was the exceptional care that I got right here in the state of Arkansas. And now we're fostering even more homegrown talent with this facility. I'm so glad to be here to inaugurate this new place and what will be the beginning for so many Arkansans. I'm so thankful to everyone who made it possible and I appreciate all of the hard work that each person here has put into seeing this vision become a reality. Thank you so much for your hard work and thank you to the people of UAMS for the work that you do, save, serving not just our city, but our entire state. Thank you so much for letting us be here today. Governor Sanders, thank you so much for being here and thanks for your leadership here in the state of Arkansas. We appreciate you so much. Uh, now, everybody who is gonna be participating in the ribbon cutting, if you could come up here, please, and we will do this thing. Thanks to all of you for joining us today, and anyone who wants to tour, please come on up and see. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim, and good afternoon. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. You know, I've had a lot of introductions, and uh, Having grown up in politics, I've seen a lot of different people introduced, and I'll never forget one time when I was a kid and I went to an event with my dad, and the man went up to introduce him and said, I've been told this man needs no introduction, and that's a good thing because I've never heard of him. So we're already off to a much better start than that. I want to say a huge thank you to Senator Bozeman, Senator Cotton, and Congressman Womack, and Mayor McGill for their unbelievable leadership and bringing us to the point that we are. All of the people on this stage and in this room have worked in a culmination of their efforts, have made today the exciting moment that it is. We could not and would not be here without their leadership and their steadfast support for this program. I can't express how excited I am for today's event. Probably more than a lot of Arkansas governors, I've had the chance to travel around the world interacting with our military on a daily basis during the time that I served at the White House. And I got to see the unbelievable men and women who make up our armed forces. I got to see how steadfast and just how incredible our airmen are. However, as great as all of the people that I interacted with as I traveled around the world, I know that the very best to represent our country are right here at home in Arkansas. Arkansas has long been the training ground for some of America's very best pilots and air personnel. And today we are taking that global. 
Soon, Ebbing Air National Base will be home to 36 state-of-the-art aircraft and 1,200 new base staff. We'll host airmen from as far away as Europe and Singapore. As governor, I'd like to be the very first to extend our welcome to those who will soon call Arkansas home. I'm probably a little bit biased in this, but I believe that our rich heritage, our natural beauty, and the most important asset that Arkansas has are kind and generous people make us the very best state anywhere in the country. May we, we might even teach some of these out-of-towners how to call the hogs. I think we're pretty good at that here, too. The federal dollars that have been spent on construction and personnel will cascade into as much as a billion dollars in economic impact. For the Fort Smith area, the River Valley, and our entire state, this is monumental. What's truly astonishing about this project is its speed and seamlessness through which it came into being. The fastest environmental impact study in the Air Force history. Rapid financial help from the state, from the county, and the city. Zero negative comments in the public comment period. And as somebody who's been a part of a lot of public comments, it's pretty spectacular <laughs> that you could have anything with zero negative comments. This project looks simple on the surface because of the way that it has been executed from the incredible people in this room. But it required a mountain of work behind the scenes from local, state, and our federal leaders. The chamber and the city had to sell this idea to the Fort Smith community. Our congressional delegation had to flex its muscle on Capitol Hill, and the state had to be a willing partner throughout. I can't thank the team here enough for their leadership and for their work on this project. This will be a generational impact on our state, and it puts Fort Smith right at the center of America's global defense infrastructure. We are so proud of what is being accomplished here today, and we cannot wait to continue this. Congratulations to the city, to our airmen, and to Arkansas. Thank you so much to the men and women who serve and make Arkansas look so good, not just here, but around the world. Thank you so much, and God bless. Loud. It's okay to be loud. Thank you all so much for being here. This is a, a very exciting day here for our state. Uh, I had the opportunity over the last couple of hours to spend some time at the Air Base. Uh, such a point of pride for Arkansas. Uh, just an absolutely amazing facility. But what makes it such a special place are the people who served there. And we could not be more grateful for the men and women in uniform who uh, sacrificed so much for our state and for our country and do such a phenomenal job, which is why today is exciting for us because we want Arkansas to be the very best place in the entire country for any person in service to live. And one of the ways that we get to do that is by making sure that every child in the state of Arkansas has access to the best education possible. And so by opening up and signing this legislation, we will allow parents to make the best decision possible about where their kids can best be educated, whether that be a public, a private, a parochial, or homeschool. Each individual should have the ability to decide what is best for their student. One of the things that I love too about this piece of legislation is bipartisan. You had people from both sides of the aisle coming together, working together to serve this community and to make sure that we are making Arkansas the very best place in the country for our men and women in uniform to live. And I'm extremely excited about getting to sign this uh, and also excited for the partnership that we have with the members of our legislature that are here, Senator English, who has carried water on this and so many other things when it comes to ensuring that every student in the state of Arkansas has access to the best education possible. Senator, thank you so much for your leadership. Uh, we've got several other members of our legislature over here, as well as our Attorney General Tim Griffin, who has done a phenomenal job and been a great partner 
uh, in leadership for our state. So thank you uh, for each one of you and the work that you've done to make this possible. But most importantly, thank you to the men and women who serve our state and our country. Uh, we would not be here without you and certainly we would not be uh, the greatest state that we are without the work that each of you do. So thank you so much. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Senator English and then I'll sign and then come back up for a couple questions. Thank you very much, Governor, but you said it all, and I think that we have for years worked very hard in the legislature and with the Department of Education and others to make sure that we have those things in place that make it as easy as possible for military families to be able to locate here in the state of Arkansas. And with this legislation, as the Governor said, giving every, every uniformed service personnel and their families the opportunity to choose the education that is best for them. That is what this is all about. Thank you very much. if there are any. If not, that's okay too. Oh. So the for this piece of legislation specifically, it's active duty military. In general, there's a, a breakdown. Be happy to send that to you. It's the students most in need, uh, low income and lowest performing schools. And, and it'll phase in over a three year time period. And by year three, all students in Arkansas will have access to education freedom accounts. I have a lot of thoughts, but we're short on time, so I'll keep it fast. Uh, first, I think it is uh, an absolutely absurd lawsuit, has zero merit, uh, very confident in the fact that the Attorney General will be, be able to fight back. The, the sad thing is this is a political game that people are playing with children's futures. Uh, we are focused very heavily on making sure that every student in the state has access to a quality education, making sure that our teachers get the pay raises and the rewards that they deserve for the hard work that they're putting in in the classroom. We want to see those things happen immediately and we're confident that'll be the case. Great. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, President Simpson, for your introduction and more importantly for the work that you do and for organizing today's event. And thank you to everyone who is joining us here today especially the families of our fallen officers. Our state is forever in your debt. Joshua Caldwell, Michael Springer, Paul Newell, Jeremy, Jeremiah Story, William Shibley, and Donald Scobie. These men made the ultimate sacrifice to keep us all safe. Today is a day to mourn their passing and to give them thanks for their selfless service. But it is also a time to remember the outstanding lives they led, both in and out of uniform. Joshua loved to fish, loved to cook, loved the hogs, and more than anything, loved being a dad. He never missed a chance to bring his family together, whether it was an early morning fishing trip or to cheer on the Razorbacks. Michael was a decorated Navy veteran of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan who embodied his battalion, battalion's motto, can do. He doted on his two daughters and two new grandkids and relished a chance to put his military construction training to use, whether at home or with the Arkansas State Police. Paul loved that his job let him combine a career in law enforcement with a passion for motorcycles. On the road, he was a two-stepping, boot-wearing biker and at home, he was a loving father and grandfather to his two daughters and three granddaughters. Jeremiah was only 21 years old, excited to build a career in corrections and with the Army National Guard. 
He was a proud patriot and a proud Arkansan who looked forward to serving both his country and his community. Bill served with the Sebastian County Sheriff's Office for 22 years and cherished having a job where he could meet strangers and share a laugh or two. If he wasn't enjoying time with friends, you could count on him to be creating memories with one of his 13 grandkids. And Donald dedicated his life to serving his country from Iraq and Bosnia to Stuttgart, Arkansas. Friends and co-workers described him as the type of man who would give you the shirt off of his back. Words can't express the hole that these losses leave in our hearts and in our state. Our men and women in blue are the fabric that binds Arkansas together. Losing any of these heroes is a tragedy for every Arkansan. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and to pay a small tribute to these amazing individuals' lives. Please know that Arkansas and our entire administration will always have your backs and we will always back the blue. You have our deepest sympathy for your loss. May God bless you and may God bless each of your families. Thank you for your service to our state. Time, I'm going to introduce our keynote speaker, Colonel Mike Hager. This sworn in as the Secretary of Public Safety and Director of the Arkansas State Police on January 13, 2023. He took the post after serving as Captain of Troop A Highway Patrol, and he has more than 26 years of service with the Arkansas State Police. Prior to becoming Troop A, prior to commanding Troop A, Colonel Hager served as the Executive Protection Detail for more than 14 years, rising in the ranks from trooper to captain. As captain, he supervised all operations regarding the security of the governor of Arkansas, immediate family, and the governor's mansion grounds, and coordinated all logistics for the governor's domestic and international travel. Colonel Hager has received multiple official accommodations for exceptional service, including a legislative citation of merit for service beyond the call of duty, and the Trooper's Cross with Valor for actions during an armed confrontation with a suspect during a hostage situation. Colonel Hager receives his Bachelor of Arts degree in Criminal Justice from the University of Arkansas, Little Rock, and he is a graduate of the Northwestern University School of Police Staff and Command. Colonel Mike Hager. Good afternoon. I want to start by thanking our governor for being in attendance today. Uh, governor, you've shown over and over that you support law enforcement, not just through your words, but through your actions. Uh, it's been an honor to serve for her. I continue, or I continue to honor to be able to serve in that role. Uh, I've, I've talked to colleagues across the country, and that's not the norm everywhere in this country. So, uh, all the police officers in the in the attendant or in the congregation, we need to make sure that we never take that for granted. So, thank you so much for your continued support. I'm honored to welcome the officers. I'm sorry, the families of our fallen officers. This is an event that you never wanted to attend and it's certainly not under these circumstances. The words thank you simply aren't strong enough for the sacrifices you've made on our behalf. You shared your family members with us and their sacrifices became yours. I've never felt more pressure to find the right words to express the gratitude and respect that you all deserve. Throughout the years I've attended this service many times. I've attended the funerals of more officers than I could have ever imagined. A common term that we've heard at any police officer's funeral is the end of watch. While that term is fitting, I do not want to focus on the end of watch today. I want to focus on the watch itself. In Hebrews chapter 9, the Bible tells us it's appointed unto man wants to die, and after this, the judgment. Regardless of our profession, we're all going to pass from life either through death or through the return of Christ. The Bible tells us that when we face judgment, God will not judge us on how we died, but rather how we lived. Today, I want to talk specifically about the life of a police officer and how these men and women that we are honoring here today lived in service to their fellow man. If you know me, have you ever heard me speak about law enforcement? You've heard me say that this is a calling from God. I believe that with all of my heart. Just as pastors are called to the ministry, 
law enforcement is the calling to the service. The people we are honoring here today answered that calling to the fullest extent. In Romans chapter 13, the Bible says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. The authorities that exist are appointed by God. Later in that same chapter, we're told, For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister. As a Christian, I firmly believe that police officers are the ministers of God. The Bible is very clear on the subject. My dad tells a story about a bumper sticker that he saw once on a car. He said it read, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Well, as my dad pointed out, you can strike part of that phrase out. The fact of the matter is, God said it, and that settles it. I would challenge each of you here today to focus on the watch. Many years ago, George Orwell said that people sleep peacefully in their beds at night because rough men stand ready to face violence on their behalf. While no police officer seeks out violence, we live in a world where evil exists and violence will sometimes find us. As police officers, we have an awesome responsibility. If we truly believe we are ordained by God, our service should reflect that. Those that we are honoring today are the epitome of that service. They lived a life of service up to the point that they made the ultimate sacrifice. As police officers, we all believe in the priority of life that should determine the way we do our job every day. We all have all sworn an oath that will put the lives of innocent before our own. These words are very easy to say, but living up to those words is much more difficult. My pastor frequently says that your talk talks and your walk talks but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. These men and women we are honoring here today walk louder than they ever talked. We are forever grateful for this. We can only pray that when we are put in similar situations, we will find the courage and sense of duty that these officers found and be able to fulfill the oath the way they did. I'll let you in on a secret I'm sure every police officer here will agree with. My family knows that my prayer is to grow old with them. I want to meet my grandchildren and even my great-grandchildren. However, as I said earlier, it's important that a man wants to die. Only God knows when that day will be for each of us. If God decides that my death is to be earlier than I may choose, I'm hope I'm able to give my life in the line of duty. I, can think, or I can't think of a more honorable way to pass from this life and face my judgment. As all Christians, I strive to hear God say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. This is our calling. This is our watch. To the families here today, you allowed your loved ones to follow their dreams and answer their calling. They subjected themselves to the worst this life has to offer. As a result, you also took on that burden. You were their support system, and now we will be yours. You take it on this calling just as your loved ones did. You shared your family members for the greater good and now feel a loss more profoundly than we can ever imagine. Please know that you are not alone. You are our family now. You may have lost your loved ones, but the day they put that badge on, they gained an extended family that will always be here for you. We may not have known them all personally, but we didn't have to. They are our brothers and our sisters. There's a bond that we all share that extends not only to each other, but to their families as well. This is why we attend their funerals. This is why we shed tears for people that we've never even met. We celebrate their life, their service, and their sacrifice. We are in awe of their watch and their willingness to do what we've all said we will do. Again, they have walked the talk and so have their families. For this, we are eternally grateful. In closing, I would suggest that it's okay to mourn the loss of these officers. I would also offer the encouragement from the Bible when it says that we do not have to grieve as those with no hope. We will see our loved ones again. The Bible gives us the path to reach that assurance. Until that day, celebrate their lives, celebrate their service, and celebrate their watch. God bless you.
anytime you get an introduction and a applause like that, you ought to quit while you're ahead, but I don't think it would be quite polite for me to walk out just yet. I was hoping I would have a little bit more time backstage to talk to Ken and some of the other guys who just won these big awards. Recently, I had the opportunity to sit down in a uh, 18 wheeler simulator. I've always had a great deal of respect for the trucking industry and the amazing work that takes place right here in the state of Arkansas and uh, what an important industry that is for our state. And I got a whole new appreciation when I sat down in that chair and after I ran over about five or six people and took out a couple of families, I was quickly asked to step away from the simulator and uh, all my rights had been provoked to continue practicing. So uh, in all seriousness, I am so grateful for the unbelievable work that those of you in this room do on a daily basis. Not only do you help power our entire state, but you power our entire country. In so many cases, you have stepped up, particularly over the last several years, we saw what a vital role the trucking industry plays, not just in Arkansas, but across the country. And we are right here in the heart and the center of what trucking does all over the United States. And the people in this room make Arkansas look so good on a daily basis. We can't tell you how thankful we are for the dedication that you have to the work that you do, but also the way that you represent our state and help us way out kick our coverage, making us one of the leaders in trucking across the country. So thank you so much for the work that you do and for letting me be here with you today. I figure you've had to suffer through enough speeches, uh, certainly probably enough from me over the course of the last couple years, and hopefully you'll get to hear a lot more over the next eight that we would spend this time and open it up today to take a few questions. So I'm happy at this point uh, to open up, Shannon, and turn it over to you and your team. And if you guys have any questions, I'll be happy to take those at this time. Thank you again for the work that you do and the way that you represent our state. Now, I didn't say that he could ask any questions, so uh, unless there is somebody else that I just said all these great things about the trucking industry and how well you represent our state, and then you get Blake to be the first person to answer it, ask the question and mess it all up. Uh, Governor, throughout uh, your campaign, one of the main themes is you traveled the state with workforce. Uh, you can see in this room and in this industry, workforce is, is a big, big deal. It's, <laughs> it's, it's the lifeblood. What, what is your... What are you personally and what is your administration doing to retain and recruit workforce for our state? And kind of, you don't have to go into the specific industries, but what are y'all doing to retain and recruit workforce for, for the state of Arkansas? Well, I don't think there's any secret um, that there is a massive workforce shortage across the country. It's not unique to Arkansas. Uh, as I've traveled around, it doesn't matter what corner of the state you're in. It doesn't matter what industry leaders you're talking to, every single one when you ask them what is the biggest challenge they have is building and bringing on a skilled, qualified workforce. And so one of the things that we've spent a lot of time is investing in how does Arkansas become the leader in addressing this problem. We've done this in a number of ways. On the very first uh, days upon taking office, one of the first things I did was sign an executive order creating the workforce cabinet. You know, I was shocked to find out when I first started in the transition process uh, after the election and uh, in the days leading up to actually taking office, looking at the various agencies within state government that all have a workforce component. And I asked, how often do you guys sit down and talk about addressing the workforce shortage? And they looked at me like I was crazy. And I said, well, we've actually never met. I said, I don't understand. You literally all work in the same uh, administration. You're all tasked with dealing with building a skilled, qualified workforce here in Arkansas, and you've never all sat down at a table together. And therefore, we work on what, what's under our umbrella, and they handle what's under theirs. And so we quick, quickly uh, brainstormed and came up with the idea of creating the workforce cabinet and bringing all of the stakeholders to the table. And then I appointed Mike Rogers, who came from the private sector, to be the chief workforce officer and report directly to the governor's office meeting on a regular basis with the workforce cabinet, bringing all the players to the table. It can't be a government approach. It has to be a partnership between education, between the private sector and government, all coming to the table and working together. And all those things aren't gonna be successful if we aren't actually training our young people to be capable of doing anything. For a long time, I've said we look at education in the wrong way. 
we look at at the end, what does this student know? And instead we should be asking ourselves, what can this person do? And if when they finish from high school or a two year program or a four year university, and they're not capable of stepping immediately into the workforce, then we have failed to prepare them in the way that we should. And so our goal has been to really take a step back and how do we prepare students to actually go directly into the workforce? We've done that in a number of ways by creating a really strong foundation for students at the earliest level. I'm very proud of the fact that we just passed the most comprehensive, aggressive education reform package, I think anywhere in the country through Arkansas Learns, actually focusing on putting students on a lifetime pathway to prosperity instead of making them forever dependent on what we know to be a very broken system. And I'm proud of the fact that one of the big pieces of that is helping those students at a much earlier age make a determination about going into the workforce and what that could look like, creating things like the dual uh, diploma. So students as early as ninth grade can start taking classes and getting certification so that when they graduate, they're prepared to go immediately into the workforce. These are some of the investments that we're making, some of the legislation we've been able to pass. And I'm really proud of the fact that I think Arkansas will become a blueprint for the rest of the country on what it looks like to build a skilled and qualified workforce. So now I take back a couple of those main comments I made about Blake since he asked a pretty good question. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Can you share some of the highlights of your efforts? Can you please share some of the highlights of your recent efforts to cut taxes? Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think any time that we can stop the exponential growth of government and that we can find savings and pass that on to the taxpayer, those are the things that we should be looking for. And we we're very proud of the fact that we're going to continue chipping away at our state's income tax until we get it down to zero. It's not going to be something that happens overnight, but as we can continue to make progress and put more of people's hard-earned money back in their pockets, that's greater investment into the you know, long-term future of our state. When we have Texas and Tennessee on each side of us, we have two states that we're constantly competing with that have zero state income tax. We have to get more competitive if we want to retract uh, and retain talent here in our state. And so that's one of the big focuses. Uh, there have been a lot of pushes to do different tax cuts in different places, but I think the best place that we can really lean into is on the income tax. And we were able to push through both personal and corporate income tax cuts during this legislative session. And I have a great deal of confidence we'll be able to continue to do that over the next couple of years as well. I know this is not normally a shy group, so feel free to jump up. I'll try to give you a soft question. This will be the one that ends my career, so. <laughs> we heard a lot this morning from earlier sessions about uh, nuclear verdicts and court reform in some other states. And I was just wondering where you or your administration might be at as addressing court reform for the state of Arkansas. I think it's something that we certainly have to have on the table um, and certainly has to be part of the conversation. And, um, you know, it wasn't something that became a big priority during this session, but I wouldn't be surprised if it comes up uh, even during our fiscal session next year. Um, that's been pushed back a little bit because the presidential primary that normally takes place in February. It'll happen in April. I know there's a lot of ongoing discussion. I think it's something that we certainly have to take a look at and engage and see what opportunities are in front of us for Arkansas. Anybody else? This table is like popular over here. Y'all have already gotten two questions. The governor's center. Right here, sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry, there's a light right there oh, yeah. so I can see you. Thank you for being here and for, your, for what you've done. Um, you know, with everything that's going on, we've heard a lot about disruption and growth and accelerating growth. Um, you know, Shelly Simpson talked about how oxygen, or growth is oxygen, right? And that's going to help propel us forward. And so with, with growth, obviously you need training and then also uh, mechanisms to help fund the training. So I guess twofold question. One, what can be done uh, from a state level for funding training opportunities for industry partners? And then what disruption would you like to see within the state to help accelerate growth in Arkansas? Great question. I think there are a couple things when it comes to funding. We have a number of state grants that already exist through uh, Department of Commerce, 
that allow us to target specific sectors. We know that the trucking industry is vital to our state. And so that would be a natural fit for us to invest in and lean into. That's one of the big tasks that Mike Rogers has is doing kind of a statewide assessment of what we have, what's working, where are the holes and how do we fill those. And so that's kind of the process that we're in right now is that assessment phase. We have never taken uh, a kind of whole of government comprehensive approach and comprehensive look at workforce and building up that growth, building up those sectors. And that's what we're doing right now. That's why bringing all of the players together is really important because we have so many people that are working on the same things but not communicating with one another. And that will open up, I think, a lot more resources so that we can invest directly into uh, things like uh, apprenticeship programs and partnering up with uh, technical education and vocational training programs across the state but right now there's not even a comprehensive list and look at what really exists. And so that's kind of the big place is figuring out what we have, figuring out what we need and then building that plan. And Mike has been tasked with doing that. And I have a great deal of confidence that uh, he will not only deliver on that, but I love that you use the term disruption because he usually introduces himself as, hi, I'm Mike Rogers, I'm the disruptor. And so he is there to flip the script and really change the way that we have approached this. And um, it's clearly one of the biggest priorities that we have for long-term success for the state. And I, I feel very good about first building a strong foundation through education, taking this assessment and then creating a plan that puts us on a good path forward. Anybody else? We'll take maybe one more question. Oh. I, We've met. You still owe me a truck, Butch, so word, word must have gotten out that you heard I wasn't a very good driver, and so uh, you changed your mind on that. Not at all. Uh, I was passing through West Memphis the uh, day before yesterday, and I noticed the um, rest area that the highway department is just about completed, and uh, I'd like to know, are you uh, seeking other locations throughout the state for rest areas for our trucks? Absolutely. I know, I know this is uh, something that's a, a big priority and that stop will open up, I think, about 85 new spaces, um, which will be a, a huge addition uh, in rest area spots. We're looking in Arkansas Department of Transportation is looking at a couple of other locations and hopefully we'll have some that mirror what we're able to do uh, there off of I-40 in West Memphis. Uh, you know, my parents, uh, I know that we've transitioned away from calling them truck stops, and we were joking earlier, my parents' first date was at the Fulton truck stop. And so um, we're a little partial to the truck stops in our family. We like to tease my dad that despite the fact that that was their first date, she married him anyway, but um, it worked out pretty well for me, and um, we're certainly very supportive. But again, Arkansas Department of Transportation has done a great job on opening up that space and we're looking for other opportunities to do that as well. Thank y'all so much for letting me be here today. Really appreciate it. More importantly, uh, appreciate the work that you do every single day in the way that you represent our state. Um, and just, again, the critical role that you play into our state success. So thank you so much. And Shannon, thank you for letting me be here with you guys today. Really appreciate it. So great to be here this afternoon. We started a tradition not too long ago, uh, right after taking office. One of the things that uh, we found out very quickly during the campaign is how remarkable some of the great businesses are that we have across the state of Arkansas. And we could not be more proud of some of the businesses who have stepped up, uh, particularly over the last uh, several weeks to help out as our state was devastated by a really uh, difficult tornado system that came through central Arkansas and went into eastern Arkansas and when. And during that time, one of the things that I think each of us were reminded of is how amazing the people of our state are. Um, in a way that we could never have predicted, people stepped up and really helped take care of one another. 
And over the course of the last couple of months, we have spent time each month recognizing businesses who have gone above and beyond here in the state of Arkansas, either helping their employees or uh, just being a great business. And today I'm excited that I get to recognize uh, Middleton Heat and Air here today as Arkansas's May Business of the Month. Some people may not know the story um, behind um, one of the things that took place in Wynn, Arkansas, when the tornado came through and had just absolute devastation citywide for Wynn, one of the areas that was damaged and impacted the most was the Wynn High School. And um, there was very little usable structure left of the Wynn High School after that tornado came through. However, we still had a couple months of school left and we wanted to make sure that those students were able to finish out the school year and called on people around the state to help us mobilize and quickly get students back in the classroom. And one group that stepped up and helped make that happen so that students only missed seven days of classroom instruction was Middleton Heat and Air. And we could not be more thankful for their willingness to act so quickly. The people standing behind me and those over here went into action within 48 hours of the storm hitting our state and brought in air conditioning and mobile units within uh, a week so that students did not miss that critical instruction. After we had students out of school for the better part of off and on for two years after the COVID pandemic, one thing we knew is that we didn't want them missing any more time in the classroom. And last weekend, I had the opportunity to speak at the Wynn High School graduation. And because of the work of the people in this room, those students were able to finish out their school year uh, because you were able to open up facilities by providing air conditioning so quickly. Uh, I know that nobody here wants to be in any building, much less a classroom without air conditioning in April and May in the state of Arkansas. And so by opening up those facilities and helping those students get back in the classroom, you provided not just a great service to those students, but frankly, to our entire state. We've always known that Middleton was a great company and we got to see just the true goodness of the people from this organization. And so therefore, I'm very proud to recognize them. And Larry, I'm gonna present this to you uh, on behalf of the state of Arkansas. We are naming you Arkansas's May Business of the Month. And thank you so much for the work that you all did. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to all of your team for helping make that happen. We know that doesn't happen by any one individual and that the uh, success of this company is at the hands of all of you standing over here and all of you behind me, many of you who have been here for years. So thank you for your dedication. And uh, I know that the season is just getting busy for all of you. So I wish you best of luck and let's keep Arkansas cool over the next couple of months. Thank you all so much for being here today. We appreciate it. Good morning. Thank you, Harry, so much for that very kind introduction. You know, I'm towing the line. I may still be the youngest governor in the country, but I'm, I'm about to be ineligible for uh, 40 under 40. So I'm going to hang on to that for as long as I can. But it is such an honor to be here with you this morning. And General Penn, uh, thank you so much for your service, not just for being here this morning, but for all that you do for our state and have done for our country. And uh, you have taken on this role as Secretary of the VA and done a phenomenal job in short order. So thank you so much for the work that you're doing. You know, during my career and certainly uh, during my time at the White House, I've had the chance to meet some absolutely unbelievable people. But I find that no matter where I go and what I do, that the people I'm most impressed with are the veterans who have served our country. And nothing beats the men and women who have served that live right here in the state of Arkansas. Not too long ago during the campaign, I remember going up to Harrison and getting to attend an opening at a place called Camp Jack, a veterans community center. And I walked in and I'm greeting people and I meet a man named Vic and I get to hear his story. And I was mesmerized by hearing all the things that Vic had done in his time of service to our country. But what really stood out to me was finding out what Vic was doing the night before that community center opening. 
Vic, you see, had come in because she wanted that day and that event center to be perfect for the veterans like him who had served our country. And so Vic had climbed up into the rafters and this was an old building and we're not talking 10 or 12 feet into the air, this was 40 or 50 feet into the rafters to paint and make sure every piece of that room where the opening ceremony was, was gonna be perfect. Ordinarily, that might not be that impressive, but when you find out that Vic was 80 years old and climbed up into those rafters, it got a lot more impressive really fast. And I was blown away by his dedication and his willingness to put himself on the line to climb up to make sure every little piece of that event and that opening was perfect. But I shouldn't have been surprised because that is the type of spirit that our veterans have. That is the type of dedication and duty that each of them bring every single day to everything that they do. Vic told me that morning that he loves to volunteer at Camp Jack because the veterans there deserve it. And if that means climbing up into the rafters at 80 years old, then he's game to do it. And that blew me away because men and women like Vic have gone above and beyond to serve our country, to serve our state and serve their community. And they continue every day waking up and doing it over and over and over again. I look out into this crowd and I see other men and women just like Vic from Harrison, men and women who have already given so much to our country. And yet you're still here volunteering, dedicating yourselves and pouring more and more into it more sacrifice, more service. And it is truly humbling and amazing. You know, people look around right now and they can get disheartened by some of the things that are going on in the country. And they'll tell you that they've lost hope in America. But when I look out into this room and when I meet people like Vic, my hope is not only restored, but it is renewed. Because I know that the greatness of America is not in the events going on, but in the people who make up our incredible country. The Disabled American Veterans stands for the best part of our country, a spirit of service, not just here in Arkansas, but in every state, and even a few there in Washington, D.C. I know you're gonna hear from a lot of the men and women who have made a real difference during this year's convention, but while I have the chance, there's a couple of the local chapters that I'd love the chance to highlight. At Harry's home chapter in Russellville, for example, I know that they're famous for monthly food distribution with rising prices at the grocery store. Things like that have never been more important than they are right now. Down in Sheridan, the chapter helps maintain one of the more interesting parks that honors veterans here in our state. It's complete with the full replica of a B-17 flying fortress that crashed in Grant County during the Second World War. And in Redfield, member Larry Nelson was just honored for 12 years of volunteering to drive veterans to their appointments work that is frankly the bread and butter of chapters around our state. He's dedicated more than 3,000 hours and driven more than 2,200 veterans over 40,000 miles. Larry is an inspiration to all of us and a great reminder of the spirit of dedication of our veterans. Of course, those stories barely begin to scratch the surface of everything that our local chapters and our members are doing for our state and for our veterans. It's such an honor to join you here today and give a small token of appreciation that I have on behalf of the state for the lifetime of service that each of you have taken. Know that my administration will always be here for every veteran in every corner of Arkansas. You have put everything on the line to defend our freedom and to keep us safe. The least we can do is give a helping hand and make sure that you know that we have your back here at home. Thank you for your service and for everything that you do and have done for our incredible country. Thank you so much for letting me be here with you this morning and God bless. Gentlemen, good morning, and welcome to the 1st Battalion, 142nd Field Artillery Brigade Departure Ceremony. 
On behalf of the soldiers and leaders in attendance, thank you for attending today's ceremony for the upcoming mission in support of Operation Lone Star. The ceremony is designed to recognize the soldiers and families for their selfless service and dedication to duty for the mission that they are about to embark on in defense of our great nation. We are honored to have with us today our distinguished guests, the Governor of the State of Arkansas, Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders, the Adjutant General of Arkansas, Major General Jonathan Stubbs. The 142nd would also like to extend a welcome to the many other distinguished guests in attendance. And last but certainly not least, we extend our deepest appreciation and gratitude to the families and friends in attendance today. I am Captain Andrew Pang, and I will be your Master of Ceremonies. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the invocation given by Chaplain Robert Birch. Good morning, everyone. Please join your hearts with mine in prayer. Almighty and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence with us today and for your ever-abounding goodness and faithful love toward us. We thank you for buildings and vehicles that have air conditioning capabilities on nice warm days like today. Uh, we thank you for giving us another day to serve you and to serve each other and that we can gather together for this ceremony. We ask that you'll be present with us during today's events as well as the days and weeks to come. I thank you, Lord, for these soldiers here today and their commitment to this country. Please bless them for the sacrifices they make to preserve our great country and keep it free. As they go on to defend our nation from all enemies, foreign and domestic, please protect and defend them against the same. Please give the leaders of our nation, state, and military wisdom as they are faced with the difficult decisions that come with their office and appointment. May your blessing, guidance, and favor be upon us and upon this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. The 142nd Field Artillery Brigade is currently comprised of 1st Battalion of the 142nd headquartered in Bentonville, 2nd Battalion of the 142nd headquartered in Fort Smith, 1st Battalion of the 181st headquartered in Chattanooga, Tennessee, 1st Battalion of the 117th headquartered in Andalusia, Alabama, and 2nd and 217th Brigade Support Battalion headquartered in Lincoln. The Brigade Headquarters and Brigade Signal Support Company of the 142nd Brigade are headquartered in Fayetteville, Arkansas. The 142nd continually trains for the next call to action from a nation and state who has always found the 142nd Field Artillery Brigade to be competent, capable, ready, and willing to answer the call. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time I would like to introduce the commander of the 142nd Field Artillery Brigade, Colonel Ty Parker. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> distinguished guests, citizen soldiers of the 142nd Field Artillery Brigade, hey, today is a great day as we, uh, dem as we gather today to demonstrate our unwavering support to the soldiers of the 142nd Field Artillery Brigade. You are embarking on a vital mission supporting our southwest border. The brigade's motto is answers the call. I am proud of your commitment and our organizational readiness in meeting and fulfilling that call. As you deploy to Texas, you carry the values of honor, duty, and integrity that define our communities, this brigade, this state, and our nation's military. Working alongside border security agencies, you will face unique challenges in maintaining border integrity, preventing illicit activities, and supporting law enforcement. I want to acknowledge the sacrifices involved in this mission to the soldiers leaving their families. We recognize the hardships you will endure, and to the families, friends, and loved ones, that are sitting here today, we acknowledge your unwavering support. Your selflessness allows these soldiers to provide service to this nation, to the state, and uphold the values we hold dear. First of the 142nd, thank you for answering the call. 
It's my pleasure now to introduce a distinguished career Army National Guard officer with over 27 years of dedicated service to the Arkansas Army National Guard. He has held various leadership roles in the 39th Infantry Brigade Combat Team and supported operations during Ira uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom. With extensive experience, including as Chief of Staff for the Arkansas Army National Guard, he was promoted to Brigadier General working at the National Guard Bureau and most recently appointed as the 54th Adjutant General of Arkansas in January 2023. Ladies and gentlemen, Major General Stubbs. Good job, Ty. Oh, thank you, sir. All right, team. Madam Governor, so great to have you here at, at Fort Chaffee. Uh, we are very blessed uh, with your presence. Uh, to our community leaders here in attendance, thank you so much for coming out and, and representing and, and supporting these great soldiers and their families. It's a big deal to have you here. To our families, what an honor it is to have you sitting uh, in attendance with us today, being a part of our greater military family and of our greater state family. It is just so important. Uh, that you are here to witness this uh, because without you, without your love and your support uh, and your dedication to your individual soldier, uh, they would not be here and we would not be as nearly as successful as we are. So thank you for your service and your support uh, to your respective soldier and to the soldiers in attendance. Madam Governor had an opportunity yesterday uh, during their evening chow to, to come into the chow hall and uh, shake their hands look each each soldier in the eye and i can tell you uh, without doubt without question these soldiers are trained and ready to go and they're fired up they are fired up they are ready to go they are excited and uh, they are going to do great things down there on the southwest border they are going to represent our state uh, incredibly well with distinction with professionalism with determination with grit and they are going to set the standard and I told them, and I believe this, ma'am, uh, with every fiber of my being, that these soldiers, once they get deployed, once they start operations, they will be the finest soldiers serving on the border, without question. I believe in this group. I am so incredibly proud of you. And like we talked about last night, we're going to remain professional, all right? We're going to do our job with the utmost professionalism, commitment to one another. We're going to take care of one another, all right? And then we're going to be prepared for anything. We've got to be prepared for anything down there. We're going to watch out for one another and be prepared to do what we need to do uh, to support the, butter, the border um, Customs and Border Protection agents that are down there to support our fe fellow Texas National Guardsmen who are carrying out their mission have been doing so for well over a year. They've asked for our help and we're coming to help them. All right. And I'm incredibly proud of each and every one of you. So without further ado, now let me say one more thing to the families. I need to say this and I told your soldiers this, but I need to tell you and I need to make this public statement to you. Colonel Ty Parker right here. Raise your hand, Ty, just one more time. He is the brigade commander. So the commitment I made to your soldiers is this. If you have an issue, a problem, you need help while your soldier is deployed, let us know, and we will be there for you, okay? No matter what, we will be there for you. It is... It is our ultimate obligation and commitment to you that we will take care of you no matter what. So please let the unit chain of command know. And like I said, we will be there for you. So, like I said, we got the commander in chief here uh, to deliver remarks. And it is just my distinct honor and privilege uh, to introduce her. Uh, she is committed to your success. There is no bigger fan of the National Guard than your commander in chief. So without further ado, uh, Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders, ma'am. Let's give her a round of applause. You can always count on General Stubbs to be the hype man. So if people were not excited before, they certainly are now. Good morning. Thank you, Major General Stubbs, for hosting us today and for all that you are doing on behalf of our state and our country. We are unbelievably proud to be represented by you and to have you at the helm leading our guard. 
and to our Arkansas National Guardsmen and your families. Thank you for your service to Arkansas and to our entire nation. Over just the last few months since taking office, I've already had the chance to see firsthand the unbelievable dedication, the unwavering support that our state and frankly our country and our world are receiving from our Arkansas Guardsmen. Just a few weeks ago, we had the chance to see our Guardsmen step in and help after our state was devastated by tornadoes that ravaged central and eastern Arkansas. And just last week, while I was in Germany, I had the opportunity to sit down with some of the members of our Guard and see the unbelievable work that they are doing and the level of commitment that they have to serving and representing our state. I knew it before I took office, but I've been reminded every single day just how unbelievably incredible our guard is. By far the best in the country. Not that I'm biased at all. And in just a few short days, you will be on the front lines of another of one of the most pressing issues facing our country. And we need your help because we know that we need the very best to take on this mission. Because it won't be an easy one, but I certainly would not have asked our guardsmen to do this if it wasn't a mission focused on the safety and the security of our country. You are Arkansas's very finest, and we know that you will complete this mission and we have total confidence in you as you deploy today. In just a few days, you will see the crisis at our southern border firsthand all-time high illegal border crossings, a flood of deadly drugs like fentanyl, human traffickers operating with free reign. I was recently at a border briefing in Texas about a month ago, and in just a few weeks, they had already apprehended more people in that month that were on our terrorist watch list than the previous six years combined. Some leaders in Washington think complacency equals compassion. So they've thrown the door open to the cartels, leaving states to pick up the pieces. Let's get one thing clear. It is not compassionate to encourage people to put their lives and their children's lives in the hands of deadly cartels. It is not compassionate to let 100,000 Americans die from drug overdoses every day. And it is not compassionate to force cities and states to bear the burden. However, States are doing exactly that, and we're stepping up. We are taking on the burden where our federal government is failing. Our federal border policies are not compassionate. They are cruel. And if our leaders in Washington won't step up, states like Arkansas must. This is a task that the Arkansas National Guard is uniquely qualified for. You've provided the same assistance to commanders and law enforcement for years. And now that help, that training, will be instrumental in combating this crisis. To the leadership of the Guard, thank you for your quick work to make this deployment possible. And to the families here today, thank you for being here to see your loved ones off to this mission and for the support that you give them each and every day. And to our brave Guardsmen, we cannot thank you enough for your service on behalf of Arkansans and all Americans. We know that you truly represent the very best of our state and our country, and we are forever grateful for your service. Thank you for what you do. God bless you, and be safe. Thank you, Governor Sanders. Ladies and gentlemen, sorry to do this, but please stand for the benediction. Please join your hearts with mine once more in prayer. Almighty Father, we come before you again on behalf of these soldiers. As you protected the army of your nation, Israel, please protect ours in this unit specifically as they are given a mission away from home 
May they walk in wisdom and under your guidance. May each one of them seize every opportunity they can for personal growth and development during this time. May they look after one another, not only on the front lines of their mission, but in each other's personal lives as well. As we face the difficult days ahead, help us to remember your faithfulness and the words you spoke through Isaiah. For I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. Your word also says you will keep those in perfect peace whose minds are stayed on you. And that is my prayer for each one of these men and women. May our hearts and minds be focused on you, and may you grant your peace that to us that surpasses all understanding, and may it guard our hearts and minds, just as your word proclaims that it will. Heavenly Father, I want to pray for specifically for Colonel Barr and Sergeant Major, Major Anderson. Please give these men direct guidance and wisdom. Please protect them and their soldiers and all their families. May your hand and blessing be upon this mission. May we remain in your peace, protection, and in your blessing. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. As we bring this event to a close, we wish to thank our families and friends for the support they provide to our soldiers. To the soldiers, thank you for your service in the Arkansas Army National Guard, and thank you for your dedication to our country. We wish you all the best at the upcoming mission. Families are encouraged to meet loved ones outside, outside the theater prior to departure. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the ceremony. Thank you for your attendance. cabinet and leaders in Arkansas's justice system. Thank you to Justices Webb, Wood, and Kemp for being here today. Just two weeks ago, our state lost a legal titan. Justice Wynn's service to Arkansas was immeasurable. From his days as a hard-charging Dallas County prosecutor to his decade at the highest reaches of our legal system. Justice Wynn could have been anything, a pastor, a politician, a businessman, and yet he chose instead to devote his life to Arkansas and the law. For that, I and our entire state are eternally grateful. Brian and I continue to lift up the entire Wynn family in our prayers. Today, I have the responsibility of choosing a new justice to fill Justice Wynn's place on the Supreme Court until 2025. I am pleased to announce I have selected another former prosecutor and a U.S. attorney, Cody Highland, for this role. Cody brings a lifetime of legal experience to the job, from his early days as a staff attorney in state government and an aide to my dad, who is also here today. He made service to Arkansas the centerpiece of his career. He was twice elected prosecuting attorney for the 20th Judicial District, serving Faulkner, Van Buren, and Searcy counties. And after unanimous confirmation by the United States Senate, something that I think all of us would acknowledge doesn't happen for every nominee, he served as U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Arkansas from 2017 to 2020. Under his leadership, the office produced an unprecedented 82% increase in criminal cases in that time. Cody's commitment to law and order is unparalleled. After the end of the Trump administration, Cody became chief legal counsel for the Arkansas Department of Public Safety. And last year, Cody stepped down from that role to join me in my campaign for governor. He helped us traverse the legal issues that come up with any high profile campaign and headed up our Law Enforcement for Sarah Coalition. Together, we crafted the Safer, Stronger Arkansas Legislative Package that I had the privilege of signing this year to clean up the crime on our streets. And after the campaign, our fellow Republicans selected Cody to lead the state party under this new administration. Today, like so many times before, Cody is stepping up again and making another sacrifice 
to serve the people of Arkansas. It will be impossible to fill Justice Wynn's shoes on the Supreme Court, but Cody's decades of experience, even temperament, and love for our state and the rule of law bring him closer than anyone else could. He will be there to call balls and strikes, interpreting state law as it was written, and leaving the legislating to the legislature. Cody comes from the same mold as some of the finest jurors we have in the country today, the same legal minds who are finally bringing back strict originalism to our courts. This is the first time Arkansas Supreme Court will have a conservative majority, and I know it will have the same effect on our state as it has had on our country. Cody's highest loyalty will be to the Constitution and the rule of law. That's all we can ask from our justices, and that is all that I have asked of him. Before turning the podium over to our newest justice, I want to give my deepest thanks to Cody and his entire family. Jana, Claire, Caitlin, John Reagan, Ethan, thank you for your support as you all enter this newest, biggest role to serve Arkansas. Cody, congratulations. Thank you for that. Um, I will confess to being a little bit conflicted today, uh, given the circumstances that necessitated today's announcement. <clears throat> Justice Wynn's passing was a loss for his family, the courts, and a loss for the state. morning. An exciting day here. You know, it's great to be at the Witt Stevens Junior Nature Center. Uh, what a special place for our state. The only thing better than this place is the person that it's named after. A true icon when it comes to all things Arkansas outdoors and somebody who frankly helped set the gold standard of what it means to be an Arkansas Game and Fish Commissioner. And so I'm excited that we get to be here for today's announcement. Uh, so thankful for all of the members of our commission who do an absolutely outstanding job. Arkansas well beyond outkicks our coverage when it comes to our natural resources and also the amazing people who help us conserve those resources, who help us protect those and help us promote them. And these are people who are successful every single day in their own business, but choose to give up their time and volunteer to be part of this commission. And they could not represent our state better and we could not be more thankful for those of you who sit here today and the work that you do every single day to promote our state. 
got our executive director, Austin Booth, who's also here, who does a tremendous job helping lead this organization and spending every day promoting our great state. When it comes to taking on a role like this, meeting a certain standard uh, is, is something that you look for. And the person who is leaving this position has left extremely big shoes to fill. Bobby Martin is uh, a legend, not just in Arkansas, but frankly across the country. And not just in outdoors, but in business as well. Uh, anytime you can get people from rappers to businessmen to know who Bobby Martin is, it's a pretty big deal. And uh, he has done just an outstanding job as chair of the Game and Fish Commission. And I know he will be missed in this role, but we know that we will not miss him from his dedication to the outdoors and to conservation efforts here in the state. Um, because, Bobby, we know where you live and we will find you and we will suck you back in time after time to make sure you continue to be uh, integrally involved in what we're doing here. Brian and I have made no secret that promoting our state's outdoor economy is one of the top priorities that we have. We know it's one of the greatest assets that our state has. So making sure that we have a team around us through the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission that share that same commitment and same passion was so important. They say that you get to know somebody really well in moments of both victory and defeat. And I don't think that there is any way to experience both victory and defeat in Arkansas more than either going duck hunting or watching an Arkansas Razorback football game. I've had the opportunity to do both of those things with our newest Game and Fish Commissioner. You know, you get to know somebody really well, especially when you sit all day in a duck blind and you never pull the trigger. I'm not saying the duck hunting was bad, but it wasn't our best day. And we spent uh, the better part of about six or seven hours sitting out in the freezing cold. Um, and you really get to know somebody. You get to see their passion. You get to see what matters to them. You get to see where their areas of commitment are. And there is no doubt that Brandon Adams, our newest commissioner, and somebody I'm very excited to announce today will be taking that position, is committed to a few things that I certainly share and am glad that he will be taking on this role. He loves his family. He absolutely cares and loves his family in a way that I hope everybody gets to experience. He cares about our state. He wants to see Arkansas succeed in every area. And he loves the outdoors. And he loves the idea of making sure that every single Arkansan has access to the great resources that we have right here in our backyard. I don't think there's anybody that could step into this role and do a better job representing our state, fighting to protect our great resources, and making sure we take Arkansas to the top than somebody like Brandon. I know he is going to do an absolutely phenomenal job. Like I said, he's got big shoes to fill, and he's got to follow in the footsteps of great legacies, those like George Dunklin and Jim Hinkle, Whit Stevens, and now Bobby Martin. But I have every confidence that Brandon will do a great job. I know he's gonna represent our state well, I know he's gonna represent the commission well, and I know he is gonna do a great job adding to this amazing, extraordinary, elite group of people that I'm so proud I get to work with every day. Thank you, Brandon, for being willing to take this on, and now I will introduce you and let him make a few remarks to our newest Arkansas Game and Fish Commissioner, Brandon Adams. Thank you so much. I feel like I should quit now that I am ahead. It's pretty rare that you get an introduction like that. I am uh, unbelievably honored to be here today. One, because it's a good thing I ran and became governor of Arkansas because I would never have been admitted into governor's school. I'm not quite the stellar student that I think most of you are representing some of our state's very best and brightest. Senator Davis, thank you so much for the very kind introduction. As you stated, we got to know each other nearly two decades ago. I think it's such a great reminder to look around the room at the people that you're seated with, the people that you'll spend the next four weeks with, because these will be people you will likely intersect with many times over. Get to know them. Take time to appreciate the skills they have that you don't, so that you can complement one another in the future. Make friends. 
because you never know who may be introducing you one day and you want to make sure that you are nice to them over the last couple of decades so they say really nice things about you. It is such an honor to welcome students, parents, and faculty here at one of Arkansas's great institutions. It's always an honor and a privilege to be here at Arkansas Tech's campus. And it's exciting to join you here at a pivotal moment in your educational journey. I still think some of the best memories that I have came from growing up in Arkansas and during the time where I attended Little Rock Central High. You know, Little Rock Central High is a place full of traditions. It's a lot of things that have been going on for decades. One of my favorite traditions that we got to participate in while I was a student at Central was the junior caravan. This was the day where junior students were becoming seniors and it took place as the seniors were taking their last of their final exams. So the junior class gets to skip school on a sanctioned skip day. I mean, sanctioned by ourselves. Obviously, the school wasn't pushing for us to skip class. But we would take this day off and we would caravan around the city. And one of the traditions was as we passed by the high school there at Central, is one of the students would bring a chain and lock the senior high parking lot so that the senior students couldn't leave. It was a way for us to try to keep them there a little bit longer. That was at least the story. I think it was really just to see who could pull off the best pranks in the junior class. Usually, one of the seniors would bring bolt cutters and quickly open the gates back up, and the joke only lasted for a few minutes. Because my class was full of a lot of overachievers, we decided we'd go a step further than just putting a simple chain on the, the gates there at the lot. We pulled our money together, and for the ripe cost of $250, we bought an old beat-up station wagon that didn't run. We painted it in black and gold, the colors that represented our high school. And we put the class of 2000 there on the hood and every student in the junior class signed the hood and we towed that car and we left it right there at the gates of the senior parking lot so that the seniors would not be able to exit. As you can imagine, they were pretty furious. They weren't able to break the chain so quickly, but they did bring out baseball bats and golf clubs and beat that station wagon to bits. To be clear, I'm not encouraging anybody to participate in that type of tradition if it's not something that already takes place at your high school. And to the parents in the audience, rest assured, this is not the governor telling your kids to get in trouble while they're here at governor's school over the course of the next several weeks. But I do think it's a reminder that the memories that you make here can last a lifetime, and that you should cherish each of the four weeks that you will have here on campus. You are among the very best and brightest from our state, selected from a hyper-competitive applicant pool to create the most enriching intellectual environment possible. You're going to discuss, learn, and do amazing things over the course of the next month. When I ran for this office, I promised that I would be the education governor. And with help from leaders like Senator Davis and Secretary Oliva, we have overhauled our entire school system, K through 12, in just a few short months. That includes pay raises for teachers, education freedom for parents, and major investments in literacy for students. For high schoolers like you, we're focusing on bringing in the skills education programs that we know will help more students land jobs right after graduation. But we can't take our education system to the top without committed students. That's why I'm so glad to see each of you here today, taking time out of your summer simply for the sake of learning. Thank you to the Governor's School faculty and especially the leadership team here at Arkansas Tech for making this program possible. And to the students in the audience, Thank you for taking advantage of this amazing opportunity and dedicating your time to learning. I hope that you will take time to enjoy these four weeks, that you will make memories that will last a lifetime, so that one day when you're standing on this stage, you'll have ample speech content because you will certainly need it. I want to be one of the first to say congratulations to you. We cannot wait to see what you do next. Thank you for letting me be here and have a great four weeks.
this is a huge event, and I can tell, and I'm not going to mention any names, but there's at least one person in the crowd that I tried all of last year to get to come to Rotary, and uh, he ignored me over and over and suddenly is here in the audience today. So, uh, Well, then we certainly won't call on him for a question. I don't know who it is, but that's usually the <laughs> career-ending game-changer individual. So. <laughs> Um, we've got a lot of ground that we're going to cover. I know there were some topics that were important to you uh, that we worked on with staff to, to build some questions in. Uh, we'll cover some parts of the LEARNS Act. We're going to cover the Natural State Initiative, economic development. Uh, but first, before we dive into that, uh, I wanted to give you an opportunity to give us a, a state of the state uh, and, and update us on these first uh, seven months. Absolutely. First, thank you so much for having me. It is uh, an honor to carry on the tradition and get to be uh, part of this event here today. So, you know, I have an incredible team. I think one of the, the best and brightest staffs of any governor anywhere in the country. And they do a great job preparing me for events, giving advice along the way. But I found that sometimes the best advice that I ever get is from one of our three children. My husband Brian is here with me this morning. And as Ross mentioned, uh, we have three kids, Scarlett, Huck, and George. They are 11, 9, and 8. So uh, we do chaos at our house really well. But our kids um, are certainly not shy on sharing their opinions. And our youngest, George, is probably one of the more outspoken eight-year-olds you will ever encounter. And George told me not too long ago, Mom, I know you're going to do another one of those events. Please do not give one of those really long, boring political speeches. No one likes them. So I'm working on uh, tailoring my remarks and keeping them a lot shorter and uh, really focusing on uh, a little bit of substance and then jumping into the Q&A portion today. Uh, you know, we feel like we have really taken this role and this opportunity by storm and just finished one of the most, uh, obviously I'm biased, but that's okay because I have the microphone, but successful legislative sessions that we've had ever in the state of Arkansas uh, over the last couple of months. And not only are we, I think, taking the Capitol and the legislative session uh, to a whole new level, but things at the governor's mansion uh, as well. Our kids are the first elementary aged kids to live back in the governor's mansion since Chelsea Clinton. And so um, it is a whole new ball game and we have a lot of Nerf Wars and uh, fun activities. We had a slip and slide in the backyard yesterday. But our kids are uh, certainly shaking things up as well and a few weeks ago I walked outside I knew the boys were going out to play in the backyard and I go out I look for them I don't see them and I hear voices coming from the front I walk around to the front yard and they have um, you know I know this is a family friendly event but they'd stripped down to their underwear and they were swimming in the front fountain <laughs> and I went up to our eight and nine year old and I said guys what in the world are you doing? Like, this is not a swimming pool. You cannot do this. George looked up at me and he goes, Mom, be cool. <laughs> he goes, it's shallow. It's not like we're going to drown or anything. Just be cool. So uh, in, in the great advice of the brilliant theologian and my eight-year-old son, George, I'm going to try to be cool and, um, you know, keep things quick so that we can spend a lot of time on taking questions from you all. But we set out this year uh, quickly after taking office with a few very clear objectives. One of the biggest and most important things that I wanted to focus on that I spent two years talking about pretty extensively on the campaign trail was the fact that our education system here in Arkansas was not meeting the standard that we needed to provide the highest quality education possible for every single student in the state. I knew we could do better, and so we set out and spent a tremendous amount of time traveling the state, frankly traveling the country, talking to stakeholders, looking at what other states were doing that was working that we weren't, and really took a completely comprehensive approach to transforming the status quo. 
I don't know if anyone here was satisfied, but I certainly wasn't with seeing our state continue to be 48th and 49th and 50th, frankly, in every category that not only I want to be first and second, but I know we're capable of being there. And so we built what I think is one of the most transformative education reform packages, certainly in our state's history, but probably anywhere in the country, that will really lift every student up and make sure that they have access to that quality education. I'm very proud of the fact that we worked hard to build, pass, and now are implementing Arkansas Learns here in the state that we will be able to see uh, lives changed and students have that greater opportunity and greater access. Uh, I'm a big believer that despite the fact all of the things you see going on in the world that can make you think that uh, the end is near, that we still live in the most amazing country on the face of the planet. And one of the greatest things about being an American is that it doesn't matter where you start, you get to decide where you will finish. And I wanted that to be true right here in Arkansas. I wanted every kid in the state to say, I want to be X, Y, or Z, and have the opportunity to go out and do that and see it achieved. And I think that education is one of the greatest platforms and foundations we can possibly provide to help those students. And so I'm very proud of the fact that we set out to accomplish that and we were able to do that during this legislative session. Some of the other big priorities are continuing to phase out our state income tax. We have to do that responsibly, certainly not going to happen overnight, but if we want to continue to be competitive with states like Texas and Tennessee, we have to uh, work consistently to phase that out. We made progress on that, and I think we'll be able to continue to do that while still investing big in things like education. One of the other big priorities we had this legislative session was to focus in, on strengthening our communities by making them safer. Uh, we can have the best education system that the country has ever seen. We can have amazing economic development. But if our communities are not safe, if the streets that our kids are growing up on are not safe, then we have not succeeded in our job and our responsibility as government officials. And so we really focused on a couple of key areas that we feel very strongly will help elevate and make uh, our cities and our entire state much safer through the Safer Stronger Arkansas Legislative Package. I think we were able to accomplish that. Uh, and the last big priority that we had, and certainly uh, I think fits in very well with your motto of the power of fun, is really focusing on what I believe is one of our state's best assets, and that is our natural beauty. Really leaning into our state's outdoor economy. I'm a big believer that I have the great opportunity of being Arkansas's chief salesperson and going out and telling our story. And I think we have an unbelievable story story to tell. This is one of the most beautifully, culturally rich, historical states anywhere in the country. And a lot of our Kansans don't even know what we have in our backyard. So we want people not just here, but frankly around the world to know what Arkansas has to offer. We want them to come here, frankly spend a lot of their money here in the state of Arkansas and see our tourism industry continue to grow. And I'm confident through the steps we've taken with the Natural State Initiative that my husband Brian uh, has volunteered to lead. He didn't know all the things he was going to get to volunteer to be a part of when uh, he married me 13 years ago. And uh, what an adventure it has been. And he's doing a tremendous job really leaning into kind of that unique selling proposition that we have as a state to go out and help grow our outdoor economy and tell Arkansas's story. So I believe the state of Arkansas is unbelievably strong and I think we have so many opportunities in front of us and I look forward to continuing uh, to elevate our state, work with the people in this room to make Arkansas the very best place uh, anywhere, not just frankly in the country, but anywhere in the world to live, to work, and to raise a family. Appreciate the overview there. We'll, we'll drill down. You guys will notice some familiar themes as we kind of walk through the questions. Um, and then we're also going to, inevitably, there will be a follow-up that I miss or, or something that you came and have a burning question. Uh, and the governor's been gracious enough to allow us some time uh, for member questions at the end. So uh, bear with me if I miss one. 
you can follow up and uh, you can ask. Um, so I want to start with, with the LEARNS Act. There's certainly no shortage of, uh, of pieces of that that we could discuss. But I wanted to start with the literacy component of that uh, because that's something that's been such a focal point for our club, uh, including last year uh, we launched a literacy lab with the Little Rock School District, uh, seeing exactly the, the same things that you have. Um, I wonder if you could talk through some of the components of that literacy piece. I know one of them uh, shocked some people that the third grade uh, reading level um, and, and uh, not being able to advance beyond that if you couldn't read at grade level. Uh, but frankly, it seems like we've got to do something. Uh, and so I wonder if you could kind of walk through that and, and why you, you chose some of the things you did around literacy. Sure. I think that one of the most important things to look at is that uh, the greatest probably data benchmark that we have for any success story in education is all tied back to literacy. If a child is not reading and not meeting that most basic benchmark, particularly by the time they hit that third grade mark, then we know we are setting them up, frankly, uh, and just to be very blunt, for a lifetime of failure. Uh, that is one of that critical make or break moments. A child up until third grade is learning to read, and after third grade, they're reading to learn. And if they aren't able to do that, not only do they fall further behind, but it almost becomes impossible to catch up. And so really leaning into that space was absolutely critical. And Arkansas was at the very bottom when it comes to the number of our students that were reading at or above a third grade reading level. Uh, there are various different tests and markers that you can look at, but on average, only about 31% of Arkansas third graders were actually meeting that critical benchmark. We know that if a student is not reading also by that point, there is a 70% chance that they will have a lifetime in poverty. If that doesn't startle and scare you and put you back on your heels, that 70% of students who aren't reading by the time they hit third grade are going to live a life of poverty and only 31% of Arkansas third graders are meeting that benchmark. If that doesn't shake you into making some significant changes, frankly, you shouldn't be part of the solution because this is an absolutely critical point for our state. We didn't have a single county in the entire state of Arkansas that had more than 50% of their students reading at a third grade or higher level. In fact, 40%, 46% was the highest county anywhere in the state of Arkansas for third graders. To me, that is simply unacceptable because we know that we are setting those kids up for a lifetime of failure. So we had to do something radically different and bring about not just a tinkering of the system, but frankly, we had to flip the tables over and really charge forward and look at what are the best practices. So we looked at what was working in states all across the country. You know it's a problem when you're in Arkansas and you can no longer say, thank God for Mississippi. And frankly, that's the position that we found ourselves in. Mississippi's literacy rates were skyrocketing while Arkansas continued to hover at the bottom. So we looked at what they were doing and we took language directly out of some of the changes that they made and we built even more on top of that. One of the biggest things that they did that had a huge amount of impact and success were deploying literacy coaches that were funded and paid for by the state into districts and schools that needed the most help and catch up. So that's exactly what we've done. We put uh, a provision in the Arkansas Learns Act to provide 120 literacy coaches paid for by the state and that will work directly for the state that will be deployed into districts all over Arkansas to help those students, help catch them up, and also provide a resource for teachers to lean on. When a teacher is responsible for 20 to 25 students, having to stop the entire class to catch those one or two up can hold back the students who are doing exceptional. So by having a partner that can join them in the process as a literacy coach can, it allows the exceptional students to continue to rise but also help us catch those students up that are falling behind. One of the other things that we did was included uh, tutoring grants of up to $500 so those students who need additional 
time, either before, during, or after school. We provided funding so that their parents, their teachers, their counselors can help them by putting them in a program to receive additional assistance. Uh, that was another one of the things that we saw that was really successful in another state. And one of the, probably uh, the thing that I think, as you mentioned, probably catches a lot of people off guard, and we had some pushback, was not moving students forward from third grade to fourth grade if they aren't meeting that critical benchmark. However, there's a whole lot more context that has to be added. We didn't just say, oh, you didn't make it, best of luck, try again. No, we said we're going to come around you and provide wraparound services for those students so that over the course of the end of the year, over the summer, we are working extensively to catch them up, ideally so that they do get to move forward to fourth grade. What would be absolutely ridiculous uh, and frankly would just be a complete failure is if we said, you know what, you didn't make it in third grade, we're going to put you right back into this system that has already failed you once. But instead, we are providing a additional resources and again wraparound services for those students so that they are getting uh, a much more intense immersion services to help catch them up so that they ideally spend those next couple months and move up with the rest of their class. There are also a number of waivers and exceptions for students with special needs and other factors that might play in uh, that would allow those students to continue to move forward. But simply doing nothing is not acceptable and is not an answer. We had to bring about drastic reform. I think that's what we have done through the Arkansas Learns Act. Uh, and I think it's one of the most critical and important pieces of the legislation. Frankly, that doesn't get talked about near enough because we know it's such a critical game changer for students all across the state. So while we're, while we're on the subject and of, of improving education, I think one of the uh, one of the important components of learns one of the important components of learns also uh, was around teacher raises. Uh, we've seen a, a number of headlines ar around that, uh, including uh, I believe uh, the possibility that teachers in Arkansas could move from uh, essentially last in the country in pay uh, to first, depending on level and experience and those sorts of things. Um, that competes with some headlines we're seeing right now where, where uh, schools are having trouble uh, filling or recruiting teachers. And so I wonder if you could speak to uh, the raise component of that, how that will be implemented, and then ultimately what the hope is there. Uh, absolutely. We, it's no question uh, that the direct success to so many students is tied to the success uh, of a great teacher. Uh, I'm sitting here today because I had amazing teachers who forced me to be better, who pushed me uh, to excel and go beyond what I knew I was capable or what I thought I was capable of doing because they believed in me. And we need all of those amazing teachers that we have in Arkansas, one, to stay in the classroom, and those that are thinking about doing it, we need them to join the ranks and be part of that process. So making sure we took steps not only to retain, but also to recruit the best and the brightest and hardest working public servants out there in our teachers was incredibly important in this process. So we looked at what we needed to do to be competitive. And one of the most important things was raising that base pay. But it wasn't simply just giving new teachers a raise. It was making sure that every single teacher in the state of Arkansas received a raise. That was something that was really important to the members of our legislature as well as to our team was making sure that every teacher was rewarded. It's, it's not just the paycheck, it's also the message that we're sending, is that we understand your importance, we see the value that you bring to the table, and we want to make sure you know that we feel that way. And so by elevating Arkansas from being, frankly, 48th in the country to starting pay uh, to top five, and when you adjust for cost of living, we're number one in the country for starting pay now for teachers here in the state of Arkansas. That makes us competitive with California, Texas, New York, Florida. Literally every state in the country, our teachers' starting pay is now at a competitive rate. And that's a big thing for a state like Arkansas. And so doing that was really important, but also adding uh, those teachers who have been in the classroom for a long time. We made it sure that every single teacher in the state would receive at least a $2,000 pay increase. And, you know, there's some pushback that maybe we're not rewarding the teachers who have been there long enough. 
those teachers should continue to get pay raises. We've provided additional and even greater flexibility to districts so they can do exactly that, so they can reward their veteran teachers. We also provided uh, up to $10,000 in merit and incentive pay. Some of that is growth and achievement based, but some of that pay is also for teachers who are willing to go into those high demand areas uh, like math, literacy, uh, as well as uh, high demand uh, geographic locations, uh, places where it's harder to recruit some of those teachers. So there are incentive-based pay for those things as well, up to $10,000 that in large part will benefit a lot of our veteran teachers. In addition to that, we also included um, not only the language, but the funding. The key part is that the state is footing the bill, not just for one or two years, but in perpetuity for these raises. Every dollar that a district was receiving prior to learns, they receive, and now they're gonna get additional significant funding on top of that. One of the, I think, biggest misconceptions is that this is somehow uh, not positive for public education, when in reality, this is the largest investment we've made in public education in decades. And so it is a very big positive step in bolstering public education across the state. Uh, but one of the other things included in that, that is part of that kind of teacher package, was also uh, helping pay and cover the tuition for teachers as they go into the classroom. The state is willing to take on uh, those teachers' loans and make sure that those are reimbursed so even more of their money is going directly into their pocket. So putting those incentives to keep our best and brightest in the classroom was really important. Um, and this isn't the end. It's the first step, and it's a very important one. But it gives us a place to build from and continue to add on to from here. While we're on the subject of funding, I think one of the recent headlines was the state has a surplus uh, north of a billion dollars. Um, I have some ideas on how we could spend that. We'll talk after this is over. Um, but, but I wonder for you, have you identified some, some areas where uh, we could invest some of that? Certainly don't want to spend all of it, but uh, where, where are the greatest needs there? Uh, certainly, I, I wish that the uh, sole decision was up to me and I got to just decide, but I get to work with a lot of my good friends and partners in the legislature on how we can do that. Certainly, I have some key priority areas, as I know they do as well. I uh, want to continue to invest in education because I know it's one of the different, biggest difference makers in the best places as a state that we can invest. One of the other things that I mentioned earlier that I want to continue to do is responsibly phase out the state income tax, things like this allow us to do that. We want to continue putting more money back into the pockets of our Kansans all over the state. And I think that we will have the opportunity to do that over the coming months. You, you mentioned the state income tax. And uh, of course, the, the rallying cry for a lot of people is, oh my God, we don't want to become Kansas because we've seen what happens if you don't cut responsibly. Um, cutting taxes is often seen as a way to drive economic development. Um, and, and I wonder what are some other creative ways that we can attract industry, uh, both recruit and retain beyond uh, income tax cuts? I certainly don't want to be like Kansas. Um, we are very competitive in that space, and uh, that's, I think, one of the key reasons that we have to do it slowly and over time and can't just flip a switch and make it happen overnight, even though we'd like to. Uh, but it is something we have to work towards and strive towards, and I think we can ultimately get there. Other things that we can do uh, that I think really help us change and grow economically Far and away, the number one thing I hear from every single business owner, every area of the state, it doesn't matter what type of industry you're in or what part of Arkansas you live in, the number one thing that every business owner will tell me that their challenge is, is workforce. So our task and one of the biggest things that we can do is help step up and build a skilled, qualified workforce. One, that's why education is so important as a foundation, because that's where it starts. If we don't get that right, all the other things we want to see happen, frankly, they won't matter. We can uh, try to recruit all the companies in the world that we want, but if we don't have actual workers that are skilled, qualified, and ready to step in and do the jobs that they're bringing, frankly, it doesn't matter. So addressing that shortage has to be a huge priority. It's why one of the very first things I did as governor was sign an executive order creating the workforce cabinet. I was shocked 
when the very first time I sat down with some of the leaders in agencies that are tasked with uh, working on workforce development. There are seven different state agencies that have a workforce, either office or component, under their umbrella. And I asked them, how often do you meet? And the guy said, well, we've never met. I said, I don't understand. How is that possible that this is literally the job that each of you have and you've never sat down at a table together and talked about what one another is doing? And he said, well, I don't know. We just, we haven't. And out of that conversation, the workforce cabinet was created. And not only are they tasked with actually sitting around the table talking about what they're doing, what's working, what's not working, but they have metrics and measurements that they have to meet. We don't want to just throw ideas out there. We want to make data-based informed decisions. And so that's what we're doing. There are things that we know that work. There are things we know that don't. But really leaning into this space has been a big priority. We also uh, created a position called the Chief Workforce Officer. And I hired a guy named Mike Rogers out of the private sector who had been working for one of the biggest companies here in the state uh, for the last two decades, going out recruiting and helping them find and train talent within their company. And so we took somebody with that private sector knowledge, brought them in and married them up with state government. And that's one of the biggest things is bringing all the stakeholders to the table. So often education operates in a silo over here. Your economic development team is in a silo over here. Your universities and community colleges, they don't even talk to each other. And they're in two totally different silos. Your business leaders, your community leaders, they're not all sitting at the same table saying, here's the problem. What are we going to do to work together to meet that demand and figure out the solution? And so that's what we've done. I think that Arkansas has the ability to frankly really draw the blueprint and show the country what it looks like to do workforce development correctly and I feel very confident that we're going to be able to really change the game and that will be one of the biggest things that differentiates us not only from keeping companies that we already have here to grow and to expand but also the ability to be to recruit and bring new investment and new business into the state of Arkansas. Switch, switching gears, I have one more question that we'll open up to you guys. Um, well, that's also, all the time we have for today. Oh, gotta go. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, while we're on the subject of economic development, uh, it's been no secret that the outdoor economy has a big, been a big focal point. Uh, we had the opportunity to hear from the first gentleman and others uh, a few months ago uh, about the uh, uh, outdoor uh, council. Um, I'm curious, and you alluded to this some in the State of the State address to kick us off, but why was this personally important to you, and, and how do you see this actually being a, a driver of economic development for the state? I, I think one of the, the biggest ways is right now our tourism industry is our number two industry in the state, uh, and growing that helps us uh, do some of the other things that we want to see happen invest more in education, uh, invest more in public safety, phase out our state income tax. As much as I wish that we could cut government enough to get rid of our state income tax, that's just not the reality. You can't cut your way out of that. You're going to have to grow different sectors of our economy. And one of the biggest and most unique selling propositions we have as a state is our outdoor economy. And one of the most amazing things about it is it's something that can be enjoyed year round. A lot of other states can't tell that story the way that Arkansas can. There's a reason that Arkansas's nickname and our motto is the natural state. It's because we have unbelievable natural resources and natural beauty right here in Arkansas. And we need more people to understand that here in our state, but also around the country and come experience what Arkansas has to offer, whether it's hiking, biking, fishing, hunting. Uh, there's so many bird watching. I've learned is actually a very big industry in the state of Arkansas to bring people in uh, to spend their time and their money in our state parks, our restaurants, our hotels. All of those areas benefit by our tourism industry. And we have, like I said, unbelievable natural beauty and we should be uh, experiencing it ourselves and helping other people see what we have to offer and growing that industry as much as possible. 
All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, we're going to open it up to the floor for member questions. Well, that and I was think quick, we have, uh, we, have runners, we have runners with mics. Right, Kenny. He looked way too prepared and excited to ask a question. Front row so, seat. so I first want to, forget my voice, I first want to thank you for leading by example with your intern program because you have given kids the opportunity to start careers of which we're going to have a meeting coming up shortly. So thank you for doing that. My question is, in the perfect world, not holding your feet to the fire on this, what would you love to have as the progression of the reduction of that state income tax? So we've done a quarter, we've done a half, you know, and I understand you've got to adjust that based on a lot of factors, but in your perfect world, what would you like to see? I mean, in a perfect world, I'd like to see it at zero. I, I, I mean, I, I think you have to be careful because the economy and the environment can shift, um, and that's why we have to do it over time and we can't just immediately take it to zero. The good news is Arkansas's economy is really strong. It's doing very well. Uh, people are working, and Arkansas is rising, which means we have more of an ability to do it faster. Um, I'd like to see it during my time as governor, certainly, uh, over the course of the next seven and a half years. But I, I think the key is not doing it fast or on a specific timeline, but it's making sure that we get it right so that we don't hurt programs and care that we offer through the state. So as my diplomatic answer, Kenny, of saying I'm not going to answer that question completely. So. Oh, go ahead. I'd like to ask about the aviation and aerospace industry and what you see in its future, and if you could expand upon what, uh, how, how your trip to the Le Bourget Air Show was. Absolutely. I, I think this is one of the spaces that Arkansas has so much opportunity. One thing that a lot of people probably don't know is now our number one export, just over a billion dollars, is our aerospace industry, and it is absolutely booming, and I think it will only continue to grow and expand from where we are right now. We had the opportunity to travel with uh, Secretary McDonald and Clint O'Neill, uh, the head of AEDC, to the Paris Air Show and meet with leaders in aerospace and technology industry from literally all over the world, and they love working in Arkansas. Uh, some of the biggest names in this space already have operations here, and I expect us to be able to announce expansions of some of those operations as well as the recruitment of new ones over the next couple of years. This is an incredible opportunity. That industry is doing this. It's not going anywhere. It's going to continue to grow and I want it to grow right here in Arkansas and I think we have uh, all of the components necessary but I will say the biggest thing and I already mentioned it so I don't want to sound too much like a broken record that we heard from every single one of those meetings that we sat down with is we need Arkansas to step up on the workforce side and so we heard uh, their request, and we're going to do everything we can to meet that demand and make sure uh, Arkansas not only meets expectations but exceeds them when it comes to workforce and meeting uh, the needs that that industry has. So what I wanted to ask about, going back to literacy, and I applaud you for those efforts because I agree, it is a huge problem. And but. We have some incredibly rural parts of the state, as we all know. So some of those services that can wrap around kids in central Arkansas, northwest Arkansas, and other more populated parts of the state, those services exist. But is there an effort for the companies that provide some of those services to move into some of the more rural parts of the state? Any incentives to get them to do that? And then how could we as business help help achieve that and help those children. I know several of us have, have helped, you know, kind of coaching, but that's not that intense work those children need. So how can we, you know, get those companies moving into all parts of our state to be able to help those children? Well, one of the best ways, and thank you for certainly your question and your willingness to, to help and put some skin in the game, because I think our business and community leaders stepping up and engaging certainly makes a huge difference. The government cannot fix this problem on its own. Uh, we certainly can help, but it's going to take that partnership. And so thank you for your willingness to do it. Uh, I, I think one of the big things that helps encourage those types of companies to go is to know that they're going to get paid. And when the state is 
providing the funding for the services, that incentivizes them to want to go into those schools that need it the most when they know on the back end that someone is going to pick up the tab. And the state has committed to doing that. So that's step number one that makes a difference. Also, those 120 literacy coaches, some of those areas will be the number one location that those individuals be, will be deployed to because those are some of the spaces uh, that we have the lowest performing numbers that we really need to boost and do that intense kind of immersion services. So those are some of the key pieces, but I think that the community and business leaders working with the schools, helping, stepping up, and being partners in the process will be a huge differentiator uh, for some of those communities having success. However, I think it's really important to note that some of the counties in our state with the very best reading scores are our rural counties. So don't discount uh, just because they are smaller and rural. Those are some of the highest performing areas that we have anywhere in Arkansas. And you would be shocked probably to hear that some of our lowest performing are in some of our more populated areas. Uh, and so it's not always just about resources, um, but we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can from a state perspective to look at where are those uh, lowest performing data points and how do we raise those up so that we're competitive across the state. Uh, Governor, I want to compliment you on these all these positive programs you have going, and they're very encouraging. Uh, and I hope I'm wrong, but it would seem like to me for us to get to our goals, it'll go past your seven and a half years left. How do you see it continuing after that? Or how, how do you... Well, I'd like to think we'll get it all done in seven and a half, but... What we don't, I, th I think we, you know, have to look to who's next and uh, our legislators and our community leaders and our business leaders and everyone coming together as a state and focusing on these key priority issues that we know are going to make a difference between whether our state is first, second, and third uh, in education, workforce development, uh, economic development, health care, safety or if we're going to be 48th and 49th. I'm focused on moving us up, and I'm going to do that as quickly as possible and try to get as much done in seven and a half years as I can. Who's after that is probably going to depend a lot more on the people in this room than it is me. All right, our last question is going to be right here. Thank you. Sarah, I know we need uh, the third graders need to be reading so we can develop our workforce. Our sixth graders need to be worked on so they don't graduate, go on up without any education. But we have a workforce out there that needs to be educated, and that's the people that got out of high school and really didn't succeed and didn't go anywhere. We have people coming out of prison. Those people are ready. What are we doing for adult education, adult training, um, those things that can really create some high-paying jobs? We already have those people sitting there. How do we go get them, and what do we do with them? I, I think you are exactly right. It's one of the best pipelines of workers that we can find um, are these people that we can help bring additional skills and training to so that they're actually in the workforce instead of dependent on the system. That's the ultimate goal. So we've done things that I think help on a high school level, but those individuals, the adult education, we're investing in some of the workforce and training programs at our prisons, working with Secretary Perfury, who is doing uh, a great job of first taking an assessment of where we are, what's working. But one of the biggest things that we didn't have uh, that I think helps put us in a better uh, long-term strategy is we created uh, a job and training database so that we have one central location that uh, individuals who want to go to work, companies who want to hire, uh, a one-stop shop for anybody looking to uh, be part of workforce in some capacity can go. So if you are someone who has graduated from high school but has no additional training or uh, skill that you need to take into the marketplace, you can go and say, look, I want to make $60,000 a year. Here's a job or two that I'm interested in. What does it take 
to get the training skills I need. Here's where I can go to get it. Here are places that will help pay for me to get that training. And here are jobs that will be available on the back end. So we've created this database. We're still adding to and developing. Uh, but people can start to use that as a great resource so that we kind of have that one-stop shop that helps streamline the process so more people have information at their fingertips. That's a good starting place. But having more and more people engage in that system, people who are ready to hire that are putting those jobs up there, working closely with our community colleges, our trade and our vocational training programs is going to be absolutely critical and key. Um, and we're investing pretty heavily, particularly over the next uh, several months into those specific programs that will help us, I think, create that pipeline from a very... Uh, ready, willing, and able group of people that frankly have sat on the sidelines for far too long. Uh, thank you guys for the questions. Governor Sanders, thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. Thank you guys so much. you're with teachers because I actually know you're supposed to respond to a good morning. <laughs> thank you, Stacy, so much for the very kind introduction. And thank you to all of the administrator support staff and teachers for joining us so bright and early. You know, as a mom of three kids, uh, I know that kids can keep us humble and keep us in check. And nobody knows that better than teachers who spend all day, every day, in a classroom getting uh, feedback from their constituents. As a mom, I get to feel those moments pretty regularly at my own house. I have three kids, Scarlett, Huck, and George. They're 11, 9, and 8. And when Scarlett was about seven years old and getting ready for her first ever father-daughter dance, it was a really big deal at our house. She had clearly seen one too many princess movies because she had this perfect vision of what that night was supposed to look like. And it was my job to execute it flawlessly. So we spent all day making sure she had the dress, the hair, the nails, everything just right. And Scarlett didn't just want to go to the dance. She wanted the big reveal. She wanted to come down the stairs and her Prince Charming, my husband Brian, to be standing there with a very specific flower in his hand waiting to whisk her off for the night of her life. So I'm sitting upstairs, I'm putting the final touches on Scarlett. And as I'm sitting there, I'm sharing this, what I think is a very special mother-daughter moment. I'm telling Scarlett how proud we are of her, how grateful we are to be her parents, how beautiful she is, on the inside and the out. And as I'm having this incredibly special, heartfelt moment with Scarlett, I started to get pretty emotional, started to tear up. And as I'm crying, my sweet, beautiful daughter reaches up, pats my shoulder, and says, it's okay, Mommy. One day, you can be pretty, too. <laughs> so just when you think for a second, you kind of got it figured out, kids will put you right back in your place. And I know that there is nobody that understands and appreciates that more than the people in this room here today. It is an absolute honor to get to address Arkansas educators. Through your work, you touch so many lives, you change so many students, and you literally create success stories. I know this because my own life was changed by great teachers. I think back to when I was in the ninth grade at Pulaski Heights Junior High. I just moved to Little Rock from Texarkana. And let's be honest, junior high is hard enough without having to contend with a new city, new classmates, and a new school. I was absolutely terrified. My civics teacher, Mr. Stewart, took pity on me and he worked hard day after day and convinced me to join our team's mock trial. At first, I was incredibly reluctant. After all, how would debating my new classmates actually help them like me more? But he wore me down, and eventually I joined the team, and it gave me confidence in front of a crowd. 
new friends that I thought I would never have, and the amazing opportunity to go to the national mock trial competition. Only a few months ago, I had the opportunity to welcome this year's national mock trial championship teams to Little Rock, Arkansas, this time as the governor of the state. Mr. Stewart taught me confidence, but by the time I got to college, I think I had learned that lesson just a little too well. In my first semester at Washtenaw Baptist University, I signed up for Dr. Down's upper level communications class. Our first assignment was a 20 page paper and I knew I was gonna ace it. As this cocky freshman, I came in thinking I had all the answers. The day after I turned in my essay, Dr. Downs asked me to stay after class. I saw that he figured he wanted to tell me congratulations in person for the spectacular work that I had turned in. Needless to say, that wasn't quite the case. He handed me back my paper and it looked like a cow had been slaughtered on that 20 page essay. It was covered in red ink from front to back. He told me that he knew I had potential and that I could do better and that this was not even close to what he expected from me. And he gave me the opportunity to rewrite that paper because he knew I could do it better. And as much as I hated to admit it at the time, he was right. I rewrote that paper and I got an A. I went on and signed up for every single class that Bill, Down, Bill Downs taught because I knew he would force me to work hard and be the very best student that I could be. If those two teachers hadn't encouraged me, hadn't pushed me, and most importantly, hadn't believed in me, I would not be standing here today as the governor of Arkansas. Those are the kind of effects that teachers can have on their students. Every single day, you literally shape the next generation of Arkansans. I came into office to be the education governor and I signed Arkansas Learns into law to fulfill that promise. But I know that nothing we do in state government will ever be effective if we do not give our teachers the resources that they need to succeed. That's why I prioritized raising teacher pay, going from the starting salary to $50,000 and giving every teacher at least a $2,000 raise. I know that not only have I learned from my teachers, my kids have as well. They regularly bring home the lessons that they learn. Not too long ago, I was standing in our kitchen, our bedrooms on the floor above. I'm standing there talking to my other two kids and I notice our third child is missing as water starts to pour into our kitchen. Not drip, literally pour into the kitchen. So I race upstairs to see what's going on. And as I step into the bathroom, my youngest son, George, he'll love this story when he's older, is standing there completely naked with a plunger in his hand, one foot on the toilet, one on the bathtub, and about two to three inches of standing water covering the floor. I'm like, George, what in the world is happening? He turns to me and he said, it's okay, mommy. My teacher says, everybody makes mistakes. <laughs> I know the difference that you're making. I know the impact that you're having. And I know that we will not stop until we make sure that our teachers have the resources they need to continue to be successful. Arkansas is gonna continue to move up. Investing in our teachers, rewarding their hard work is only the beginning. We have made that move to take Arkansas from 48th in the nation for starting salaries all the way to the top five. When you adjust that for cost of living, Arkansas is now number one in the country for starting teacher pay. And this isn't just a one-time raise. The state will pay for it in perpetuity. This puts Arkansas on a level playing field with every state in the country, helping us to not only recruit but also retain the very best and brightest teachers in our classrooms. For our veteran teachers, we're offering thousands of dollars in bonuses and student loan forgiveness for those that are transforming student lives. 
We're also tackling early literacy through a massive investment in public schools, through literacy coaches, tutoring grants, and the proven practices that we know will allow every student to succeed. We've invested in high school skills training, school safety, and early childhood education. And this is just the beginning. I know these changes will be at the top of your discussion at this year's summit. My administration is here to help answer any questions you may have and help make this transition as smooth as possible. That's because we know that quality schools are only possible with quality teachers. We're here to support you in any way that we can. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for what you do every single day. Most importantly, thank you for committing yourselves to the lives of the students here in the state of Arkansas. Thank you for letting me be a part of the summit. God bless you, and let's have a great fall school year. All the best. Um, she went to our opposing school. I'm a part of you, grad. Uh, they beat us quite a few times. Um, I can't. <laughs> That's actually true. Uh, I wish I would have uh, been able to play in those games. I was, I, I was never starting, so if I had started, it would have been different. Uh, but anyway, um, you, you, when, you, when you are from the area, when you uh, understand the importance of education and, and you realize how it's impacted you, um, you have a special passion and a special heart uh, for this area and, and that you want to see our youth in Central Arkansas succeed. And that's been not only her priority for Central Arkansas, but Arkansas overall. And we want to be a part of the effort to show that there are new opportunities and new innovative ways to educate our youth and prepare them for life after high school. And we want them to know that life after high school uh, doesn't mean that you have to leave Arkansas in order to achieve success, that you can have it right here. You can have it right here in our state, right here in our community. And we have those opportunities. And through her efforts, uh, we're going to be able to expand. We're going to be able to show Central Arkansas that those opportunities are available for our youth. And we're able to continue that and work with a system that is able to uh, allow us uh, to provide those educational opportunities for them. That includes internships. Uh, cadet programs, uh, scholarships and grants, as well as job opportunities uh, after graduation. So, Governor, appreciate all the effort and all the time you put into this. We know how important it is. We know the challenges that Arkansas has faced throughout the years, and I believe that we have a realistic plan now that can move us forward in education. So, ladies and gentlemen, your governor, Governor Sanders. so much and good morning. I am uh, really glad to see that uh, your wife is it looks like started speaking to you again so um, that's a very positive step but most importantly I'm glad that whatever way it happened that you woke up and made it here this morning. One because we would be lost without you but more importantly because I know that under your leadership this place in particular, these cadets are going to absolutely thrive and really change our state for the better. So thank you for your willingness to step up and take on this challenge, and we know you're going to do a phenomenal job leading. I'm so excited that I get to be here today for this grand opening because it is such a positive and big step for our state. You know, I get to do a lot of different events and go to a lot of special moments, but very few are quite as promising and optimistic as this one. Last week, I had a chance to visit Little Rock's Korean War Memorial and mark the 75th anniversary of the Korean War Armistice. It was a powerful event, but more powerful than the event itself was the speech given by a man named Floyd Brantley. Floyd is a 96-year-old veteran from Conway who served in World War II. I met Floyd more than a decade ago when he came to Washington, D.C. for an honor flight. Despite the fact that Floyd is nearly 100 years old, he still probably has more energy than every person in this room combined. And he always brightens the day and puts a smile on every person's face that he encounters. He has a shirt that he loves to wear that says, hug a vet, even the old ones. Over the course of 96 years on this earth and three major wars, 
he still finds a way to make every single person's day better. Our veterans are truly the very best of our country. Today, we're inaugurating a facility that will usually serve people who are about 80 years younger than Floyd Brantley. But the same values that pushed him to serve our country in some of our very darkest hours will be the same behind this new academy. Values like bravery, servant leadership, and patriotism. I cannot think of a better set of ideas to instill in our young people or a better way to prepare them for a lifetime of success. Someday when we're all gone, there will be another Floyd who started his career right here at this academy. And just as Floyd is to us, that future leader will be a living reminder to the next generation of the true meaning of service. So thank you to the community leaders who have stepped up that are behind this facility. And thank you to the educators who will be teaching classes here. But most of all, thank you to the students, or as I've learned this morning, the cadets who will be walking these halls in just a few short weeks. They are truly not just the future of our state, but the future of our country. And they're getting their start right here in Little Rock, Arkansas. We are so proud of you. And we are so proud of the work that will happen here and what it means for our entire country. Thank you so much for letting me be here for this special day today. Thank you and God bless. You know, with an introduction like that, you should quit right away. It's one of the things I love about the Delta, they'll claim every vote no matter who gave it to you, so I appreciate that. You know, one of the things I love about Bishop Carter is I gave him a compliment and he immediately gave it to his wife. So Bishop, I'm going to give you my husband Brian's number here in just a minute so you can remind him of how that works. But, you know, they joke that you wear many hats, but nobody wears a suit quite as well as you do. I told him he's the best dressed man here and always is, and he said it's your doing. He has nothing to do with it, so keep up the good work. It is such a great time to be back here in Helena. Uh, just an incredible community and wonderful to be here and have good news to share. I want to thank John Edwards for hosting this event and for all of the business leaders, not just those who spoke, but all of those that are here in the room who continue to invest in this community and in this region. The Delta is one of the richest, culturally rich areas of our entire state. It has some of the best food, the best people, the best music. I grew up coming and watching my dad play at the King Biscuit Blues Festival every year right here in Helena. And he's not a bad guitar player, so I was uh, always glad that they let him up on stage. Came here eating tamales made by Joe St. Columbia pretty regularly and try to get those every time I'm in the area. And one of my favorite things I love to do when I'm in this part of the state is to go duck hunting. And I'm especially excited to go as governor. This will be my first season that I get to actually go as the governor of the state. And the reason I'm excited about that is because when I was a kid, and my dad went with my brothers not too far from here for the first time as governor. They went out and they're sitting in the blind and the ducks come in and everybody shoots. And immediately they start congratulating my dad. Amazing, great shot, governor. Wonderful. My brother looks over and goes, at least make him fire his gun first. <laughs> so much like the way that the voting works, the duck hunting claims go the same way in this area, and I'm pretty excited about taking credit probably for a lot of ducks I don't shoot too. But there's so many other great things that are happening here and across our state. Arkansas's economy is taking off, not just here, but all over. We have the lowest unemployment rate in our state's history, and job growth is soaring. Companies are paying attention, and they're starting to invest heavily in Arkansas. I know the previous speakers gave a rundown of our announcements today, but I want to reiterate just how major this news is for Helena and the surrounding region. The Helena Health Foundation is bringing a brand new water supply online for this city and its harbor. The Helena Harbor Industrial Complex is building 4,000 acres of prime development opportunity on one of the finest harbors on all of the Mississippi. Skates Group and Helm Fertilizer 
will make this city a focal point in fertilizer transport. And Schooler Grain Biodiesel is charting new and innovative ways to power America right here in Helena. And Poinsett Rice and Grain is doubling down on Arkansas status as America's rice capital to bring even more of this homegrown product straight to the market. And I couldn't be more grateful for these businesses to de decision to invest in Arkansas and especially here in the Delta. In my administration, we're doing all we can to make announcements like this routine, not the exception. I ran to be Arkansas's education governor because I know that quality schools are how we take students off the path of poverty and put them onto a lifetime path of success. Arkansas Learns is going into effect as we speak, raising teacher pay, investing in literacy, and expanding education freedom to every family in the state. One of the very first meetings that I had as governor was right here in this area. We gathered with education leaders, superintendents, principals, at the request of Senator Murdoch, who I saw sneak in here a minute ago. There you are. And Senator Linda Chesterfield, we came here and we met with those education leaders. And some of the ideas that they presented that day are reflected in the final piece of the LEARNS legislation. And we're going to continue fighting to make sure that every single family in the state, every student, has access to a quality education. We're making major changes to bring Arkansans off the sidelines and into the labor force. And we have a lot more of that coming. We're cutting taxes, we're cleaning up crime, and we're investing in tourism, all to make Arkansas the best place in the country to live, to work, and to raise a family. It's an honor to be back here in Helena, and I can't thank these business leaders enough for their willingness to continue to invest here. Together, we will grow this region. We will continue to make Arkansas the best state in the country. Thank you so much for letting me be here and for all of your work to make Helena such a great place. Appreciate it. Thank you all so much for joining us here this morning. Last week, our state lost a deeply dedicated public servant. Mark Lowry spent decades serving the people of the state that he loved so much. And he spent much of his career focused on something that I too am very passionate about, improving our state's education system. I was saddened that his term was cut so short and so sudden. And I know our entire state is grieving for Mark's family, friends, and the Treasury office staff. But today I have a responsibility to fill that role and choose a new person to fill Mark's position until 2025. And I'm pleased to announce that I've selected another longtime public servant, Larry Walther, to fill this role. Larry, I clearly did something right because of the seven months I've been in office, we've never gotten that kind of applause for literally anything that I've done. It's standing yeah. <laughs> we, we don't bring chairs in this room on purpose, so every, every applause is a standing ovation. But to anyone who's ever dipped their toe into Arkansas state government over the past couple of decades, then Larry Walter is no stranger to you. I first got to know Larry when he served under my dad as director of the Arkansas Economic Development Commission, and my dad is here joining us this morning. My dad plucked Larry out of a very successful career in the private sector and made him our government's face to businesses around the world. Larry and I got even closer a few years ago when I actually moved into a house that he used to live in. During Litterock's massive snowstorm, Two years ago, our water line burst in our house, and it started flooding into our kitchen. I searched desperately, along with my husband Brian, all over our yard trying to find the water line so we could shut it off, but because of the deep snow, we couldn't locate it. It was the middle of the night, it was freezing cold, but I decided it was enough of an emergency that I would still call Larry and ask for his help. And sure enough, Larry answered the phone. Of course, he didn't have a clue where that water line was either. <laughs> but his amazing wife, Janice, did. And she gave me step-by-step -step instructions 
walk 10 feet out and take another 10 feet to your left and start digging and you will find that water line. And she was exactly right. We located that water line and shut it off with Larry and Janice on the phone the entire time. It's no surprise that even though it was late and a snowstorm, Larry answered the phone. As many of you know, we lost Janice in May of this year and Larry was by her side the entire time. 53 years of marriage. Larry embodies servant leadership with his family, with his friends, and during every step of his career. At AEDC, Larry brought businesses and jobs to our state. He served as director of the U.S. Trade and Development Agency and on the board of directors for the Export-Import Bank and as DFNA's chief fiscal officer, where he worked to streamline the entire agency. And anybody who knows anything about that agency, if you can streamline anything, much less the entire agency, it is an absolute success story. He moved nearly every single service that DFNA offers online and made Arkansas one of the first states in the country to provide online vehicle registration. <laughs> it wasn't just a way to save the state money, it saved countless hours for every Arkansan. Larry was gracious enough to gracious enough to continue in his role when I became governor, shepherding us to a historic government surplus. And today, he's continuing that legacy of public service as Arkansas's treasurer. We need a steady hand and a savvy head for business to oversee our state's investments, and Larry has both. Thank you for your willingness to step up and take over this position. I have no doubt that you will bring the same level of excellence and servant leadership to this role as you have every single thing that you have ever done. We are so excited and honored for you to help continue to lead our state. And with that, I will turn it over to our next Arkansas Treasurer, Larry Walther. Thank you, Governor Sanders. First, I want to say how deeply saddened I am at the passing of Treasurer Mark uh, Lowry. I'm sorry, I'm uh, I got a little emotional there. It's, kind of a, it's been a really tough year for me. He was a friend, and he was a professional uh, in his job, and he and I were, had a very close relationship. He, he was certainly worthy of all the accolades and expressions of love that have been shared by so many in these last few days. I know it has been a difficult time for the Treasury staff. My role as Secretary of DFA, I have had the opportunity to work closely with the Office of Treasurer. I understand how important your role is in the economic well-being of our state. I've made a commitment to the Governor, and I make the same commitment to each of you here today and to the people of Arkansas to coordinate a smooth transition and to perform the duties of the office with integrity. Governor, I want to say to you how much I appreciate your trust. What an honor it has been to serve as Secretary of DFA and as a member of your cabinet. I look forward to continually working with you, alongside you as the constitutional officer and spending and serving the citizens of the state of Arkansas to the best of my ability. To the staff of the Department of Finance and Administration, it has been a true privilege to lead you. Very few understand all the diverse, complicated, and critical work that is done in, on the day-to-day -day basis at the Department of De uh, Finance and Administration. Um, I want you to know and understand and make no mistake about it, I appreciate you Im immensely. Uh, and you have, have it, I'm, I'm sorry, and you have made it easy. The success that we have achieved as an organization is because there are hundreds of wonderful public servants whose attitudes, work ethic, and professionalism are second to none. I have been fortunate. I've been fortunate in my career to, to work with 
very remarkable, dedicated teams. And Governor, I count D your DFA team is among the best. I'd also like to thank my family for being here, my daughter Mandy, my uh, son-in-law Justin Carswell, my grandson uh, Jack, who's uh, home from uh, West Point. He's a senior at West Point this, this semester. Real proud of you, son. And thank you for being here. My friends who are here, I apologize. I'm a little emotional. It's been a really tough year for me. And, uh, and uh, I'm, I miss my wife, and I wish she were here to, to be with me to enjoy the, the, this uh, announcement and this uh, responsibility that the governor has given me. Thank you to my friends who are here, the cabinet, constitutional officers. I've had a great relationship with each and every one of you. I, I appreciate y'all, and I look forward to continuing to work with you on an ongoing basis. So again, Governor, it's an honor to be chosen by you to serve as treasurer of the state of Arkansas. Thank you. I always have to do this, uh, so that's okay. I'm used to it. Well, good morning, everyone, and, and uh, thank you, Rajesh, for, for all those kind words. And uh, you, you uh, often remind me how old I am, so thank you for that 30 years. So I am proud to be here, and uh, thank you to everyone to celebrate this outstanding accomplishment uh, that we together uh, achieved. So I want to especially recognize the partnership between the city of Little Rock the state of Arkansas and, the, and Dollar General. You see, at Dollar General, our mission of serving others is something that we continuously strive to be a force for opportunity for our customers, our employees, and the local communities we serve. Across the state of Arkansas, we proudly employ more than 4,700 residents in 550 stores, which have been proudly serving customers with convenient access to affordable household essentials for nearly 50 years. Now, just north of here, we're under construction on our $140 million North Little Rock Distribution Center, which we expect to be operational next year. We're excited about this new facility as it allows us to further invest in this community, and we're proud to say it'll create nearly 300 jobs. A Dollar General we like to say we're America's general store, the neighborhood general store. And while we're not a grocer, we understand millions of Americans and their families rely on Dollar General to provide convenient access to affordable and nutritious foods, as well as the health and wellness offerings we provide. We recognize that each community is unique, and we continuously evaluate and innovate our store formats so that we can better meet the needs of each community that we serve. You're seeing this here in Little Rock through the number of adapt adaptations we've made in your local stores, specifically around expanded produce offerings, our Better For You program, which offers a variety of ways to eat more, nu more nutritionally and healthfully for our customers, our DG Wellbeing, which includes an expanded healthcare offering, and Feeding America donations and much, much more. So let's talk about the expanded produce. We are so pleased that more than 200,000 Little Rock residents now have additional and affordable access to fresh fruits and vegetables at their local Dollar General store. In fact, 12 Little Rock Dollar Generals now carry fresh produce. And nationally, we have plans to expand this to a total of more than 5,000 stores by the end of January 2024, which will give Dollar General more individual points of produce distribution than any other U.S. mass retailer or grocer. Plus, our Better For You program with a registered dietitian and nutritionist provides recipes to make healthier meals for items purchased at our stores. DG Wellbeing, it's aimed at solving health care access issues and provides additional health and wellness products for our customers. We're helping to address food insecurity nationwide through our Feeding America partnership. And right here in Little Rock, 
Donations to the Arkansas Food Bank are helping feed and nourish neighbors in need. At Dollar General, we understand the positive impacts these changes are making here in this community. And it serves to strengthen our commitment to help fight food access and insecurity and to provide healthier food options in small town and big cities across the country, often in places where other retailers either cannot go or will not go to serve. All of us at Dollar General take very seriously our role as a resource for communities. And I'd like to thank several of the exceptional DG leaders here to celebrate with me uh, here in Little Rock and their focus that has helped us make many of our stores updated so that we can bring you the, the, uh, the products that you need and our soon to be new distribution facility. I'd like to ask those leaders here today to stand and be recognized. If you're with Dollar General, please stand so folks can recognize you. That's where the real work happened. The success in Little Rock are only possible because of the constructive partnerships among the corporate community and nonprofit and government sectors. I'd like to thank Governor Sanders, alongside state and local officials, and the Greater Little Rock Chamber of Commerce for being here today. And a special thanks to Hugh McDonald for his thought partnership and collaboration. We look forward to additional conversation in ways that together we can collectively serve Arkansas today and in the future. Thank you very much for all that you do, and thank you for allowing Dollar General to serve this great state. Thank you. What an amazing day. Um, you know, Jeff, I, I, I want to echo what you said about this is where the work gets done, because as uh, Governor Sanders knows as Congressman Hill, Congressman Crawford, Mayors um, Scott and Hartwick know, uh, we get to stand up here and take credit for what a whole lot of other people do. And, and so first of all, I want to say thank you and recognize 50 for the Future President, Lisa Farrell. I saw her a few minutes ago. Lisa's over here. She and 50 for the Future have played a huge role in this because this truly is regional economic development and partnerships at its finest. As we were walking through the process of this project, Governor, uh, we started uh, talking to Dollar General about opportunities that really weren't about a distribution center. We had talked to uh, different groceries, uh, grocers and grocery stores and, and operators about the possibility of adding some, uh, some product in places where we, we, the people of Little Rock, needed it. And in the process, working with Steve Brophy and obviously Jeff's team, we were able to start that pilot project here in Little Rock while our friends in North Little Rock were helping build a state-of-the-art distribution center. And uh, Robert Birch and his team, Daryl Hartwick is here. Let's give them a big round of applause as well. It is, it's truly a team effort, and that's one of the wonderful things about being a part of this regional partnership. Uh, most of the time, your team never knows who we work for because we all work for you as we're trying to get these things done. And the next person I would like to bring to the microphone is, is certainly uh, a representative of that type of hard work. She's the 47th governor of Arkansas, inaugurated on January the 10th of this year. She's the first woman to serve as governor of the state and currently the youngest governor in the country. Since taking office, she has enacted transformational conservative reforms. Those include Arkansas Learns, a sweeping overhaul of Arkansas's education system, including higher teacher pay and universal school choice, public safety reforms to invest in prison space and to get repeat offenders off of our streets, tax cuts to give more taxpayer money back to our Kansans, the Natural State Initiative to grow our outdoor economy and reforms to streamline state government. She's been recognized in Fortune and Time magazine as their 40 under 40 leaders. She's the author of a New York Times bestseller, Speaking for Myself, a former Fox News Channel contributor, and she's also served on the Fulbright board. Thankfully, 
and we're very thankful. She lives here in Little Rock, is the governor of Arkansas with her husband, Brian, their children, Scarlett, Huck, and George, and maybe one of my favorite members of the family, their golden retriever traveler. Please welcome with me the governor of the great state of Arkansas, Sarah Huckabee Sanders. Thank you very much. Traveler's always everybody's favorite, so I'm learning to get over that. You know, Jay, you're exactly right. We get to come up here and take credit for a lot of things that so many people put so much hard work into. But I have to say, it's one of the benefits of being governor is that you get to claim uh, credit for a few things, even sometimes when you really didn't have that much to do with it. One of the reasons I'm super excited, as most people know, duck hunting is really big in the state of Arkansas. We like to uh, broadcast so that we're the duck hunting capital of the world. And this will be my first duck season to get to go duck hunting as governor. And I learned as a kid, my dad was governor of Arkansas for just under 11 years, that doing things as governor, you get some pretty great privileges. But duck hunting ranks at the top of that list. One of my favorite stories is the very first time that my dad went duck hunting as governor. He was with my brother who was an avid duck hunter. And they get out to the blind, the ducks come in, shots are fired, the ducks fall, and immediately the entire group that is hunting starts patting my dad on the back and telling him, great job, governor, great shot. And my brother turns to him and says, guys, at least make him fire his gun first. <laughs> so I'm pretty excited uh, to move into this first season and take credit for a lot of ducks. I may or may not actually shoot, but more importantly, I'm excited for the role that I do get to play and for the small part I get to be part of of so many amazing things that are currently taking place around our state. So many great things are happening in Arkansas and that is in large part because of the people that are sitting out in this room this morning. We have some of the best, some of the brightest, and some of the hardest working people in all of the country when it comes to economic development. Jay, you and your team have done a phenomenal job. Jeff, I promise you, you will not be sorry for investing and continuing to double down your efforts here in the state of Arkansas. It's great to be with uh, two of my favorite mayors here this morning, uh, making Central Arkansas look good every single day, and obviously our two of our uh, members of our federal delegation, Congressman Hill and Congressman Crawford, who do a phenomenal job representing our state and continuing to uh, voice conservative principles and causes for all our Kansans in Washington, D.C. And we have some amazing men and women that make up the Little Rock Chamber who certainly had a big part in making today's announcement happen. So I'm excited to get to be here and join forces with all of this group. Earlier this week, I was in Helena, Arkansas. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether you're in that part of the state in the rice fields of Arkansas or the rolling hills of the Ozarks. Every single place you go in Arkansas, there's a good chance that you're going to be very close to a Dollar General. Unfortunately, equally as possible is the fact that whether you're in a big community or a small town, uh, there's gonna be a lot of food insecurity across the state of Arkansas. It's one of the things that we have been dealing with uh, even more so over the last couple of years than ever before. And just as common in a one stoplight town as it is right here in Little Rock, many of our citizens are challenged with food insecurity. And as Jeff mentioned, Dollar General has stepped up to take that issue head on. And we're very thankful for your willingness to partner with us in fighting against that. Last year, his company announced that they would be rolling out fresh fruits and vegetables in 10 stores right here in Little Rock. And if the pilot program was successful, they did expand it to communities across the country. And only one year in, this initiative is already going extremely well. That's not only good news for our state, it's great news for our Kansans, and frankly, it's great news for Dollar General. And now this company is literally doubling down on its investment here in central Arkansas, creating 300 new jobs and investing $140 million into our state. Dollar General's new distribution center will make this region the center of the company's entire national supply chain. 
fresh fruits and vegetables won't be the only exciting thing too that our state will get to see. Dollar General is facing the same issues that every company is facing. One of the things that we've worked very diligently on since taking office is addressing the workforce shortage that exists not just in Arkansas but across the country. We know that you have the same challenges that every company across the country is facing, is meeting that workforce shortage. Arkansas is stepping up to help not only you, but every company that is in our state address that challenge. We wanna to continue to have more announcements like the one that we're having here this morning. We know that success starts with a good education. And I signed Arkansas Learns to raise teacher pay invest in literacy, and give education freedom to every family in the state. We're tackling the workforce shortage with our new workforce cabinet, and we're lowering taxes so we can compete with our neighbors in Tennessee and Texas. And for every new regulation our agencies make, we're taking two off the books. Today is a great day for Central Arkansas and our entire state, but the good things happening here won't stop today. This room is filled with men and women dedicated to growing Arkansas's economy and putting every single Arkansan on a path to success. And I know that if we keep working together, announcements like this will become regular and the norm, certainly not the exception. We're so grateful for the team at Dollar General, for our state and local leadership who have made today possible, and for all of us coming together to continue to watch Arkansas rise to the top. Thank you so much for what you're doing. We look forward to a great partnership, and we look forward to it even more. I know you don't like to make big investments of $140 million, but we'll be happy to take another one whenever you're ready. Thank y'all so much for being here today, and thank you again for the great partnership. Senator, again, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. Welcome to ASU Mountain Home. This is my alma mater, so it's a privilege to have everybody here tonight. So without further ado, it's my distinct honor and privilege to introduce my friend, the 47th Governor of the State of Arkansas, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, and Secretary of Education, Olivia. Thank you all so much. Jacob, I feel like we should quit right now. I was like, this is the, the best, we've well, done we, all, we've almost done, a dozen of these. This is the warmest, best welcome I think we've received, so well, thank we, you. We've done a lot of these and uh, certainly, we like this crowd the best of them all. Just don't tell anybody else in another part of the state and get us in trouble. But we are so thankful for your willingness to be here tonight. Uh, we know how hard it is to get out in the evening after you've put in a hard day of work, especially during the summer. And we are so grateful for your willingness to come out and spend a little bit of time with us here tonight. I am so unbelievably proud of why we are here. Today, August 1st, is the full enactment of the LEARNS Act, one of the most historic, comprehensive education reform packages in our state's history, and a truly transformational piece of legislation. And I see a number of our legislative friends and partners here on the front row, uh, and this would not have happened without their dedication, their diligence, and just their steadfast commitment to making sure that we delivered for the students and parents of this state. At the end of the day, I think like every person in this room, I'm a mom, I have three kids, and I'm frustrated. I'm tired of seeing our state at the bottom. I'm tired of Arkansas being 47th, 48th, 49th, and in many cases 50th in all the places that we want to be first and second. Places I know we have the capacity and the potential to be at the top, yet we've simply been satisfied and allowed ourselves to stay with and stick with the status quo. To me, that's unacceptable, because I know our kids deserve better, and I know we are capable as a state of doing better. And so that's exactly what the LEARNS legislation is all about. It's about taking our state to the top, and that's exactly what we've been able to do. We're gonna focus on things like major investment in our state's literacy. I'm tired of watching our kids compete at the very bottom, when only 35% of Arkansas third graders are reading at or above a third grade reading level, that's not good enough. We can do better, and we will. When our teachers are at the lowest end 
in teacher pay anywhere in the country, number 48. When we have the ability to be in the top five, that's exactly what we did through the Learns legislation. When we have the ability to empower parents to make the best decision possible about where and how their kids are educated, then we should do that. And that's what we were able to do and deliver through the Learns Act. I could not be more proud of what I think this means for our state and most importantly for our students. We want to spend tonight uh, not lecturing but listening. We're happy to answer as many questions as we can. We'll spend time working around the room. Uh, if people will just take time uh, and raise their hand, Secretary Leva and I will get to as many as we can because we're proud of this legislation. We want to make sure that we have the opportunity to get to as many places around the state as possible to talk about it. I think this is our ninth town hall, and we are so thankful again for your willingness to be here tonight, and we will certainly answer a lot of questions and hopefully have a little fun along the way. And with that, I will turn it over to Secretary Oliva, who I'm going to make show his socks because he's really proud of them. Well, they're, they're, and, uh, he, he uh, is very big on wearing fun, colorful socks, and I'll let you tell you tell let him tell you why he's wearing those today. But thank you again for being here tonight, and we look forward to a great back and forth and discussion with all of you. Jacob. Th th thank you. So th thank you, Governor Sanders, and I, I want to echo the sentiments and thank everybody for coming out and, and engaging in a conversation to help be more informed and learn about what is some of our agency's priorities and how can we overall improve student outcomes. So today is officially the day that the LEARNS bill goes from planning to implementation. So I'm thankful to Governor Sanders for the vision to help outline a blueprint that we're able to put into policy now that we're, we're going to be able to implement and see positive change. So I did wear um, cupcakes on my socks because I felt like it was a celebration. And if you're going to have a party, you can't not have a party without cupcakes, right? So I, I, I'm excited to, to be engaged in this work. And uh, if there's anything that we know in education is that a one-size-fits-all approach does not work. And if that's the way our system sailed up, is set up, then that system's not set up to make sure that all students are successful. And we know that I think we can do a little bit better job. And, and a lot of times I like to say bad systems be good people every time. So are we making sure we're building out the right system? So when you look at that kind of omnibus overall approach uh, to educational reform across the state, it's really from cradle to career. It starts at early learning, realigning early learning opportunities, making sure that every family that wants to participate in quality childcare and early learning environments have an opportunity to do so. Right now, that system's a little bit fragmented and it's not coordinated. LEARNS is pulling all of those programs under one agency so we can have a common vision of what does quality early learning look like and look at how we measure kindergarten readiness. We know those foundational years in literacy are critical. Investing in K2 by making sure teachers, the best teachers we can recruit, retain, and recognize, have access to high quality evidence-based curriculum and best practices that we know will help support students. Also access to literacy coaches. Access to parents that, that see that if their children are struggling, they have an opportunity to get additional tutoring and additional services outside of the school day. So really building out those foundational years. And then also looking at the different career path opportunities that students have all the way from elementary, middle, and high school. We know that every student is not on the highway to university. That may ultimately be the goal, but building out opportunities, one of the things that I'm really excited about with the LEARNS initiative is developing and implementing what's called a career high school diploma where we have students that are earning industry certifications, earning stackable credentials, credentials of value. How do we articulate into that into a high school diploma that they can then transfer to a receiving institution if they want to be able to do that? Right now, we have students that are completing those high quality programs while they're in high school. And depending on the receiving institution will depend whether or not they recognize those credentials uh, or certificates. And sometimes we tell students, well, you didn't earn it here. You have to start all over again. Well, that's not fair. And then we wonder why people get frustrated. So when we talk about moving the needle and, and we talk about kind of ranking in the bottom, U.S. News and World's report recently did a ranking. And I'm not saying it's the best methodology on how they look at education, but it looks at states and it starts all the way from how do you do with early learning, how do you do in K-12, and how do you do in post-secondary, and it ranks them 1 through 50. 
So when we look at where Arkansas ranked overall, the current ranking was 43. One of the things that I, that I found interesting is, is I've been able to go across uh, this wonderful state, meet with teachers, meet with superintendents, educational cooperatives, um, really get a kind of an update in the state of the state. I actually did a high school student panel discussion and it was with educators and these were students that were in high school that wanted to be aspiring teachers. And we were just talking about learns and, and improving outcomes and opportunities. And I remember I asked the students, I said, you know, US News and World's reports came out and ranked states in education. These are kids in 10th, 11th, and going into 12th grade. I said, where does Arkansas rank? Oh, probably 50th. These are our own students saying, not one of them said anything higher than 45. So when we look at uh, the system, I think it lo we look at opportunity. And, and if our students don't have hope or belief that they're getting the best educational opportunities, then sometimes the system is failing them, which is why we're really excited to start with, with Learns Implementation. And one of the things that, that I've learned as we've been moving forward is there's a lot of misinformation out there. And there's a lot of people that have really wonderful questions. And there's a lot of opportunity to continue this momentum to get even better. So as I went to every single co-op and met with the superintendent and reported back to the governor about how productive these conversations have been, is one of the, is one of the outcomes of this is let's have some town hall meetings and meet with community members and talk to them about what we're doing and hear what kinds of questions they have and have an opportunity to engage in dialogue so how we can work together to improve and see better outcomes. So thank you for being here today. We're really excited to engage in some questions. And with that, we will open it up. If you guys have a question, feel free to raise your hand. Uh, Becca and Catherine are here, and we'll walk around with the microphone so everybody can hear the question as you have it. And if nobody has one, then I will call on Secretary Oliva to sing and dance, and nobody wants we to see not. that. So. Well, we can sing uh, like a happy There's birthday song. One right here, song. Catherine. Happy Learns Day yeah. to you. With the state's current uh, budget surplus, which you should be very proud of, will any of this money be guided to help the LEARNS Act and help uh, the teachers with um, payments, uh, increased salary, and uh, you know, maybe work some of that money um, to your program? Thank you. You know, I wish that they would let me just decide where all of the surplus money got spent. Unfortunately, I have to work with all my friends here on the front row to make that decision. But I'm confident that we will work together closely to do things like investing further in education, as well as passing that savings on to the taxpayer. One of the things I've been very vocal about and going to continue to be focused on, and one of the things I'm very proud that we were able to do this legislative session, was continue chipping away at our state's income tax. And we're going to keep doing that. And having a budget surplus like this allows us to keep doing that. So we're going to keep putting our heads down working aggressively to phase that out over time and also focus on investing in things like education and public safety, which is certainly a priority that I have that I know I share with my friends in the legislature. That's the long answer to say we're going to have to figure that out and we're going to have to do it together. And they're not going to let me do it all by myself. But if you want to change that, I'm happy <laughs> to uh, take on that responsibility and uh, do that all by myself. But you'll have to talk to these guys for that. And thank you for your question. We'll jump here and then we'll pop over. OK. Um, Governor, thank you. Um, we talk about money. And uh, we've heard so many times that throwing money at uh, problems doesn't seem to fix it. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of the, this is an old program, PISA program. Uh, and I did a, a little study on that in this, for the state of Arizona. And as the funding went up, more money was allocated into administration. Less money every year allocated to the classrooms and into areas that, uh, to uh, especially beginning teachers. And so when we talk about uh, uh, throwing money or just giving money out, I think it's the allocation of the money and where that money is going to go and how it's going to be spent. So it is spearheaded right to the target where it needs to go and not just 
given to be spent uh, uh, any way that uh, any particular district decides where they want to put it. I, I couldn't agree more. I don't think there's anything dumber than throwing more money into an already broken system, which is why we couldn't just say, here's more money, go see what happens. We didn't make just decisions in a vacuum. There are hundreds of thousands of dollars of research that informs this piece of legislation. We didn't just sit around and say, you know what, this, I, I feel like this could work. It is all evidence-based uh, legislation. We know beyond a shadow of a doubt that one of the most important data markers there is for any student's long-term success is whether or not they're reading at that make or break moment of third grade. If a student is not reading by that point, we know we are setting them up for a lifetime of failure. If you look in our prisons across the state of Arkansas, 70% of those who are incarcerated can't read. It is a telling thing that only 35% of Arkansas third graders are hitting that basic benchmark. We have at least a dozen or more counties where less than 10% of their third graders are reading at or above a third grade reading level. We have to do more. So we didn't just throw more money into a broken system. We went in and we made specific changes that we know work because we've seen it happen in other states. You look at a state like Mississippi, which has a really similar demographic makeup to Arkansas, and they started investing heavily heavy in literacy, immersion programs similar to what we've done. They went from being tied, fighting with Arkansas there at the bottom, to number 22 in the country in terms of literacy, and they're continuing to move up. We took a lot of the things that we saw working in other states and implemented them through this. Reading coaches being one of the biggest. 120 re reading coaches that are specialists, hired and paid for by the state that will go into districts of highest need. We've already been able to hire 75 of those individuals that will be in districts this fall. They're undergoing training and additional uh, resource allocation, and they will be hitting districts across the state here in the next couple of months. We know that works because we've seen it already. So we're not just throwing money into the system. We also wanted to make sure we were rewarding our hardworking teachers. And we wanted to make sure that money actually hit teachers' pockets. And so when we raised teacher pay, we didn't just arbitrarily do that. We went from 48th to top five, going from 36,000 to 50,000 at that base salary making us competitive with every other state in the country, helping us not only retain some of our best teachers, but recruit new teachers to come in the classroom. We also ensured for those who were already making above that amount that every single teacher in the state of Arkansas gets at least a $2,000 raise, all paid for by the state. And part of the stipulation with that to make sure it gets into teachers' pockets is that we required 80% of that funding to go directly to teachers salaries, which has not been the case in the past. And so we made some really, again, specific changes, uh, changing a focus on things like workforce development. Uh, one of the things I think Secretary Oliva alluded to was the new dual track diploma that we have created and implemented into high schools so that a student has multiple options and pathways for success. We have kind of perpetuated, frankly, a lie to kids, not just in Arkansas, but across the country for decades, that if somehow a student doesn't go to a four-year university, they're somehow less than, when nothing could be further from the truth. There are a lot of kids who have a different pathway to success, and we need to help put those opportunities in front of them, and that's exactly what that dual-track diploma does. I know this is a really long answer, but there is a lot of really specific evidence-based things in this legislation that we know work, and that's why we're so excited to see them implemented here in the state of Arkansas. And I'll let Secretary Oliva add to that, because I know he'll have some additional things to say. So well, that was well done. You're doing, uh, you're learning a lot about all this, uh, the nuances and ins and outs of schools, but I, th I think overall to, to support Governor Sanders is, is you're right. And uh, superintendents, school boards, principals, every day th th there are some challenges with balancing budgets and the school districts are facing some of the same realities that industries are facing when diesel prices go up the cost of running buses go up uh, when the power bills go up they feel that too the cost of food is going up the cost of construction has been a real challenge for school districts because uh, five years ago you could do commercial uh, 
build commercial projects on your schools if you're doing renovations for about $250 a square foot. Now it's three to $400 a square foot because they're filling those supply chain demands as well. But I think what those school leaders would tell you is at the end of the day, they have to protect the classroom. And when you look at the initiatives and priorities and learns, it really supports the schools with giving them dollars in a category that's outside of their school budget so that their school budget that they receive historically through their foundation funding isn't impacted by increasing teacher salaries because we wanted to make sure that those dollars didn't get lost into a very confusing formula but actually hit those teachers to give them the, the rightful increases in salaries that they deserve. And then even um, through Governor Sanders' vision, is there some pilot programs to even incentivize districts to apply for additional dollars to not only compensate highly effective teachers that would come outside of their budget so that they can, uh, as a state, we can recognize and, and, and reward those individuals. But even uh, uh, there's an innovation, transportation innovation pilot, because the cost of transportation and logistics for a school district is, is high. When, when you figure the average school bus could be $100,000, so if you look at what is the cost for an average school bus run, is thirty dollars to $40,000. If you have a school bus that gets six miles to the gallon and the prices of diesel f go up, schools are going to fill that. So are there more innovative ways to look at transportation? We have a pilot program inside of LEARNS that's going to to work with districts to find ways to do that because if we can uh, use our resources more efficiently in other areas, then we can reallocate those dollars back into the classroom where we know that return on investment will be uh, multiplied indefinitely. Great. We'll, we'll go here and then we'll come to Becca. On the front row. I, I just wanted to say it's really refreshing to see someone thinking outside of the box because the status quo hasn't been working. And um, uh, and, and the voucher system has proven to help o overall education, especially like places like Denmark and, and other places around the world. Uh, but my concern is with just a cross the board raise to teachers, um, are, does this have any incentive like Tennessee does with the master, master teacher program to uh, give uh, teachers a, a reason to teach better you know, than they have? Absolutely, there are a couple things that are in the legislation and uh, one is that there are um, opportunities for teachers to make up to 10,000 additional dollars in merit-based incentives as well as teachers who are willing to go into uh, higher demand subject area needs and um, specific demographics in a district that may have trouble recruiting. So there are some specific things that incentivize as well as uh, loan payback programs where the state will cover the cost of uh, teachers' student loans uh, to help them alleviate some of that burden so that they're more focused on the classroom and being able to stay there. Um, Secretary Leva, I know you've you spent a lot of time in this space. There are specific things like that that we've included in the legislation that certainly, I think, incentivize um, teachers. One of the things that I feel like often gets lost in the conversation is that somehow this is not pro-teacher. It's the largest investment that we have made in our public schools and our public school teachers in decades. And I have to commend the legislators that are sitting over here on the front row because we worked very closely and this was something every single one of us came to the table and said we want our teachers to understand that we know that they have value, that we know that our students do better when they have great teachers. And so we wanted to incentivize them with a higher base pay but also include some of those additional incentives that you mentioned and that you talked about. And, and I think to, to the point, what, what is really great about what the legislation does in regard to salaries is it returns those decisions back to the local school district. So instead of having a statewide salary schedule that pushes everybody into one model that doesn't allow for in, in, innovation and flexibility, this now gives local school districts the opportunity to develop a salary schedule that works best for them because they know the teachers and, what, and the students that they're serving in their community. So if they're having a hard time staffing chemistry or physics teacher and want to de develop an incentive to recruit and recognize and retain individuals that are in typical hard to staff areas, 
they now have the flexibility to do that. One of the things that school districts, and we were talking to superintendents across the state about how they're going to develop a salary schedule that works best for them, um, that I encourage them to do is on the old, status, the old salary schedule, you can be ranked unsatisfactory and make more money the next year because you breathe for a year. Well, I think that's ludicrous. If you are unsatisfactory, you shouldn't be guaranteed a raise. Like we, we should be able to link um, expectations for the behaviors we want to incentivize and build a salary schedule around that. So school districts now have that flexibility and they have that control and they're using that flexibility to their advantage. Oh, thank you for your there question. There's a question over here. Thank you, Governor, for coming. I know parents and grandparents here, we want to support the teachers, but we, this is about our children and our grandchildren. We want them learning math, science, reading, arithmetic, history. We want them to be incentivized, the students more than the teachers. I mean, we need the teachers incentivized, but the students get lost in all of this, well, we have to have right gender things and we have to have furry conversations. Let's stick to teaching what's important. Let's get our children excited about being Americans, about what America is about. When they get excited, they want to learn. They will grasp these topics and more. But if it's just a matter of you know, no child left behind, therefore nobody can get an award for being an outstanding student, we're going to lose our students no matter how good the teachers are. And we need the teachers to be responsible to the parents. The parents want to know what their children are doing. No more of this behind closed doors, oh, don't tell your parents what we're talking about. That, throw that out. Let's clean up our libraries. Let's clean up our libraries. We don't want our children reading pornography. We don't want our children exposed to dancers in obscene costumes. We want our school boards to be able to read books that our children are being exposed to and not deny them because they're pornographic. If they're too pornographic for the school board, they're too pornographic for our children. Let's support our children first. I, I don't disagree at all. It's why we pass legislation doing exactly those things. Uh, we're fighting them in court and we're going to continue to do that. Um, I, I hope that the critics and the opponents know I don't back down very easily and I fully expect and anticipate that we will win in court on each of these issues because I don't disagree. Protecting our kids has to be one of our first uh, fundamental responsibilities that we have and that's why we put specific things in this legislation to ban, to ban the indoctrination of our children, getting rid of things like CRT and uh, focusing on the things that we know put kids on a pathway to success. The other piece of that is we have given parents the ability to choose another path if the school that they're attending isn't meeting their students' needs. I think that's why the education freedom accounts are so important because it puts power back into the hands of the parents. I also think a really important thing here is that we might want to recruit you to run for the school board. So uh, be careful if you do that good of a job in front of this crowd and get that kind of applause, we may put you on the hook. So thank you. I had a question. I want to commend you, Governor, for in the legislature for raising the teacher's salary. Personally, I don't think they even get paid enough, but that's a great step. If you'd be kind enough to explain to everybody about the voucher system and how you're going to monitor it. Sure. There's a couple of pieces of this. Uh, first, we're going to phase it in over the course of the next three years. Uh, right now, we have 90 schools across the state that have applied and been approved and will participate in education freedom accounts representing all parts of the state. Uh, and about 4,500 students have already applied and been approved to participate in the program for this upcoming school year. Um, we focused this first year on students of greatest need, those in F schools, foster kids, some very specific areas. Next year we'll add additional kids in to the program and by the third year it will be open for everybody. But we didn't want to just open the floodgates wide without there being some accountability for the schools that participate. Number one, a school gets to decide whether or not they participate. If they don't want to, they don't have to. But if they do and they choose to participate and accept 
education freedom account dollars. They have to be willing uh, to implement a standardized testing that would be similar to what you might have in a public school. I'll let Secretary Oliva go into a little bit more detail on that because we want there to be accountability. That's also available for homeschool parents. However, one of the things that I think people are lost on is that this, the government's just going to be mailing out checks. That's not accurate. The money will go directly to the school up to the certain amount uh, for each of those students that are approved and enrolled in the program. When it comes to homeschool, it would have to be used for specific needs that are directly tied to education. If your family wants to go out and buy an Xbox, it's not going to be covered through an education freedom account. But if they want to buy curriculum and textbooks and things of that nature, then that would be an approved expense and allowed under the education freedom account. Yeah. Secretary and, and to the point, uh, uh, there is built-in accountability. And, and as we're phasing this over the next few years, we're, we're adopting state board rules and going through the processes to make sure that we can do that. Cause we want to make sure that we have quality choice programs and not just choice for the sake of having choice. So we're going to hold, uh, if, the, if a private school chooses to participate, we'll be able to publish the scores because they're going to take a standardized assessment from an approved list and then we'll be able to publish to so parents can see how the students are doing in that school and then the parent can be informed, well maybe they're getting the results that we're hoping for, maybe they're not. The payments aren't going to be automatic. There, there's a big misperception that there's direct payments going to families. That is not going to happen. That system is never going to be set up in the state of Arkansas, and we're going to monitor that. That's a, good point to that. That's a big misconception. It's a bi very big misconception. And in fact, even for the private school component, when the school is, becomes an approved provider, we also vet through the parents' application to make sure that they qualify. Those payments are distributed quarterly. So if there's a bad actor in that space, whether it's on the family side by not continuing to go to school, or on the school side, th those payments would cease and we would not be able to participate in that program because we're going to monitor to make sure those dollars are going where they're intended to go. Yes, ma'am. Oh, thank you very much for raising the salaries for the teachers. Thank you for adding the VOTEC, uh, because my older brothers and sisters, who would be like 100 today, had that option when they went to school. However, I have some long-term concerns for small school districts, and we have a number of them here in this area. Bruner Pilot, Norfolk, Cotter, Lead Hill, uh, Viola. How are these school districts going to afford the salaries for the teachers in future years if it's not fully funded by the state? Are they Can going I stop to have you real fast? I just want to correct one thing. It is fully funded by the state in perpetuity. This isn't a one or two or three year program. We looked at this for the long term and the state is on the hook. Whatever funding a school received prior to the passage of LEARNS, they still receive, and now they will receive additional funding to cover the cost of all teacher raises in perpetuity. So the state is on the hook, it's not the district, and that's one of the biggest, I think, things that is being peddled that is simply just not true. Okay. Thank you very much for that because I was concerned about these smaller school systems having to consolidate or cut programs. There's such integral parts of their communities and the families and the students. And I'm glad to hear that and I'm glad there's subsidies for, house, uh, for transportation because in the last two school years we have brought ten thousands of children here on school trips to see books come alive on stage. We brought Jungle Book here, Paddington Bear here, Call of the Wild here, Newton's Laws of Motion here. And I'm hoping that we'll continue next year with those kinds of programs for, we had like 11 different school systems come here. So I'm glad to hear that because I was very worried about that. Yeah, I'll let Secretary Oliva had something he wanted to comment on. That. So, and we hear that a lot about the small and rural districts, and, and I'm glad Governor Sanders cleared up the funding because the school districts receive their funding that they receive historically. Now, they may go up in enrollment, they may go down. Their funding is going to change based on the population they serve, but the dollar amount to support learns is a complete different separate category 
category in the state budget that the legislature supported. And we hear a lot of, we used to hear, I used to hear a lot, and as we've been talking and clarifying um, those communications, in fact, we had a real small rural district in the Delta that was, it was on the process of being consolidated, and we started using LEARNS, the flexibility applied in LEARNS, to keep that district open. Our mindset is, if you have a local school board that's balancing a budget where students are learning and you have uh, excelling schools and parents are happy, keep on doing that. If your school system is failing students, we're going to be knocking on your door. I mean, and that's, that's our role is to hold people accountable and, and make sure they're doing that. But, but I will tell you, one of the best things for small and rural districts, because a lot of our small districts, um, because they, they may not generate the dollars that larger districts do, because there's an economy of scale and there's a cost of doing business. There's some very realities to running school districts. So a lot of them, their minimum salary was $36,000 a year. There's, there's about six or seven small and rural districts in the state where not one teacher made over $50,000 a year in the entire district. Now every teacher is going to make at least $50,000 or $50, a year. So when you're able to raise disposable income in everybody's, uh, in the education system, which in many small rural districts is the largest employer, the community feels that impact. This is the biggest investment for small and rural communities that this state could probably have made. One other thing that I think is really important too is that we also pass legislation this session that would prohibit a school from closing simply on the size. Uh, so often there are other factors at play and so we removed some of that I, I think stipulation um, because there was a lot of question around that. There's usually a number of other factors. As Secretary Oliva said, if it's simply because you went behind low a certain threshold, but you're performing at a high level and your students are doing great, we want to see that continue. Nobody wants to see those doors close. In fact, we want to figure out how to get more kids and copy what you're doing, not shut it down. And so it's so rare that a school ever is pushed below and that legislation protects specifically for that so that those school districts that are doing well or those schools that are doing well can continue to serve their students um, in a way that we know they'll be successful. There's some questions over here. Yeah. Oh, wait, you got one back there. Oh, we'll go here and we'll come thank, thank you for explaining those last two questions. Uh, that helped a lot to understand what you're doing. Uh, one quick question I had was in um, Yaleville, Mar Marion County, we've introduced the Barton uh, reading program for dyslectic and reading impaired uh, students, and that's been helping very well. And uh, in fact, we found out that it seems like those impaired by those things are actually very smart IQ, but they just get their syllables and, and their brain doesn't quite function in, the, in, in that in the right way for reading uh, English. So, is uh, Barton going to be, um, you know, a statewide uh, uh, option? I'm glad you said option because a lot of times I get asked those questions about are we going to mandate a specific curriculum from the state. So we, we, I believe in local control. The school district needs to be, have the flexibility to adopt a curriculum that works best for the students and the teachers they serve. But what we're doing as a state is identifying what are those high quality instructional materials and incentivizing districts to choose those exact materials. So the state of Arkansas was really moving forward to what we call implementing the science of reading. Definitely a move in the right direction. One of the things that we're doing through LEARNS to help support districts with that is look at how we monitor and identify students through dyslexia screeners. Right now, every district does something different. And we don't have a statewide unified coordinated progress monitoring system, especially in K1 and 2, that embeds dyslexia screening. And we have a career and college readiness assessment in 3 through 10. It's kind of a big deal that we're making a big pivot back to criterion reference assessments in 3 through 10, end of course exams in algebra, biology, and geometry, but also having a unified coordinated progress monitoring system that is statewide so we can see where students need additional supports and make sure that we're able to allocate those resources. By embedding this in one system, what's happening now is our teachers are having to stop 
depending on whatever the district system is, seven, eight, nine, ten times a year to do a progress monitoring, to do a separate dyslexia screener, to do a different uh, fluency assessment. We're putting out a, a, a statewide call to embed all of those into one system to hit, it won't be up for this school year, but it'll be in our classrooms for 24, 25, that puts all of that in one thing so a teacher doesn't have to stop teaching to test, and that snapshot in time can happen three times and give the information that teachers need. It then helps support teachers with training with high quality materials like what you're doing there because we have to accelerate students and stop focusing on remediating students. I believe every student in the state of Arkansas is capable of learning and we have to create a system that pushes them to do that. He's got a whole notebook. Are we going to go through all those pages? No, no, because a lot of those questions got answered already. Um, the, I'm, I'm wondering about the homeschoolers and the private schooling. It sounds like you're focusing on the public school system. And if I'm understanding this correctly, they're going to be put back a few years in this tiered system you've got, I guess. So they're, you're not going to be addressing these uh, third graders who can't read okay. immediately. Is, right. am, am I missing something or, I'm not or sure I'm following. why are so, they being? Yeah, a couple different things that you talked about on. One, when you say that we're, we're talking about improving public education, I was, I'm a product of public schools. My children attend public schools. <laughs> Neighborhoods need high quality public schools. What, what LEARNS is the largest investment is in is helping to improve the neighborhood public school. That's where children grow up together. That's where their parents grow up together. You see generations attending the same schools. So our priority is to make them better. But we also want to empower parents because if a school is not able to meet their needs, they have high quality choice options to them. So you talked about homeschool, because we talked a little bit about private school. The homeschool uh, doesn't go into effect this school year, but it'll be working on getting implemented for the 24-25 school year, where those, th that system and those rules would be put in place, because we've got to build a system for accountability so that if parents that are choosing to participate in homeschool want to be in a reimbursement program, we have the proper guardrails in place so that we can make sure that parents are using those dollars to target education. But when you talk about third graders and what that rolling in is, Governor Sanders stated earlier, third grade is that benchmark, right? Our, 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 we actually just got new data from our students that took an assessment in spring this year for 23. So in 22, it was 35% of our students met that readiness rate. It actually went down this year. Right? So this is more evidence why we need to stop playing red light, green light with LEARNS and get this implemented because we went down just over two points in third grade. So we know that that's pivotal. So looking at this year's kindergartners, are we making sure that every year they're getting access to high quality literacy instruction by a certified qualified teacher and getting the proper interventions the student needs or getting accelerated? When this cohort gets to third grade, we don't want to just push them along the system. Because what happens in that pivot for instruction is those foundational years are heavily grounded on phonics and phonemic awareness and building vocabulary, measuring fluency, which leads to comprehension. When you get past third grade, you start using those skills where you learn how to read to apply them around content and instruction and explicit systematic instruction and phonics and phonemic awareness isn't naturally part of that system. So before a third grader just automatically gets moved forward, the team has to come together with the parent and write an individual learning plan to make sure that if there's holes in their learning when they go to fourth grade and fifth grade and beyond, that somebody's addressing that. Right. Thank you for your question. We'll jump over here. Well, Mike, Catherine, get a workout tonight. Get your steps in. <laughs> um, many years ago, uh, the federal government implemented a program for special education called IDEA. Mm -hmm. That program has never been fully funded from our wonderful federal government. Will your LEARNS program be funded from the beginning, or will it be a stepped process 
and, and will, it, will it specifically address uh, the teachers and students in special education because they have been relegated to the back of the bus for a long time? Yeah. Well, the federal government is really good at coming up with ideas and then letting the state figure out how to pay for it. Uh, and we actually operate very different in the state. We have to balance a budget and we have to make sure that the legislation we're pushing forward, we have the ability to pay for. And so that was one of the first steps and one of the important things that this group of people was really focused on is not also just not funding it for one or two years, but that we had the ability to take this on as a state for the long term. And so absolutely the funding is not like a federal program, it will remain when it comes to teacher pay, the uh, literacy programs, workforce development and career and training and technical programs. Those are things that we have invested in and made sure we have the ability to continue funding for the long term uh, because that's how the state operates. Very much like you might in your household, very different than the federal government. When it comes to specializing in that special education, I certainly want Secretary Oliva to comment here because this is something I know he's very passionate about. That's actually where he started as a teacher uh, for special education students. That's one of the reasons I think that the education freedom accounts are so important is because it allows a parent to make a decision if they are not having their student's needs met, they have the ability to look at other options. It empowers parents to make sure that regardless of what challenges their student may have, they have the ability to figure out where they can best be educated. I have three kids. And just with my three kids, they all learn very differently. And they need very different things. And I should have the ability to decide how they can best be educated as their parent. And this provides that flexibility and those opportunities so that those child's needs are being met wherever that parent chooses to send their, their student. Yeah. And And I think the first part of your question is, you're right. And, and if I was talking to school principals and superintendents and, and we talk about the full cost of implementing the Individuals uh, with Disabilities Education Act to make sure that those students have access to the course level and rigor that they deserve, some might say it's an unfunded mandate, right? So when we look at does the federal government give us enough money to fully implement those mandates? Probably not. How does the state help support that? The, the school budget is very complicated and there's what's called a matrix that gets into different categoricals. So there's some weights that are attended to that where a school district may generate more funds for special education students. But I do think it's an opportunity that we can look at to see if there's a way to be more efficient and improve in that as well. But one of the things um, that I think is, is also encouraging is because a lot of times special education students may need what we refer to as related services or services out, outside of the school day to enhance what's happening in the school, is those parents would be able to qualify, um, A, not only for scholarship programs if that's part of the pathway that they want to choose, but high impact tutoring dollars and programs for school districts where we can target making sure the special needs students are, are prioritized and then even access to um, literacy uh, tutoring programs where if, if the parent's getting outside service above and beyond, there's dollars there to help cover that cost as well. Great. Thank you. We have time for a few more. We'll go here and then, oh, sorry. We'll go over here. I promised him first, so sorry. I just want to see how fast they can go back and forth. <laughs> Governor Sanders, Mr. Secretary, is there a plan within the LEARNS Act to increase the salaries of bus drivers, teachers' aides, and any classified staff within our schools? Yeah. It's a great question. Um, and one of the things that I have stolen from Secretary Oliva is how he talks about the educational community. While the teacher is vital and so important that we have good teachers in the classroom, it's not just the teachers that the students interact with. It is the bus drivers, the cafeteria workers. And it was important for us to actually put additional funding, and we did that. We raised that up, that hourly salary, uh, for classified workers in the LEARNS legislation. And so that was important uh, for all of this group to make sure that those individuals that are regularly interacting with students also knew that we valued that and that we increased those salaries as well. I think we allocated roughly about $20 million that's specifically for classified staff. We have a question on this side. Oh. Okay. Um, 
I teach at Viola, and I'm the business teacher there. And I, I understand the big importance of reading when it comes to not only reading and writing, but it also affects business classes and ag classes and fax classes. In this LEARNS Act, what are the plans for career and technical education at the high school level that will help us business teachers to be an important part of going forward in our schools? Sure, I'll jump in here and I'll pass it circularly. But one of the things that, um, without fail, no matter what part of the state I was in over the two years that I spent campaigning and running for governor, um, and no matter what type of industry I met with, what type of community leader, business leader, the number one challenge every single one of them would tell you that they had was recruiting a skilled, qualified workforce. It is the biggest challenge that almost every business in the state faces. Again, it doesn't matter whether you're in healthcare, hospitality, education, finance, or retail, recruiting that skilled, qualified worker is very difficult. So that was one of the things that was really important. We know that literacy is a very important part of the foundation. The career and technical training, it's one of the things I was talking about a minute ago that I'm so excited about. Creating that dual track diploma was really important so that a lot of the students when they're in eighth and ninth tenth grade Can start getting on a pathway to go directly into the workforce There are a lot of students where a four-year university is going to be phenomenal and they're going to thrive and they're going to do really well For some students that's not the pathway to success for them And we need to create a number of different opportunities so that every student has a pathway to success And that's exactly what that did so a lot of students will now have the ability to graduate with certifications to go directly into the workforce. However, we don't want that to be the end of their learning journey. We want them to have the ability to stack on top of that. If they graduate with that certification but they want to continue their education, they should have the ability to do that and build on that foundation. So creating a lot more coordination and transparency in our programs is going to allow those students to continue doing that. And I think investing in our career, technical, trade, education is one of the most important investments that we can make as a state because that is something that has been ignored for so long and we have a huge shortage and there is a massive demand for those type of workers and so by investing in that not only are we meeting the demand but we're helping a sector of students be successful that have been ignored for far too long Good. If I was to add to that, first, thank you for being a business teacher in high school and um, for what you do to prepare students, because some of the content they're going to learn in your class, they're going to be able to apply to life, and um, they're going to see relevancy, and that's a big deal. So thank you for doing that. One of the things, and as Governor Sanders was talking about, is workforce readiness. Sometimes there seems to be a disconnect for with K-12 values and says this is the foundation that we need to say because for, for the starting point to be successful in life is getting at least a standard high school diploma. But the reality is, is to be successful in the workforce today, there's a plus to that standard high school diploma, whether that's industry certification, whether that's some college, whether there's some post-secondary opportunities. So there, there's an attainment rate that's calculated every year for states and the, the attainment rate for 23 that was just recently published said that in the state of Arkansas, 87.3 adults have reached attainment. What attainment means is measuring the adults that are 25 and older in your community that have at least a high school diploma. So while a lot of people will say 87.3, that, that's pretty good, that puts Arkansas in the bottom 10, right? So when you look at the number of citizens that have a college degree or beyond, that number drops to about 28%. So there's opportunities to get students onto this career pathway, and we need to do a better job making sure there's not a disconnect between K-12 and what industry is actually looking for and the skills that they need so people can walk in the door ready to learn and ready to earn. And so one of the things that I, that I think um, Governor Sanders should talk about is, is, is her vision is really forced our state agencies to, to meet and work in an established a workforce cabinet and. Um, and, and really appointed people to answer exactly that question and is holding us accountable. 
Yeah, just if I could piggyback, one of the things we did the first like couple days of being in office is we looked at some of the things that were already happening in state government. There were seven different state agencies that have a workforce development office or component. And I asked how often they met, and one of the individuals that was part of that group said, well, we've never met. I said, I don't understand how that's possible, how you are literally tasked with addressing the same issue, and you all work for state government, and you don't talk to each other. And they kind of looked at me like it was the craziest idea that had ever been thrown out there. So we quickly uh, put together an executive order and created the workforce cabinet. So now, not only are they required to meet, but they're required to put an update to Together so that we're actually all rowing in the same direction. We also created a position called the Chief Workforce Officer, a guy named Mike Rogers who came out of the private sector who has spent an entire lifetime going out and recruiting, training individuals to go directly into the workforce. And so now he is tasked with bringing all of those agencies together and making sure that we actually have a coordinated effort to addressing the workforce shortage in the state. They wake up every single day being tasked with how do we do it better? And that is oddly, which shouldn't be, but it's oddly something new for state government to try is to actually coordinate and talk to each other. And I think that we're already starting to see uh, that pay dividends and a real impact across our state. I think we're going to be one of the first states that figures out mm -hmm. how to build that blueprint for addressing the workforce shortage that we have, frankly, across the country. I know we've got time for a couple more questions. We'll go to this group, and then we'll come to you. I agree there needs to be an educational reform, and I definitely applaud the acknowledgement of said need. Um, it seems the act was fast-tracked with an omnibus, a take-all or nothing approach to educational reform. And what concerns me about it is mostly, okay, like the, the voucher system, the funding will be funneled into private and charter schools away from public schools. Like a $7,000 voucher will not cover all of the costs necessary to attend these other schools, tuition, books, transportation. And it seems that this money would be better spent increasing the levels of education in our public schools. Why are the public schools not sufficient? Instead, I see this crippling the public school system. How are you going to protect the public school systems from the collapse that it, this seems to be headed towards. The teachers more than likely will be leaving. Why wouldn't they? And at, that's the first question. The second one, you, know, you were That was like seven, but I'm going to try to make sure I address them all when we come back to it. How the public school system will survive with the funneling going towards private and charter schools. The next one was regarding um, you were talking about the vocational programs. In other states, high schoolers are allowed to take college courses, and many of my friends in other states, their kids are graduating with associate's degrees. I want my son to go to college, and I definitely agree that stu other students need to take a more vocational route to go from high school to work. That's not what I want for my son. So. Will there be a system in place to be able to graduate with an associate's degree and a high school degree? That was a lot to unpack, and I'm going to do my, our sure. best to try to address each one of those questions. First, I want to address the fast tracking. Um, the idea that somehow this was fast tracked is honestly, I don't mean to be rude, but is frankly laughable. I literally spent two years traveling the state. I went to all 75 counties talking extensively about the fact that my number one priority when getting elected would be to be the education governor. And I spelled out exactly what that looked like. And I won with the history historic overwhelming margin. So to me, that tells me that that is a demand from the people of this state. I didn't make it a secret. I literally broadcast, I spent half a million dollars on TV telling people exactly what I was going to do when I got elected. And I won. 
Frankly, if this was fast-tracked and there wasn't support for it, I wouldn't be standing here. And that would have been a very clear message to me that this was not what Arkansas wanted. But I did win. And I won by a big margin, as did a lot of the individuals that are in our state legislature that campaigned on similar issues. So to me, that tells us not only is there broad-based support for it, but frankly, there's a demand from the people of this state that we do better. And that's exactly what we've worked extremely hard over the last several months to do, is make sure that we did better, that we delivered for students, that we delivered for parents, that we delivered for teachers. When it comes to the public education piece, like I said, this is the largest investment that we have had in public education in decades. We have not done anything big on education since my dad was governor nearly 20 years ago and our numbers continue to fall. So to me, we couldn't just tinker with the system. We couldn't make a little change here and a little change here and expect a transformational difference. And I think our kids deserve a transformational difference. And that's what we delivered. I could not be more proud of the work that we did. And it wasn't like we made these decisions in a vacuum. Like I said, there is hundreds of thousands of dollars of research and data proven evidence that these are things that work. We didn't just say, oh, I think this could be a good idea. We spent time meeting with parents, stakeholders, teachers, superintendents across the state to build out an education plan that delivered for our students. And I think that's exactly what it did, and it is a massive investment in public education and one that I think every Arkansan has the ability to be proud of. The last part of that question was about accelerate opportunities, and yeah, so and and I agree, I, I agree wholeheartedly, and, and I like I, I I tell the governor all the time I was like I, I'm going to learn all the data and all the numbers in state. 117 students graduated this past year with their AA degree at the same time as their bachelor's degree. I think that's really low on a state this size. What about 30 to 33,000 students in a senior cohort? that number should be times 10. There are some challenges that we're gonna work with with the state colleges because we don't have a common course code numbering system and making sure that the college credit articulates the high school credit because there's some technical nuances, but that's adult problems that are hurting students, so we're gonna get that fixed and we're acting with urgency on that. And one of the conversations I've been having with superintendents is pushing acceleration. Let's, it's right around 17% of the students in the state of Arkansas took algebra by ninth grade, or excuse me, took algebra by eighth grade. Typically, if you're going to be pushed into where you're in concurrent credit and earning, not even just an AA, maybe even some students should be earning bachelor's degree, you need to be on more accelerated math paths. But some of our school districts don't even offer high school credits in middle school, so we're reimagining how we look at acceleration. 30% of the students this past school year in ninth through 12th grade took an accelerated course, meaning they were either in an AP course, an IB course, or a concurrent credit course. So there are some students that are getting access to accelerated opportunities, but it shouldn't be pockets of excellence. We should be creating a system where regardless of the district or region you're in, you have those opportunities. But one of the real challenges and one of the things that we need to make sure we're informing parents in meeting with school counselors and building out that schedule, 47% of last year's high school seniors, which was just over 15,000 students, didn't have a full schedule. They're just leaving school and going home and doing nothing, and they should be sitting in those college classes. And, 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 and I'll even further exacerbate that because I get excited. I'm sorry. I love but, all the numbers. But when you look at who went to our state college system, the percentage of students that left high school and went to remedial math is criminal. And one of the conversations that I've had with college presidents is we've got to figure out a way to eliminate remedial math because these students should be ready for college algebra or beyond. 65% of the students that were sitting in remedial math this last semester graduated with a 3.0 GPA or higher. Something's disconnected. We have to overhaul this system. Thank you. I think I promised to come over here. I think we've got time for this last question. Hi, uh, Governor Sanders. I just want to be, say uh, thank you for um, being here tonight. Um, I just had a question. Um, I've heard everything about special education. Um, I've heard about other programs in school, but I haven't heard anybody talk about gate programs. 
My daughter was in a GATE program before we moved here to Arkansas. Unfortunately, I didn't agree with the school system here, so I sent them to a private school. Um, but I'm wondering, too, why is, you talk about workforce, but we took shop out of our classes. We took auto mechanics out of our, our schools. We took woodwork out of our schools. Not everybody is going to go to college. It's not going to be for everybody. So therefore, if we are going to have a public school system and, and claim to be educating our children, how about educate them for going out into the world after high school, as well as like balancing a checkbook. You don't see that in school either. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't have much to differ with you on. I think we're making some great recruitments for school board races in the room here tonight, but I, I don't disagree. That's one of the reasons that we focus so much on that career and technical training, giving kids a different pathway. Because you're right, not every kid needs to go to college. We want that opportunity if that's the pathway for them. But if it isn't, they should have another direction to go where they can still have a lifetime of success. And there are a lot of opportunities for that, specifically in a state like Arkansas. And so we focused heavily on that. Don't disagree. I think for so long we focused specifically and strictly on what does a student know and not what can a student do. And we have to start asking that question. When they graduate, what are they capable of doing? Can they go directly into the workforce? Have we given them the tools they need to be successful? And if the answer is no, then we probably failed on our end, which is why we are trying to reimagine the way we look at so many pieces of education and why the LEARNS initiative was so important to get passed. I, I, I'm not sure I'm specifically familiar with um, what that is. Welcome to Arkansas. We knew you guys looked really smart, so we're glad to have you here in our state. Thank you. Come from in Henderson. It's gifted, a talented. Um, um, education That's what she was saying. my gay. daughter was able to get into the gate program when she was in first grade she started elementary three years old she got into a program what they called for um, what did they call it um, no I'm, it's where they come in and they work with special needs children they say normal children and it's like a monkey see monkey do well my daughter had to apply for this position at three years old had to go and talk to you know because of her doing that successful program in henderson they continued it it's uh, i can't remember what it was called but also when she hit the first grade that's when they put her in a gifted and talented education. It was a higher degree because some kids get bored on everybody else's level. I mean, there's got to be an incentive for these kids that are very gifted minded like my daughter was. Yeah. I, thank you for clarifying. I thought you were saying GAPE, and I wasn't sure what that was. So GAPE, the gift in talent education. You've got so. you to pick up the Arkansas accent over the course, <laughs> so we'll be able to follow well, a little easier. I, we, I agree, and unfortunately, sometimes our system pushes students into pathways by age, and that's not really going to be a successful system. So how are we pushing more accelerated opportunities, exposing students that are ready to move along the educational court, uh, uh, continuum to do that? I, I've, I've met with families, and I've listened to stories. And I've, and I've talked to parents firsthand where, where they have children that want to be in rigorous accelerated opportunities like AP, and they're ready to take AP courses in ninth grade, and the schools say, well, we don't offer that till you're in 11th, right? So we have to rethink how we set that up, or we have ninth graders that are ready to earn concurrent credit, and the school says, we don't offer that until you're in your senior year. Right, right now, when I talk about the, the, the number of industry certifications that are earned in the, in the state of Arkansas, it was about just over 6,000 of them were earned in a student's senior year. It was like 15 of them were earned in seventh or eighth grade. Well, I'm sorry. We should not be waiting till the children, the child's senior year to earn an industry certification, especially if we want them to earn stackable credentials. So um, gifted and talented 
students need to be in specialized programs, but need to be able to have accelerated opportunities and pathways, and that's something that we're going to continually have conversations to try to, to seek out and improve. Thank you. We want to, again, say thank you so much for your willingness to come out tonight. Um, I, I know that it is a big ask for people to spend their evening, but I don't think there's anything that we could talk about that's more important for the future of our state and the future of our country than investing in the kids right here in Arkansas. It's the reason that this was the number one priority that I had and that a number of these people right here on the front row had and worked so hard to make sure we delivered for the students of our state, and I think we did that through the LEARNS Act. If I could um, get our legislative friends and partners here on the front row to stand up, y'all are never shy. You literally ran for office, you can't be shy. So I wanna give them a huge round of applause. Um, Thank you guys so much. This would never have been possible without amazing representation from across the state. And this group right here uh, has been vital, not just for the success of LEARNS, but I, we had, I think, one of the most successful historic legislative sessions that we've ever had in Arkansas, and I love to tell my dad that. So uh, it's not a secret. Feel free to repeat that if you ever see him. But we would not have been able to have the level of success that we did without these people who fight hard for the people that they represent. At the end of the day, it's really simple for us. We love our state. Arkansas is home for me. This is where I grew up. This is where my husband and I chose to raise our kids. I want my kids to stay in Arkansas, to raise their own families. And I want the Arkansas that I love to be, and the one that I grew up in, to be the one that my kids inherit. I want them to wake up and know that they can do and be anything that they want and they can do it right here in our state because we gave them all the tools, all the opportunities, and all the freedom to go out and decide what they wanted with no obstacles in front of them. That's exactly what this does. This puts all the opportunity in the parents' hands and in students' pockets. And that's what we want to see because we want our kids to be successful. And I know that they can be and they can do that right here in Arkansas. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you for your willingness to be with us and have this conversation. And most importantly, thank you for choosing to live in the best state in the country. So thanks for being here tonight. come into a uh, fog machine. So you guys are already off to a much bigger party than we're used to. Thank you so much for being here bright and early this morning. Uh, very excited to get to be part of this event. I know you've got an incredible lineup over the next several hours, including Secretary Hugh McDonald and Congressman French Hill, who are slated to speak after me. I love getting to be both of their warm-up acts uh, they are truly impressive leaders for our state, and we are so excited that you will get to hear from them. They are both business leaders in a past life, and French even used to run a bank. So I'm going to let all of the really technical details and expertise come from them, and I'll do the fun stuff here this bright and early Monday morning. I don't know a significant amount about the banking industry in the same way that French does, but I do know a tremendous amount about the state of Arkansas, the amazing people that come from our state and the fantastic business opportunities that anyone who chooses to invest here can enjoy and see. That starts with the great city that you're visiting here this morning in Little Rock, Arkansas. I will never forget the day that my family moved to Little Rock from Texarkana a small town in southwest Arkansas, right on the Texas-Arkansas border. It was a little bit of a uh, quick shift. My dad had just become governor and not in the traditional sense. He hadn't been elected to that position, but he was the lieutenant governor and was becoming governor rather rapidly overnight. So it was quite the transition for my family. And from those of you who are from big cities like New York and Chicago, it may come as a surprise, but moving to Little Rock in that moment felt like moving to the big city. I remember wanting to make a very special first impression and a big entrance at my dad's inauguration that day. And it was supposed to be kind of my first foray into Little Rock's social scene. 
unfortunately for me, my mom had other plans, and I'll never forget, nor will I forgive, the outfit that she chose for me that day. It was a red, white, and blue one-piece suit complete with shorts and shoulder pads. If you can't get that mental image in your head, I can assure you it's something that you would not have wanted to personally have to experience. Looking out at the women in the crowd today, I'm very happy to see that 90s fashion is no longer uh, what we're, we're going with. Even though I thought my Literox social life in that moment had ended before it even began, that turned out not to be the case. I've literally loved every minute of living in this city, calling it home, and in every town, big and small, all over the state of Arkansas. And I know you will too, because Arkansas has so much to offer. Right here, just in central Arkansas alone, we are home to big names like Simmons, Stevens, and Centennial. Up in Northwest, we have the largest business on the face of the earth, Walmart, plus other Fortune 500 companies like Tyson and J.B. Hunt. Across the state, business leaders are making new investments every single day in industries as diverse as aerospace, steel manufacturing, energy, and much more. But I'm here to tell you that this is just the beginning. My administration is working hard to make our state even more appealing to every kind of business, from fintech to farming, and we're making tremendous headway very quickly. We made a historic investment in our education system by raising teacher pay, expanding education freedom, and implementing the proven practices that we know will improve literacy for every student in the state of Arkansas. We've lowered taxes so we can compete with our zero income tax neighbors like Texas and Tennessee. And we're cracking down on crime to keep our community safe. We're making sure that every day we are getting the word out about our state's single greatest asset, our natural beauty. These are big changes, but I've never believed that the government can just wave a wand and simply make new business appear. It will take all of us, from elected leaders, to entrepreneurs, to everyday Arkansans, to make this state a hotbed for innovation, the hotbed that we know we are capable of being. That's why I'm so excited to welcome this summit back for another year. This is exactly the kind of group we need to take Arkansas to the very top. So thank you to the organizers at Vincent for making today possible. Thank all of you for being here and being part of our state's growing economy. And most of all, thank you to our attendees for joining and being part of today. You are the entrepreneurs, you are the innovators, and the business leaders that we need to, take, to make Arkansas the best place in America to live, to work, and to raise a family. And we're glad that we get to be here with you to celebrate this amazing day. Thank you so much. And I'll uh, leave the fog machines and the fun to Secretary McDonald from here. And uh, we hope you have a great time here in Arkansas. Thanks so much for being with us. So I am excited to be here at the Mid-America Aerospace and Defense Summit. Thank you, Chad, for the great introduction. And thanks to the Aerospace and Defense Alliance for the important work you do for our industry. Collaboration fostered by your leadership, and we all benefit from our work together to enhance our industry's infrastructure and workforce. I'm here today representing Aerojet Rocketdyne, now an L3 Harris Technologies Company. I still have to get that part right. <laughs> Um, so we have nearly 1,200 Aerojet Rocketdyne employees in Camden who manufacture over 75,000 solid rocket motors per year to help protect our warfighters, our nation, and our allies. Our tremendous growth and ability to meet our mission is thanks in part to our longstanding partnerships with state and local agencies as well as the governor's office. I am honored to have the opportunity to introduce our keynote speaker, Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders. Augurated in January of 2023, Governor Sanders is the first woman to serve as the governor of Arkansas. And through her career, Governor Sanders 
has demonstrated great leadership while working for senators, governors, presidential campaigns, and as the White House press secretary for the former President Trump. Governor Sanders was the third woman to serve as the White House press secretary and the very first mom to do so as well. Her recent trade mission to Europe highlights her commitments to our industry and to furthering aerospace and defense investments in Arkansas. It is now my pleasure to introduce Arkansas native, Arkansas, the Honorable Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders. Thank you. Come back to this group more often. It's not every day I get behind a podium and people cheer and are excited to see me, so I like it. Thank you so much, Chandra, for the very kind introduction. And it is so good to see you again. Chandra's one of the stars in Arkansas Aerospace, and we are thankful for your leadership and all the work that you and your company are doing to invest right here in our state. For those of you that are not from Arkansas, welcome. We are so glad that you're here. It is an absolute honor to address this group. You don't just stand on the cutting edge of aerospace technology. Frankly, you're on the cutting edge of Arkansas's economy. I know it won't surprise anybody in this room, but lots of Arkansans are amazed to find space. It has now become a billion dollar industry and it is primed to grow even bigger. I had a chance to visit Lockheed Martin's facility in Camden a few months, a few months ago and stop by the industrial park there and meet with all of the players there that are investing so much into South Arkansas. This city is quickly becoming an aerospace hub, fueling the U.S. military and militaries around the globe. Families in Camden are so excited about this investment. Not only are these great paying jobs, but it's helping revive that community and frankly, all of that region. But folks down there are also excited to be, a, to be playing a part in defending our country and securing freedom around the globe. They've gotten so excited that I've heard that they've even started naming their kids after some of the products that are being made in the area. Which seems like a really great idea right now, but here in a few years when the kindergarten teacher shows up and has six javelins and four strikers in her class, it may become a little bit more complicated. Of course, that's just a small part of our aerospace industry. My administration is working to make Arkansas a national leader in the sector. Not too long ago, I got the opportunity to travel to the Paris Air Show and pitched Arkansas to some of the world's largest aerospace companies. I brought my kids along because they'd never been and I thought it would be a great opportunity for them to see another part of the world. Our kids are 11, first meeting was going to begin. I thought the best way for them to really experience the culture and take some of Paris in would be to stop in at a little sidewalk cafe and watch the people come and go and experience the city. Unfortunately, a few minutes after we sat down, I looked up over my youngest, my eight-year-old George's shoulder, and I saw that store after store after store, it was X-rated shop after X-rated shop. So I did what any good wife would do, and I kept our kids facing us the end. We're getting ready to walk out thinking we've had this victorious moment, and our kids have not said anything or seen anything, and we're walking away and our youngest grabs a hold of me and he said, hey mom, look, it's the coolest store I've ever seen. They have toys and DVDs, can we go? <laughs> we got out of there, we made excuses, and other than that one experience, the trip was an absolutely huge success. We met with industry leaders from across the world to learn how we can attract even more aerospace investment right here to our country that we've met with, is finding enough quality and no matter what industry we're meeting with this is a demand that everyone has and our administration it just came into office and I asked how often they were meeting 
And one of the guys, all of these groups tasked with working in workforce would actually sit down and speak to one another. They said, well, we've never met. And we quickly changed that and created what we call the workforce cabinet. Under the leadership of Mike Rogers, who's sitting up here on the front row, if you haven't had a chance to meet Mike, you are missing out. But I would go ahead and block 20 or 30 minutes because he's a big talker, <laughs> which I appreciate. Mike is our chief workforce officer, and he's doing a phenomenal job. He's got decades of experience in the private in major headway, bringing Arkansans off the sidelines and into the job market. We know that education plays a huge role in your companies. After all, I'm pretty sure we want qualified people putting together our country's airplanes and missiles. We raise teacher pay to $50,000, the highest in the nation, career and technical training into high school classrooms. Companies can now go directly to nearby high schools. This is a huge win for our state. And students can now earn a dual diploma so that they can find a job right in their backyard before they even graduate. Beyond that, we're cutting taxes, combating crime, and building up our outdoor economy to make our state even more inviting to newcomers. Arkansas has never been more attractive to business, especially the aerospace industry. To those companies that have already invested in our state, Thank you for choosing Arkansas. And if you want to make another investment, I'm happy to work with you to make that happen right away. That's because we know that when business and government come together, we can literally lift every single person up in every community across our state. And together, we will make Arkansas the best place to live, to work, and to raise a family. We are so grateful for the work that you're doing, for the investment that you're making in our state, and the many future investments that we know you will also make into Arkansas. We're going to be a great partner. We're here to work with you and make Arkansas the leader in all of aerospace. Thank you so much for being here, and thanks for letting me be part of your event. Good morning. You're right. It is so much better. You know, n most of the groups that we speak to, it's like, oh, nobody says anything when you first get up there. So this is way better. I love speaking in front of teachers, not just because you say good morning, but more importantly, because of the work that you do. I am so excited to be in this room this morning because I know what a difference the people in this room are going to make. It is absolutely imperative for students across our state to have access to good quality education. And I know firsthand the difference that having a really good teacher makes, both as a student when I was in college. Uh, I will never forget one of the most impactful people in my entire life was one of my professors. Uh, his name was Bill Downs, Dr. Downs, and he was notorious for crushing people's dreams. And I was a very uh, arrogant freshman, and I thought, you know what? Some people may crumble under Dr. Downs, but I'm ready to show him just how smart I am. So I went in, I registered for an upper level communications class, thought I was really going to impress Dr. Downs. And I went into that class. Our first big assignment was about a 20, 25 page paper. And I could not wait to turn my paper in so that he could see just how lucky he was to have me as a student. And I rushed through, I turned that paper in. And the next time I'm in his class, he asked me to stay after. And I was like, oh, he was so impressed. He wants to like tell me in person what a great job I did. So I go in and he says, this is the worst trash I've ever seen. And it had red marks just from front to back. He said, this is embarrassing. You are capable of doing better. And he said, because I know you're capable of doing better, I'm going to give it back to you and I'm going to give you a second chance. He said, but if you ever turn anything like this in my classroom again, you won't be able to grace the door. And I was like, wow. Okay, so he put me in my place very quickly. I worked extremely hard. I got an A on that paper when I turned it in the second time, and I took every single class that he offered because I knew that he would make me better. I knew he would challenge me, he would push me, and force me to step up and meet the expectations that he was laying out for me. When we challenge students, when we push them, and when we raise the bar instead of lower it, they're going to meet it. 
because kids are absolutely resilient and amazing and each kid is capable of learning when given access to the right tools, the right resources, and frankly, the right teacher. And I know the difference that individuals like you can make in individual students' lives because my own daughter went through a program very similar. When she was in kindergarten, we were living in Northern Virginia, just outside of DC, and her teacher noticed that she was missing a couple of important markers when it came to reading. And she had been trained in the science of reading. She had been a reading specialist prior to being a kindergarten teacher. And she called and said, I think if your daughter will spend 30 minutes each day for the next couple of weeks meeting with the reading specialist here at the school, it will really help her fix some of these places and put her on a, a great path and give her a really solid foundation. So we did that. And now my daughter's in sixth grade and reads at an eighth grade reading level. Had she not had somebody looking for certain things, know what to find, help correct them, and put her on that path, I don't know what kind of foundation she would have had. As a parent, I didn't know what to look for. And I feel like I'm a pretty engaged on top of it, but I still would have missed those things. So having people like you that can come alongside our students, help catch them up or correct those things, doesn't just make a quick change in their life. It is setting a long-term foundation that will literally change their future. The work that you are doing is going to truly transform the state of Arkansas for the better. Because we know that there's almost no greater indicator for a child's long-term success than their ability to read. And so the work that you're doing, helping give kids the tools they need, the resources, the training, and the teachers that you'll be working alongside, you are going to help put those kids on a lifetime path to success. And we are so thankful for the work you're doing. We are so grateful for your willingness to be here today and to be alongside our teachers and students all over the state of Arkansas. I think this will be one of the single most important factors to success for Arkansas Learns are those of you in this room. So no pressure, but we're all kind of counting on you. <laughs> so I'm taking note of the faces. So if things don't move, we're coming back to you. But just like our kids, we wouldn't set that bar so high. We wouldn't set that expectation so high if we didn't know you were capable of rising to that moment. I'm 100% confident that the people in this room are going to be the ones that deliver our students with game-changing results. Thank you so much. It is uh, wonderful to be here, uh, mostly because anytime George Macris asks you to do something, the answer is an automatic yes. <laughs> And I know that anytime Simmons puts their name on something, and especially if George is right there in the middle of it, it is going to be done to absolute perfection. There is nothing they do, there is nothing they engage in that isn't at the very highest level. And so while we are super excited to have you here and the PGA invest here and see what all of us already know about Arkansas, we're pretty biased in thinking that you guys are the lucky ones because you get to work alongside Simmons and George Macris and get to experience our amazing state. I get to tell people all the time that the best job I have as governor is to be the chief salesperson for Arkansas. And it's pretty incredible when you have the best state in the country to go out and talk about. And this is one more thing that gives us another advantage, another thing to sing about what is happening here in the state. One of the things that we've worked pretty tirelessly on, my husband Brian and I, over the last eight months since taking office, is really elevating Arkansas's natural state and helping people to understand all that we have to offer in this space. We want to grow our outdoor economy, and events like this that have a $15 million impact are exactly the type of thing that we're looking to bring and highlight here. Because not only does it help people here in Arkansas see what we have to offer, so many people from around the world will be tuned in to that event and they will get to see the amazing things going on right here in Little Rock, Arkansas. And I'm very excited about that. David, I'm kind of like you. I'm not much of a golfer, but I think I'm a pretty good <laughs> cart operator. So if you need some help, I'm going to go ahead and volunteer my services. Uh, but we could not be more excited about what this means for the state what this means for Little Rock and the partnership that we know will be ongoing for many, many years to come. And we look forward to hosting you in that tournament uh, here in about 23 years. So <laughs> thank you so much for 
what you're doing here, uh, the investment that you make, not just in this event, but frankly, the investment that Simmons makes in Arkansas every single day. Thank you all so much. I think what we'll do at this time and go Lee Jones, I'm the director of Keep Arkansas Beautiful, and I'm so honored to have all of you join us today. Each spring and fall, Keep Arkansas Beautiful hosts a cleanup season where thousands and thousands of volunteers join together to improve their communities. Some of those groups have actually joined us today, and I'd like to thank them for their, their efforts. Today we have Keep North Little Rock Beautiful, Keep Little Rock Beautiful, Keep Bryant Beautiful, and Keep Sherwood Beautiful all represented here with us, behind us. Our nearly 18,000 volunteers annually are our boots on the ground every single day, and we could not be successful at all without their efforts. They educate their communities on the importance of not littering, they remove litter, they host recycle drives and beautification efforts to improve their communities. I would like to take a brief moment to thank some very important people that help us support our volunteers. First and foremost, I would like to thank the Keep Arkansas Beautiful staff. Some of them, Robin Taylor, you'll hear from in just a second, Dion Elliott and Michael Barker. They help us on a daily basis operate Keep Arkansas Beautiful and support the volunteers. Also, thank you to the Arkansas Department of Parks, Heritage and Tourism for their continued support through a variety of ways. To the Arkansas Department of Transportation who helps us with cleanup supplies. To the Clorox Company in Rogers, Arkansas that has provided us glad trash bags for our volunteers to Goodwill Industries in Arkansas for their efforts to promote our mission throughout all of their locations statewide and for diverting 36.4 million pounds of product away from our Arkansas landfills in 2022 alone. To Keep America Beautiful for also providing us gloves for our volunteers to utilize and safely remove litter to MHP TMSI, our marketing firm that helps us annually spread our mission throughout the state to all Arkansans. And to Blue Cell Coffee, who's here with us today, a huge supporter of cleanups, not only in the state, but worldwide, and have provided refreshments for us. I would also like to thank our commissioners. Uh, Vice Chairwoman Lori Black Hamilton was able to join us, thank you and to all of our commissioners who were unable to join us and our foundation members. And a special thank you to Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders. <laughs> Governor Sanders is a huge supporter of us through a variety of ways, promoting preservation and conservation through the Natural State Initiative and her family has also been integral to Amendment 75 and the creation of Keep Arkansas Beautiful as a commission. So thank you for your dedication. Often we only think of litter as an environmental impact when in all actuality it impacts every aspect of our lives. It detours tourism which the tourism industry is our second lead leading industry across the state, second to agriculture. It welcomes crime. It deters economic development and it impacts our health. That is why Keep Arkansas Beautiful is so passionate in recruiting every Arkansan to join forces with Keep Arkansas Beautiful to make a positive impact in their hometowns. We hope you, that you will be able to join us this fall cleanup season and at this time, I would like to welcome our volunteer program manager, Robin Taylor, who facilitates our cleanup program to give us a brief history about the fall Great Arkansas cleanup. Thank you. Good morning. It's an honor to be here with you all. In 1969, Carl Garner, a former Keep Arkansas Beautiful Commissioner and Engineer for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, established the Great Arkansas Cleanup on Greer's Ferry Lake and the Little Red River. 
This nationally recognized cleanup effort and his dedication to conservation in Arkansas led to the renaming of Federal Lands Cleanup Day to the Carl Garner Federal Lands Cleanup Day in 1995. Carl Garner Federal Cleanup Day occurs on the Saturday after Labor Day and where it all began at Greer's Ferry Lake, it's recognized as the Great Arkansas Cleanup. This Saturday, September 9th, marks the 54th annual Great Arkansas Cleanup at Greer's Ferry Lake. With its success and positive message, Keep Arkansas Beautiful also recognized the Great Arkansas Cleanup and expanded it to a full two-month statewide cleanup campaign. Any Arkansan interested in participating in the Great Arkansas Cleanup can do so from Saturday, September 9th through October 31st. Those seeking to volunteer can receive free supplies based on a first come, first serve basis and while supplies last by registering your event at KeepArkansasBeautiful.com. Lastly, thank you to all of our volunteers for over 50 years of cleanups in the natural state. We could not do it without you. I would like to now introduce um, Deputy Director of Arkansas State Parks, Jeff King. Thank you, Robin, and thank you, Colby. Um, I appreciate you all being here today. Um, the, the Department of Parks, Heritage, and Tourism uh, supports the efforts of, of both of our staff, the commission, and the foundation, and we really appreciate everything you do for the natural state. Arkansas State Parks serve our citizens by enhancing quality, quality of life through exceptional outdoor experiences, connections to Arkansas heritage, and sound resource management. Our division's goal is for guests to experience excellent hospitality and form a personal connection to the parks and places they visit. Each year, the State Parks of Arkansas prioritize the Great Arkansas Cleanup as a division-wide effort across the natural state. Our employees facilitate cleanups wherever litter is most needed, whether that's roadsides leading up to our parks, in wooded areas adjacent to our trails, or on stream banks and lake shores. And this year, participants working on cleanup events are also able to participate in our 100 Hours of Service program, which is part of the centennial uh, celebration of Arkansas State Parks. When we have visitors to our state and to our state parks, to the cities, towns, and com communities that support those parks, we know it's so instrumental to our guest experience that they have a memorable and litter-free time in the natural state. Thanks again to all of the Keep Arkansas volunteers, supporters, and partners that are here with us today, and I'd like to just give them a round of applause. It is now my honor to welcome a truly special guest here with us today. Uh, as the 47th governor of the state of Arkansas, uh, she has created the Natural State Initiative to grow Arkansas's outdoor economy and continues to fulfill her promise to make Arkansas the best place to live, work, and raise a family. Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders. Good morning. Thank you all so much for being here. It is so exciting to be here and join Colby and Robin and Jeff and the rest of the team gathered here behind me and volunteers from all over the state to kick off the great Arkansas cleanup. This is uh, an especially exciting event because this was something my parents were both extremely passionate about when my dad served as governor of Arkansas for nearly 11 years. My parents campaigned all over the state to help raise money for the Keep Arkansas Beautiful program and I think it's one of the most proud achievements that they had during my dad's time as governor and certainly one of the most impactful for our entire state. One of the other reasons I like being here and being part of this event is because it's probably one of the largest volunteer uh, efforts we have anywhere in the state of Arkansas that has such a massive impact in all 75 counties. With nearly 18,000 volunteers coming together with over 600 events and again participating in those events in all 75 counties across the state, it has a tremendous impact. The estimates are up to about $5 million economic impact based off of the work that is done over the course of the next two months. It is something that not only helps make our state better, but frankly, it helps us preserve one of the things that makes Arkansas so special and unique in the first place. We're not the natural state for no reason. We're the natural state because we are one of the most beautiful places anywhere in America. And all of these people coming together and helping us protect the great 
assets that we have, our natural beauty, is so incredibly important. My husband Brian and I kicked off the Natural State Initiative because we believe not only in our state's beauty, but also in the potential that it can have, not just for us to enjoy, but for future generations long after we're gone. It's our second biggest industry in the state, and one of the things that we know can continue to grow and help add not just revenue, but value to each person's life. The quality of life that so many of us get to enjoy in our outdoors is so important. And it's why I'm so glad I get to be here and celebrate this event and kick off what we know will be our biggest and best participation that we've ever had. We're so grateful for the people who come out and help pick up and make Arkansas the natural state and help us preserve uh, the greatness of our beautiful state. So thank you for letting me be here today. Thank you for the work that you do. And let's continue to make Arkansas the best place to live, to work, and to raise a family. Thank you again, Governor Sanders, for joining us today. Uh, it's, it's very special to all of us, all of us. And thank you to all of the volunteers. I see all the Keep Arkansas Beautiful fall cleanup shirts, so that's amazing. I see one of our banners as well. At this time, we would also like to signify Pulaski County as the first county to sign up for our fall Great Arkansas Cleanup Season. While our cleanup season has not officially kicked off until Saturday, we already have 61 counties registered in the pre-registration area of our cleanup. So we are expecting some amazing things this fall. And with that, if you see litter today out here, we do have some cleanup supplies available for everyone. Please get involved if you know someone in your community that wants to make a positive impact. We are here to help them help their communities. Thank you. Good morning and thank you all for being here today. It's great to be with President Hester, House Pro Tem, and many of our other partners and leaders in the legislature. Kind of feels like we're getting the gang all back together again, which is kind of fun. It's been a little too quiet in these hallways. I also want to thank several members of my cabinet, as well as a few of Arkansas's constitutional officers, Lieutenant Governor Leslie Rutledge, Commissioner Tommy Land, and Treasurer Larry Walther for also joining us and being part of this day today. When I took this office, I promised to limit the growth of government before government could limit the growth of liberty. To achieve that, today I'm calling a special session of the legislature, beginning next Monday focused on three things cutting taxes, streamlining state government, and protecting our freedom. It's no secret around the Capitol that tax cuts will be our top priority. Arkansas has Tennessee on one side and Texas on the other. Both are zero income tax states, making it hard sometimes for Arkansas to be competitive. And with President Biden's big government policies, making it even harder for people to make ends meet, Every Arkansan needs a little extra money in their pocket. The legislation we're introducing will cut taxes by even more than we did in the regular session. By the time our lawmakers return home next Wednesday, we will have permanently shaved $250 million off of annual personal income taxes and $58 million off of annual corporate income taxes. This lowers our personal income tax rate to 4.4% and our corporate income tax rate to 4.8%. But that's not all we're doing. We will also offer up to $150 in immediate one-time tax relief to about 1 million middle-class taxpayers, making less than $90,000 a year. And we will create the Arkansas Reserve Fund and fill it with $710 million to keep responsibly phasing out the income tax entirely. These tax cuts go a long way towards shrinking government, but they're just one piece of the puzzle. To make our government smaller, we have to make it more efficient. To do so, we will also update Arkansas's Freedom of Information Act. Arkansas FOIA laws have been largely unchanged since they were signed in 1967. In a time before email, cell phones, text messages, 
and sadly, before some of the more aggressive polarization that we see across our country today. Arkansas has some of the most transparent FOIA laws in the country, and these reforms will do nothing to change that. But some are weaponizing FOIA and taking advantage of our laws to hamper state government and enrich themselves. They don't care about transparency. They want to waste taxpayer dollars, slow down our bold conservative agenda, and frankly, put my family's lives at stake. The last point is very personal. I had to deal with credible death threats when I was in the White House, becoming the first White House press secretary in the history of our country to require Secret Service protection, something that is generally reserved for the president, the vice president, and their families. When I was campaigning for this office, we had violent people track our movements to try to do us harm. A man near Russellville was arrested for threatening to shoot me. And just last month, a man in Oklahoma pled guilty for trying to kill me. Our current FOIA laws put me and my kids at risk. So we will update sections of the law so that the sources and methods Arkansas State Police uses to protect me and my family outside of the governor's mansion are not subject to disclosure. This will function the same as current law, which makes it so that those same sources and methods used within the grounds of the mansion cannot be released. In keeping with our mission of transparency, we will also add a requirement that on a quarterly basis, Arkansas State Police will prepare a report for the legislature that aggregates the cost of security for the first family. We are also updating our laws to the same standard that the federal government uses to keep internal deliberations in the executive branch exempt from FOIA. Right now, a Chinese state-owned company operating in Arkansas could use their employees to FOIA for internal government documents. Somebody suing the state of Arkansas can FOIA our attorneys to determine our legal strategy. That's not just crazy. It's a waste of taxpayer resources. We will end this practice and bring Arkansas in line with federal law and the laws of other states, ranging from New York and California to Oklahoma and Alabama. Lower taxes and more efficient government are our goals, and they are certainly good, but they are not enough. We also have to be sure that government never again tramples on our liberty like it did during the COVID-19 pandemic. Back then, a handful of bureaucrats shut down our schools, our churches, our businesses, and forced masks on our kids and tried to implement vaccine passports. That will not happen again here in the state of Arkansas. When I took office, I repealed a long list of executive orders related to the pandemic. Now we're going further and banning COVID-19 vaccine mandates for all Arkansas state employees. And our State Department of Health will publicize the potential risks related to the COVID-19 vaccine so that all Arkansans can make informed decisions about their health. Cutting taxes, improving efficiency, and expanding liberty. That's what this legislative session is about. After a successful regular session, I never said that we would sit back and rest and do nothing. We're going to continue to make big changes. We're rejecting the status quo, and we're making this government better because that's what the people of Arkansas deserve. I know that there are probably a lot of questions, and I'll be happy to take those after we bring up a couple of our legislative partners to make a few comments. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you, Governor, and also thank you to my or to the leadership both in the House and the Senate for the continued commitment to making sure that we're competitive uh, in Arkansas on our income tax rates here in the state, both for our working families and also for our job creators. And so I think that's demonstrated mostly through the three tenths reduction that is ongoing. But one thing I do want to focus on is the governor's commitment to helping working families here in the state. And I think that's why it's imperative that we were able to add this $150 uh, credit, also uh, doubles up to $300 for a uh, married couple uh, into this tax bill. That is, just to make note, retroactive to the first of this year, and so we will be more immediately feeling the benefit of that here in the state. 
There's not a whole lot we can do, uh, you know, with the nonsensical economic policies that are coming out of D.C. right now, but we can do something, and I think this is a responsible step for us to take again to help those working families that honestly feel like they're, you know, they have their feet out in, underneath them and figuring it out, and it's cut out all over again based on what's coming out again out of D.C. So again, I thank you for your commitment, and also thank you for my colleagues for uh, joining in on the effort. So as the governor mentioned, in addition to the tax cuts, there will be legislation to update, modernize the FOIA law. I just want to briefly outline the four components of that, the four major components of that bill. First and foremost, we are going to take action to protect our governor, her safety, the safety of her family through uh, executive protection and security. The reason that executive protection security exists is because individuals through the nature of their job operate at a higher level of risk personal to their personal safety and it is unacceptable that we would expose uh, our governor or any of our constitutional officers in that way so we're going to do that we're going to create a more reasonable standard for attorneys fees that can be recovered in FOIA lawsuits we're going to adopt uh, attorney-client privilege so that the state is not inherently at a disadvantage in lawsuits so that um, they can't bypass discovery and immediately obtain the state's legal strategy to defend important laws that we pass, like LEARNS, like the SAFE Act, like many others. And then we're going to add in a level of deliberative process that is mirrored on the federal FOIA law and that will enable our state to continue moving forward uh, continue adopting bold conservative policies and allow some level of deliberative process for pre-decisional um, measures such as that. So I look forward to filing this bill later today and working with my colleagues in the legislature to pass it. Thank you. Thank you, David and Jonathan, for your leadership, as well as all of our uh, legislative partners who have been tremendous during both the regular session and know we'll have a continued great working relationship. So thank you for the work you're doing. And with that, we'll open up for questions. Damila. Let me start with the first part of your question on the security part. Anytime you're exposing sources, methods, and patterns, then you're allowing and opening yourself up to vulnerability. But that's not my determination. Neither you nor I are security experts. I don't even pretend to be one on TV. However, I'm taking the advice and the guidance of people who that's their full-time job is to make an assessment, look at vulnerabilities when it comes to security and a determination and advice on how best to do their job. The Arkansas State Police and the Executive Protection Detail are statutorily obligated to protect uh, me, my family, and other constitutional officers. And this is a determination that they've made that reveals the way that they do that. Absolutely. It's ridiculous to act as if this is some massive radical change. We are literally mirroring federal language that was upheld by a Supreme Court decision of seven to two, a bipartisan decision. We are taking that language and almost copying verbatim into state law. It's also similar to uh, more than a dozen other states that have these same protections. When this law was passed in 1967, the devices that you have sitting in front of you and most of the ones that are in people's pockets around the room didn't even exist. We are inhibiting our government's ability to be efficient and modernizing and stifling innovation here in the executive branch 
For instance, uh, one of the specific examples that we've seen is if the state is recruiting a new business to come into Arkansas and one of their competitors can simply FOIA their strategy in which to do so, it puts us at an unfair advantage. The idea that we would have no ability to act pre-decisional is totally crazy and out of line with what is taking place in most states around the country as well as the federal government. Again, by revealing the sources, the methods, the patterns that are used in order to protect an individual, uh, you're putting that person in vulnerability. If they know you travel with two people versus four people or six people and you take this route versus this one or you fly specifically on this airline versus another one, you're revealing the way in which they do their job. Again, this isn't an assessment or determination that I've made myself. This is by people who are experts in their field and have made uh, the assessment that this is the best way to protect both me and my family as well as other constitutional officers. I mean, I, I think it's hard to go through, like, from here, case by case, every single example. But if we are in the deliberative process, in the decision-making process, where we're still in discussion, um, the idea that somebody couldn't throw out an idea and have that discussed and even dismissed without it hitting the front page of the paper really stifles and inhibits our ability as a government to function and to be innovative. It would keep anybody from wanting to raise up uh, an innovative or different idea for sake of being on the front page of the paper and eviscerated uh, for simply suggesting something might be possible. I, it would depend on what the final decision looked like. I mean, you'd have to walk through the step-by-step -step process. Uh, there would be some, if the decision was completely thrown out, then it's possible that it wouldn't be subject to FOIA. Well, not just the legislature. I mean, there are a lot of executive actions that are done without the legislature as well. Well, because the premise of your question is completely wrong. We're not hiding anything. Again, we are trying to add government efficiency. If you think about when this law was passed in 1967, a deliberative process probably took place in a room like this. In fact, many conversations did take place in a room like this. There wasn't the back and forth uh, electronic communication that even existed. You couldn't have a conversation in the same way today that you do uh, at that point when the law was passed. We're simply modernizing it and bringing it into the 21st century. Again, this isn't some like radical idea. It literally mirrors federal language that was supported in a bipartisan fashion. Absolutely not. Again, there's a number of areas where they would still have the ability to FOIA uh, records, expenses, all those things are still public record and available for any citizen across the state or frankly outside of to have access to. Which ones are you specifically? The, the 250 million? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Jonathan probably has it in his head. If you have a specific question, I'm sure he'd be happy to answer it for you. Did you have a follow? -up? Yeah. No. So I mean, it's roughly 150 million on the three tenths reduction for individual, 
35 million or so, I think, for the uh, corporate, and it's 155 million uh, for the one time credit that's retroactive. Well, if you look, one, at what takes place uh, both through the Secret Service as well as other executive pr protection details in states around the country, we're actually going a step further than most states by providing that aggregate cost of uh, expense to protect the first family. A lot of states provide nothing at all. Frankly, Arkansas doesn't provide that right now, so that's an additional transparency that we've added in this legislation. But it's also an assessment that was done by outside security company as well as the Arkansas State Police. I can't imagine that a threat assessment would be available so that you could see every vulnerability that might exist. That seems irresponsible to me. I mean, I know there are pieces of legislation, there are individual members that I've talked to that have not asked for financial impact studies uh, from DFNA and other things similar when it goes to business recruitment that people have stopped some of those communications because of the ability to FOIA and stifling that. Take one more question. Uh, I'll take the retroactive piece first. That's only specific to the security component, and that's largely due to, again, the patterns that would have been used in the previous administration or similar to this one. There was also a significant amount of conversation uh, during the campaign because both myself as well as the Democrat nominee would be the first governors to take office uh, in decades that have young children. And so the dynamics and the protections that would be in place would have been very different uh, regardless of who won that race, uh, given the fact that young children would be under the executive protection detail for the first time in a long time. Uh, this legislation isn't about any one particular person. It's about protecting the vulnerabilities within our law, stopping the weaponizing and harassment uh, that, frankly, is what FOIA is being used for in some cases right now, and making our government more modern and more efficient, something that we pledged to do and talked about extensively uh, during the two years I spent on the campaign. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. It is an absolute honor to host this amazing group of people at the Arkansas Governor's Mansion. I've actually lived in this house longer than any other, so it kind of felt a little bit like a homecoming when our family moved back in earlier this year. But I didn't always feel that way about this place. I remember when my dad first became governor and we had to move from Texarkana to come here. Like most 13-year-olds, I thought the world was going to end when I had to leave my friends behind. I told my parents that I was old enough to take care of myself and I would just stay in Texarkana and live with my friends and they could come visit me when they felt like it. Unfortunately and very surprisingly that didn't go over very well. Soon I was packing up all of my things and saying goodbye to all my friends and taking every chance I got to let my parents know just how much they were ruining my life. Obviously, I survived, and I came to absolutely love this house, which became a home, and love my new hometown. But I didn't run for governor because I like this house. I ran because I absolutely love this state, and because I think we have a fantastic opportunity to shake up and change the status quo. And there's no better place to do that than with education. I ran to be the education governor because there's no greater tool for taking kids off the path of poverty and putting them onto the path of prosperity. We focused on Arkansas Learns in my first legislative session because I believe it is the single best way to overhaul our schools and change the trajectory of our state. 
And I'm proud to say that we passed that law with overwhelming margins in both the House and the Senate. LEARNS is a grab bag of fantastic changes. We're raising the starting teacher pay to $50,000, one of the highest in the country. And we're implementing the proven practices that we know will improve literacy. Just last week, I had the opportunity to welcome 78 new literacy coaches who we will deploy to our struggling schools to make sure every single student can read by the third grade. We're investing in career readiness training and pre-K so that our education system truly supports kids from cradle to career. But one of the biggest changes, and I think the one that all of you in this room care the most about, is Arkansas's new education freedom accounts. The ACE scholarship program has been ahead of the curve on this issue, providing education freedom to low-income families in Arkansas and around the country. And now we are expanding that statewide. Already nearly 5,000 families and 100 schools have signed up for the EFA program. And in three years, this opportunity will be available to every single Arkansas student. I made EFAs one of the cornerstones of Arkansas Learns because I believe, like you do, that no child should be stuck in a struggling school just because of their zip code. Most families choose and will continue to choose their neighborhood public school. And as someone who graduated from my local public school, I know how important the sense of community that can provide. But that one-size-fits-all model that Arkansas used to have let far too many students slip through the cracks. That's why we'll soon let every family choose whichever is best, whether it be public, private, parochial, or homeschool. There is an education freedom revolution going on in this country, and I'm very proud to say that Arkansas is at the tip of the spear. But we wouldn't have gotten here without the leadership from so many in this room, our state legislators, and the dedication of organizations like A Scholarships. You were empowering parents long before government was, and you continue to play a critical role in helping low-income families break out of the cycle of poverty. I can't thank you enough for your support of education freedom and for building student by student the future generation of Arkansas leaders. Thank you for being here today. Thank you so much for your important mission, your dedication to our students, to our state, and to our country. We are all better for it. Thank you so much, and please enjoy your event here today. God bless. We will also update Arkansas's Freedom of Information Act. Arkansas FOIA laws have been largely unchanged since they were signed in 1967, in a time before email, cell phones, text messages, and sadly, before some of the more aggressive polarization that we see across our country today. Arkansas has some of the most transparent FOIA laws in the country, and these reforms will do nothing to change that. But some are weaponizing FOIA and taking advantage of our laws to hamper state government and enrich themselves. They don't care about transparency. They want to waste taxpayer dollars, slow down our bold conservative agenda, and frankly, put my family's lives at stake. The last point is very personal. I had to deal with credible death threats when I was in the White House, becoming the first White House press secretary in the history of our country to require Secret Service protection, something that is generally reserved for the President, the Vice President, and their families. When I was campaigning for this office, we had violent people track our movements to try to do us harm. A man near Russellville was arrested for threatening to shoot me. And just last month, a man in Oklahoma pled guilty for trying to kill me. Our current FOIA laws put me and my kids at risk. So we will update sections of the law so that the sources and methods Arkansas State Police uses to protect me and my family outside of the governor's mansion 
are not subject to disclosure. This will function the same as current law which makes it so that those same sources and methods used within the, within the grounds of the mansion cannot be released. In keeping with our mission of transparency, we will also add a requirement that on a quarterly basis, Arkansas State Police will prepare a report for the legislature that aggregates the cost of security for the first family. We are also updating our laws to the same standard that the federal government uses to keep internal deliberations in the executive branch exempt from FOIA. Right now, a Chinese state-owned company operating in Arkansas could use their employees to FOIA for internal government documents. Somebody suing the state of Arkansas can FOIA our attorneys to determine our legal strategy. That's not just crazy. It's a waste of taxpayer resources. We will end this practice and bring Arkansas in line with federal law and the laws of other states, ranging from New York and California to Oklahoma and Alabama. Uh, Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders became a household name during the Trump administration. Everyone knew her. We are so happy to have her back in in Arkansas. It, it's just great to have her back here. And even more than that, it's great to have her as our governor. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to take any of the time here. But, but the other day, something was said, and I think it's, it's really a good point that was made. When they were watching us during the, the news conference the other day, and they said, this is a perfect example of the executive branch working with the legislative branch to get things done. And this administration has certainly came out of the gates very hard. We've got a, we've got a lot of great things accomplished during the, the general session, and we've got a lot of great things accomplished during this, this last special session. We couldn't have done that without good leadership working with the legislative branch. So please help me welcome my governor, Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders. Thank you so much, Rick. Uh, you know, we just finished up a, a pretty intense few days in a special session, and um, I think if anybody else had asked me to be here, I'm not sure I would have made it, but because I absolutely love and appreciate Rick and all the hard work that he has done and the incredible partnership that we've had with members of our legislature, I certainly wanted to be able to spend some time here with you this morning. And we are so grateful for your leadership and, and work that you've been able to do. It's great to see a number of our other Arkansas legislators that are out in the crowd. Uh, as I said, we just finished up a special session. Uh, and my guess is they're pretty ready to get out of Little Rock and get back home. But we are thankful that we get to spend a little bit of time here with each of you today before we do that. And of course, I want to thank all of the legislators who have come in from around the country who are attending this event and visiting our capital city. You know, I grew up in a lot of different towns all over Arkansas, but the governor's mansion here in Little Rock is actually the house that my family and I have lived in longer than any other. Now, some of you probably think, wow, that's amazing. You're pretty lucky. And don't get me wrong, there are a lot of great perks and wonderful parts of being governor. But there are also a few downsides to raising three kids who are 11, 9, and 8 in probably what many people would consider Arkansas's most public home. Just a few weeks ago, I walked out of our front door and I found our two boys, Huck and George, who are our 9 and 8 year old. They had taken off all of their clothes and stripped down in the front yard and were swimming in the front fountain of the governor's mansion. And as soon as they saw me, they knew they'd been busted. And George, my youngest, he looked up at me with just a completely serious, stoic face and goes, it's okay, mom, be cool. <laughs> he said, it's not that deep. We're not gonna drown. I said, George, my biggest concern is not that you're gonna drown. It's the fact that you don't have any clothes on and you're in the front yard of the governor's mansion. He didn't seem to be bothered by that at all. Besides some of the chaos, though, it's been an amazing place to live and make new memories with my own kids. And Little Rock is an absolutely fantastic place to raise a family. But 
while this is our capital city and this is a great place to raise a family, that's not where the action when it comes to Arkansas's energy industry is mostly focused. If you look down in South Arkansas where we drill for oil and natural gas and we are now moving at breakneck speed to become the lithium capital of America, that is where the activity and excitement around Arkansas's energy industry is coming from. South Arkansas is home to one of North America's largest brine processing industries, and new technology allows us to siphon lithium from that brine. Lithium, in turn, is critical for batteries and other energy products. And I'm not being dramatic when I say that this has the potential to transform the region and our entire state. Companies are already making massive investments to South Arkansas. And once they fully scale up operations, they estimate that our state could produce 15% of the entire world's lithium supply. Coincidentally, this is not South Arkansas's first rodeo being an energy powerhouse. Towns like El Dorado, Magnolia, and Smackover were built on oil and gas drilling. And our state still produces 4 million barrels of oil and 400 billion cubic feet of natural gas each year. I believe that these industries can continue to coexist and thrive. After all, whether it's lithium, oil, or natural gas, it translates to new jobs and new businesses for our Kansans. My administration won't discriminate when it comes to the energy industry. To help these industries grow, we're investing in workforce and education two critical components that every company asks us about every single day. We created the workforce cabinet in my first days in office to bring an all of government approach to the worker shortage. And we passed Arkansas Learns, my transformational education bill to bring Arkansas schools to, to the very top, making us competitive with every state in the country. Already students are entering this school year with new literacy coaches new dual degree diploma programs, higher paid teachers, and expanded education freedom. Amid all this though, Arkansas and every other state represented in this room are facing an all out attack on American energy independence. President Biden seems to have a vendetta against the energy industry, which explains why gas prices have surged under his leadership. His policies, frankly, run from bad to worse killing the Keystone Pipeline, a near moratorium on oil and gas drilling on federal lands, a $6 billion tax on natural gas producers, and just last week, the cancellation of leases in Alaska that could have supplied our country with 11 billion barrels of oil. The president's war on energy industry hurts all Americans, but I believe that we as state leaders can fight back. We can grow our own energy industries we can invest in the energy workers of tomorrow, and together we can bring energy independence back to this country. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for the work that you do every single day. And together we will continue to make America energy independent, and Arkansas is certainly going to help lead the way in that effort. Thanks so much for your work, and thanks for letting me be here with you for a few minutes today. Great to be here with you all today. And Katie, thank you for such a kind introduction. Katie did amazing work when she was actually working for the previous governor. And I know she's doing a great job now that she is here with the Arkansas Hospitality Association. It is great to be here with this crowd. Even if I haven't had the chance to meet everybody here in the room, I've probably had the chance to visit one of your hotels, your restaurants, or certainly the town that you're from. That's because when you're running for governor and working on previous statewide campaigns for my dad and others, it gave me the chance to stop in basically every single town, big and small, all across the state of Arkansas. In fact, when I was a kid and my dad was running for office, diners were usually one of the best chances for him to meet voters. Some people think that was just because he liked to find uh, the off the beaten path places to to find hidden gems and best restaurants in Arkansas, but it's really because for a political campaign, you have a built-in crowd if you go around a mealtime. And uh, we learned very quickly, if you can't turn people out, show up during mealtime and you have uh, voters that can't go anywhere. 
When he eventually became governor and our family moved from Texarkana, one of our very first nights here in Little Rock was actually spent in a hotel room. It wasn't all the, the glamour, though, that you might think. I remember wanting to make a very special first entrance into the Little Rock social scene at my dad's inauguration. Unfortunately for me, my mom had other ideas. I'll never forget, nor will I ever forgive, the outfit that my mom chose for me for that first special moment. It was a blue one-piece suit complete with shorts and shoulder pads. And yes, it's as bad as it sounds. Even in the mid-90s, that was out of style. 13-year-old me was mortified, but it turned out not to make a dent in my Little Rock social life, and thankfully, I have loved living in Little Rock ever since. A big part of what makes Little Rock and cities and towns, frankly, all across our state so special is our hospitality industry and the people who make it up. If you want to break the ice with an Arkansan, just ask them about their favorite roadside joint or about their favorite Arkansas brewery or who they ran into in the lobby of the Capitol Hotel. In my administration, we're working hard to make sure that the hospitality industry is thriving and growing for generations to come. Just today, we announced that tourism tax revenue, a very good measure of industry spending, is up nearly 9% since this time last year. Tourism employment reached a record high earlier this year, and our goal is to grow it even more. Alongside my husband, Brian, we launched the Natural State Initiative to grow our tourism industry and invite even more people, Arkansans and out-of-staters alike, to explore every part of our great state. Already, that group has guided new legislation to improve facilities at state parks, cut red tape and park maintenance, invest in Main Street revitalization, and invite more entrepreneurs into our outdoor economy. Our goal is to double the size of our tourism industry in the next decade. And while I know that is a huge target, I firmly believe not only do we have the people and the natural beauty, we have the capacity to get the job done. My administration is also tackling the ongoing problems facing both the hospitality industry and every other business in our state. We know that workforce is a huge issue. So I launched the Workforce Cabinet in my early days of the administration to bring an all-of-government approach to the issue. We know taxes are way too high, so we've permanently cut income taxes by $250 million and corporate taxes by $58 million to make our state more competitive. We know that we all want safer streets and a more educated workforce, so we passed the PROTECT Act and Arkansas learns to bring long overdue reforms to both of these issues. And we're working hard to pave the way for Arkansas business owners. But I'm under absolutely no illusion that government can somehow ma wave a magic wand and get the job done on our own. It takes each one of you to make our economy grow, to make our businesses and our state better and stronger. And that's why I'm here today, is because I believe in the work you're doing we want to be a great partner from the state. We want to make sure that your industries continue to thrive because that's when our state wins. And I know that working together, we can not only double our tourism industry, but we can have a great partnership that lifts every single Arkansan up. Thank you so much for the work that you do. Thank you for the investment that you make into our state. And thank you for giving us the best story possible to tell about the best state in the country. We appreciate what you're doing and thank you for letting us play a quick and small part in your event today. Thanks so much. Uh, do some questions and so we'll leave the majority of the time open for that but I am so excited to be here and get to be part of this program and what Mike has been working so hard over the last several months to put together. I actually met Mike Rogers right here and a few people around the room were Part of that event, we did a round table specifically on workforce development, and we were sitting there, and this guy just wouldn't stop talking. He kept going and kept going, um, but he actually had a lot of important, knowledgeable things to say, and we walked out of there, and I said, we're going to hire him. I don't know for what, 
I don't know how we are going to convince him to leave the private sector and come work for the state, but I walked out of that room and I said, we have to have Mike Rogers helping us lead this effort. And um, I went on a crusade at that point to recruit Mike and am so thankful that we were able to do that and get him to take on the new role that we created as the chief workforce officer. There is very little that is more important in our state to help us drive economic development, economic growth, than building a skilled, qualified workforce. Over the course of the two years I spent on the campaign, every single community I went to, every single business leader I met with, whether I was in Northwest, Southwest, Northeast, Southeast, or Central Arkansas, every single one said the exact same thing. The biggest challenge they have in their business is hiring skilled, qualified workers. So we knew that had to be one of the biggest focuses that we had. Starting first with education, that was one of the biggest priorities I had during this last legislative session and will continue to be the biggest priority I have, hopefully as eight years as Arkansas's governor. Because to me, there's no greater way that we can build that workforce than by creating a solid foundation through education. So we've taken aggressive, bold, transformational steps over the course of the last several months to make sure every student in the state of Arkansas has access to a quality education. And now we want to help them get into the right work, into the right career, putting those kids on a pathway to prosperity versus being dependent on the system forever. And with the work that Mike is doing, we know that we can accomplish that. And so we're glad that you're here today. We're glad that you're going to help be part of helping us because this is not something government can fix on its own. This is not something that government can wave a wand and make better. This takes everybody coming together. It takes the business industry, the community leaders, our educators, and government coming to the same table and working together to address this problem. I think Arkansas can set the standard. I think we can create the blueprint of how workforce development is done correctly, and that happens with each of you here in this room today. So I'm very thankful for your willingness to be here and be part of our efforts to really put Arkansas on the map when it comes to workforce development. So thank you, and with that, um, I will happily open it up and take some questions. And I also want to say a huge thank you. We've got a number of our legislators that are here. Senator English, who was doing work on uh, workforce development and education long before it was cool. The very first time uh, I met with her during the campaign, she was pulling literally folders and folders and uh, these huge spreadsheets that spread across about six of these tables put together from the back of her car to show me all the things that we were going to do. And um, we're very excited for her efforts, but there are a number of other legislators around the room. If you guys don't mind just standing up uh, so that we can recognize you and thank you for the work that you're doing, because none of the things that we were able to do this last session would have been possible without the leadership of these guys. Thank you all. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike, and we'll be happy to take some questions. Yeah, so we have our first question. You're going to get to see Mike run, the Mike run. So Randy Henderson with Nucor had a question to start. You had to sit in the back corner, didn't you, Randy? Thank you, Mike. Uh, I just knew Mike would put me on the spot this morning. Um, everyone, if you have a challenge in your workforce, what challenges do you have in your workforce with regards to recruitment, with regards to people that need jobs, and regards to people that are unemployed? Randy, you want me to answer that or this group of people? I'm kidding. So I just want to make sure I, I understand the question correctly. You're asking what are the challenges that we have for recruitment? I think one of the biggest things certainly that I've heard, and, and obviously this room probably knows better, and, and different industries are going to have different problems, but so many of the kids that show up, and even adults, they're completely unprepared and unable to take on tasks that are given to them. Uh, one of the things that I met with and took a tour of a, a pretty large-scale manufacturing business down in South Arkansas, they told me that one of the tests that they give is to point out three different measurements using a ruler. And they're very basic. I mean, it was like, can you put you know, 
two inches and show me, and they give them a ruler and ask them to measure it out. They said nine out of ten students that come that are graduates from high school cannot do that. And so we aren't teaching basic skills. So we have to do a much better job. That's why education is so important, is we have to equip students. One of the things I'm so excited that doesn't get a lot of attention in the LEARNS legislation is the dual diploma track, where students in high school are getting to earn certification and credit so they can go immediately into the workforce upon graduation. They're getting those skills as sophomores, juniors, and seniors in high school, and they're being taught the things that they need to go directly into the workforce. And they're also developing a relationship with a community uh, of business leaders that already exist right where they are. So I think that's one of the biggest pieces that we have to do a better job on is equipping students with the right skills, um, engaging the business community into our education, bringing that in so that they're actually teaching the students those skills that they need so that they can go into the workforce can make a huge difference. One of the other things that uh, some people aren't super excited about and have had a little bit of pushback that frankly I think is one of the more important pieces of the LEARNS legislation is the community service requirement for graduation. And I had somebody ask me a few months ago, Sarah, what about the kid who doesn't have a parent that's engaged that will help get them to and from a community service project or they may not know anybody in their community that can help them complete that? I said, well, that's the exact student that needs it more than anybody else because they need a relationship with somebody that has a success story that they can look at and they can say, you know what, I can do this. Their school can partner with them. It is very achievable for us to help match them up with mentors within their community so that not only are they seeing hey, I can achieve this level of success, but they also have a point of pride. Even if it's picking up trash at the high school football stadium on Saturday or Sunday after the game, they get to come in on Monday and say, I did that. This is something they got to be part of. And for a kid to have that point of pride when they have very little else to be excited about and look up to, that changes things for them. So I think there are a lot of different pieces that are helping us prepare students in a way that frankly we have never done in the past. For so long we look at education as simply what does a student know, not asking the question what can a student do when they graduate. And we have to take a step back and say what are we preparing them to be capable of doing when they leave here. And if it isn't stepping into the workforce or going into a continuing education so that they are better prepared for the workforce, then frankly those of us involved in the system are failing those students and we have to do better and we can. Anybody else? If you have a question, feel free to just raise your hand. You're right here on the front. We're sharing a mic, so. We'll share that mic as well. Uh, Governor, first of all, uh, thank you very much for your emphasis. Thank you for bringing uh, Mike on board and the focus. Um, just um, a little more specifically about state government from your perspective, how, how can how can you bring uh, the resources of state government and your administration to addressing these particular needs? His question, because you didn't hear in the back, was what can we do as state government to bring the resources together? W one of the things, and Mike, I'm going to put you on the spot and make you talk a little bit about this. I, I, my guess is you're going to walk the group through some of this here in a little bit. But one of the things that Mike has been working around the clock on um, is an online resource center so that you can see in one location very easily, number one, what jobs are available uh, right there in your backyard. What does it pay and what do I need in order to get it? And it's something that an employee, an employer, all can go to and it will be an easy to follow, easy to understand system so that we're bringing all of the different elements to the same location and making it very user friendly. Um, I think it's one of the things that will be a great resource tool for both individuals looking for work, but also employers seeking to hire. Um, and that's something that will help us bring all of those resources to one location. It also allows us, if an employer says, 
I need a hundred of a certain type of worker, we can easily help pull what we have available, people that are looking for work, specific things like that so that we can work directly with the business community to help address a need. We can also then look at uh, working with a high school or a technical center, much like the one we're standing in, a training facility. If there's a new company coming in, we can partner with them to help train those individual workers so they can go straight into the workforce using that resource center. So Mike, if you don't mind, can you give a little bit more color and breakdown to what you guys have been working on and the timeline too for the launch? I love to put the pressure on in front of a large crowd of people so that it happens faster. You know, it's been amazing the orchestration of the workforce cabinet, which we'll get to soon, but the the heavy lifters in the room, the people have been working tirelessly to bring together a vision, an idea, a strategy to serve our Kansans has been amazing. It started with the idea of eHarmony meets Indeed. Many of you have heard me say that already. Then I came back with what if Google Maps meets Netflix and it's a one place, single sign on portal front page place facing that I can get this navigation six clicks, clicks or less to an answer. So we haven't released the name yet. Are we going to keep them in suspense? We want to. Well, what if they don't like it? Now it's, <laughs> now, now, now I feel like they have to. They're going to love it. They're going to love it. So it's called Launch, and um, we want to launch people into the workforce, and uh, I think it's going to be a really great uh, part of our process. And I'm glad that you mentioned the workforce cabinet because I did not do that earlier. And I think that's one of the other ways that we're bringing all the elements together. One of the things we noticed very quickly um, upon stepping into state government is that we have a lot of different divisions within state government that are specifically tasked with helping on workforce development. And I asked how often they met and was looking to get this report of all the different things that they're working on together. And when I asked that, the guy I was talking to said, well, we've never sat down together. I said, I don't understand. How is it possible that there are seven different divisions and you are all literally tasked with working on building a skilled, qualified workforce and you don't meet regularly. And they were like, well, we just each operate kind of our area and our division. So we quickly created the workforce cabinet and now all of our cabinet secretaries are meeting on the monthly basis um, and talking frequently with one another about how we're bringing all those programs together and in integrating the system. We were functioning so much in silos that we were duplicating efforts. We didn't know what was working and what wasn't working. And now we have a much more streamlined, efficient process that Mike is helping lead. And several members of our workforce cabinet are here today. And we have some of the best and brightest people, uh, both from the private sector and from public service that are coming together and helping us address this problem. So I'm really thankful for their commitment and the work that they're doing. Randy, I said I wasn't going to call on you. So if anybody else has a question, we'll be I'm kidding. Governor, again, let me amen what Danny said. Thanks for being here and all the leadership and the effort, especially with Mike's leadership. Um, a big part of the challenge that employers face, all we hear from members is the people that I see and are, that are candidates fall short very often. It's tough to hire, as you've heard those stories time after time. Our labor force participation rate is running about five and a half to six percentage points below the national average. To me, this is one of the root causes of the supply problem. The demand is there. The supply is what we've got to work on. Is there any effort, I know there is, or conversations going on with some of the, the health and welfare agencies that meet those people who are not, who are on the sidelines with with um, benefit programs and all that kind of stuff. Is there any is there any activity or way to sort of connect the supply with the demand that would get at that participation rate? I'm, I, there are certainly some things that we can do, and and one of the things that we've been pushing for, and Secretary Putnam, uh, who runs DHS, is, is here and part of the workforce cabinet. And one of the areas that we are aggressively leaning into are workforce requirements. 
um, for people that are on government assistance and programs. And when we have able-bodied individuals, they should be participating in the workforce of our state. And so we've applied uh, for a waiver through CMS to pursue that. We feel very confident. I know it's been done in the past, but Arkansas is actually poised to, um, and I may put Secretary Putnam on the spot because she spent a lot of time researching and working for us to find a new way to apply for that waiver. And we feel like we have done that in a very creative and different way that puts us on much better footing. Um, um, Secretary Putnam, if you don't mind just kind of giving a breakdown, but I think that we're always looking for ways to do that, and that's one of our best places where I think we have the ability and some leverage to pull some of those able-bodied individuals off the sidelines and put them into the workforce. So if you don't mind just giving a little more detail. I didn't know I signed up for a speaking part, but uh, I'm Christy Putnam. I'm Secretary of Department of Human Services. Um, literally every issue that we deal with in our communities that's a, a social challenge can be solved with the right opportunity. And um, so one of the things that we are focusing on is we, we requested, I think my uh, second week here, I went to Secretary McDonald and I said the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families program is something that we could really use at DHS to help support some of our individuals who need additional connections. So what we're working on, like the governor said, we are working on multiple fronts, one of which is applying for a waiver from Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services to allow us to incorporate a work component. It's not a requirement, it's a work component in our Medicaid program for our expanded population, those who are um, have, have received Medicaid because we expanded here in Arkansas. That's just one of the ways. We have other work programs in our, pro, in our department. We have SNAP employment and training. Many of you are probably providers and familiar with that. Uh, but we are looking to combine all these things with Mike's help and with the workforce cabinet's help to make sure that we're wrapping around services and supports for families who just have some barriers to employment. I know, um, you know, I've been in the private sector. I know that a lot of people have childcare, transportation. Those are the two top reasons why people say they can't work. And then there's also the fiscal cliff, the, the uh, benefits cliff. So when they can't promote or can't work extra hours because if they get extra income, additional income, they move out of eligibility for assistance. That is something that we're going to need everybody in this room and beyond to help address because it is not a quick fix. Um, so we'll, we'll be bringing lots of ideas and solutions, but we will be asking for help. Um, and so I just appreciate the support. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to work with great partners on the workforce cabinet, but we look forward to partnering with the employers. So thank you. One thing I want to add to that, that we are doing is trying to lead by example from the state perspective. And Secretary Putnam um, came to us with this idea to run a pilot program, which we actually have kicked off and started at DHS, where we allow workers um, to bring their children to work, uh, newborn babies, up to six months, is that correct? I want to make sure I get the, the numbers correct for the pilot program. but. That does a couple things. It helps us keep moms in the workforce, but it also helps provide that bonding time that we know is so important, um, and there's so much data to support. Um, and so that's one of the things that we're trying to do from a state perspective is lead by example and allow those moms to continue in the workforce. We've also started a program that we're piloting at DHS as well uh, that is part of that. And that allows parents to bring their kids to work on days if the school closes um, last minute, which a lot of parents have experienced over the last couple of years in particular. Um, it's not a, a long-term daycare. We are not creating that at DHS, to be clear. But there are so many times where parents have something come up at the last minute, um, and they either means they can't come to work or they're leaving their kids at home by themselves and so we want to alleviate that um, and so we created that bring to work program you have to have uh, approval from your supervisor to participate and things like that but it's something that we're trying to pilot from a state perspective and we're continuing to look for innovative ways that we can engage and bring more people into the workforce um, and lead by example as the state sure yes ma'am Capture it. We want to. People are watching remotely, so we want to make sure that it's it's here. Now, now you got to be careful. <laughs> That's okay. I'm Sarah Roberts with Cobalt Aero Services in Hot Springs. Um, I was. We've ran into the problem here lately, uh, where evidently the COVID crisis is over, so a lot of people are coming off of state insurance, and I've ran into a major crisis of everybody 
scrambling to get insurance and I can't afford it. I can't afford my medicine. I can't afford this. They say I make too much and they're making 11, $12 an hour. So what are we doing to alleviate that? Or is it a, is it something that is going to fix itself or they just have to reapply because we've had a lot of that. I, I was going to say, I, I think I'm happy to answer that if you'd like, Governor. Um, so the public health emergency unwinding is what you're referring to, and we have gone through eligibility redetermination. If individuals are, are making too much money to qualify for their level of Medicaid, they have been discontinued. What we've been working on is we've been trying to partner with providers and with other community partners to make sure that if they qualify for support through the federal marketplace, that they are getting referred to that, because chances are if they're, if they're making just too much to to qualify for Medicaid, they probably qualify for a significant subsidy up to 400% of the federal poverty level. So that's something that I'm happy to, to offer my contact information. People will be reapplying. If they were discontinued in error or they didn't return their information, then they should reach out to DHS. Um, but, but we definitely want to make sure that they're connected to the right level of coverage. There's coverage for them. It just may be a different kind of coverage. Just to also add a point of clarification, I think one of the big things that um, people may not be getting full picture is that we had, uh, I want to say on average, about 20 to 30,000 people a month prior to COVID are removed from those roles uh, as standard practice because they are no longer eligible. No one that is eligible for Medicaid should be removed. These are people who either have gotten jobs in the process over the last couple of years uh, and no longer are meeting that eligibility requirement. This is something that we've always done and always removed moved people who are no longer eligible, but that was put on pause during the uh, COVID pandemic. We went through a couple years where no individual was able to be removed, whether they had uh, taken on a new job or had no longer met the eligibility requirement, we could not remove them. And so we had a backlog of about four to 500,000 people roughly that were no longer eligible that traditionally would have been rotated off. So it feels like there are a lot more all at one time because there are, uh, but there was a, a law passed that also required Arkansas to remove those individuals within six months. And so DHS has been working around the clock to put out notification to those individuals that they would be removed, but if they felt that was a mistake, they could reapply. And there were a lot of different processes and points of contact uh, attempted to make sure anybody that was eligible still received care. And if you, you know, as the secretary said, there are a lot of different pathways. Even if it's not Medicaid, there are a lot of other options that we can help facilitate through DHS if they still need assistance. Sure. Yes, sir. Walk that back there to you. Thank you for meeting me halfway. Yes. Thank you for having this. My name's Chris West. Uh, I own a plumbing business, 34 years in the trade, so I'm here to represent skilled trades, also representing uh, Plumbing, Heating, Cooling Contractors Association of Arkansas, which has newly been formed. My question is, uh, my business model, to frame the question, my business model has been to recruit young kids out of school. Um, I've had to mainly draw in the first 20 years, probably, from homeschool programs because there was this wall in the public education system. Um, it's been my goal to basically recruit young kids, give them a trade, mentor them into life, make it to where they can have a lifelong career for me with all the benefits that the white collar world enjoys. And we've achieved that. So my question is, what can we do to re-educate the educator that skilled trades is not a second choice? Um, one example, I have a employee that's an apprentice and he has a master's degree with speech pathology and literally worked a year in the program and left because he couldn't find the value in what he was doing. And so basically he's a classic example of where he was misdirected, you know, at an early age. So how can we re-educate the educator? First of all, if you could give your number out to everybody in the room, because anytime you really need a plumber, it's very hard to get them to show up. So um, I feel like you have a pretty captive audience for business right here. But I, I think you pose a really great 
question and, and certainly a problem that we have allowed to, to build exponentially over the last several decades. For so long, we kind of pushed, frankly, what I think is a lie to so many kids. Most of the people in this room were raised to think that if they somehow didn't go and get a four-year degree, they were less than when nothing could be further from the truth. We have to change the way that we are talking about opportunity that exists right here in our own backyards, whether it is that skilled trade uh, in plumbing, electricians, manufacturing. There are so many incredible pathways for students that don't require a four-year degree. Um, putting those apprenticeship programs, that dual diploma track that we're trying to implement into high schools all across the state, those are the types of things that we, I think we will see a real difference. But letting kids know that there are a lot of different ways to build a career and be successful is really important. One of the things I talk about a lot too is we have to put it in terms that kids understand. You start trying to talk to a 15, 16, 17 year old kid about their 401k and the benefits and things like that, you've lost them. You start talking to them about the fact that they may be able to own a boat and have season tickets to the Razorbacks, you all of a sudden have their attention. And I think putting it in terms that make sense to kids is something that we have to do a better job on. And that's one of the things that we're trying to do. And I think that's one of the places where Mike is really going to have a lot of opportunity is those partnerships with uh, junior high and high schools around the state helping people understand the various opportunities, but not just what exists, but helping them build a pathway to get there too. And partnering with people like you who are willing to take on and train those kids is gonna be what I think makes a long-term difference. I think we got time for a couple more questions. Yes, ma'am. Thanks so much for uh, um, being here and focusing on the issue and for bringing together the existing departments working on this. I think that's extraordinary. My question has more to do with how can the state continue to support emerging industries? Um, industry moves quickly and new things are always on the forefront. And right now I feel like it's landing on nonprofits who are working well with OSD and others. But um, how can the state help to support that in terms of helping to create the career progressions, link them to training opportunities, help the employers know they don't have to always train completely internally. Great question. I think that's where we have to lean somewhat on the business community to help us guide those steps. Uh, that's one of the things I know that Mike is, is trying to work on. But one thing I, I try to point out is that as a small state, we have the ability to take on a handful of things and do them really, really well. We don't have to be all things to all people. We don't have to be the best in 400 different industries, but we can be really good at about 20 or 25. So let's zero in on the places where we know we can win and let's really lean into those spaces. That's kind of what Mike has been building out that I know he's planning to walk through is some of the categories and then building skills training centers around helping produce uh, and provide the skills training needed so that we can be number one in those categories. If we go out and Hugh McDonald, the Secretary of Commerce is here, and if Hugh tries to chase after every single business, every single potential uh, company anywhere on the globe, we'll never land anything. But if we decide there are a handful of places where we have the right to win and we're really aggressive and we build the skilled training centers around those areas, then I think we have the ability to really transform our success story. And so that's what we're trying to do is streamline that process and really focus in on some key areas that we know we can really excel in. Class is over. Hopefully that means it's lunchtime. We'll take one last question right here. Hey, Governor, Chad Causey, Arkansas Aerospace and Defense. Uh, you touched on a lot of uh, critical points on getting kids into the workforce. And I think our industry, I represent aerospace and defense companies that have a major presence here in Arkansas, as you know, and we'd be remiss if we didn't, didn't talk about creating the jobs that require these critical important uh, conversations about workforce training and just wanted to say thank you to you um, and your team and the governor's office at, at Secretary of Commerce McDonald and ADC 
uh, for leading a group of aerospace and defense companies over to the, to the Paris Air Show, the largest air show in the world. Uh, I think that is critical in order to recruit the jobs to come here. I think we're seeing that success. Um, and we have got to have those jobs in order to fill them. And one of the things that our industry has focused on is how do we get and encourage that next generation workforce. And I think you just touched on this a couple of questions ago in, in discussing you know, how do you make it resonate with a junior high kid that is trying to figure out what they're gonna do for a career and you know maybe a bass boat and Razorback tickets is more appropriate. I call it the boom and zoom. I, 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 uh, I, I pitched Mike on the boom and zoom academy. Y'all went with launch, but I think launch works for me too. <laughs> well, good, good. My question is, what can industry do to work with you, to work with Mike, to assist y'all in making those critical connections for kids in junior high, high school that are, that are making those job career decisions? What, what can we do as an industry to, to support your efforts? First of all, thanks, Chad. I, I, I think you standing up brings up a valid point, kind of what you were asking and what I was talking about before in spaces that I think Arkansas has the right to win. Aerospace and defense is one of the places where Arkansas has a right to win and where we're frankly leading. It is now the number one export that we have, which a lot of people don't know. It's a billion dollar industry for the state of Arkansas and growing. And that's exactly the type of area where we can lean into and continue to grow. How we, I think, talk to those students is frankly sometimes you guys showing up. I, I know, Randy, you guys have done a lot and through Be Pro, Be Proud, y'all have gone around and shown kids and let them come in and you know, play with simulators and see what a job actually looks like. But showing up, I think, is half the battle. So many kids have no idea what opportunities exist. And so that's one of the reasons we're trying to build these partnerships so that not only do kids know what their life can look like with the paycheck that they can earn, but they also have hands-on uh, experience and the ability to talk to somebody who is leading in that industry that they can see that as somebody who's part of their community and they know um, what that looks like for them in a town like El Dorado or Smackover or Paragould, they get to see it firsthand. Um, and I think that makes such a huge difference because so many kids just don't know what exists. And so showing up, walking them through, here's what it looks like, here's what's required of you to get here, and here are the ways that we're going to help you uh, facilitate those things. I think that makes a huge difference. And so, um, I mean, especially in an industry like yours, people think that, you know, building rockets and missiles are kind of cool when they're in high school and so talking about that and showing them those things can be really fun and, and interesting for 15 and 16 year old kids but yes ma'am well I said that was the last question but we'll come back over here sure and Chad we've met before so um, actually Cobalt Aero Services is working in hand with we have a meeting this next week uh, with National Park College to get a program up and running for basic mechanical skills for aircraft mechanics. And um, I know Bill Allison is here, and um, Gary Jackson, Gary Troutman know about this. We are having this meeting. So if anybody would uh, like some information after we meet up and see how far we've gotten to, to make this a go, that's a critical source. This, this campus right here, would be a great source as well. And we would like to include as many people as we can. Well, <laughs> I, I, I want to say again, thank you so much for, for it, whoever's controlling that obviously didn't vote for me. So I, <laughs> only kidding. I want to say again how much we appreciate you showing up. I think that for so many uh, parts of this puzzle coming together is all of the various sectors working hand in hand. And that's what I'm hopeful Mike is able to achieve is bringing all the players, all the stakeholders to the same table and helping address the problem. I want Arkansas to lead in this effort. I know we're capable of it. And I think that the willingness 
and the number of people that are in this room today shows that we're serious about doing that. And with each of you participating and being willing, I think we can really put ourselves on the map for what true workforce development looks like and how to do it right. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Mike, for your leadership to all of our cabinet um, and to each of you for showing up. So thanks so much for being here today. To provide a quick welcome and say thank you to each of y'all for being here on such a, a special day. Uh, as, as each of y'all know, uh, agriculture is our largest industry in the state of Arkansas and just so incredibly important. So any, any chance that we get to celebrate our, our rice industry, which is known and well known, not just here in, in Arkansas, but throughout the country and really throughout the world, uh, we're, we're excited to do that and to celebrate that. And we've got uh, a great lineup of speakers who are going to talk this morning, uh, but the, I have the distinct pleasure to get to uh, introduce someone who doesn't need an introduction, but someone who's just been an incredible uh, advocate of our state's largest industry and of the rice industry, and someone who's just been a pleasure to get to work, work with and work for, uh, and that's the governor of the state of Arkansas, Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders. So, ma'am. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here. You know, it's always nerve wracking when you have somebody get up and say, I've been told this person needs no introduction because I'm reminded of a time when my dad was governor and the guy got up to introduce him and said, I've been told that he needs no introduction. And that's a good thing because I've never heard of him. <laughs> Thankfully, Wes and I have known each other a long time and he is doing an absolutely phenomenal job leading the Department of Agriculture, which as he noted, is our number one industry and that's an amazing thing not just for our state but frankly for the entire country making sure that we have great food security is a key component frankly to survival if a state and a country cannot feed themselves fight for themselves and fuel themselves they simply cannot survive and so the service that our ag community provides not just to our kansans but to the entire country is absolutely vital and key to our country's long-term success. And so it's exciting to be here and be part of today's event and announcement. Uh, it's great to be back at the Arkansas Food Bank. My family and I had the opportunity to come here at Thanksgiving last year and put boxes together. I got to say, when they assigned my eight-year-old the uh, can good area, I was a little nervous. Uh, thankfully, no one was injured in our uh, box distribution, um, but it was pretty close on a number of occasions. I told the group earlier they should have given him the rice instead of the canned goods to put into the boxes. but. It is wonderful to be back here with this organization and the incredible work that they do and for the partnership that we get to be part of today. Not only does the Arkansas Food Bank provide and help so many families and communities across our state, but to see them partner with uh, our rice community um, is such a special an important thing and we have I know a number of the people that are helping make this possible here today and I'm glad that I get to be here and witness uh, the union of two great things um, helping provide and help address the food insecurity that so many Arkansans unfortunately have this is a great step it's Arkansas rice month it's also hunger action month and so bringing those two things together is a great thing for our state it's a great example and I'm glad that I get to be here and be part of this and look forward to uh, a great continued partnership for a long time so that we can continue addressing the hunger issues that we have in the state. So thank you for your willingness to be here and the work that both of these organizations do every day to take care of not just our Kansans, uh, but people across the country. Thank you all so much. morning. My name is uh, Jeff Rutledge. I'm a rice producer from Newport, Arkansas, uh, and also represent the rice industry here this morning. I want to thank uh, Governor Sanders, Secretary Ward, for being here to recognize the impact that Arkansas rice and agriculture in general has on our state economically. Um, and also what we do to partner to, to alleviate food insecurity in our state. Um, Arkansas rice is uh, the leading producer of rice in the U.S. Um, not only do, do we produce about half the rice produced in the U.S., 
It also provides over 25,000 jobs and has a $6 billion impact on our state's economy. With, with those blessings, with the blessing of the natural resources that we have to produce a rice and the producers that are there to, to be good stewards of those natural resources and the, and the blessings that we have, we are honored this morning to announce our partnership, uh, long-standing partnership with the Arkansas Food Bank in announcing a donation from the rice industry of 240,000 pounds of milled rice this morning. That represents uh, 1.8 million servings of rice that's being donated to help alleviate food insecurity in our state. Uh, we consider it an honor as an industry to be able to share some of the blessings that, that we have been blessed with to help those who are less fortunate and, and suffering from food insecurity in our state. So thank you all for being here this morning and uh, thank you for your uh, attention and, and thank you again to the governor and the secretary for being here uh, to uh, help us celebrate our industry and this donation this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, Governor, Secretary. I'm Brian Burton, CEO here at Arkansas Food Bank. Boy, what an amazing day this is. And it feels like a little bit of a family reunion in here with so many friends and people that know each other. But it, it all started in 1982 when rice farmers in Arkansas realized they had two things, a surplus of their crop, and they knew there were many people uh, hungry in our state. And they said, why don't we share what we have with those who need it the most? And out of that, the Arkansas Rice Depot was formed. And it's just uh, been a legend since then. We, we had the privilege of uh, merging the Arkansas Food Bank and the Rice Depot so we could be one strong, efficient organization in 2016. So we get to carry on that tradition. And it couldn't come at a better time. We were telling the governor last Thanksgiving how difficult this food sourcing environment is right now with, with the government uh, commodities and uh, pandemic uh, help subsiding now and with so many supply chain issues that linger and just difficulties with inflation. Food banks have really been squeezed. So this incredible donation could not have come at a better time. And the bounty is not just for Arkansas Food Bank, it's for every uh, Feeding America Food Bank in our state. And today we're very uh, blessed to have the representatives here from Texarkana and the Food Bank of Northeast Arkansas and Jonesboro and the Hunger Relief Alliance. So we work together so beautifully. It's just an amazing collaboration. So this rice will flow out into every single county throughout our state. So I wanna thank the participating uh, farmers and meals, you see them on this uh, beautiful colorful banner, the dryer locations, of course the governor, the Arkansas Rice Federation, and of course a group that sometimes gets overlooked, our truck drivers. I mean, let's just appreciate them right now and all these friends who have been such a vital part of, of, of this, of this uh, opportunity. So. We'll wrap it up. Uh, we kept the speeches short today. You know, FDR used to say, be sincere, be brief, and be seated. So we're going to do that for you. But we want you to linger in the spirit of the Rice Month. Let's enjoy some refreshments courtesy of the Arkansas Rice Council. We'll also be unloading one truckload of today's donation in the warehouse here shortly. So thank you all so much for coming, and thank you for all these donors and friends. Good day. <laughs> I want to see a test. How many sixth graders do we have in the room? Oh, all on this side. Oh, this is going to work out really well. How many seventh graders do we have in the room? Oh, so good. Who do we think is louder, sixth grade or seventh grade? Your principal is going to love me for this. Okay, we're going to see. We're going to go first with the sixth grade. And you're going to say good morning as loud as you can. Are you ready? We're gonna go on the count of three. So seventh grade, you guys have to be really quiet because you don't want to help them out. All right, you ready? On the count of three. One, two, three. It's pretty good. They've set the bar pretty high. 
You guys think you can compete with that? I don't know. That was really good. All right. We're going to go on the count of three. Sixth grade, remember, you don't want to help them out, so you got to be quiet over here. I need to practice that uh, countdown you did earlier. Do you think that works in the legislature if I count like that? It would. I don't think so. I don't think I have quite the same power as the principal. All right, you ready, seventh grade? One, two, three. It's pretty close. I think we'll call it a tie so I don't get in trouble with any side. But now we know everybody's awake. And we are so excited to be here, so excited to be uh, with sixth and seventh graders. You know, I have three kids. Uh, one which is a sixth grader and I also have a fourth grader and a second grader and whenever I'm getting ready to go talk to kids they like to give me advice on things I should do shouldn't do topics to talk about you know Taylor Swift always seems to be a pretty safe space uh, saw a lot of Kansas City Chiefs jerseys out here and gear my husband's from Kansas City so we're big Chiefs fans my kids said stay away from those things because I'm not cool enough to talk about any of that stuff my youngest actually gave me advice and he said, Mom, please, whatever you do, don't go up and give one of those long, boring speeches. People hate that. So I'm going to take the advice of my eight-year-old and I'm going to keep it quick and we're just going to have fun this morning. Mostly, I want to be here to say thank you because schools like this are making our state look so good. I don't know if you know it or not, but Secretary Oliva mentioned it, but this is one of the very best schools we have in the entire state of Arkansas, and we are so proud of you guys. You know, a lot of people will look at schools from the outside and say, oh, that's an amazing building, they must have an amazing school, but what makes a school great is not the building, it's not the facility, it's two things. It's the students, and it's the people who help run those schools. Your teachers, your principals, your superintendents, all of the staff, the cafeteria team, the janitorial staff, that's what makes schools great. And the reason that this school is one of the best in Arkansas is because it has some of the best students and definitely some of the best teachers. And we are so proud of the work that each one of you are doing to make Arkansas look so good. Because we want to beat out all the other states by having the best and the brightest students and some of the best teachers anywhere in the country. And we have that right here at this school. And so we're really excited to be here and celebrate with you today. Now, I have been told that while I don't have a lot of authority to do this, that I could give out a couple of free homework passes. Now, the person I asked was Secretary Oliva, who also does not have permission to give those passes out. So we will see if that actually happens. But I'm going to ask a question, and the first person to put their hand up gets a free homework pass. Well, then you don't know the question yet. <laughs> but if, if you raise your hand and you miss, you have to do an extra hour of homework. Is that fair? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We're not doing that. I'm just kidding. But if you get it right, then we'll see if we can work out a deal with your teacher. If not, we really tried. All right, first question. We have had one president from the state of Arkansas. What was his hometown? Oh, right here. No, close. That was a good guess. No, right here. No, but that's a, that's a good guess. He did live there. No. It's a town in Arkansas that the first and only president that we've had from the state of Arkansas, what city was he from? Right over here. Yes, she wins. All right, great job. I don't know who your teacher is, but we'll see if we can put in a good word for you. All right, we'll, let's see if we can come up with uh, one maybe that's a little easier that will get faster. Our state's largest university, what is the mascot? Right here. The, st the state's largest university, our biggest college, what is the mascot? Close to here. Right here. There you go. All right, we got two winners. All right.
Well, again, I just want to say thank you for letting us be here with you this morning. Hopefully you're happy you got out of class for a few minutes, but we don't want to keep you waiting. We have a, a little bit of big news. And so I'm going to turn the microphone back over to Secretary Oliva. But thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being amazing students. Thank you to the incredible teachers that we have that are making all of our state look so good. So thanks so much. And uh, now I'll turn it back over to Secretary Oliva. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Governor, for being here. Good morning. Nothing like having to follow Tim on a Tuesday, a Monday morning when he's had too much coffee already. So it is wonderful to be here and to welcome our Attorney General's inaugural 2023 Human Trafficking Summit. Tim, thank you so much for the honor of opening this year's summit. We both agree that human trafficking is a huge issue, not just here in Arkansas, but around the country. And I can't think of a better way to bring together all of the experts and the greatest minds on this topic to tackle this issue. I like to say that Tim is our state's bulldog, and no, that's not a shout out to any Georgia fans out there. Tim was our bulldog in Congress, he was our bulldog in the lieutenant governor's office, and now he is our bulldog attorney general. And that's important because if we are going to tackle this difficult issue, we need a bulldog. Arkansas sits right at the heart of America, which gives us the amazing opportunity to be directly at the center of both transportation and trucking. Sadly, that also means that our state is right at the transit point for human traffickers, some of the worst people anywhere in the world. Years ago, there wasn't even a protocol to spot human trafficking victims, let alone help them and identify help for them. However, a lot has changed since then. Thanks to some of the amazing advocates, industry representatives, and law enforcement that are in this room today, we are making big changes. Just this past month, Arkansas State Police led an operation that detained 10 suspected human traffickers and helped their victims, both women and children, get the assistance that they need. But we can do even better. That's why at the start of my administration, I signed an executive order and formed a working group focused specifically on this issue. We brought together experts from inside and outside of government. And just last week, I received and released a list of recommendations to help solve this problem. Those include setting up a state police hub to combat human trafficking through centralized reporting and clearly defined protocols, and a screening tool for private citizens and public officials to use to evaluate possible victims. I'm ready to get to work and put these recommendations into place. We secured a federal grant and Secretaries Hager and Putnam are putting their departments quickly to work. But government is only part of the solution. We can roll out all the tools and all the resources possible, but without the help of everyday Arkansans, we will never end human trafficking in our state. That's why this conference and each one of you in the room here today are so incredibly important. Yes, it's an opportunity to meet fellow experts. Yes, it's a chance just to learn about the problem that we face with human trafficking right here in Arkansas. But it also raises awareness about an issue that I fear, frankly, far too many Arkansans know nothing about. And it's going to inspire everyone here today to get back out into our state with renewed passion to fight this heinous crime. So thank you, Tim, not just for the work that you're doing in your official role, but for bringing this incredible group together and focusing on this critical issue and dedicating yourself and this conference for bringing human trafficking victims into life. I know that together we can prosecute the criminals, we can save the victims, and we can work together to finally end human trafficking here in Arkansas. Thank you so much for the work that you do, and thank you for being part of this incredible and important event here today. Thank you, and God bless.
We got a whole crew. Good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us. It's great to stand up here with some of the most influential and amazing women from across our state. We are all here to say, frankly, that we've had enough. Enough trying to erase women and girls, enough denying our biological differences from men, and enough of the craziness that is taking over our country. I've had the honor of being both the first woman and the first mother to serve as the governor of Arkansas. Before that, I was the first mother and the only the third woman to serve as the White House press secretary. Because of that, I came into this role with a few pretty unique experiences. Among them is giving birth to three amazing kids. That experience underscored to me that a woman's perspective is important and fundamentally different from a man's. Nowadays, though, only conservatives seem to be making that point. On the left, women have taken a back seat to political correctness. It's why Senator Irving and Representative Barker had to pass the Fairness in Women's Sports Act to defend our girls across the state. They're using nonsense words to erase women and girls, and more importantly, to erase our voices and our experiences. Today, we're taking a stand against woke nonsense. What frankly started as a fad among a few grad students has seeped down into corporations, the healthcare industry, and increasingly state government. It's demeaning to women and it needs to stop. In a moment, I'll sign an executive order banning a number of all sorts of ridiculous words from state government documents. Those include words like pregnant people, laboring person, birth giver, and several other nonsense terms that have cropped up in recent years. Some on the left will accuse us of being nitpicky, that Arkansas should just lay down and accept the cultural revolution without complaint. I say it's the exact opposite. It's the left that decided that woman is a dirty word. It's the left that decided we needed to toss out basic biology and basic grammar along with it. I think they're just mad that conservatives are starting to fight back. And they better get ready because we're just getting started. Thank you for being here and thank you to the amazing women that are standing up here with me. I'll sign this executive order. We'll hear a few words from Dr. Chandler and I'll be happy to take a few questions. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Kay Chandler. I'm pleased to be Arkansas Surgeon General, and I'm a practicing obstetrician gynecologist here in Little Rock. I've been serving women of all ages since 1997, but the governor's executive order doesn't require a medical degree to understand. It's just common sense. As I was taught in medical school, and actually have known since I was five years old when I happened to be looking through my mother's nursing school textbooks and ran into some embryology textbooks, women give birth. Today, that has somehow become controversial, but it shouldn't be. Governor Sanders' executive order is smart on a number of counts. It stands up to those who try to erase women in the name of political correctness. In this administration, I know our governor won't let political correctness get in the way of science. Thank you. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to take a couple. Are there Well, there's always an urgency to doing the right thing. Look, I, I wish that we didn't have to write and have executive orders like this, but because of the growing trend uh, that continues to seep into all areas of our life, we feel like it's important. We have seen specific instances that have happened in state government and been reported in other places in state government. And so at no time will I apologize for defending women and standing up for the differences between men and women. Does it matter if there's one? Is that not enough? How many times should a woman have to be insulted before we stand up and say, we've had it? 
Like it shouldn't even take one time, uh, but one instance to me is enough for us to stand up for women and say that we can do better, and we will. I mean, I'm not keeping a running tally, but I have seen one specific instance, and we've had a, sep a number of other instances that have been reported to our office. What agency? Uh, specifically at the health department. Are you in the words of currently in a government document? As I just said, we've seen uh, specific instances at the health department and several others that have been reported. It's, it's not that they're offensive, it's that they are scientifically wrong. And that's a different thing. There's something different about whether your feelings got hurt versus something that is just factually incorrect. You said they were insulting. I think it is insulting to women to define them as something other than what they are and to take away experiences that are so specific to them that cannot be uh, created just by saying uh, them into existence. Because there's a difference between what is right and what is wrong, what is factual and what is not. It's not just political correctness. It's literally the difference of what is accurate and what isn't. Which actually I think underscores the exact point. Because we have a federal government that is taking those kind of actions, it is imperative for states to step up and actually defend women. It's, you know, I feel like there's a question of why now? Because we have examples where the craziness is seeping into our state and our communities. This would be specific to state government documents that we have the ability to monitor through an executive order. I can't imagine why anybody would need to have incorrect information in a specific government form, but um, we could cross that bridge when we get there if needed. All right, thank you so much. I'm gonna sign the executive order now. way to begin the week by sharing some great news about our state's second largest industry, tourism. I would like to thank Governor Sanders, First Gentleman Brian Sanders for joining us today, as well as members of the State Park Recreation Travel Commission and Director Austin Booth is also here with us today as well. So thank you for joining us. Um, I'm here to unveil the results of the 2022 Economic Impact Report for Tourism in Arkansas. And I'm gonna jump right in. It's such great news, I wanna share it right off the bat for you. So our first slide, and I'll kind of highlight information along as we go forward, um, was related to the study that was conducted by Tourism Economics. It takes into account the totality of the impact of Arkansas tourism on our state's economy, including the numbers of visitors received, how much they spent while in the state, and total tax receipts and overall impact. As I'll show the numbers, I'll share some perspective of what the meaning behind those. First, 48.3 million people visited our state in 2022. That's a 17.1% increase from 2021 uh, and a 27% increase over COVID, uh, pre-COVID 
2019. So since the pandemic, we continue to see growth in numbers in visitation. And I think this, in, in, my, in my view, it's for a couple of different reasons. First of all, we have really leaned into digital marketing, which allows us to target key audiences across the nation and around the world uh, to maximize our reach and help us optimize future campaigns. And secondly, something that we know for sure is that a lot of visitors found us during the pandemic. What we are known as the natural state really came true and, and relevant during the pandemic that helped many people gain a greater appreciation for the beautiful outdoors that we have, which continues today, and what Arkansas has in abundance. As a result, direct visitors hit spend hit the $9.2 billion mark. That's up 15.4% from 2021 and exceeds by a billion dollars the pre-COVID 2019 numbers. This high, the highest spend categories for visitors were in transportation, food, and lodging. Lodging, as a matter of fact, accounted for the largest increase in visitor spend with a year-over-year -year increase of 23%. That's great news for an industry sector which took a financial hit during the epidemic. We also studied the indirect and induced impact that tourism has on our economy. And that number is $6.5 billion. That's money put back into the economy by industry operators when buying goods and services and by industry employees who are investing their wages where they live. When combining direct visitor spend with indirect and induced impact, the total effect is $15.7 billion, a major impact on our economy. In terms of tax receipts, the tourism industry industry generated 536 million in state taxes, an increase of 14.8% over 2021. Counties and municipalities collected $216 million in taxes, which is up 16.1%. In total, tax receipts from visitor spending in Arkansas was $752 million. For a perspective, without this visitor-generated tax receipts, each Arkansan household would need to be taxed an additional $866 to replace those tax dollars. Let's take a look at the collection numbers for the 2% tourism tax. The reinvestment of these dollars fully fund Arkansas's tourism marketing efforts which you have seen have been very successful. In 2022, the tourism reinvestment tax collected a record $24.3 million. That's up 15.8% over 2021. It's almost 6.5 million more than those pre-COVID 2019 levels. Arkansas's tourism industry employs 68,100 Arkansans, which represent 3.9% of employment within our state. So if you're kind of wondering how these numbers break down and where a lot of the spending has taken place, here are the top five counties for visitor uh, spending. Pulaski County uh, generated 1.9 billion, Benton County in Northwest Arkansas, a little more than 1 billion. Garland County in Hot Springs, 840.6 million dollars. Washington and Sebastian counties uh, in Fort Smith rounds out the top five uh, at 401.8 million, 709 specific in Washington County. You can find data for all 75 uh, counties in copies of the economic impact report uh, that we have available for you today. Those printed copies are found at each side of the stage here. You can also view those numbers and additional information online as well. 
In a few minutes, some of our tourism partners from these counties will make some comments uh, to help uh, explain uh, the growth that they've, they've seen in their areas throughout the state. Bottom line is that Arkansas's tourist is, tourism industry has never been stronger. Our state is now, on a is now a national travel destination thanks to both private and public investment in product development that has pro proved more memorable and affordable uh, experiences for people in activities such as biking, hiking, mountain climbing and rock climbing, water sports, and even outdoor art. I fully expect that we'll be standing here this time next year giving you data that exceeds what I've shared with you today. That's because of our strong industry partners and visionary leadership from Governor Sanders and the First Gentleman. I'll be excited to be uh, back with you at this time next year as well. It's my pleasure to introduce our governor today. When Governor Sanders took office earlier this year, she said she wanted to be the chief salesperson for our state. She's not just a governor who talks about tourism and our uh, bountiful outdoor economy, she lives it. Every chance that she gets and the first gentleman and their, the first family, their three children are outside in Arkansas enjoying its beauty. It's my pleasure, please help me welcome our 47th governor of Arkansas, Sarah Huckabee Sanders. Good morning. Thank you everybody for joining us here this morning. I certainly appreciate Shay leading us off with some fantastic statistics about Arkansas's tourism. I want to thank our legislative partners who have helped lead us to this point and all of the members of our tourism industry, tourism commission, natural state initiative, and our friends and partners at the Arkansas Game and Fish as well. One of the incredible things about living right here in Little Rock, or frankly, any city in Arkansas, is that you are always close to nature. Even right here in the center of our state's largest city, we're only a short drive from one of Arkansas's best state parks. When our family needs a break, we can head over to Pinnacle. My husband, Brian, usually takes the reins in organizing and planning those trips. The only problem with that is anybody who's familiar with Pinnacle State Park knows that there are two ways that you can get up the mountain, the easy way and the hard way. And when we let Brian plan the trips, it's usually pretty much a guarantee that we are gonna go up the hard way. The kids and I will usually complain when we're trekking up that side, but you certainly feel more accomplished when you get to the top. As they say, nothing worth doing is ever easy. You might say something similar about Arkansas's tourism. It's easy to forget, but just three years ago, the entire tourism industry was on the rocks. Shuttered restaurants, empty hotels. Some were actually saying that our tourism industry would never bounce back from the pandemic. But as Shay laid out earlier, we're back and we're better than ever. Thanks to amazing leadership and partnership from many of those of you who are here today. Arkansas saw 48.3 million visitors last year, up 17% from the year before, and they spent $9.2 billion while they were here, up 15% from 2021. Tourism is the state's second largest industry, employing nearly 70,000 people and attracting far more tourists and new residents to experience the great things here in the natural state. These numbers, are excellent, maybe even tremendous, but I know that we can and we will do even better. Today, I'm introducing someone who I know agrees with me, who's about to help us take Arkansas tourism to the next level. I'm proud to announce that Delaney Thomas will serve as Arkansas's new director of tourism. Delaney, we're excited to welcome you. Delaney has spent nearly a decade working with Arkansas tourism from the, out, from the outside, brainstorming new ideas to get the word out about our state. 
She spearheaded nationwide marketing campaigns and has the creative chops that we'll need to compete with other states. Delaney joins an incredible team that is going to help us take Arkansas to the top. This administration is making sweeping reforms to make our outdoor spaces even better. Last legislative session, my husband Brian huddled with experts in both the public and private sector to help come up with new ways to improve Arkansas's outdoor economy. Their solutions passed overwhelmingly in the legislature and they're already starting to make a difference. We cut red tape at state parks to make maintenance and lodging better and more seamless. We funded grant programs to support high impact recreation projects in small towns all across the state and we're supporting entrepreneurs who are innovating in everything from food to lodging to guide services. And the Sanders family favorite, we're launching a lifetime hunting and fishing license that Arkansans under 10 can get for half off. I'm just a little disappointed we didn't do it sooner because only two out of three of our kids qualify. But you pair this with all of the progress going on in the private sector and nonprofit spaces and you have an absolute recipe for success. Thank you to everyone for being here, for all your hard work in this space, and all that you do for Arkansas's tourism. And now I'm gonna turn it over to our new tourism director, Delaney, to say a few words. Thank you so much. Thank you, Governor. I'm humbled and I'm honored to step into this new role. First, I'd like to give thanks to the Lord for I believe it's his plan that has led me here to this job and has equipped me with the skills and experience that will allow me to serve the state as the next tourism director of Arkansas. I wanna thank my family and my husband Robert for their continued support as well as their agreement to always be my partners on Arkansas Adventures. To Governor Sanders and Secretary Lewis, thank you for your trust and confidence in me to do this job. I look forward to working together to grow Arkansas's second largest industry and to continue to establish the natural state as a national leader in outdoor recreation. I'm also excited to continue to tell Arkansas's amazing story to audiences across the country and world. I love Arkansans. I love the hospitality and tourism industry, and I have a deep appreciation for what our destinations do, our outfitters, and our frontline workers, what they do every single day to make sure our visitors have the best, most memorable experience possible. As a Southern state, I believe that hospitality is in our DNA, and our competitive nature probably runs deeper than the Arkansas River. Add in our spirit of goodwill and cooperation, and you've got the perfect recipe for a success story. Together, we are the natural state, and I truly believe that's a privilege. I look forward to working with each of you to take it to the next level. Thank you. Good evening, Trump country. You know, I've spent a lot of time at Trump rallies, and I gotta say, this is one of the best. because our country has never needed Donald Trump more than we do right now. And I love you too. I was going to Trump rallies way back in 2016 when I first worked on the president's campaign. Eight years later, it is just as exciting as when he came down that beautiful golden escalator the very first time. I know I'm upsetting a lot of Democrats by being here tonight because they like to pretend that they are the party of women. They don't like that the very first woman to ever serve as governor of Arkansas is a proud conservative Republican. And my message to them is very simple. You cannot be the party of women if you cannot tell us what a woman is. The truth is, it's not even a question anymore between right and left. It is normal versus crazy, and the left is doubling down on crazy. We've got out of control inflation. 
violent crime, an open border, a rising China, Biden and the left have failed over and over again, and they know it, and you know it, and it is time for a change. That is why tonight I am so proud to endorse my former boss, my friend, and everybody's favorite president, Donald J. Trump. Think back to four years ago. Our economy was booming. Gas was cheap. Homes were affordable. People were thriving. President Trump put conservatives on the Supreme Court. He cut taxes, and he rolled back Obama's big government regulations. He made us energy independent. He cut America First trade deals. Donald Trump was building the wall and rebuilding our military. President Trump was the first president in my lifetime to take a hard line against China. And I'm proud to be the first governor in the country to ever kick China off our farmland and out of our state. Under President Trump, ISIS was destroyed. The cartels were on the run. China was weakened. Iran was isolated. Our enemies actually feared us, and our people loved us. President Trump made us great, and I know that he will do it again. That's because he's not afraid to be an outsider, a change agent, a disruptor. He put America first the first president in a long time to do exactly what he said he was going to do. He's the complete and total opposite of Joe Biden, the corrupt Washington insider. I know that a lot of people may complain that President Trump was too loud, too disruptive, and sometimes even a little too direct. Bye-bye. But to me, that's the very best thing about this president. He tells it like it is. He's not afraid. We want Trump. 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 President Trump's not afraid to make waves and get the job done even if it's politically incorrect. And you know what? I'd take a lot of mean tweets right now, especially since I'm no longer the White House press secretary. Out of over inflation, open borders, and World War III, when I worked under President Trump in the White House, I saw firsthand a side to him that a lot of people didn't. A great boss, a mentor, and an outstanding father. When I was press secretary, I had to endure some of the most nasty, malicious attacks from the left in the media. They attacked my appearance, my character, even my fitness as a mother. We love you! Thank you. But I will never forget the time that President Trump pulled me aside looked me straight in the eye and said, Sarah, you're tough, you're beautiful, and you're good at your job. That's why they attack you. Never let them get you down. Then in true Trump fashion, he popped me on the shoulder. He said, OK, now get back to work. It was exactly what I needed to hear. 
again and again and again as a working mom, as a woman, President Trump not only empowered me, he defended me when I needed it most. That's the man I know, and that's exactly the kind of leader we need back in the White House. During my two and a half years serving under the president, I traveled on every single one of his foreign trips. We'll give him a minute. We'll stay here all night for President Trump. The most unforgettable trip we ever took was December 25th, 2018. It was Christmas Day and my husband Brian and I had just cleaned up wrapping paper that was shoved in literally every corner of our house. When I had to walk out on my own family's Christmas, I couldn't tell them the place that I was going because the place I was traveling to was so dangerous, they didn't want anybody in the world to know that the president would be on the ground even for a few hours. Yet we have men and women living, serving, sacrificing every single day in that exact location. We boarded Air Force One in complete and total darkness. There were no lights on the plane, no lights on the runway. Our phones and computers shut down. We were going totally off the grid. And 12 hours later, in the pitch black of night, we landed in war-torn Western Iraq. Again, no lights on the plane, no lights on the runway. The only light you could see was coming from about a mile away. The reason there was light in that one location is because there were hundreds of troops packed into a dining hall, gathered thinking they were having dinner with senior military leadership from around the region. They had absolutely no idea that the President and First Lady were about to walk into that room. And when they did, it was a sight and a sound and a scene that I hope I never forget. That room absolutely erupted. Men and women from every race, religion, region, and political party stood up and started chanting over and over and over again, USA, USA, USA. That was the kind of patriotism President Trump brought back to our country, and he's going to bring it back again. One of the young soldiers yelled from the back of the room, Mr. President, I re-enlisted in the military because of you. And without missing a beat, the President said, and son, I am here because of you. As the president made his way around the room, that same young soldier came up to me and said, Sarah, you have a tough job. I told him what I do is nothing. You take bombs and bullets. That is a tough job. Then the soldier reached up and he pulled the Brave Rifles patch that he wore on his shoulder and he placed it into my hand. He said, Sarah, we are in this together. I couldn't say anything. I just reached up and I hugged him and thanked him for being the hero that he is that helps keep us free. As we sit here tonight, I'm thinking of people like that young soldier. They fight every day to keep us free, and they deserve a leader at home who has their back like they have ours. But today, our country is under attack from the outside and from within. And let me be clear, Joe Biden is not up for the job. His party has gone completely crazy, and we need President Trump to step in and help bring our country back. We need him to finish what he started eight years ago, 
We need him to make America great again. This is our movement. This is our moment. This is our time. And this is our president. Please help me welcome everyone's favorite president, Donald J. Trump. Well, I want to thank you very much. And, Sarah, thank you for the wonderful endorsement. And uh, Arkansas is in very good hands. It's a great place. It's a great state. Florida, great state. We love to be with you. Good morning. It is great to be here this morning and join all of the team at DHS and some of our partners around the state, as well as President Hester and Representative Wooldridge, uh, who we have worked closely with on this specific issue. You know, when I first came into office, one of the very first actions that we took was signing an executive order to bring all of the various stakeholders so that Arkansas can do a better job in this space. One of the things I'm most proud of when it comes to Arkansas is the fact that we are the most pro-life state in the country. But for me, pro-life doesn't end once a baby is born. And here in the state of Arkansas, I know that we can do a better job of addressing some of the most vulnerable population among us. Right now, we have roughly 4,100 kids who need uh, permanent homes. And I think with the people in this room and the efforts both at DHS as well as the private sector, our nonprofits, and our partners in the legislature, we can address this very special need. I'm glad to be here this morning so that we can highlight the things that we're doing, but also just remind people and bring greater awareness to the kids that need a permanent home. I'm thankful for the various partners that we have who have come together and are working so closely with us to address this issue. And I look forward to Arkansas continuing to be a national leader in this space and making sure that every child in the state has a caring, loving home. 
I don't think there's any greater calling that we could have than to address this issue in the state of Arkansas, and I know that we can. I'm so thankful for those people uh, who are willing to step up and foster and adopt here in the state of Arkansas. We want to make that process easier and better for each child and each family that is willing to take that on, and that's our commitment to continue in that practice, continue bringing everybody together. So thank you for the work that you're doing, and together I know that we will help every child in Arkansas find that loving home. So thank you for being here today, and thank you for the work to all of our partners, uh, both, again, in the nonprofit, private sector, and especially at DHS. So thank you for being here this morning. Hey, good morning. I'm Tiffany Wright and I'm the DCFS director. Today in this room and on Zoom, um, I'm fortunate to be surrounded by my staff and our partners who uh, work hard every day to support the work we do to find safe, stable families for children in foster care. Making sure that children are in the best, most appropriate family can mean different things for different children. Um, for most, that means staying with or reunifying to their families when it's safe and appropriate. For others, it might mean living with a relative or a family friend. But for some, we are on the search for forever families, meaning connecting children and families together forever. That's what this month is all about. Today, we are proud and humbled to shine a light on adoption in Arkansas, to shine a light on 274 children and youth who are waiting for their forever family, to shine a light on families who provide love and support and stability to our most vulnerable population, and for my staff and partners who sacrifice so much to make connections, and for our advocates who go above and beyond to support us every day on what we say the road to zero. Um, I'm also very proud of my staff who work day in and day out to love on these children and help them know their value and worth. Um, they stand alongside some of these children's and children in the hardest moments of their life. I'm deeply and appreciative of the support of the governor and our legislators who are empowering us to be able to do the work to serve children and families in this state. And I'm also thankful for our partners at Project Zero. They go above and beyond for us at DCFS every day, but man, do they go above and beyond for children who are waiting in foster care with the goal of adoption. And I have to say their names because Project Zero is four very special uh, women who give everything they have. Christy Irwin, Anna Dietrich, Kara Safer, and Candace Gerber. Again, they go above and beyond for children in foster care, empowering them to give them a voice so we can move them to forever. And their goal is right on point with our values. One child plus one family equals zero waiting children. And I know in Arkansas, we are on our way with the love and support of Project Zero. So in my next guest, I am so excited to introduce her. It's Anna Dietrich. She is the logistics coordinator for Project Zero. And y'all, that means big things. She can take chaos and make it look like perfection. And I'm like, how'd you do that? <laughs> uh, and she is the mastermind behind Candyland Christmas that is happening right now, the wish list that we're collecting. So without further ado, I want to introduce my dear friend, Anna Dietrich. Good morning. Maddox, Abigail, Daniel, Tennessee, Jaylee, Michael, Daquan, Carmen, Kaylee, and Cameron. These names are just 11 of the 274 children and teens waiting in foster care to be adopted in our state. I say their names this morning as a reminder to us that we hear the number 274, that there are 274 children and teens waiting to be adopted, but their names are a reminder that they are a person, an individual, a life, a soul. They are our kids, Arkansas's kids. Each one has an individual story, personality, likes, dislikes, hopes, fears, and dreams. They have a past, a present, and a future. Unfortunately, a unifying part of their story is that they came into foster care through no fault of their own and are now waiting to be adopted. 
by the Wright Forever family. They are waiting for permanence through adoption. But each day a child or a teen waits is a day too long. No one should be waiting for a family. No child or teen should wonder if they will have a family or a teen to call their own. Maddox needs a family. Jaylee needs a family. Project Zero is honored to link arms with our partners at DCFS to help raise awareness for the need for adoptive families, find families for each one of our precious waiting ones, but most importantly, to raise hope in our kids during the wait. I could not think higher of my teammates at DCFS and DHS. They work tirelessly to keep our children safe while fighting for their permanence that each child and teen deserves. Our goal is to work ourselves out of a job. The mission is zero kids waiting in the state of Arkansas. We fight this fight all year long, but in November, National Adoption Month, we get a little louder and a little more insistent in our call on behalf of our waiting kids. We as a state need to go the extra mile to find permanence, to place the lonely in families. This fight for zero children and teens waiting to be adopted in Arkansas will take each one of us. They are our kids and deserve the efforts of the entire state to link arms in mission for permanence through adoption. Our roles in the process and in their way may be different, but the mission begs that no one stands on the sidelines. In fact, the mission begs that we all go the extra mile. Miguel is worth the extra mile. Calice deserves our extra mile. Many in Arkansas have already joined the Mission for Zero Waiting, but we are not to zero yet. Arkansas needs more families willing to go the extra mile through adoption, to be a forever family to a waiting child, teen, or sibling group. We are asking more families to open their hearts and homes to sibling groups like John and Lisa, and teens like Annabelle and Jordan. Your yes could mean the world for even one of our 274 waiting ones. To stick by our kids for the long haul, a commitment of permanence, a commitment and a passion to love through the good days and the bad. It's not a mission for the faint-hearted. It requires much, but our kids are worth it. They deserve to know they are valued and loved and safe and home. They need us to go the extra mile so they never have to wonder if someone loves them. May each one of them never wonder if and where they belong again. Will you put your yes on the table? The extra mile on behalf of our waiting kids begs for urgency and tenacity. It begs us to see and acknowledge their value. They are not second best or less than. They are priceless souls who deserve to have their names known, to be seen and heard and valued. They deserve the permanence of a forever family. There are still 274 waiting who need each one of us to go the extra mile on their behalf. Daniel is worth going the extra mile. Michael deserves permanence. One of the ways Project Zero is committed to going the extra mile is through raising awareness and sometimes in out of the box ways. We have in partnership with Nathan Willis Films produced a National Adoption Month video for the past few years. And today we are honored to show Project Zero's 2023 National Adoption Month video when the music stops. Thank you. During my two and a half years serving under the president, I traveled on every single one of his foreign trips. We'll give him a minute. We'll stay here all night for President Trump. The most unforgettable trip we ever took was December 25th, 2018. It was Christmas Day and my husband Brian and I had just cleaned up wrapping paper that was shoved in literally every corner of our house. When I had to walk out on my own family's Christmas, I couldn't tell them the place that I was going because the place I was traveling to was so dangerous, they didn't want anybody in the world to know that the president would be on the ground even for a few hours. 
yet we have men and women living, serving, sacrificing every single day in that exact location. We boarded Air Force One in complete and total darkness. There were no lights on the plane, no lights on the runway. Our phones and computers shut down. We were going totally off the grid. And 12 hours later, in the pitch black of night, we landed in war-torn Western Iraq. Again, no lights on the plane, no lights on the runway. The only light you could see was coming from about a mile away. The reason there was light in that one location is because there were hundreds of troops packed into a dining hall, gathered thinking they were having dinner with senior military leadership from around the region. They had absolutely no idea that the President and First Lady were about to walk into that room. And when they did, it was a sight and a sound and a scene that I hope I never forget. That room absolutely erupted. <laughs> Men and women from every race, religion, region, and political party stood up and started chanting over and over and over again, USA, USA, USA. That was the kind of patriotism President Trump brought back to our country, and he's going to bring it back again. One of the young soldiers yelled from the back of the room, Mr. President, I re-enlisted in the military because of you. And without missing a beat, the President said, and son, I am here because of you. As the President made his way around the room, that same young soldier came up to me and said, Sarah, you have a tough job. I told him what I do is nothing. You take bombs and bullets. That is a tough job. Then the soldier reached up and he pulled the Brave Rifles patch that he wore on his shoulder and he placed it into my hand. He said, Sarah, we are in this together. I couldn't say anything. I just reached up and I hugged him and thanked him for being the hero that he is that helps keep us free. As we sit here tonight, I'm thinking of people like that young soldier. They fight every day to keep us free, and they deserve a leader at home who has their back like they have ours. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, and thank you so much for allowing me to be here. Let me see if we can get these kids fired up. Good morning. We'll work on it. We'll work on it. It is such an honor to be here enjoying Founders Classical Academy for today's Veterans Day event. I'm definitely not Santa Claus, uh, and much like my kids, they are equally unimpressed with uh, the fact that I am not Santa Claus, and being governor is not always impressive to elementary-aged kids, so I fully understand that Santa would be way cooler. But it's a great honor to be here and see so many of our veterans, particularly veterans from so many different uh, backgrounds and all ages. What you and your team here are doing is absolutely incredible, and I'm so glad that I get to be here and witness this firsthand. As governor, I try to take any chance that I can to thank our veterans, not just today and not just this week, but as much as we can every day and throughout the year. Their service and sacrifice is why we are all able to enjoy our life as free Americans. When I worked in the White House, I got to join the President on a number of incredible events, some moving service, some moving ceremonies that specifically honored our service members. One Memorial Day, I was the staffer assigned to be with the President, and it was a holiday, and we were honoring our fallen heroes at Arlington National Cemetery. And I decided to take 
My oldest son, Huck, who was about five at the time, as you know, Memorial Day is a bit more of a somber occasion. Probably not the best fit for a five-year-old, but I thought it was an important lesson and something I wanted to see him to see firsthand. He'd been interested in joining the military and talked constantly about it, so he was excited to go and be part of the ceremony. I didn't realize just how much of a part of the ceremony he would make himself when I took him with me. We were riding to Arlington and we were in the presidential motorcade and Huck was peppering the staff with question after question after question. Apparently they were tired of his questions, so they thought a good distraction would be if they told him that all of the people lining the streets were actually there to see him and not the president. So Huck took it on his personal mission to wave to each and every single person that we passed by and was quite proud that so many people had turned out to see him. When we arrived and the ceremony started, the keynote speaker got up and gave a moving and inspiring message. He ended his speech with a simple word of hallelujah. And as he closed, the entire crowd was completely silent, taking in the message and the moment that this individual had just delivered. While that crowd was silent, my five-year-old thought that it was his turn to join in the celebration, and he yelled back as loud as he could in front of thousands of people, hallelujah. I guess that's what happens when you let your dad, who's a former Baptist minister, babysit. <laughs> but in all seriousness, it was an absolute privilege and an honor to be able to take Huck to that event because I know that he will remember it and that he will learn from that moment and many others about the true cost of the sacrifice of our service members. We're more than a century past the first Veterans Day inaugurated by President Wilson to mark the end of the First World War on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918. Arkansans joined the many Americans returning home from that war after leaving their families and homes to defend our country in foreign trenches. And the world was reeling from the largest conflict that we had ever seen up to that point, so much so that they called it the war to end all wars. Of course, we know that certainly was not the case. From Europe to the Pacific, from Korea to Vietnam, from Iraq, to Afghanistan. Arkansans have had to leave our shores to fight for our freedom since that first Veterans Day. And then they have returned home to become the parents, the friends, and the leaders that help run every community in our state. This year, Veterans Day is of course a time to say thank you to these heroes, but it should not be the only day that we do it. Every single one of these veterans put their lives on the line to defend our most cherished freedoms. And every single day is a great day to give them thanks. So to all of our veterans, thank you for your service, thank you for your sacrifice, and most importantly, thank you for the gift of our freedom. America is the greatest country that the world has ever known, but never forget why. America is great because we are free. And because of these incredible heroes, we get to enjoy that freedom. Thank you so much for your service, for your sacrifice, and for letting me be part of this ceremony to honor that today. Thank you so much. A little bit of chipperness on a Monday. Thank you guys so much for joining us. It is an honor to be here with some of our state's biggest economic leaders and a strong showing from South Arkansas, including some of our great legislators from the area. We're also here with a special guest, Patrick Haworth from ExxonMobil. Patrick is joining us to make an announcement that has the potential to transform our state, even our country. In these past few years have shown us anything, it's that energy security is national security. Our nation's enemies are on the move and they know full well that if they can strangle America's energy supply, they can bring down our entire economy. Global conflicts seem a lot less distant when they affect your gas bill, as Russia's invasion of Ukraine has done. They seem a whole lot closer when they raise the price at the pump, as the crisis in the Middle East could do. 
and we would face serious challenges if American manufacturers can't get the raw materials they need, as China is threatening to do by controlling critical mineral mining. Here in Arkansas, we're not going to take those things lying down. Today, ExxonMobil is announcing that they are drilling their first lithium well in our state, tapping into the vast smackover formation that sweeps across the southern part of Arkansas. Lithium is critical for batteries and other energy products, and right now the vast majority of its the vast majority of it is produced overseas, but hopefully that will not be the case much longer. Exxon's first well will be near Magnolia in Columbia County, and if this first venture is successful, you can expect wells all around South Arkansas. I'm not being dramatic when I say this has the potential to transform our state. Companies like Exxon have already directed millions of dollars to the region. And once they and others are in full operation, some estimate that the natural state could produce 15% of the world's finished lithium supply. That is huge for Arkansas and for America. This isn't South Arkansas's first rodeo with the energy industry. Towns like El Dorado, Magnolia, and Smackover were built on oil and gas drilling. And our state still produces 4 million barrels of oil and 400 billion cubic feet of natural gas every year. The expertise and equipment we've used to extract those energy sources will be critical as companies like Exxon scale up operations. And I believe these industries will continue to coexist and thrive. After all, whether it's lithium or oil or natural gas, it all translates to energy security new jobs, and new businesses for Arkansans. My administration will not discriminate against those things. To help lithium mining take off, we're investing in the workforce of tomorrow and slashing red tape and taxes as much as possible. South Arkansas will need new qualified workers to get these facilities off the ground. Arkansas Learns and all the new career and technical training it provides will be critical to those future jobs. And when these massive international companies see that the natural state is lowering its taxes and easing regulatory burdens, we hope their investments will expand far beyond simple extraction. I want to thank ExxonMobil for their decision to invest in our state and in the energy industries of tomorrow. And I'm proud that many of the leaders of South Arkansas here today are working hard to make ExxonMobil's growth as seamless as possible. I know that today is just the first page of a whole new chapter in Arkansas's economy, one that will strengthen the story of South Arkansas and beyond. The Sanders administration is ready, and I know our businesses, community leaders, and our legislature are too. So thank you so much for being here, and now I'll turn it over to Patrick from ExxonMobil and a few others, and then come back up and take questions. Thank you guys so much. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank the governor uh, for inviting us here this morning. We're proud to be part of this announcement. For over 140 years, ExxonMobil has been delivering uh, and driving innovation uh, to evolve our business to meet the world's demand for reliable and affordable energy and other essential products. Today, the, the world needs urgently more lithium. It's a critical raw material in the battery manufacturing supply chain, especially here in North America. ExxonMobil is aiming to be a leading supplier of lithium by 2030. And we're making significant investment in drilling for lithium in southwest Arkansas. With this landmark project, not only will we tap into a potentially vast new source of lithium, but we'll also use modern manufacturing processes that are far less intrusive and significantly lower environmental impact than traditional methods. Development of this new type of lithium resource is expected to provide substantial economic benefit and new jobs for the local communities. Arkansas is establishing itself as an early leader in this new type of lithium development. There's an existing regulatory structure that allows for timely permitting a skilled workforce for new jobs that will be created, and very importantly, strong support from the government and the local communities. 
ExxonMobil has the skills, capabilities, and resources to take on and complete large-scale projects. And in Arkansas, we're delivering fast. Since the start of this year, we've acquired over 100,000 acres near Magnolia. We're beginning a lithium drilling campaign this month and are targeting our first production by 2027. We're looking forward to investing in Arkansas as we advance these important projects. Thank you for your time this morning. Good morning, everyone. My name is Clint O'Neill, Executive Director of the Arkansas Economic Development Commission. It's great to be with you. We all know that the demand for lithium is on the rise because of electric vehicles, consumer products. Uh, one other thing that's on the rise is economic development in the state of Arkansas. Economic development is a team sport. We have many folks in the room that contribute significantly to the growth of the economy in Arkansas. We've got several of our local economic development partners here, uh, community leaders from Magnolia and around South Arkansas. I saw our commissioner, Chris Gosnell, many members of the General Assembly that have taken steps under Governor Sanders' leadership to reduce taxes, reduce regulatory burdens, and create a pathway for companies like ExxonMobil to be successful in Arkansas. It's a very special day when we can gather together and, and talk about a, a company like ExxonMobil, a Fortune 500 company, number three on the list, saying we're investing our capital in the state of Arkansas. So our message to ExxonMobil is, is thank you. Thank you for, for your investment, uh, for the steps you're taking, for energy, energy security, for national security, for what this is going to mean for not only jobs created by ExxonMobil, but for the opportunities that we'll have to recruit domestic manufacturing to the United States and to the state of Arkansas because of this lithium that will be uh, produced here in our state. So this is a great day. Many jobs are going to come from this, from this, uh, from this announcement, from this investment in ExxonMobil. We're, we're grateful, and the team at AEDC is going to be ready to, to support ExxonMobil and all the uh, initiatives that are going to come from this lithium, including companies that are going to be attracted to, uh, to, to come and do business with you and to create more jobs in our state. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Doug Hills. I'm the county judge for Columbia County. And I uh, appreciate the uh, governor inviting me to come today. This, uh, this is going to be a Im big impact for South Arkansas and the uh, Columbia County and Lafayette County area. And uh, we're all just real excited to uh, see what's coming. We've already been working hand in hand with Mobile Exxon, uh, trying to get uh, roads to their wells prepared and everything. Um, I know it's, uh, it's going to be a lot of good things come out of this. There will be a lot of issues that we'll have to uh, head out. And uh, looking forward to working with the, uh, with the state and with ExxonMobil to handle the, any issues that come up. It will be a big boost for the economy in South Arkansas. I know I've, I was raised in Magnolia, born and raised in Magnolia. And uh, just seeing some of this come in like it is is going to be a, a big pick-me-up for the, for the area. It's just uh, one of the lower income places in the state. But this will help a lot. So, But I, uh, just for the community, they're real excited. Some of us politicians have a little, uh, uh, I don't know what you call it, but we're, we're ready for it anyway. We're trying to get ready for it. So. But uh, I appreciate everyone here today and appreciate what's going to happen in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Uh, and with that, we'll take a couple questions if anyone has any. What type of economic impact do you expect this to have on the state? Talk about it, you know, growing the economy, whatever. What, what does that look like in terms of projecting them? Well, I think this is something that has the ability to have tr tremendous long term economic economic impact. This isn't limited over the course of the next year or two, but uh, something that could go on for decades, and that's certainly the hope. Uh, we know that the scale, and I'll be happy to bring Patrick back up here, could go into the hundreds of millions of dollars just for Exxon's investment in the overall project. 
but this is something that has the ability to have long-term impact. This is not a one-and-done thing. So uh, it's hard to measure at this stage in the game exactly just how big and how far it could be. Uh, certainly, that's one of the reasons that the partnership between the local, the state, and the corporate side are so important. Uh, and while all the players have to be at the table, we're going to work very closely to clear any hurdles or barriers that could impact the project, uh, and we'll deal with those as they come up. We are the national, national state. Is there any uh, economic uh, impact as far as uh, having to do with uh, national resources and drilling and whatnot? Uh, certainly as the natural state, I think that is one of the best things about Arkansas. We want to protect our natural resources, but that also means that we should tap into them where we can. This has the ability to really transform, I think, a lot of South Arkansas if things continue to go down the trajectory it started with, and that's a good thing for all of our state. Uh, big believer that the natural state is one of the unique selling propositions of Arkansas and something we should lean into, not shy away from. Take one last question. But a question for Patrick. I'm sure. Sure. Hi. <laughs> Certainly. So maybe to start with the last part of that question, um, we're kicking off our drilling campaign um, this month, and so we'll be drilling uh, very shortly. Um, in terms of the, the land, uh, we acquired over 100,000 acres earlier this year of mineral rights, um, and we'll be progressing the development uh, there. And then in terms of the process, uh, the smackover formation in Arkansas is, is pretty deep. It's about 10,000 feet below the surface. We'll be drilling wells into that formation, extracting the brine to the surface, and then using modern processing techniques that are uh, significantly um, uh, lower environmental impact than the current methods to selectively extract the lithium before putting the brine back in the ground. Yeah, so my, my name is Patrick Howth and I'm the Venture Executive for ExxonMobil. And we'll be happy to send that information around too. Thank you all so much. Although I'm disappointed you didn't ask me the technical drilling question, but we'll save that for next time. Thank you guys so much for being here today. Give everybody a minute to get in. Good morning, and thank you all for joining us here. I'm joined today by our Attorney General, Secretaries Perfuri and Hager, members of the legislature, local leaders, and law enforcement. I wish I could say that we were here this morning under pleasant circumstances, but that's simply not the case. When I ran for this office, I promised our Kansans that I was going to make us safer and stronger. Arkansas has had a crime problem made worse by an unwillingness to make necessary changes. We had weak penalties for violent criminals and overcapacity issues in our state prisons. We currently have over 16,000 available beds, but over 18,000 criminals that need to be incarcerated. For far too long, many in positions of leadership have chosen to ignore the issue and kick the can down the road. Unfortunately, some in those positions of leadership are still playing games that put Arkansans in harm's way. As governor, my top priority is the safety and security of our citizens. I will not sit by while we enact the same broken policies that got us here in the first place because no one ever called those in leadership out. Not anymore, not on my watch. Last week, the Arkansas State Board of Corrections refused to approve Secretary Perfuri's thoughtful, informed, and desperately needed request to open up hundreds of additional prison beds. This is simply unacceptable. For far too long, there has been a revolving door in our state's prison system. Criminals commit crimes, get sentenced by the court system, and then, because of a shortage of bed space, are let back out on the street streets with just a slap on the wrist. We must enforce the law and quit putting our citizens' lives at risk. I've said it before and I'm saying it again. The failed status quo will not continue as long as I'm governor. That's why the legislature passed and I signed the PROTECT Act, cracking down on repeat offenders. It's why I asked for and the legislature agreed that we will build a new 3,000-bed prison, the first major investment in prison expansion in nearly two decades. 
It's why Secretary Porfiri has worked overtime to open up 1,000 new prison beds in our existing space, reducing pressure on county jails and local law enforcement. But now, the Board of Corrections is declining to approve almost 500 additional beds for no reason whatsoever. In fact, the Board has been against the PROTECT Act from the beginning, and it puts our Kansans' lives at risk. We have the space, we have the resources, we have the personnel. All that stands between us and a safer, stronger Arkansas is bureaucratic red tape. It's time for the Board of Corrections to do what is needed to protect our people, which is why I'm calling on the Board to convene an emergency meeting without delay to approve the 500 additional beds that they denied last week. It is time to act. The Board knows it, the people standing here with me know it, and most importantly, the people of Arkansas need it. <clears throat> I'm now going to turn it over to the Attorney General and a few others to make remarks, and then I'll come back up and we'll be happy to take questions at that time. Thank you. Tim. Thank you, Governor. This is not <clears throat> a new problem. This is a problem that has existed for decades. What's new, the bold actions of, of the legislature and the governor to fix it. We had a robust debate, lots of discussion for a long, long time about the PROTECT Act, but ultimately it passed, I think it was 82% in the House and 83% in the Senate. But whether you were for the PROTECT Act or not, no one can reasonably argue that they weren't for expanding prisons, even though they weren't doing anything about it. What do I mean? Well, for years, the prisons were quietly expanded through the county jails. So what happened was everybody know, knew we needed more space, but instead of having the open public debate about building more prison beds, quietly filled up all of our county jails, threw away the misdemeanor part of the criminal code, and were able to smugly act as if they weren't expanding prisons. And there were people in both parties doing that. And the people who were most adamant about fighting the PROTECT Act, they never said a word when the county jails were filled, ever. So let's be clear, there's no one that is, that is able to intelligently, with a straight face, argue that we don't need more prison capacity. Which brought us to the PROTECT Act. And the solution that the legislature and the governor worked on, and I was proud to be a part of that effort with a lot of other people. We, this is a revolutionary piece of legislation. It passed the House, supermajority, passed the Senate, supermajority, signed into law. And now we're relitigating this. I understand what the statute says. I understand the role of the board. I also understand that the board could approve this. But the governor referred to this. The chairman of the Board of Corrections testified against the PROTECT Act. That's ridiculous. If he didn't understand the need for it, he shouldn't be in that job, in my view. I'm not speaking for the governor on that. This is so, so basic. And I've heard things like, well, until you get a plan for 3,000 beds, we're not going to give you 500. That's like saying well, we would rather 500 murderers roam the streets until we get a perfect plan for 3,000. That also makes no sense. Let me be real clear. The actions of the Board of Corrections make our Kansans in this room and all around the state less safe. The Board of Corrections in Arkansas, a government body, makes all of us less safe. Let me read from their website what their purpose is. The purpose, quote, the purpose of the Board of Correction is to manage correctional resources in the state such that offenders are held accountable for their actions. Failure, 
Victims' needs are addressed in a positive manner. Failure and the safety of society is enhanced. Failure. They failed. They need to expand this. And let me say as an aside, if you were to ask little Susie, little Jimmy, whatever their names are, at school, what's the, what, how does something become law? They say, well, the legislature passes it, maybe even passes it by a supermajority. The governor signs it. The teacher would have to say, well, that's normally the case. But in Arkansas, if it's Department of Corrections, after the governor signs it, Benny Magnus, who's been over there for decades, he has to sign it. That is a horrible way to run state government. If that is, in fact, the case, which it appears to be, this is a clarion call for constitutional and statutory reform on this issue. Expand the beds, Mr. Chairman, so that we can all be safer. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Attorney General. <clears throat> I want to be clear and, and ensure we make no mistake. This is a public safety issue. The Department of Corrections stands as a sentinel in the criminal justice system. To have an effective system, all parts of that system must work as a whole. The inability for the Department of Corrections to take prisoners from county jails, from that upstream affect of arrest and incarceration at the, ju at the county level, pending incarceration after conviction, creates scenarios where people who need to be in prison roam free. <clears throat> it is my job as a secretary of the Arkansas Department of Corrections to create opportunity and create space and to run safe prisons. Any beds that I have added, any beds that I will add or request to add will not create any unsafe prisons. I will not deviate from the mission of safe prisons. Our prisons are accredited nationally, every single one of them, by the American Correctional Association. We maintain requirements associated with square footage and treatment of those offenders that are housed in our custody. But to stand in the way to add additional beds when we can create public safety opportunities and individuals who are arrested by law enforcement can be d d retained in jail systems is my responsibility. Adding additional beds and approving this request will provide that opportunity for police and sheriffs and I am here to stand before you and ensure that we do that. Thank you so much for your support. Let me begin by saying thank you to the governor for her support during this past legislative session of the Protect Arkansas Act uh, and also the Attorney General and my co-sponsor in the Senate, Senator Gilmore. Uh, the Protect Arkansas Act, as many of you know, was historic criminal justice reform legislation that will truly make Arkansas a safer place for generations to come. And I want to say this about the Protect Arkansas Act. The primary purpose of the Protect Arkansas Act was to fix our broken parole system and to close the revolving door in our prisons. And the way that you close the revolving door in the prisons is that you have to expand capacity. And we talked about this uh, many times during the debate of the Protect Arkansas Act. Secretary Perfiri has come up with a plan to expand capacity of approximately 500 beds that is desperately needed and that will desperately uh, improve the condition of public safety in the state of Arkansas. And so on behalf of my colleagues in the House of Representatives and in the Senate, we want to strongly encourage the Board of Corrections to work with Secretary Perfiri to expand capacity and improve public safety for all our Kansans. Thank you. I'll be happy to take a couple questions if there are any. We're working through that process. As you can imagine, building a 3,000 bed prison is going to take time, uh, especially with the government and following all the procedures that come along with that, which is why this temporary space is so desperately needed. Because while we wait and go through the process to get that new prison up and running, we need this space so that we can keep those violent offenders off the streets.
I think it's pretty clear what we're trying to do is we're trying to get them to allow us to keep people safe. It's very simple. Uh, we know that we have people that should be locked up and they're not helping in that process. We've been very clear, I've been talking about, as has the Attorney General, uh, Representative Gasway, Senator Gilmore, about the need for additional bed space for the last couple of years. This is not a new topic. Uh, we've gone before them and tried to follow that process. They're simply standing in the way of us protecting Arkansas citizens, and that is unacceptable. All right, thank you guys so much, appreciate it. Thank you. Good morning. And thank you so much for being here. And thank you so much, Secretary Ward, not just for the kind introduction, but for the great job that you do helping us lead the Department of Agriculture and also for organizing this year's program. We're excited to be here this morning to induct some of Arkansas's most serious farmers. You'll be happy to know that while they've let me drive a few big tractors lately, it's kind of amazing the keys that they'll turn over to you as governor of the state. <laughs> I will not be challenging anybody for Farm Family of the Year, but we have had a great time getting out in the state and engaging directly with a number of members from our agriculture community. And it's an honor to be here this morning with the 36 families that we are inducting today. Each of these families has farmed the same land for more than 100 years, and they are joining the nearly 600 farm families who are already members of our state Century Farm program. Congratulations to each of you. When we talk about farming here in the capital, we often talk about it in terms of economics, since it is our state's largest industry. Or we talk about it in terms of national security. As my dad likes to say, a country that can't feed itself fuel itself or clothe itself simply cannot survive. That's why my administration became the first in the nation to kick a Chinese state-owned company off our farmland last month, and that's why we're always looking for ways to protect and grow this industry. While farming is more important in both of those senses, it also runs very deep in, this, in the culture of our state. Farming is our heritage. It is our culture, and for many Arkansas families, it is a way of life. Today, unfortunately, that way of life is under threat. The average American farmer is 57 and a half years old. Younger generations aren't picking up where the older ones are leaving off. And that's not just a danger to our businesses or our security, it's a danger to the very fabric of the natural state and to our country. We're the nation's top producer of rice and contribute our fair share of soy, wheat, corn, and poultry. But unfortunately, we still rank at the bottom in the nation in terms of food insecurity, something that will get worse if our farmers close up shop and are not allowed to operate. My administration has convened stakeholders from the public, private, and nonprofit sectors to bring an all-of-government approach to this issue of food insecurity but we have to make sure that we're taking care of our farmers if we're going to actually address this issue. That's why I've been proud to sign laws that deliver strong support for our farmers and for their communities. Our workforce initiatives include career and technical education programs in smaller towns that connect high schoolers directly with local employers, helping them to stay in the area after they graduate. We've created a rural veterinary student scholarship program to make sure that large animal vets come to Arkansas and actually remain here after they graduate. And of course, programs like the Century Farm Program help us give farming families the recognition that they deserve and should be getting on the regular basis. So I want everyone to join me in congratulating these families on their accomplishments and thank them for their incredible dedication, not just to their craft, but to our state. Every day that we sit down for a meal, every day that we put on a shirt or engage in any way with our communities, we need to thank our farmers because those are the people that allow us to be here today and to be the great state that we are. Thank you so much for the work that you do. Thank you for representing our state so well and congratulations to all of our new Century Farm families.
Good morning. It is such an exciting day here at another one of Arkansas's incredible state parks. This one is particularly special because it's in my hometown of Little Rock. One of the things that I love about the natural state and particularly this state park is that standing out here, you feel like you're hundreds of miles away from any type of population when in reality, you're just a short drive from our busiest downtown and our state's most populated city. This is a place filled with incredible memories, both from childhood and now as a parent sharing with my own kids. Uh, I'm pretty excited about the fact that we will now have Lob Lolly as a great motivator to get our kids back down from the mountain as well. We are certainly not above bribing our kids for, uh, with special treats to keep them moving. But it is an exciting day, and I'm really ex thankful that I get to be here and be part of this project. Thankful for the amazing leadership that we have from uh, the Central Arkansas Legislative Delegation that is here, who have been great partners in helping us continue to elevate our state parks and continue to sell Arkansas as the natural state. One of the things that I think sets us apart from every other state in the country are our incredible natural resources and the fact that we have some of the best state parks of anywhere in the country. And this will just continue to allow us to elevate what we are already doing at an exceptionally high level. Like I said, I have a lot of great memories here. I also have a couple of not so great memories here. You know, whether it's my husband forcing me up the hard side of the mountain or shattering my ankle uh, and being forced to be on crutches for several weeks. I know most of you think it was probably when I was hiking the mountain, but it actually occurred in the completely open flat field that sits right in front of the mountain playing Frisbee. <laughs> Despite the fact that I've had a couple of those challenging moments, all of the great moments certainly outweigh, and I'm really excited about the fact that this is a state park that no matter what your adventure level is, there is something here that you can enjoy, whether as an individual, as a couple, or as a family, that can go multi-generational. And that is something that is really special and unique about a lot of the opportunities that we have here in Arkansas at our state parks. And one of the reasons I'm so excited about what we have here today. I also wanna give a special thank you uh, to former Secretary Hurst who helped start this project and also to Secretary Lewis who has helped complete this. Having something that has been so transformational for our state and go across multiple administrations, I think is a great testament to just how important the natural state and our state parks are to every Arkansan. And one of the things that can bring everybody together and give us something to enjoy, uh, no matter where you are in life. So thank you for being here today. It is a great day for Arkansas, another great addition to Arkansas State Parks. And I look forward to enjoying all of the many new offerings that we will have because of this visitor center. So thank you for being here today. Good afternoon. Governor, thank you so much for the introduction and thank you for inviting me, but most importantly, thank you for your incredible friendship. You know, taking on this job, uh, you look to people who have been there in front of you to guide you, partner with you, and I could not have asked for a better uh, mentor and neighbor in Governor Lee as you have been. So thank you very much for your leadership. You know, frankly, when the governor called and asked me to come and speak, I was pretty reluctant. I have to admit, most of you probably know, Tennessee and Arkansas are actually rivals. And I wasn't sure I wanted to give any help to our friends on the other side of the river. You guys seem to be doing quite well without any help from me. And we would like to win in a few things in Arkansas. But when I read what the governor was proposing, I knew that there was no question that I had to be here. There is an absolute conservative education revolution happening in our country, and I wanted to be part of it here in Tennessee, as well as my home state of Arkansas. It has already swept Little Rock and across the natural state. And I know with Governor Lee's leadership, the speaker, the Lieutenant Governor, it is gonna sweep across the volunteer state as well. As I said, our two states have a little bit of rivalry. You've got the Smokies, 
we've got the Ozarks, you have Graceland, we have Johnny Cash's childhood home, you've got the Tennessee Volunteers, we've got the Arkansas Razorbacks, go Hogs. We'll ignore this past football season and look to the future on uh, <laughs> basketball. And now we're competing to be the best state in the nation for education freedom. But frankly, this is a rivalry that will benefit everyone in both of our states. I ran to be Arkansas's education governor. And in just my first few months in office, I signed legislation called Arkansas Learns Into Law. It was the single largest overhaul of our school system in recent history. We made changes like taking starting teacher pay from being at the very bottom 48th in the country to top five overnight. We deployed an army of literacy coaches around the state and invested in career and technical education. But the key cornerstone of Arkansas Learns is our state's new education freedom accounts. This program gives families the ability to send their kids to whichever school best fits their needs, whether that's private school, parochial, public, or homeschool. We jumped from 13th in the country for education freedom to number four within the last few months. In the next few years, as the program expands to every family in our state, LEARNS will truly transform Arkansas's education system for the better. Like Governor Lee, I ran for office to change the status quo, not to be a caretaker, but to shake things up and do things different so that it would help every single member of my state. And we've been doing that, not just at the Capitol, but also at the governor's mansion. I'm a mom. I have three school-aged kids, an 11-year-old, a 10-year-old, and an 8-year-old. And like I said, we're shaking things up and doing things a little differently. When we first moved into the governor's mansion, I couldn't find our two boys I'm looking all over the place. I hear a lot of commotion coming from the front yard. I go outside to find them stripped down to basically their underwear swimming in the front fountain of the governor's mansion. <laughs> I went up to my youngest son, George, and I said, George, what in the world are you doing? He said, it's okay. Be cool, mom. It's not like we're going to drown. I said, George, my concern isn't the fact that you might drown in ankle deep water. It's the fact that you're practically naked in the front yard and it doesn't seem to bother you at all. Thankfully, Governor Lee is not following our lead in every area that we're taking. And I don't think he's got that problem going on in his front yard. But I am proud of the fact that he is recreating some of the same success that we've had when it comes to education, changing things all the way from Memphis to the Mountain City. And when he gets his proposals passed, every single Tennessee family, just like every Arkansas family, will have the freedom to choose the school that best fits their child's needs. <laughs> and this couldn't come soon enough. It's not a secret that America's students are struggling. COVID lockdowns erased years of progress in math and reading. Some schools now seem more interested in teaching the newest politically correct fad than basic writing and arithmetic. Where the education establishment has failed, conservatives are picking up the pieces. From school boards, to state legislatures, to Congress, education freedom is winning across this country. And for those of us who have fought so hard for so long in support of these reforms, it's a pretty amazing feeling to see it all come together. Like I said, I'm a mom of three elementary aged kids. So it's an even bigger victory knowing that my kids will also benefit from having the best education they possibly can. None of my children learn in the same way. It would be insane to suggest that they should all be taught in the same way. Yet, frankly, that's the lie we've told for far too long. And that ends today. Tennessee is joining Arkansas to say yes. Individual students need individual education. A student's zip code shouldn't be the only thing that determines where they go to school. And it is time for the failed status quo to end and every child, not just in Tennessee, but across the country to have every opportunity to succeed. I
I couldn't be prouder to stand up here with all of you to announce the next state to join the conservative education revolution. And I couldn't be prouder that it's our neighbor to the east, Tennessee, although we still plan to beat you in a few key categories. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Governor Lee, for your incredible leadership to the speaker, to the lieutenant governor, and to the members of the legislature here in Tennessee. We wanna be your partner in helping you get the job done. We look forward to being uh, a great competitor uh, in not only education, but in all the other categories. Football, we're ready for you next year. Thank you so much. Good morning and thank you so much for joining us. It is an honor to be here to make the first of hopefully several jobs announcements to come out of this summer's trip to the Paris Air Show. This past June, we brought our administration to Europe to meet with aerospace and defense leaders at the largest air show in the world. Aerospace is Arkansas's largest export, a $1 billion industry that employs people from Northwest Arkansas to Little Rock to the Golden Triangle of South Arkansas. That's why past Arkansas governors have gone to tout our state's strong business environment, and it's why our state made such a big showing this year to compete against other states. The 2023 air show, though this time, felt a bit different. Since the last air show in 2019, Russia has invaded Ukraine. Communist China has raised tensions in Taiwan to a boiling point. And earlier this month, Hamas terrorists committed one of the worst acts of evil against the Jewish people in recent memory, evil we thought we had defeated and buried in 1945. The world is a lot more dangerous than it used to be. Our enemies are on the march, and they have their targets set squarely on the backs of Americans and our allies. Because of that, my job was as much about touting Arkansas's economy as it was about touting Arkansas's spirit. We don't shy away from being America's arsenal. We're not bashful about building the aircraft and weapons that are necessary to keep Americans safe. Everyone from our congressional delegation on down believes that the only way to have a safe America is to have a strong America. One of my earliest trips as governor was to a community that embodies that Arkansas mentality, Camden. I toured one of the facilities used to make missiles for the U.S. military and our partners around the globe. They're not timid about their role in defending freedom in Camden, Arkansas. And today, Camden is doubling down on that commitment to protect America and our allies. I'm proud to be here with Jeff Shockey to announce that Raytheon Raphael is building a new $33 million facility in East Camden. The site will create 30 new jobs and will build Tamir missiles, which are used in Israel's Iron Dome weapon system and its U.S. equivalent, Sky Hunter. Soon, everyone from the U.S. Marines to the IDF will be defending innocent lives using materials built right here in Arkansas. I want to thank our team here in the state for doing the legwork to secure this investment, especially Secretary Hugh McDonald, Director Clint O'Neill, James Lee Silliman, and Randy Zook. Thank you as well to Washita County Judge Robbie McAdoo, East Camden Mayor Angie McAdoo, and Camden Mayor Charlotte Young. We're also very grateful to Senators Bozeman and Cotton and Congressman Westerman, Womack, Crawford, and Hill for their support in Camden's growing role in defense manufacturing. And of course, we want to thank RTX for believing in Arkansas. We promise we will not let you down and we will always rise to the challenge. Their Director of Government Relations, Jeff Shockey, flew in on short notice just to be here for this important announcement. It has never been clearer or more urgent that America needs to reinvest in its defense. And there has never been a state more willing or more capable to step up and answer the call than Arkansas. I'll now turn it over to Jeff to say a few words about this great announcement. Thank you so much for being here and thank you for your partnership. Good morning. I am Jeff Shockey, Senior Vice President of Global Government Relations at RTX, formerly known as Raytheon Technologies, the world's largest aerospace and defense company with 180,000 employees uh, worldwide. RTX and our business units 
Collins Aerospace, Pratt & Whitney, and Raytheon provide advanced systems and services for commercial, military, and civil customers around the world. Thank you so much, Governor, for inviting me to join you for this announcement today. We have a beautiful day to announce this great news. Honored guests, I can't stress enough what a great partnership we have with the state of Arkansas. It's always such a pleasure when we at RTX get to work with you all in the natural state. Throughout the entire RTX Corporation, we feel like we're part of the family here. Let me say a few words about why we're here today. The Iron Dome Missile Defense System is one of the best known missile defense systems in the world. We at RTX are so pleased to be part of a system that has saved countless lives over the years. You don't have to go further than today's news or the TV to see the systems in action. The system, unfortunately, has had to prove itself almost daily over the skies of Israel. But despite that, it has had a mind-blowing success rate in excess of 90%. A lot of work goes into building missiles that successful. Our business, our Raytheon business, has a strong and enduring missile defense partnership with our Rafael teammates, and we have a great team. The partnership is now coming to Arkansas as we're going to construct a new facility in East Camden to build and deliver Iron Dome missiles for the Marine Corps medium range intercept capability, more commonly referred to as MRIC, with factory capacity to support our Israeli and other uh, partners uh, to achieve their Iron Dome requirements. With the news of the horrific um, Hamas invasion in Israel, this couldn't be more timely. Our goal is to begin producing these missiles in 2025. There's been a lot of talk in the media, as the governor mentioned, about the resiliencies of the nation's munitions industrial base. That it can't be delivered, it can't deliver what is needed and it's not big enough, et cetera. Well, today we are doing something about that. RTX and Raphael are investing over $33 million, coupled with the generous support from state and local governments here, to build this facility that will be operated by R2S, the, Ra the Raytheon Raphael Protection Systems, our joint venture with Raphael Defense of Israel. When we begin production, this facility will create more than 30 jobs and we anticipate more work coming with the global demand for missile defense. None of this could be possible without our partnership with Arkansas. As I said, you all treat us like family, and this family is getting down to the business of defending our nation and our partners with the construction of this Camden facility. In addition to the governor, I'd like to also thank the members and staff of the Arkansas Congressional Delegation in particular, Senator Bozeman, Senator Cotton, Congressman Westerman, and Congressman Womack. They've been part of our discussions with the state and helped bring RTX and this critical investment at this critical time to Arkansas. We appreciate their steadfast support of our national defense and for our men and women who serve and protect our country and for those who support our allies across the world. Thank you again, Governor Huckabee Sanders, for your leadership when our CEO Greg Hayes and I met with you and your leadership team at the Paris Air Show this past summer, we knew right away we had found a great partner with you and the state of Arkansas. Governor, you understand the critical mission that RTX performs for our armed forces around the world, and you are keenly aware of the threats on the horizon across the globe. As everyone knows, the governor is a superb communicator and she convinced us that Arkansas was the right place for this project, this investment, and these new jobs for Arkansans. At every turn, the fabulous team from the state, the Arkansas Economic Development Commission, and the local team in Camden were incredibly supportive and responsive. Special thanks to Arkansas Commerce Secretary Hugh McDonald, AEDC Executive Director Clint O'Neill, and Senior Project Manager Gerald Wycliffe and James Lee Seelman, Economic Development, uh, and Calhoun County Judge Floyd Nutt. Um, we have a fantastic partnership across the board. Uh, Mayor Charlotte Young uh, from the City of Camden, Mayor Angie McAdoo from the City of East Camden, 
We're thrilled to be in partnership with all of you, and we look forward to a really enduring partner partnership here, again, protecting lives of not just our men and women in uniform, but those of our allies, and in particular in Israel. So, Governor, team, thank you very much for all you've done to have us invest here, and we look forward to a long and successful partnership here. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Clint O'Neill. I'm the Executive Director of the Arkansas Economic Development Commission. Just want to start this morning by acknowledging a few that made this project possible. Uh, we have uh, several members of the Arkansas delegation that were at the Paris Air Show. Uh, I have Bethany Duncan here from our team at AEDC, Tim Allen, uh, who serves on the Arkansas Military Affairs Council, was part of our trip, Randy Zook at the State Chamber, Colonel Rob Ader, our Director of Military Affairs. I uh, want to recognize our commissioners that are here. I see Tracy Ransifer and John Wycliffe back there. Um, it, it takes a team to pull off successful economic development projects. Olivia Womack, our Director of Business Development, is here. She leads our business development team to create a pipeline of opportunities for communities to compete for. This is such an important industry for us and so happy that we had this opportunity to, to work with Jeff and his team. Uh, to compete for this project as aerospace and defense is our number one export and an industry that we pay close attention to. I um, want to recognize uh, a member of our team who's not able to make it today, Jared Wycliffe. He's our senior project manager. He handled the day-to-day -day details for us leading this project, and the reason he's not here is because he's out on a site visit, uh, you know, work, working more economic de development deals for us. Um, but. We are on a winning streak. Because of the governor's leadership, uh, I, I want to recognize uh, Senator Stone and, and thank him, the other members of the General Assembly, uh, as we cut taxes in Arkansas, as we increase our business climate. Arkansas is continually recognized as a beautiful state, a high quality of life, a low cost of living, a place where people care about one another. When it comes to economic development projects, we put the ingredients in place what it takes to be successful with real estate, workforce development, business costs that are favorable, and then we go out and we find good partners. Uh, RTX has been invested in, our, in Arkansas for a long time. This is a project that uh, we have been working with their team on for, uh, for, for the past few years off and on. The conversations were really accelerated this summer at the Paris Air Show, and we're here today announcing new jobs, and we're really grateful for their investment. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm James Lee Sullivan, the Executive Director of Washtenaw Partnership for Economic Development. We're the lead uh, economic development agency for our area of the state, uh, Washtenaw and Calhoun counties. Um, I, uh, uh, we're, we're, Washtenaw Partnership is, is proud to welcome uh, Raytheon and Raphael Advanced Defense Systems, uh, their new venture to Calhoun County. Our regional area, as the, as the governor has already mentioned, uh, is uh, referred to as the uh, Golden Triangle of Arkansas. Uh, the aerospace and defense industry uh, are, are critical to the Golden Triangle, uh, e our, our economic success. And we look forward to supporting co uh, the companies as they expand their manufacturing capacity uh, in Calhoun County. Uh, Calhoun and Washtenaw County, we have a symbiotic relationship because the industrial park is right across the Washtenaw County line and uh, most of our um, uh, defense uh, contractors uh, are, uh, associate themselves to the Camden area, but it takes both Calhoun and Washtenaw County working together uh, to have a successful uh, 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 airspace and defense industry that we have in our area. Uh, but we've been a hub, uh, Calhoun and Washtenaw County has been a hub for airspace and defense industry uh, in Arkansas and the United States uh, since 1945. Um, that's how long we've been uh, manufacturing uh, rocket systems uh, in, in our area. We're excited that Raytheon and Raphael Advanced Defense Systems have chosen East Camden 
to build a new manufacturing facility, and we stand ready to assist these companies in succeeding in our community. I want to thank uh, our partners that have made this announcement today possible. First and foremost, to Raytheon and Raphael um, Systems, uh, Governor Sanders' office, uh, AEDC, and the team at AEDC that I work with on a regular basis, uh, Highland Industrial Park, and Calhoun County. And uh, we're, we're very excited about this project and uh, continuing to build on our airspace and defense base uh, in the East Camden area. And I would close with this. It takes teamwork, everyone that you see before you standing behind me today, it, uh, to, to make these projects possible. And I have a little saying that I like to, to use. It's not original. Uh, teamwork makes the dream work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, James. And with that, we'll take a couple of questions if you have any. Uh, Clint, if you want to jump up, you can give a couple more details on the breakdown of that. Sure. Yeah, so as, as Jeff mentioned, there was state and local support. Uh, so from the state side, uh, this is something that uh, I see Clark Cogbill and Tyler Hale in the back. They'll, they'll probably best to follow up with a uh, email with, with the details, but there were, um, you know, the, the performance-based programs as, as well as an infrastructure grant. So it, it was, uh, yeah, if, if from memory, y'all got guys in the back, correct me if I'm wrong, a $250,000 infrastructure grant from the Governor's Quick Action Closing Fund. The income tax credits and sales tax refunds are performance-based programs called Advantage Arkansas and Tax Back. Uh, look, today our focus is on the great news that we have in front of us and spending our time going out and doing what we can to make Arkansas better. We're excited about this announcement. We're going to keep our focus on that today. Sure. Absolutely. I don't know if there's anybody from the local area that wants to step up and give any of those details now, but if not, we'd be happy to provide it after. James, you want to jump up here? Uh, I'll be happy to, Governor. Uh, as far as local support goes, uh, there will be a, a, a pilot agreement uh, executed uh, in the future with uh, Calhoun County Quorum Court uh, and Judge Nutt, and uh, that is a uh, pilot is an acronym for pro uh, payment in lieu of taxes, so it, it will be a property tax, uh, a reduced property tax abatement to, to assist them in locating. That, that's the local incentives. I think we're starting um, producing uh, missiles in 2025, the Skyhunter missile at a, a rate of around 325 a year, and then we're going to be capacitized on the Tamir side to go up to 1,000 and maybe even 2,000 a year. I'll start with the first question. First, we've provided all documentation that has been requested. Continue to cooperate fully. As we've said many times, we welcome uh, and look forward to an expedited process. On the other stuff, uh, at this point, I think you guys are at a decision point, um, and I'm not trying to be rude, but I think you have to decide whether you want to be actual journalist or whether you want to chase tabloid gossip. And right now, our focus is on actually building up industry and focusing on bringing jobs in and doing things that matter and help our Kansans, while the press continues to chase down rabbit holes and go down ridiculous stories from people who are frankly just left-wing activists. All of the business in this state under my leadership seems to be doing pretty well, except for the media, so you guys may want to look at a different business plan. Thank you all so much for being here today. We appreciate it.